Chapter 21 Good evening, Senator. Arnold Giancola pressed the hold key on the document viewer in his lap as one of his bodyguards opened the limousine door. Good evening, Giuseppe, Senator Jason Giancola said, nodding courteously to the security man as he slid in through the open door to join his older brother in the luxurious passenger compartment. Giuseppe Lauder closed the door behind him, gave the immediate vicinity a quick scan, then waved to the chase car and climbed into the front passenger seat beside the driver. Central, State One is departing for the octagon, he said into his boom mic. Central copies, Giuseppe. State One departing for residence for the octagon at 1831 hours. The response wasn't exactly by the book, but Camille Beguin had the central dispatch watch this evening, and she and Lauder had worked together for over three years. Confirm, Central, Lauder said. He nodded to the driver, and the limo and its chase car lifted quietly into the evening. Just what's this emergency meeting all about, Arnold? Jason Giancola asked. You're asking me? Arnold replied. You're the one on the Naval Oversight Committee, Jason, and... He smiled without much humor. Our good friend Thomas Theismann seems to have lost my personal com combination these days. Because he hates your guts, the younger Giancola said seriously. Arnold cocked an eyebrow at him, and Jason frowned. I know you're the brains, Arnold. I've never pretended you weren't, but I'm telling you, that man is dangerous. I never thought he wasn't, Arnold said mildly. On the other hand, he believes passionately in due process. Until and unless I do something illegal, he's not going to take the law into his own hands, however much he and I may disagree. Maybe not, Jason conceded. But getting back to my original question, I don't know any more about this meeting than you do, except for the fact that I got my invitation as the ranking minority member of the Naval Committee. So, whatever it is, it sounds like it's got a military dimension. What doesn't these days? Arnold said philosophically. Not much. Jason glanced up to be certain the partition between the passenger compartment and the driver's compartment was closed, and that the privacy light on the intercom was illuminated. Then he looked very intently at his older brother. I don't know everything you've been doing, Arnold, but I do have my own sources, and according to one of them, someone inside the FIA is showing an awful lot of interest in Eve Croclaude. I'm not going to ask you to tell me anything you don't want me to know, but the source who handed me that seems to think the interest in question has something to do with you as well. Which, to be honest, is one reason I mentioned the fact that Theismann doesn't like you very much. Interest in Eve? Arnold blinked mildly at the senator, his expression only moderately curious. After all, it wasn't as if Jason's warning was the first he'd heard about it. Jean-Claude Nesbitt had informed him four days ago that someone else had finally, quietly, and quite illegally, accessed Groclaude's documentary file. The information had produced a slight adrenaline lag, but mostly what he'd felt was something very like relief. I don't have the least idea why anyone should be officially interested in Eve, Jason, he said after a moment, his gaze candid. And if someone is, I don't see how it could possibly concern me. His name was Axel LaCroix, and he was 26 T years old. His family had been dolists for three generations until the First Manticoran War. He'd been only a child when that war began, but he'd grown to young adulthood against its backdrop. He'd seen his family move off the BLS at last, seen his parents regain their self-respect despite the oppressive grip of the Committee of Public Safety and State Security. He'd seen the changes beginning in the educational system, seen the even greater changes his younger siblings had faced when they entered school, and he'd seen the restoration of the Constitution and the concepts of personal responsibility and liberty. He'd been too young to serve in the First War, and he knew his parents really would have preferred for him to remain a civilian, but he owed a debt for all of those changes, and so, when the fighting resumed, he'd enlisted in the Republican Marines.
Because of his occupation, he was a trained shipyard worker, his induction had been delayed, but orders to report for duty had finally been delivered to his modest apartment the day before. He couldn't say the prospect didn't worry him. It did. He wasn't an idiot, after all, but he also had no regrets. He'd spent most of yesterday with his family, and today it had been time for the going-away party his buddies and fellow workers at the yard had put together for him. The alcohol had flowed freely, there'd been laughter and some tears, but no one had really been surprised. And since he was under orders to report the next day, he'd decided it was time for him to turn in early and sleep off as much of the conviviality as he could. "'You're sure you're okay to drive, Axel?' Angelo Goldbach asked as they walked across the parking garage. Of course I am, Axel replied. It's not very far anyway. I could run you home, Angelo offered. Don't be silly. I'm fine, I tell you. Besides, if you did, we'd probably sit up late drinking and I need the sleep. And Georgina would hunt me down and hurt me if I kept you out all night again. If you're sure, Angelo said. They reached Angelo's parking stall, and he stood looking at his friend for a moment, then swept him into a quick, rough embrace. You watch your ass, Axel, he said, standing back and shaking LaCroix gently by the shoulders. Damn straight, LaCroix said jauntily, a little embarrassed by Goldbach's intensity. He smacked his friend on the upper arm, watched Goldbach climb into his car and pull out of the parking stall, then continued to his own vehicle. The runabout wasn't very new, but personal vehicles of any sort were still relatively rare, especially here in the capital city, where most people relied on mass transit. For LaCroix, though, the slightly battered, jaunty little sports car had always symbolized his and his family's success in proving they were more than simply one more clan of dolus drones. Besides, he grinned as he unlocked the door and settled into the front seat. It might be old, but it was still fast, nimble, and downright fun to fly. Five minutes, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Arnold Giancola acknowledged Giuseppe Lauder's warning and began sliding his document viewer and sheafs of record chips into his briefcase. Well, Jason, he said with a smile, I imagine we'll be finding out shortly what all the mystery is about. And just between the two of us... Ten o'clock! Jean Cola's head snapped up at Louder's sudden shout. The limousine swerved wildly, yanking hard to the right, and the Secretary of State's head whipped around to the left. He just had time to see the runabout coming. With your permission, Madam President, I'll have Admiral Lewis go ahead and begin the briefing... Secretary of War Thomas Theismann said. Eloise Pritchard looked at him, then glanced at the two empty chairs at the conference table. I realize the situation is serious, she said after a moment, but I think we might give the Secretary of State a few more minutes. There might have been just the tiniest hint of a reprimand in her voice, although only someone who knew her well would have recognized it as such. Theismann did, and he bobbed his head very slightly in acknowledgment. One or two of the other people seated around the table seemed to have some difficulty suppressing smiles as they observed the byplay. But Secretary of Technology Henrietta Barloy, one of Giancola's staunchest allies in the cabinet, was not among them. I certainly agree, Madam President, she said frostily. In fact, excuse me, ma'am. Pritchard turned her head, eyebrows rising in mild surprise at the interruption. Sheila Thiessen, the senior member of her security detachment, was a past mistress at being totally unobtrusive at high-level sensitive meetings. She also possessed a formidable degree of self-control, what Kevin Usher called a poker face, which made her present stunned expression almost frightening. Yes, Sheila? Pritchard's voice was sharper than usual, sharper than she'd intended it to be. What is it? There's been an accident, Madam President. Secretary Giancola's limousine's been involved in a midair. What? Pritchard stared at Thiessen. Shock seemed to paralyze her vocal cords for a moment, then she shook herself. How bad is it? Was the secretary injured? I 
don't have the details yet, Thiessen said, brushing her unobtrusive earbug with a fingertip, as if to indicate the source of what she did know. But it doesn't sound good. She cleared her throat. The preliminary message said there appear to have been no survivors, ma'am. Jesus, I did not need this on top of everything else. Thomas Theismann leaned back in his chair, rubbing both eyes with the heels of his hands. The emergency meeting had been hastily adjourned while the president dealt with the stunning news that her secretary of state and his brother were both dead. Theismann couldn't fault her priorities, especially not in light of the inevitable time delays in the transmission of any messages or orders over interstellar distances. It wasn't as if responding to what had prompted the meeting in the first place was as time-critical as dealing with the immediate consequences of what promised to be a fundamental shift in the Republic's domestic politics. But now that everyone who needed to be informed had been told, and Pritchard had released her official statement— which dutifully expressed her profound regrets over the unexpected demise of her valued colleague and longtime friend, the president and her closest advisors and allies, Theismann himself, Dennis Lepique, Rachel Hanriot, Kevin Usher, and Wilhelm Trajan, had assembled in the Secretary of War's Octagon office. Oh, we didn't need it in more ways than you know, Tom, Pritchard said wearily. The last three hours had been a hectic whirl, and even she looked a little frazzled around the edges. Especially not combined with the news of the Mantis raids, Hanriot said sourly. What's that old saying about when it rains, it pours? I expect public opinion isn't going to take kindly to the news the Mantis just blooded our news, Theismann agreed. On the other hand, it's possible what happened to Jean Cola will actually distract the newsies, and let's be honest here, I don't think anyone in this room is especially going to miss him. You might be surprised. Pritchard's tone was bleak, and Theismann frowned at her. What do you mean, Eloise? You've been sounding semi-cryptic all evening. I know. I know. The president shook her head, but instead of explaining immediately, she looked at Usher. Have you heard from Abreu, Kevin? Yes, I have. Usher's voice was deeper than usual. All the preliminary indications are that it was a genuine accident. Theismann looked back and forth between the president and the FIA director. And just why shouldn't it have been a genuine accident? He asked. I admit I detested the man, but I promise I didn't have him killed. Nobody smiled, and his frown deepened. "'How did it happen?' Pritchard asked Usher. "'I mean, a traffic accident less than five minutes from the octagon?' "'According to the forensics team's preliminary, the other driver, an Axel Lacroix,' Usher said, consulting his memo pad's display, "'was well over the legal limit for blood alcohol. Basically, he was simply flying on manual rather than under traffic control, and he failed to yield and broadsided Giancola's limo at a high rate of speed. Flying on manual? Lepic repeated. If his blood alcohol was so high, why was he on manual? We'll have to wait for the tech teams to complete their examination of the wreckage, but Lacroix was driving an older model runabout. Right off the top of my head, I'd guess the internal sensors weren't working properly. Well, I suppose it's even possible he deliberately disconnected the safety overrides. It's against the law, of course, but a lot of people used to do it simply because traffic control was so spotty they didn't trust it in an emergency. At any rate, for some reason, the overrides which should have locked someone in his condition out of manual control didn't do it. Oh, how perfectly fucking wonderful, Pritchard said bitterly, and Theismann leaned forward, both palms flat on his desk. All right, he said, his voice the flat, no-nonsense one of a flag officer accustomed to command. Suppose you just explain to me what the hell is going on here. If anyone in that room, with the possible exception of Hanrio, found his tone an inappropriate one in which to address the President of the Republic, they didn't say so. Tom, Pritchard said instead, her voice very serious. 
This is going to open an incredible can of worms. Theisman looked like a man in serious danger of spontaneously exploding, and she went on in that same flat, hard tone. Kevin's been conducting a black investigation of Giancola for almost a month now. Dennis has known about it from the beginning, but I didn't tell you about it because, frankly, you're an even worse actor than Dennis. You already hated Giancola, and I was afraid you'd have a hard time not making him suspicious that something was going on. I'd intended to bring you fully on board as soon as Kevin's team had anything concrete to report. Investigating him over what? Theismann's eyes were intent, as were Trajan's. Hanriot's expression still showed more puzzlement than anything else, but alarm was beginning to show as well. Investigating the possibility that he falsified our diplomatic correspondence, not the Mantis. Pritchard sighed. That he what? Theismann erupted to his feet. Trajan didn't even move, as if astonishment had frozen him, and Hanrio jerked back as if Pritchard had slapped her. Kevin, Pritchard said harshly. Tell them. All eyes swiveled to the FIA chief, and he sighed. It all started when I began asking myself a few questions I couldn't answer, he said. And when I started trying to find the answers, it turned out that... So we finally hacked into Groclaude's attorney's files four days ago, Usher concluded several minutes later. And when we did, we found Roclaude had apparently tucked away evidence which incontrovertibly proved Giancola was responsible for altering both our own outgoing diplomatic correspondence and the incoming notes from the Mantis. Let me get this straight, Theismann said in a dangerously calm voice. You found this file four days ago, and this is the very first I'm hearing about it? First, Pritchard said crisply, you're the Secretary of War, Tom Theismann. You are not the Attorney General, you aren't a judge or magistrate, and you had no pressing need to know until we'd been able to confirm things one way or the other. Steely Topaz's eyes met angry eyes of Brown, and it was the brown ones which looked away. Second, the President said slightly more mildly, as I've already mentioned, your thespian abilities leave something to be desired in a politician operating at your level. Third, despite the fact that I very unofficially authorized Kevin's investigation, it's been totally black and, to be perfectly honest, operating outside the law. You wouldn't have been very happy to hear about that, and even if you'd been prepared to sing joyous hosannas, there was the minor problem that the only evidence we had was illegally obtained. And fourth, she gestured at Usher. And fourth, Usher took over. The evidence in the files was clearly fabricated. Fabricated? Any number of people would have been prepared to testify that Thomas Theismann was a tough-minded individual, but he was beginning to sound undeniably shell-shocked. There are at least three significant internal inconsistencies, Usher said. They aren't at all obvious on a first read-through, but they become quite apparent when you analyze the entire file carefully. So, Jim Cola didn't do it? On the basis of the documentary evidence we currently possess, no, Usher said. In fact, on the basis of the evidence, it looks very much as if Claude did it and intended to frame Giancola if and when his actions were discovered. Why do I seem to hear a bot hovering in the background? Because I'm pretty sure that somehow or other it was actually Giancola who fabricated the files we found and then planted them on Roclaude, after having him murdered. In an air car accident, Theismann said. There seemed to be a lot of those going around, Usher agreed with mordant humor. So you see our problem, Tom? And you, Rachel? Pritchard said. The only evidence we've actually been able to turn up 
illegally is demonstrably falsified. Apparently, it was intended to implicate Giancola, which would undoubtedly be construed by a lot of people, especially his allies and supporters, as proof he was actually innocent. However, we have the fact that the person who supposedly falsified it was guilty in what Kevin and I both consider to be a highly suspicious accident. And now, unfortunately, our only other suspect has just been killed in yet another air car accident. Bearing in mind just how fond of similar accidents both the legislaturalists and state sec were, how do you suppose public opinion, or Congress, is going to react if we lay this all... What did you call it, Kevin? Oh, yes. If we lay this all shit sandwich out on the public information boards. But if he did do it, then our entire justification for going back to war disappears. Theisman shook his head, his expression haunted. Yes, it does, Pritchard said unflinchingly. I could argue... Convincingly, I think, that what the Irish government actually did do would have justified our threatening to use force, or actually using it, to compel the Mantis to negotiate in good faith. Unfortunately, that isn't what we did. We used force because we appeared to have evidence they were negotiating in bad faith, and we published the diplomatic correspondence they'd falsified to prove our point. And that, however much we may regret it, and however we got there, is the point we have to begin from now. We're in a war, a popular war with powerful political support, and all we have is a theory, evidence we can't use, and which was probably manufactured, and two dead governmental officials who will never be able to convince the public died in genuine accidents— And on top of that, we've got the news of these raids by Harrington. She shook her head. How bad were the raids? Henriot asked. Theismann looked at her, and the Treasury Secretary grimaced. Look, part of this is probably a case of my looking for anything to distract me from this little vest pocket nuke Eloise and Kevin have just dropped on us. On the other hand... I really do need to know, both as the head of the Treasury Department and if I'm going to be able to offer any opinion on how news of them would combine with all the rest of this. Hmm. Theismann frowned, then shrugged. All right. I see your point, Rachel. He tipped his chair back again, clearly marshalling his thoughts. To put it bluntly, he said after a moment, Harrington just gave us an object lesson in how rear area raids ought to be conducted. She hit Gaston, Tamborin, Squalus, Hera, and Holman, and there's not a damned bit of orbital industry left in any of them. You're joking. Henrio sounded shocked. No, Theismann said in a tone of massive self-restraint. I'm not. They took out everything. And in the process, they also destroyed our defensive forces in all five systems. How much did you lose? Pritchard asked. Two battleships, seven battle cruisers, four old cruisers, three destroyers, and over a hundred lakhs, Theismann said flatly. And before anyone says anything else, he continued, as depressing as those numbers are, remember the pickets were spread across five separate star systems. None of the system commanders had anything like the forces he would have required to stand off an attack planned this carefully and executed in such force, and all of that is a direct consequence of the deployment patterns I authorized. But if they took out everything, Hanrio said, then the economic consequences are... The economic damage is going to be bad, Theismann said. But in the final analysis, all five of the systems were effectively non-contributors to the war effort, and for that matter, to the economy as a whole. Hanrio started to bristle, but Theismann shook his head. Rachel, that's based on your own department's analysis. Remember the one you and Tony Nesbitt put together before Thunderbolt? Hanrio settled back in her chair and nodded slowly. After two tea years of hard, unremitting labor... Her analysts, in conjunction with Nesbitt's Commerce Department, had completed the first really honest, comprehensive survey of the Republic's economic status in better than a century, barely six months before the shooting had started back up.
All these systems were listed in the break-even category, the Secretary of War continued. At best, they were second-tier systems, and Gaston and Holman, in particular, had been money-losing propositions under the legislature lists. That was turning around, but they were still barely contributing to our positive cash flow. The destruction in the star systems is going to have a net negative effect, I'm sure. Your analysts will be able to evaluate that better than I'm in any position to do, because the damage to the local civilian infrastructure means we'll be forced to commit federal relief funds and resources on an emergency basis. But none of them were particularly critical, which is, frankly, the reason they weren't more heavily defended. We can't be strong everywhere, and the systems we've left most weakly covered are the ones we can most readily survive losing. Glant did, Pritchard said after a moment, but what we can afford in cold-blooded economic and industrial terms and what we can afford in terms of public opinion may not be exactly the same thing. They almost certainly aren't the same thing, and the Mantis clearly understand that, Theismann replied. Whoever selected their targets did a damned good job. Harrington was able to use relatively limited forces and still attain crushing local superiority. She took virtually no losses of her own, cost us sixteen hyper-capable units in addition to all those lacks, and scored the Mantis first clear-cut offensive victory of the war. And, to be perfectly honest, the fact that they did it under Honor Harrington's command is also going to have an impact— She's something of our own personal bogeyman, after all. So, completely exclusive of any physical damage she's done to us, he continued, this is inevitably going to have an impact in Congress. I've already got the general staff considering how we're going to respond when the senators and representatives from every system which hasn't been raided yet start demanding we strengthen their covering forces. I'm afraid you're absolutely right about what they're going to demand, Pritchard said, and it's going to be hard to explain why they can't have it. No, Theismann disagreed. It's going to be very easy to explain we can't possibly be strong everywhere, and especially not without frittering away our offensive capability exactly as the Montes want us to do. What's going to be hard is convincing frightened men and women to listen to the explanation. Not just members of Congress, either, Lepique said heavily. It's going to be just as hard to explain to the general public. Actually, Pritchard said, I'm less concerned about explaining that to them, or even explaining how we let this happen, than I am about the impact on public support for the war. It isn't going to undermine it, not at this point at least. What it's going to do is further inflame public opinion. I admit it could have that effect, Trujan said. But, no, Wilhelm, she's right, Hanrio interrupted. Public opinion has been riding a sustained emotional high since Thunderbolt. As far as the woman in the streets concerned, we clean the mantis clock everywhere except at Sidemore, and there's a tremendous feeling of satisfaction of having rehabilitated ourselves as a major military power, I think it would be impossible to overestimate the degree to which our sense of national pride has rebounded with the restoration of the Constitution, the turnaround in the economy, and now the successful reconquest of the occupied systems, coupled with the enormous losses we've inflicted on the Mantis Navy. So far, this has got to have been the most popular war in our history. And what's happened now? She shrugged. The Mantis have punched us back. They've hurt us, and they've demonstrated that they may be able to do it again. But our actual naval losses, however painful they may be, are literally nothing compared to the losses we inflicted on them in Thunderbolt. So what's going to happen, at least in the short term, is that public opinion's going to demand we go out and whack the mantis back harder to demonstrate to them that they don't want to piss us off. There's going to be some panic... Some shouting about reinforcing to protect our more vulnerable star systems, but mostly people are going to figure the best way to do that is to finish Manticore off once and for all. I'm afraid Rachel's right, Wilhelm, Pritchard said. And that's one reason I wish to hell Arnold hadn't gotten his 
goddamned traitorous ass killed this evening. If I'm ever going to go public with all this, this would be the best time to do it. Now, immediately. The longer we wait, the more suspect that theory is going to look for anyone who's not already inclined to believe it. But there's absolutely nothing concrete we can give the newsies, Congress, or anybody else. Only theories and suspicions we can't prove. If I did what I really ought to do, ordered a standstill of our own forces, told the Mantis what we think happened, and asked for an immediate ceasefire, I'd probably be impeached. Even assuming anyone in Congress or any of Arnold's allies in the cabinet were prepared to believe us for a moment. And frankly, I don't know if the Constitution could survive the kind of dogfight this would turn into. Silence hung heavily in the office for at least two minutes. Then Theismann shook himself. Bottom line time, Madam President, he said. As I see it, we have two options. One is to do what you really ought to do on the basis of what we think happened. The other is to vigorously pursue military victory, or at least our efforts to attain a sufficiently powerful position of military advantage, to force the Mounties to accept our original, fairly limited objectives. What I don't think we can do is try to accomplish both of those at once. Not without some sort of proof of what happened, Henrio agreed. At the moment, I think it's entirely possible we'll never have that sort of proof, Usher cautioned. These are awfully muddy waters, and the only two people who really knew what happened, Claude and Giancola, are both dead. Sooner or later, we're going to have to get to the bottom of it, and it's going to have to be done publicly, Pritchard said. There's no other way for an open society which believes in the rule of law to handle it. And if we don't do it now, then when we finally get around to it, all of us, and especially me as president, are going to be castigated for delaying open disclosure. Our personal reputations, and quite possibly everything we've accomplished, are going to come under attack, and a lot of it's going to be vicious and ugly. And to be perfectly honest, we'll deserve it. She looked around the office, her shoulders squared. Unfortunately, she said into the silence, at this moment, I don't see any choice. Kevin, keep looking. Find us something. But until he does, she swept the office once again with her eyes. I see no option but to keep our suspicions to ourselves and get on with winning my goddamned war. Chapter 22 All right, Admiral Marquette said. What do we actually know? We're still getting the details, sir, Rear Admiral Lewis told the Chief of the Naval Staff and Thomas Theismann's immediate uniformed subordinate. We know there's still a lot to come, but so far it looks like most of what we don't already have is only going to be variations on the same theme. And those variations are? Marquette prompted when Lewis paused. I'm sorry, Arno, Vice Admiral Trini said, but I thought Admiral Theismann was going to join us today. And you're wondering why I'm not waiting for him, Marquette smiled thinly. I'm afraid that's one point about which not even you and Victor have a need to know, Linda. Let's just say something else has come up which requires the attention of the secretary and certain other members of the cabinet. And when they get done with that meeting, he added a bit more pointedly, they're going to want analysis and, if possible, recommendations from us. So, let's get to it, shall we? Of course, sir, Trini said and nodded to Lewis. Victor? Yes, ma'am. Lewis tapped his memo pad to life, glanced at it, more out of habit than need, Marquette suspected, and then looked back up at his two superiors. I think probably our initial evaluation of why they hit the targets they hit was on the money, he said. All five systems have enough population to give them several representatives in the lower house, plus, of course, their senators. 
If the object is to create political pressure to disperse our forces, that would obviously have been a factor in their thinking, and my people are confident it was. Economically, as I'm sure we're all already aware, the elimination of their industrial bases will have only a minor direct impact on our ability to sustain our war effort. The indirect economic implications are something else, of course, and I expect Secretary Hanrio and Secretary Nesbitt are going to be less than happy dealing with the civilian fallout. How complete was the destruction, Victor? Marquette asked. Was it as bad as the initial reports indicated? Worse, sir, Lewis said glumly. Marquette arched an eyebrow, and the rear admiral gave an unhappy shrug. Our own raids have been primarily probes for information, sir. Reconnaissance is in force, for all intents and purposes. We've used light units, primarily lax, and we've settled for picking off individual industrial lobes that we could get to without taking on really heavy forces. And, of course, the Mantis don't have anywhere near as many systems to protect as we do. That means the ones they do have to cover are generally picketed much more heavily than anything except our truly critical ones. Harrington's target selection was different. She wasn't after information. She was here to deliver a message. She picked star systems which weren't heavily defended, and she attacked them with much heavier forces. She not only brought along the firepower she needed to destroy all of our defensive units, she also brought along enough she was able to spread out, take her time, and destroy effectively every single orbital platform in each of the systems she hit. Asteroid extraction centers, foundries, power satellites, communication satellites, navigation satellites, construction platforms, freight platforms, warehouses, all of it, sir, gone. And that was part of her message, as you put it? Yes, sir. It was a statement of the level of scorched earth policy the Mantis are prepared to embrace. It was also a statement that they intend to operate as aggressively as possible within the limitations of their force availability. Please note, for example, that they committed both Invictus-class Super Dreadnoughts and what appears to be their complete current inventory of Agamemnon-class pod battlecruisers. And they weren't particularly shy about showing us just what the katanas and those friggin' awful missiles of theirs could do either. In other words, they're prepared to pull out all the stops. Yes, sir. And they're also prepared to let some of their technical cats out of the bag. They're not trying to maintain operational security, which is an indication of how important they believe their raids to be. This is the first team they're sending in, Admiral. The fact that Harrington is in command of it would be a strong indication of that, but the force mix they're employing confirms it, in my opinion. And mine, Marquette agreed. Trini nodded as well, but then she tapped a forefinger on the conference table. There's another message in what they've done, this far at least, Arnaud, she said. I'm certain there are quite a few, the chief of staff said dryly. Which one did you intend to point out? The casualty figures, she said flatly. I know we took virtually 100% casualties in our lack groups in Gaston, Tambourin, Squalus and Allman, and our shipboard casualties were almost as bad, not surprisingly, I suppose, when they destroyed every single ship they managed to bring into range. But in Hera, Harrington herself gave Milligan the option of saving his people's lives, and they didn't kill or even injure a single civilian when they took out the infrastructure in that system or anywhere else. That was partly because they had the time, ma'am, Lewis pointed out. They had complete control of the star systems, and they could afford to give our civilians time to evacuate. Agreed. But Harrington didn't have to let Milligan stand down his forces, and they would have been justified under accepted interstellar law in simply giving us a reasonable time to evacuate, which would have been a lot shorter than the time they actually gave us. She shook her head. No, I think Part of it was the Mantis' way, or at least Harrington's way, 
of telling us that if we show restraint, whenever we can at least, they'll do the same. You may have a point, Marquette said. Certainly Arrington's record, despite that ridiculous murder conviction the legislaturalists cooked up after Basilisk, would lead us to expect that out of her, but I think she may also be being a bit subtler than some of our analysts would have expected out of her. Subtler? Yes. Think about the other side of her message to Milligan— Our technical superiority is so great, we could kill you any time we want to, but because we're nice guys, we're not going to today. All you have to do is blow up your own ships and get out of our way. Marquette's irony was withering, and Trini frowned. You're seeing it as an attack on our people's confidence and morale. At least in part. Mind you, from what we know of Harrington, I'm sure she was delighted to not kill anyone she didn't have to, but she apparently also believes in killing as many birds with each stone as she can. Trini nodded silently for a moment, then looked almost diffidently at the chief of staff. May I ask if a board's going to be convened on Milligan's actions? I think you can confidently assume one is, Marquette said a bit grimly. And I'm not at all sure how it's going to come out, but if I had to place a bet, it wouldn't be on a happy outcome. The fact is that Milligan showed good sense in not getting his people killed for nothing. Unfortunately, that psychological warfare element I just mentioned has to be considered as well. I suspect any board's going to find he acted appropriately, and that he's going to be beached anyway as a sort of object lesson— It's not fair, but we have to consider the morale of the service as a whole. I agree that we do, sir, Trini said after a moment. On the other hand, we've gone to some lengths to convince our people they won't get shot as an example to others if they get caught in the gears through no fault of their own. And, frankly, that's exactly what happened to Tom Milligan— He couldn't run, he couldn't bring the enemy into his weapons range, and the force mix we'd assigned him was hopelessly inadequate even to stand off modern manty lacks, much less STPs. If we hammer him for his actions, then we tell people we expect them to do the same thing Admiral Beach did, and that we'll hammer them if they don't. Hmm. Marquette pursed his lips, then shrugged. I said I wasn't sure how it's going to come out, and what you just said is the main reason I'm not. As for Beach, he wasn't given the same option Arrington gave Milligan, so it's not exactly as if he rejected the opportunity to save his people's lives, and from what we've been able to piece together about his tactics, they were about as good as someone in a position that hopeless could have come up with. I wasn't criticizing him, sir. As a matter of fact, Everett and I knew one another for almost fifteen years. I'm just not sure most of our people would appreciate the difference between the options he and Milligan had, and I don't want to create a situation in which our flag officers and captains start to think we expect them to go down every beam firing, no matter how hopeless the situation. Trini's expression was grim. I lost too many friends, saw too many good ships blown out of space, because their CEOs knew that was exactly what the committee expected out of them. Marquette considered her thoughtfully. Linda Trenee wasn't simply one of the new Republican Navy's senior admirals. As the head of the Bureau of Planning, she was responsible for the formulation and implementation of doctrine and training standards. As such, the concern she was expressing fell squarely and correctly within her purview. "'Very well, Linda. 
Your concern is noted, and I will make certain it's taken into consideration whenever the board on error is impaneled. For what it's worth, I agree that the points you've raised are entirely valid. The problem's going to be exactly where we balance them against the need to maintain the most aggressive mental and psychological stance we can. Trini nodded, and Marquette turned back to Victor Lewis. As you just pointed out, Victor, they did show us their best where their combat outwear is concerned. What did we learn in the process? Not as much as I'd have liked, sir, Lewis said frankly. Especially not given the price we paid for the info we did get. There are a few things we know now that we didn't know then, though. The one drawback to Milligan's acceptance of Harrington's terms, from our perspective over at Operational Research, is that her SDPs were never forced to fire. As such, we weren't able to get any sort of feel for how the Invictus's armaments may vary from their Medusa Harrington ships. The one thing that does stand out from the visual scans some of our recon platforms got and transmitted down to the planet, before Harrington wiped them out, is that the reports that the Invictus mounts no broadside missile tubes appears to be accurate. We're not certain why. We've had to make the same decision primarily because our missiles are so damned big compared to theirs that we really can't afford the mass penalty for launches big enough to handle them in ships already designed to deploy pods. All the indications from captured hardware and what we've gotten from Erewhon are that the Mantis don't suffer from that particular problem, or not at least to anything like the same degree, so there's obviously a different basis for the design philosophy. In the case of Gaston, we got a lot of sensor information on the Grace and Katanas. I'm having all of it sent directly to Admiral Foraker at Bolt Hole for her team's consideration, although my initial take on it is that most of it indicates the katana is built around more of that damned Manticoran miniaturization tech we can't match yet. Certainly they're very small units, with extremely high acceleration rates. They appear to have all the Shrike's defensive capabilities, and whatever the hell they call that new missile of theirs. On the other hand... They never fired a shot in energy range, so we're not sure what they carry there. Even bearing in mind that we're talking about a Manti-derived design, there can't be a lot of room for the kind of energy armament the Shrike hauls around with it. The real bad news seems to be those missiles. They obviously can't have the sort of range our scimitar's missiles do, but they're incredibly fast. At the very minimum, we're going to have to completely overhaul our missile defense software to deal with their speed and maneuverability, and their sensor and tracking ability appear to have significantly improved as well. The fact that the Mantis obviously know about the Triple Ripple and have adapted their tactics to defeat it further complicates the situation. Frankly, at least until the next generation lacks start coming out of Bolt Hole, I don't think our lacks are going to be able to encounter Manti units, or at least katanas, with any realistic hope of victory. My initial feeling was that Vector was being unduly pessimistic, sir, Trini put in. Having had a better look at the raw data, though, I no longer think that. My own feeling at this time is that we need to restrict the scimitars essentially to the anti-missile role. If they have to mix it up with Manti or Grayson Lax, they are really going to need to do it from within our own starship's engagement envelope. They are going to need the support that badly. Wonderful, Marquette muttered sourly. Then he shrugged. On the other hand, we never did see the cemetery as anything except a way to blunt manti lack attacks. Certainly they've been useful in other roles, but no one on our side is likely to confuse them with a main combatant. Actually, I'm more interested in what we know about their Agamemnons. First of all, sir, they're big, Lewis said. Our best estimate from Admiral Beach's tactical take is that they're somewhere around 1.7 to 1.8 megatons. That makes them about twice the size of their previous battlecruiser classes. Secondly, they don't appear to deploy the same number of pods per salvo as we've seen out of their SDPs. Manti pods are damnably hard sensor targets, but it looks like they were only rolling four pods at a time. However, he looked up and met Marquette's eyes. 
The pods they were rolling apparently carried fourteen missiles each. Fourteen? That's correct, sir. So their four-pod salvos were effectively rolling almost as many missiles as their SDP's six-pod salvos. How in God's name did they cram that many missiles into a single pod? Marquette demanded. I know I'm in charge of Navient, sir, but that's a question I just can't answer. Not yet. We do know they've gone to a fusion plant instead of capacitors in their current generation MDMs. All indications, however, were that they were sticking with about the same number of birds per pod and simply reducing the size of each pod to get more combat endurance rather than greater salvo density. That doesn't seem to be what they've done here, though, and so far, we don't have a clue how you could possibly stuff that many missiles, even if they are fusion-powered, into battle cruiser sized pods. Some of my people are suggesting that we must be looking at an entirely new missile, but if we are, they managed to keep its development completely black, which unfortunately wouldn't exactly be a first. Say what you will about the Mantis, they're clearly aware of the importance of their tech advantage, and they're very good at maintaining security on their R&D programs. Fourteen birds, Marquette muttered, shaking his head. Jesus, if they do start packing their SDP pods that full proportionately, we're going to be in even more trouble in a long-range duel. Agreed, Trini said. On the other hand, they appear to have concluded that sixty missile salvos are about the max for their fire control— for the moment, at least. Sure, Marquette snorted, until they get around to upgrading it. He frowned down at the tabletop, considering what he'd been told so far, then inhaled deeply. All right. Whatever else we may think about Admiral Beach's tactics, or the casualties he suffered, we're damned lucky we got all the tactical infos that we did, and we wouldn't have if he'd declined to fight. Another point... He looked up at Trini, to be considered when the board sits on Milligan's actions. I can tell you from what you've already said, he returned his attention to Lewis, that Admiral Seisman and I are going to want to sit down and spend some time with your detailed written report. And as you've already observed, it's imperative we get all of this information to Admiral Foraker as soon as possible. However, I want you personally, Victor, to concentrate on something else. Sir, there's going to be hell to pay in Congress when news of this is confirmed. People are going to be screaming for additional protection for their constituents, and it's going to be damned out to tell them no. By the same token, if we're looking at an increased technological inferiority, it's going to be more imperative than ever that we keep our combat power concentrated. I can't begin to predict how that's all going to play out, Politics, thank God, aren't part of my turf. But I do know from the brief conversations I've had so far with the secretary that he's going to want some sort of prediction of where they're likely to do this to us next. Sir, Lewis said, his expression troubled. I don't see any way to do that. There are literally dozens of places they could hit us the way they did here. We've got maybe 25 or 30 first-tier systems and that many, again, secondary or tertiary systems. Without completely dispersing our fleet strength, we can't begin to cover that broad an area against attacks and the strength these demonstrated. And I'm afraid tea-leaf readers have at least as good a chance as my analysts do of predicting which of them we need to cover. For that matter, if they scout aggressively enough, they'll be able to tell where we've beefed up the defenses and simply go someplace else. What they did with their stealth destroyers and FTL arrays this time around is proof enough of that. I assure you I'm already painfully aware of the points you just raised, Marquette said grimly. I'm also aware that I'm asking you to do something which is quite possibly impossible. I don't have any choice but to ask you, however, and you don't have any choice but to figure out how to do it anyway— there has to be some sort of underlying pattern to their target selection. I can't believe someone like Harrington is just reaching into a hat and pulling out names at random. For that matter, the spacing on this cluster of raids demonstrates she isn't. So try to get inside her head 
run it through the computers, kick it around, try to get some sort of feel for what kind of tendencies or inclinations may be pushing your choices. We can do that, sir. Run it through the computers and kick it around, I mean. Whether or not we can get inside her head is something else entirely. And, sir, I'm afraid that even if that's possible, we're going to need a bigger sample of her target selections before any pattern begins to suggest itself. In other words, I don't think I'll be able to give you any sort of prediction until after she's hit us again, possibly more than once. Understood, Marquette said in a heavy voice. Do your best. No one's going to expect miracles out of you, but we need your very best on it. If we can guess right even once, and smack her with heavier forces than she anticipates, maybe even mousetrap one of her raiding forces, we may be able to make them reconsider this entire strategy. Chapter 23 that's the last of them, Your Grace. Everyone? Yes, ma'am. Mercedes Brigham smiled hugely at honor. According to the preliminary reports, we didn't lose anyone on combat ops. That's hard to believe, Honor said. She reached up to gently caress Nimitz's ears and shook her head. Mind you, I'm delighted to hear it. I just didn't expect it. Good planning, good target selection, detailed pre-attack reconnaissance, FTL sensor capability, overwhelming force advantage at the point of contact, and katanas to smack hell out of their piece-of-crap lax. Brigham shrugged. Ma'am, we were playing with our deck, and they didn't even get to cut the cards, much less shuffle. Not this time, Honor agreed. I suspect they're going to make it a priority to see to it we don't do that to them again, though. Which was the entire point of the exercise, wasn't it, Your Grace? Brigham grinned at her. Nimitz bleaked in amusement, echoing the Chief of Staff's cheerfulness, and Honor was forced to smile back at her. Yes, Mercedes, yes it was, she agreed. And I rather suspect the Admiralty is going to be pleased with us. I'm sure they are. Brigham said, a bit less jubilantly. And they're also going to want us to go out and do it again, as soon as we can. Of course they are, although I'm sure we'll have at least a couple of weeks to plan. I'd like to have more time, Your Grace. Brigham's tone was downright sober this time. Honor looked at her a little quizzically, and the chief of staff shrugged. Part of the reason it went so well this time was that you, Andrea, Admiral Truman, and Admiral McKeon and I had so much time to kick it around. There was time to look at the best current intelligence data, to model the attacks, to think about where their rear area coverage was going to be weakest. With less time, we're more likely to miss something and stub our toes. It's always that way, isn't it? Honor's smile was a bit more crooked than the artificial nerves in the left side of her face could normally account for. Remember what Clausewitz said? Which quote this time? Everything in war is very simple, but the simplest thing is difficult. Well, he got that one right, Your Grace. He got quite a few of them right, actually. Especially for a theorist who never exercised high command himself. Of course, he got some of them wrong, too. In this case, though, I think we'll probably be okay for at least Cutworm 2, especially if any of our additional units have reported in while we were away. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Care to place any small wagers on whether or not they have? Not particularly. Honor shook her head, her smile tartar than ever. We should know in the next few hours, one way or the other. In the meantime, Tim, she looked over her shoulder at her flag lieutenant, please have Harper make a general signal. I'd like all flag officers to repair aboard the flagship with their senior staffers by 1430 hours. I want them prepared to discuss each system, including analysis of damage inflicted, and any observations on the Havenite system defense doctrine. I also want discussion of how well our current doctrine and hardware worked, and any suggestions for how we might make further improvements, and tell them to plan on staying for dinner. Yes, ma'am. Lieutenant Mears grinned. By this time, they all know what that means. Lieutenant, 
I have no idea what you're talking about, Honor said sternly, almond eyes twinkling, then made a shooing motion with one hand. Now run along and see to it before something nasty happens to you. On my way, ma'am, and... Mears paused in the day cap and hatch just long enough to give her another grin, shaking in abject terror. He disappeared, and Honor looked at Brigham. Is it my imagination, or does the staff seem to be getting just a bit uppity these days? Oh, definitely your imagination, Your Grace. I thought it was. Okay, Solomon Hayes said. What's so important? He sat in an expensive landing restaurant, looking out through its 200th floor's crystoplast wall across the waters of Jason Bay. The sun was just dipping below the horizon, turning the wrinkled blue sheet of water bloody and painting the clouds in crimson, purple, and vermilion. The food was almost good enough to justify its priciness, and the view, he admitted, was spectacular. And not just where the scenery was concerned. The exquisitely attired woman seated across the table from him looked as if she'd probably profited from more than a bit of biosculpt, and the flowing mass of beautiful red hair spilling down her back spoke directly to Hayes's smattering of ancient Irish genes. She was also immoderately wealthy with powerful political connections, most of which, he conceded, could probably be construed as liabilities just at the moment. Still, she'd been an important inside source during the High Ridge years, and she continued to offer an insight into the inner workings of the currently gelded Conservative Association. So direct and to the point, she said now, pouting slightly. You might at least pretend I'm more than just a newsy source, Solomon. My dear Countess, Hayes replied, leering at her only half professionally, I believe I've amply demonstrated in other environs that you're much more than just a source. In fact, I do hope you haven't made other plans for the evening. Bertram has, but since he didn't discuss them with me, and since I believe they include a pair of barely legal-aged girls, I felt free to reserve my own evening for other activities. Did you have something in mind? She smiled, and Hay smiled back. As a matter of fact, I do. Something involving a friend's yacht, moonlight, champagne, silk sheets, and a few other things like that. My goodness, you do know how to compensate an informant for her news, don't you? There was an ever-so-faint steeliness in the glorious blue eyes across the table from him. I try, he said, not attempting to deny the implication. There wasn't much point, after all. Besides, Countess Fairburn had used him at least as much as he'd ever used her. That little matter of the supposed Harrington-Whitehaven love affair came to mind, among others. And you succeed nicely, she told him, sipping wine. Then she smiled. And since you've taken such pains to arrange a pleasant evening, why don't we go ahead and get the sordid details out of the way now? I think that would be an excellent idea he agreed. The best reason to put business before pleasure is to dispose of the former early so you can concentrate on the latter properly. I see why you've done so well working with words, she said, setting the wine glass down. Very well. It's actually a fairly small tidbit in some ways, but I'll confess that I take a certain amount of pleasure in being able to pass it along to you. After all, there's not much point pretending I'm not a rather vengeful sort at heart. She smiled again, and this time there was no humor at all in the expression. That sounds a bit ominous, he said lightly, watching her warily. Oh, I suppose it will be, for some. And after that unfortunate little fiasco last year, I'm sure you'll want to check it out independently before you do anything with it. Hayes's eyes had narrowed at the fiasco reference, and she chuckled. It just happens to have come to my attention, she said, that the heroic Duchess Harrington, before her departure for Trevor Star, stopped by the Briarwood Reproduction Center. Hayes blinked. Briarwood? he repeated after a moment. Precisely.
Now, I suppose it's possible she was there to consult with the doctors because of some fertility problem. That seems a bit unlikely, given her profession and current duties, however. And even if it didn't, according to a little bird who sang into my ear, she was there for a routine outpatient procedure. The tubing of a fetus, I believe. Hayes looked at her, his eyes narrower than ever, and she smiled back sweetly. How good a source is your little bird? he asked. Quite good, actually. And he or she says this is Harrington's child? I can't imagine any other reason for her to have outpatient surgery, can you? Not at Briarwood, Hayes conceded. Not unless, for some bizarre reason, she was trying to get pregnant at this moment. He thought some more. Do you happen to know who the father is? No. For just a moment, something ugly flashed in the Countess's eyes. Disappointment, Hayes realized. He knew who she wanted the father to be, but she knew equally well that after the way Emily Alexander had rapid punched the attempt to link her husband and the salamander, he wasn't about to leap to any conclusions that couldn't be firmly substantiated. Not in this case, at least, no matter how sharp a personal axe he had to grind. Or perhaps because of how very personal this particular axe was. Pity, he said, picking up his own wine and sipping thoughtfully. I do have three other bits of information, Fairburn said. Straws in the wind, one might say. Which are? First, Harrington's declined to declare paternity. She didn't simply ask Briarwood to maintain confidentiality. She didn't tell them. Secondly, and not surprisingly, I suppose, she's designated her mother, Dr. Harrington, to act in loco parentis for her child while she's away or, if anything, unfortunate should happen to her. And third, third, dear Solomon, Dr. Harrington is also the physician of record for one Emily Alexander, who has mysteriously decided after sixty or seventy years in a life support chair that the time has come for her and her husband to become parents as well. Hayes blinked again. He was sure he could have come up with half a dozen explanations for the coincidences Fairburn had just listed without even trying. But that didn't matter. His instincts told him that, motivated by vengefulness or not, the Countess had zeroed in on what was actually going on especially in light of Harrington's refusal to declare paternity even to Briarwood's medical staff. Those are interesting straws, Elfrida, he conceded after several seconds. And I do have my own ways of confirming your information, not that I believe for a moment that it isn't accurate. This time, he didn't add, although he was certain she heard it anyway. I imagine you'd like me to maintain confidentiality about your own part in bringing this to my attention? I'm afraid so, she sighed, with what he realized was genuine regret. A part of me would dearly love to let that low-born upstart bitch know precisely who blew the whistle on her. Given the current unfortunate political climate, and the disgusting way the pearls are fawning all over her, however— it probably wouldn't be very wise to make myself a target for retaliation. Bertram wouldn't thank me for it either. I thought as much, Hayes said, projecting as much sympathy as he could. So I'll be very careful to document any hard facts I use without mentioning your name. Such a dear, cautious man, Countess Fairburn cooed. I try, Elfrida. I try. Honor. Sir Thomas Caparelli came to his feet, stepping out from behind his desk and smiling broadly as he reached out to grip Honor's hand firmly. "'It's good to see you,' he said. And Honor smiled as she tasted the personal warmth behind his greeting. "'And you, of course, Nimitz,' Caparelli continued, nodding to the tree cat on Honor's shoulder. "'And you, Commodore,' he added with a smile as he released Honor's hand to shake Mercedes Brigham's. I see you have your priorities in proper order, Sir Thomas, Brigham murmured, responding to the twinkle in the first space lord's eye. Well, Her Grace and Nimitz do rather come as a unit, Commodore. That they do, sir. 
Sit down, sit down, both of you. Well, all three of you, he invited, waving at the comfortable chairs and the conversational nook around his splendid office's coffee table. Two carafes, one of coffee and one of hot chocolate, steamed on the coffee table in question, which also offered cups and saucers, a plate of fresh croissants, and a fresh head of celery. Honor and Brigham obeyed, and Nimitz slithered down into Honor's lap, eyeing the celery with cheerful greediness. Honor chuckled and gave him a gentle smack, and he rolled over onto his back, grabbing her wrist with true hands and hand feet and wrestling with it cheerfully. And this, Caporelli observed with a chuckle, represents Sphinx's native sentient species? Some cats tend to revert to kittenhood more readily than others, Sir Thomas, Honor told him, swatting at Nimitz with her free hand while he purred happily. I'm glad he likes you, Caporelli said. I've seen pictures of what those claws of his can do. He shook his head. Personally, I've always wondered how something that short can do so much damage. That's probably because, like most people, you think of tree cat claws the way you do of terrestrial cat's claws. In fact, they aren't at all the same. Stinker? Nimitz released her wrist and forearm and sat up in her lap. He extended one true hand, long, wiry fingers slightly crooked, and unsheathed his needle-pointed claws. Caporelli leaned closer, his expression fascinated, and Nimitz held them up where he could see them clearly. If you'll notice, Honor said, his claws are much broader at the base than those of a terrestrial cat. When people call them scimitar-shaped, it's literally descriptive, except that the wrong side is edged and they retract into some fairly specialized cartilage-lined receptacles because they're actually more like a terrestrial shark's tooth than anything someone from old earth would call a claw. The actual composition of the claw itself is more like stone than it is like horn, cartilage, or bone. And this curved intersection is at least as sharp as most flaked obsidian knives. It's true they aren't very long, but for all intents and purposes, he's got scalpel blades on each finger that are the next best thing to a centimeter and a half in length. That's why a cat in a true killing rage looks so much like a berserk buzzsaw. Each individual cut isn't that deep, but with all six limbs going at once in repeated slashes, well... She shrugged, and Caporelli shuddered slightly at the image her words had evoked. I never realized just how formidable those weapons were he confessed. Well, Sir Thomas, Honor said cheerfully, if you want something to give you real nightmares, you might consider that hexapumas, which, you know, are just a little bigger, have exactly the same sort of claws. Of course, their claws tend to be eight or nine centimeters long, which is why we Sphinxians never go into the bush unarmed. Your Grace, Caporelli said, if I were a Sphinxian and knew about hexapuma claws, I wouldn't go into the bush at all. We do lose the occasional tourist, she said, straight-faced. No doubt, he said dryly, leaning forward and personally pouring coffee for Brigham and chocolate for Honor. He waved at the croissants and celery and settled back in his own chair with a cup and saucer while they helped themselves. I've got a formal meeting set up for tomorrow afternoon, he told them more seriously. I'll have several people there, including Hamish Honor, and I hope you and Commodore Brigham will be prepared to give us a comprehensive brief and answer any questions about Cutworm. He raised one eyebrow interrogatively, and Honor nodded. Good. In the meantime, I just wanted to say the preliminary read on Cutworm indicates that it did exactly what we had in mind. Good work. Especially pulling it off without any losses of your own. Whether or not it has the long-term effect we hoped for remains to be seen, but no one else could have done the job better, or, for that matter, as well, probably. Thank you, Sir Thomas, Honor murmured, tasting the sincerity behind his words. We've managed to scare up a few more units for you as well, Caporelli continued. Not as many as I'd like, or anywhere near as many as we'd originally scheduled— although some of them will be a bit newer than projected to compensate. What we have been able to dig up will be waiting for you when you get back to Eighth Fleet. The main problem, as I'm sure you've guessed, is the need to cover Zanzibar and Elizan, 
especially Zanzibar, since the peeps got such a good look at our defensive deployments there. To be honest, your success in Cutworm is actually going to make that particular problem worse. The logic, I'm sure, is going to run something like, if Harrington can do that to them, then they could do it to us. And the hell of it, of course, is that they're right. Even if they weren't, the political realities of the Alliance would require us to respond to their concerns. Honor frowned very slightly, and he shook his head. One of the reasons those realities are real, Honor, is that they ought to be. Highridge's total incompetence makes the situation even worse, I agree, but it doesn't change the fact that those two systems are our allies, that they're currently the most exposed and the most attractive secondary targets available to the peeps, and that they have a moral right to demand and receive adequate protection. I don't like what it does to my deployable fleet strength, but I can't pretend they don't have that right. Maybe so, sir, Brigham said diffidently. But Admiral Albacher's decisions when the peeps probed Zanzibar didn't help any. No, they didn't, Caporelli agreed, in a tone whose very neutrality was a gentle rebuke. That, however, is now atmosphere out the airlock, Commodore. We have to deal with the situation as it exists, and while I know it wasn't your intent, we can't afford to lend any credence to the attitude which, unfortunately, exists among some of our own personnel. Things are thorny enough already without suggesting to the Zanzibarans that we believe their incompetence or cowards who jump at shadows. No, sir, of course not, Brigham agreed. Leaving that aside, however, Caporelli continued turning back to Honor. The Newsies are already playing this one up as our first offensive victory of the war, which means you now hold title to both our defensive and offensive accomplishments. I'm afraid your reputation's been even further enhanced. That's ridiculous, Honor half muttered. She shook her head irritably. Offensive victory indeed. Those poor Havenite picket forces were so outclassed it was like... Like feeding baby chicks to near sharks. Of course it was. Caporelli shook his own head, in his case more in amusement than anything else. That's the way it's supposed to be whenever we can arrange it. On the other hand, your accomplishments, and especially the way you allowed Milligan to scuttle his own ships, is the kind of copy the newsfaxes dream of. They can't quite seem to decide whether to play you as the elegant chivalrous corsair or the tough-as-nails, blood-and-guts warhorse. Hamish mentioned a couple of wet navy types from Old Earth. Someone named Raphael Semmes and someone else named Bill Halsey. Although he did comment that you had marginally better tactical sense than Semmes and better strategic sense than Halsey. Oh, he did, did he? Honor's eyes gleamed ominously, and Caporelli chuckled. Somehow, I suspect he was looking forward to having me tell you that. Still, however irksome you may find it, don't expect anybody in the government or the Navy to try to put the brakes on it. Frankly, we need all the good press and all the morale-boosting stories we can get. Anything that simultaneously helps our morale and hurts the peep's morale is much too valuable for us to even consider not using. In that respect, Sir Thomas, Brigham said, I think what the Katanas and Agamemnons did to them ought to have a definite morale-hurting effect. For that matter, I suspect it's going to make them reconsider their estimates of relative combat effectiveness across the board. I hope you're right, Commodore. And I also have to admit that what I've seen in the preliminary reports makes me feel better about the relative effectiveness of the new ships and hardware, but the fact of the matter is that we don't have very many of them. In fact, that's one reason we gave such a high percentage of the ones we do have to Eighth Fleet. We want the peeps to see them being used, to throw them right into Theismann's face in hopes he'll be so impressed by their effectiveness he won't realize how few of them we actually have. And just how likely does Owen I think that is, sir? Honor asked neutrally. In her own mind, she already knew, and Caporelli smiled wryly at her. About as likely as you think it is, he said. 
On the other hand, when the water is this deep, Your Grace, you reach for anything that might help you keep your head above the surface. Chapter 24 Welcome home, Honor. Emily Alexander smiled broadly from her life support chair as Honor stepped through the Whitehaven door. I seem to be saying that a lot. I'm only sorry I don't get to say it more often. I'm afraid Whitehaven isn't as convenient to Admiralty House as Jason Bay, Emily. Besides, I have to keep reminding myself a certain degree of discretion is indicated. Otherwise, Honor bent to kiss Emily's cheek, I'd be out here every minute I was on the planet. <laughs> I suppose that could be called indiscreet. Tell me about it. Miranda and Mac have certainly done their best, in, of course, their own exquisitely tactful fashions, to make the point. Do they disapprove? Emily frowned slightly, and Honor tasted the older woman's ambiguous emotions. For all her natural graciousness and kindness, and for all the deep and mutual devotion between her and her servants, she was a product of the Mantikaran aristocracy. For her, servants could become friends, literally members of her family, but they were always servants. It might be important to her that her servants think well of her, but whether they did or not would never be allowed to affect her decisions, and that little naturally aristocratic corner of her couldn't help feeling it would be presumptuous for any servant to actually judge her actions. No, they don't. Honor straightened with a smile. Emily might be a natural-born aristocratic, but Honor Harrington certainly wasn't. She wasn't about to let other people's opinions dictate her decisions either, but for quite different reasons. And for her, people like Miranda La Follet and James McGuinness would never be servants, even if they were her employees. Retainers, perhaps, but never servants. Even leaving aside the fact that both of them were millionaires in their own rights, she thought with a mental chuckle. They don't disapprove at all of my doing what my heart requires, to borrow a phrase from the bad novelists. They just worry about what could happen if the Newsies got hold of this relationship. She grimaced. They had an entirely too up-close-and-personal look at what the faxes put us through last time, and they worry about me. Can't imagine why. Of course you can't. Emily's incipient frown turned into a smile once more. Actually, what I mind the most about this whole clandestine thing, in a lot of ways, Honor said with a grimace, is that I see so little of Miranda these days. She's still officially my maid, as far as Grayson is concerned, but she's effectively my chief of staff, especially here on Manticore. So I end up leaving her home to tend to business, and it would look a bit odd if I started dragging her out here to visit friends. Of course, on Grayson, under similar circumstances, although I admit that the mind boggles at the concept of similar circumstances there, I'd be leaving Mac home to tend to business and dragging Miranda around with me. She shook her head. It's a lot less complicated being a commoner, you know? Cling to your illusions if you must, Emily replied. Given your rank, little things like your military reputation and the fact that you're probably one of the dozen wealthiest people in the entire Star Kingdom, I doubt very much that your life could ever be uncomplicated again. Oh, thank you for that douche of reality. You're welcome. This is your wake-up call, Admiral Harrington. Honor twitched as the deep, soft voice spoke into her ear, and her sleeping mind snuggled closer to the bright, caressing mind glow behind the words. Perhaps that was why she didn't awaken the way she normally did, quickly, completely, senses coming immediately alert. This is your wake-up call, the voice repeated with a chuckle, and Honor's eyes snapped open very quickly indeed this time as she tasted Hamish's intent. Quick as she was, she wasn't quite quick enough, and ruthless fingers danced up her ribs to her armpits, despicably exploiting the secret she had guarded for so many decades. Hamish! she half-shrieked as he tickled her mercilessly. Her upper arms clamped tight to her ribcage, trapping his hands, but his fingers went right on moving, and she writhed. 
Both of them were perfectly well aware she could have broken both his arms any time she chose to, but he continued his attack with the fearlessness of someone prepared to take unscrupulous advantage of the knowledge that she loved him. She flung herself out of bed, whipping around to face him, and he propped himself on one elbow, stretched sensually, and grinned wickedly at her. Nor was his the only amusement in the bedroom. Nimitz and Samantha sat side by side on the headboard, bleaking with laughter. I see you're awake, Hamish said cheerfully. And you, Earl Whitehaven, are a dead man, she told him with a glower. I'm not afraid of you. He elevated his nose with a sniff. Emily will protect me. Not when I tell her why you have to die. When I explain, she'll help me hide the body. You know, she might at that. Darn right she might. Well, it was probably worth it anyway to wake up to a sight like this, he said, blue eyes gleaming, and Honor actually felt herself blushing as she glanced down at her nude state. The taste of the tree cat's amusement at her reaction only made her blush more rosily, and she shook her fist. I think, she said ominously, that all of you need to be seen to, especially you, my Lord Earl, to think I trusted you enough to actually admit I'm ticklish. The sheer treachery of your actions takes my breath away. Of course it does. He sat up and swung his own legs over the side of the bed which is undoubtedly the reason you shared your deep, dark secret in the first place. You must have known any decent tactician would take advantage of it when the critical nature of his mission required it. Definitely seen to. She smiled sweetly. You know, I was talking it over with Andrew just the other day, and he mentioned to me that it's never too late to take up a new form of exercise. Take you, for example, Hamish— I realize that at your advanced and decrepit age, you may think you're too old to learn new tricks, but you are a prolonged recipient, and I saw you on the handball court just a couple of months ago. I think you'd be a fine prospect. Prospect for what? he asked warily. Why, for taking up coup de vitesse, of course. She widened her eyes innocently. Think how much it would increase your self-confidence not to mention how good it is as a systematic exercise. You, young lady, are out of your mind if you think I'm going to let you get me onto the mat as your punching bag. He snorted. I might, might I say, be prepared to take up Grayson-style fencing. I was always pretty good with foil and épée. At least I was, many, many years ago, when I was at the island. But that brutal, sweaty, hand-to-hand -hand business of yours isn't my style at all. He shook his head. Oh, no. Self-defense is your forte, not mine. If we should ever happen to encounter a mugger who somehow penetrates the protection of those three Rottweilers of yours, I'll be perfectly happy to hold your coat while you mop up the pavement with him. Heck, I'll even buy you a bonbon and a cup of hot chocolate afterward. Honor chuckled, trying to picture a Grayson male, however enlightened, suggesting anything of the sort to any woman, be she ever so well-trained in self-defense. Well, she said after a moment, checking the date-time display in her artificial eye, we're both going to need to brush up on our self-defense skills if we don't get ourselves down to breakfast pretty quickly. Hey, don't blame me. I've been trying to get you up. And I warn you, I fully intend to tell Emily that when we're late to breakfast. God, there are no limits to your treachery, Honor said, snatching up her kimono and sliding into it. If only I'd known ahead of time. Sure, sure. He stood and stretched luxuriously. And speaking of treachery... Honor frowned. He was up to something, she could taste it, but... Hamish smiled sweetly at her and then, with absolutely no warning, dashed for the bathroom. Hamish, don't you dare! She was too late. The master bath's palatial shower's door clicked shut, and she slid to a halt as he smiled at her through it. Looks like I get the first shower, he said complacently. Unless, of course, you'd care to. He flipped the shower door open just a crack, and Honor laughed and let the kimono slip back off her shoulders to the floor. They were, indeed, late to breakfast. 
Given the fact that Andrew LaFollet and her other armsmen knew exactly why Honor had been to Briarwood, the colonel had clearly decided there was no longer any point in pretending he didn't also know exactly what was going on. Hamish's reaction, the first time he'd opened the door of his suite and found LaFollet standing guard outside it, had not been one of unalloyed amusement. He'd had the good sense not to make an issue of it, however, and it was certainly much more convenient for Honor to no longer have to go scurrying through the back hallways every morning. There were, however, some things not even an armsman could protect a steadholder from, and she and Hamish peeked through the dining room door cautiously when they finally got there. Emily sat in her life support chair, parked in her normal place, with a steaming cup of coffee in front of her. But she looked up quickly at their arrival, and Honor's smile disappeared instantly. Nimitz jerked upright on her shoulder, and Samantha did the same on Hamish's, as both tree cats tasted what Honor already had. Hamish couldn't, but the quickness and unanimity of the other three's reaction wasn't lost upon him. Emily? Honor stepped quickly through the door, her voice concerned, all humor in abeyance. What is it? It's... Emily started to speak quickly, then stopped herself. It's not good, she said after a moment, the words coming less rapidly, sounding much more like her. I'm afraid, she showed her teeth in a humorless smile, we're not quite as finished with the newsies as we'd hoped. Honor moved across to Emily's chair, her appetite disappearing despite her enhanced metabolism. She pulled back one of the dining room chairs, turning it to face Emily, and sank into it. Nimitz slid down into her lap, gazing at Emily as intensely and anxiously as Honor herself, and she felt Hamish stepping up close behind her even before his hand came down on her shoulder. It leaked, she said flatly. I think you could say that, Emily agreed with poison-dry humor. Her right hand flipped a fax viewer onto the table. You remember our good friend Solomon Hayes, I'm sure. The sinking sensation in Honor's midsection intensified abruptly. She glanced up over her shoulder at Hamish, then drew the viewer in front of her and keyed it. She wasn't at all surprised when it lit with the current day's landing tattler. Nor was she surprised that the display was centered on Solomon Hayes's gossip column. It wasn't the first time she'd found herself the object of Hayes's interest, and white-hot anger glowed as she remembered the smear campaign High Ridge and his cronies had used Hayes to open. Her eyes ran down the text, and her lips tightened. Normally, Hayes touched on several victims in each of his maliciously barbed columns. And he was also normally careful to couch his accusations and veiled insinuations sufficiently obliquely to avoid anything which might be actionable under the Star Kingdom's stringent libel laws. This time, the entire column was devoted to only a single topic, and there was nothing oblique about it at all, especially not about its three concluding paragraphs. To sources at Briarwood, she read, Duchess Harrington was attended by Dr. Illescu, Briarwood's senior physician, who personally oversaw the tubing of her son seven weeks ago. Despite all inquiries, it was impossible to determine who the father might be. Indeed, sources indicate the Duchess has specifically declined to declare paternity. That, of course, is her unquestioned legal and moral right. Nonetheless, those of us in the press must inevitably find ourselves speculating on her reasons for availing herself of that right. Certainly, it's only natural for a military woman, facing all the risks of naval combat to be concerned about the future, to assure herself and her loved ones of a child. Still, one must wonder just why she felt it necessary to proceed in that perfectly reasonable project with such secrecy— one might almost say clandestinely. And yet another clearly coincidental yet interesting tidbit has come to our attention. We feel confident that all of Lady Emily Alexander's myriad fans and well-wishers will be delighted to learn that Countess Whitehaven has also availed herself of Briarwood services. According to the same sources, her child will be born within less than two months of Duchess Harrington's. That son of a bitch! Hamish hissed behind her as he read it over her shoulder. 
That goddamned, worthless, cowardly, mealy-mouthed piece of— He chopped himself off with a physical effort Honor could literally feel and walked across to sit on Emily's other side. I wonder who his sources might be, Honor mused, in a tone whose lightness fooled no one. Actually, Emily said, you might not want to leap to any conclusions in that regard. Honor looked at her and Emily snorted. It doesn't take an empath to guess which road you're headed down, Honor, given what your parents had to say about their history with Illescu, and you might even be right. But I've had a little longer to think about this than you two have, and there are several rather odd things about this particular column. Beside the fact that this time he laid his sights on just one target, well, two targets, Hamish put in. As a matter of fact, yes. The biggest difference between this one and his usual style is that he's very specific. He gives the exact day you were actually at the center, Honor, and he also gives the correct date for our second child's birth. He wouldn't do that unless he was entirely confident of his facts, knowing what the three of us would do to him in court if he didn't have them right. But he specifically mentions Dr. Illescu by name, and if Illescu were his source, he wouldn't have provided that particular snippet of information. There's no reason he has to, and the one thing he's never done is give up his sources. That's because half the time he doesn't have any sources, Honor half-snarled. That's not really fair, Emily observed. Solomon Hayes is a loathsome, disgusting, toad-like gigolo who homes in on vicious gossip and rumors like a near buzzard homing in on carrion. Three quarters of his news comes from bored, wealthy women with the moral fiber of old earth alley cats in heat, at least half of whom have scores of their own to settle. But he usually does have a source. The thing that lets him survive is that most of the time there's at least a core of truth to the rumors he spreads. Distorted, exaggerated, or deliberately twisted, perhaps, but still there. That's what made him so damnably effective when High Ridge and North Hollow used him against you before. Salaciousness has always sold faxes, and a lot of people take Hayes lightly because of that. But the truth is, he's actually a very dangerous enemy— with much more power than many people assume, precisely because he does have that reputation for knowing what secrets he's spilling so gleefully. Her tone was almost dispassionate, but it wouldn't have fooled anyone who could see the fire in her green eyes. You may be right, Hamish said after a moment. No, scratch that. You're almost certainly right. You usually are about things like this, love. Unfortunately, that doesn't give me any ideas about what to do about this. Aside from hiring an assassin, at least. If we want to go that route, we don't need any assassins, Honor said grimly. Somehow, I suspect challenging him to a duel and then shooting him smartly between the eyes, however satisfying, might not be precisely the best way to handle the situation, Emily said dryly. Not that we couldn't make a tidy fortune selling tickets to the event. <laughs> the instant you challenge him, he'll emigrate to Beowulf, Hamish growled. They don't allow duels there. I think perhaps we can leave that pleasant fantasy out of our considerations, Emily suggested just a bit tartly, and her husband muttered something she chose to take as agreement. The thing that bothers me the most, Honor said, her eyes troubled, is how explicitly he's linked you and me, Emily. Well... She smiled almost naturally. That and the fact that I didn't really want to know whether it was a boy or girl just yet. The question in my mind, Emily said thoughtfully, is whether he genuinely believes Hamish is also the father of your child, Honor, or if he included the linkage only as a way to remind his readership about his earlier allegations about the two of you. Does he know something, or is he simply using innuendo to take a swipe at the three of us because of what we did to him last time around? I think he either knows or strongly suspects, Honor said. Then she shook her head. No, I think it has to be strongly suspects. The only way he could know would be if he'd somehow managed to obtain a genetic comparison of the child in Hamish, and if Illescu isn't his source, then I don't see any way he could have done that. That's a good point, Hamish agreed, and I'm inclined to agree with you, 
Which leads to another point. He grimaced unhappily. You've been spending an awful lot of time at Whitehaven whenever you're on planet honor. It's not going to take a hyperphysicist to figure that out. And the fact that we were accused of being lovers when we weren't isn't going to help us very much now that we are. So whether he openly suggests I'm the father or not, the suggestion's going to be out there very soon if it isn't already. I suppose I could try staying away, Honor said slowly, her expression much unhappier than his had been. No, you certainly can't, Emily said tartly and shook her head. You two should never be allowed out in a social situation without a keeper. Both of them looked at her, and she snorted derisively. If you suddenly stop visiting your friend Emily after Hayes's little bombshell, the only conclusion anyone is going to be able to draw is the correct one, which is the last thing you want at this particular moment. Don't you agree, Honor? Well, yes, but... But me no buts, Emily interrupted. Besides, in the final analysis... Since we've always intended to eventually admit Hamish's paternity, we can't stand up and call Hayes a liar. He's a cretin, a sneak, and a treacherous little worm, but this time at least, the one thing he isn't is a liar. If we call him one now, it's going to create all sorts of problems when we finally come forward. And unless we're prepared to do that, suddenly changing your habits would be the same thing as admitting he's hit the nail on the head— and that you're trying to pretend he hasn't. So, what do we do? Honor demanded. Nothing, Emily said flatly. The other two looked at her incredulously, and she flipped her working hand in her shrug equivalent. I didn't say I liked the idea. It's just that the best of the several bad options available to us is simply to ignore it. Honor's going to be going back off-world tomorrow... I'm the sort of newsy who'd be interested in following up on a story like this is going to find it pretty hard to get to her when she's back with Eighth Fleet. And much as I hate playing on the poor invalid stereotype, it does offer me a certain amount of protection from the same sort of intrusiveness, which means the only one who's likely to be stalked over this is you, Hamish. Gee, thanks for the warning, he said glumly. You're a politician now, not a mere admiral, his wife told him. That makes you fair game, and by now you ought to have at least some notion of how the rules work. No comment. That will probably work for anything from your official press secretaries. After all, even if Hayes is right, it's a personal matter, not something government spokespeople should waste time and effort on. It won't work for you, though. If someone manages to corner you in a personal interview, you're going to have to come up with something better, or you might just as well go ahead and tell them you're the father. And your suggestion is? I think your response ought to be that if, in fact, Duchess Harrington is having a child tubed, and if she's declined, at this time, to disclose that child's paternity, that's certainly her right, and you have no intention of speculating about it. And if they ask me point blank if I'm the father? Hamish waved one hand in a gesture of intense frustration. Damn it, I am the father, and accident or not, I'm proud to be. I know you are, sweetheart, Emily said softly, eyes luminous as she laid her working hand on his forearm. And if they do ask you point blank, the one thing you can't do is lie. So my suggestion would be that you laugh. Laugh? As naturally as you possibly can, she agreed. I know your thespian skills leave a bit to be desired, dear, but I'll help you practice in front of a mirror. There was actually a twinkle in her eye, and he made a face at her. But, she continued more seriously, that really is your best response. Laugh. And if they continue to press, simply repeat that you have no intention of speculating and that you believe Honor's obvious wishes in this matter ought to be respected by everyone. You, at any rate, intend to respect them just as thoroughly as you would if you were the father. And you really think this is going to work? He asked skeptically. I never said that, Emily replied. I just said it was our best option. Chapter 25 
Do you want me to do anything about this person while you're away, my lady? Miranda Lafollet sat at her desk in her Jason Bay office, and when Honor poked her head in the open doorway, her maid held up a fax viewer between thumb and forefinger with the expression of someone who just found a dead mouse in her soup. And just what did you have it in mind to do about Mr. Hayes? Honor inquired mildly. This isn't Grayson, you know, Miranda. Oh, I certainly do, my lady. Miranda's mouth twisted in distaste, and Farragut, her tree cat, made a soft hissing sound from the perch beside her chair. Freedom of the press is a wonderful thing, my lady. We have it on Grayson, too, you know. But this Hayes person wouldn't care at all for what his brand of journalism would get him back home. Sounds like a very free press to me, Honor observed. Not that I don't think Mr. Hayes would look ever so much better with a couple of broken legs. Unfortunately, if that were a practical solution to the problem, I'd already have taken care of it myself. There's always Micah, Miranda pointed out. Micah LaFollet, her youngest brother, had just turned 26. Young enough for third-generation prolong, and blessed with adequate diet and medical care since childhood, he towered more than 14 centimeters taller than his eldest brother Andrew. Despite his formidable height, he was actually five centimeters taller than Honor herself, he looked much younger than his age to Grace and I's, but he was already in the final stages of armsman training, and he had a pronounced case of hero worship where Honor was concerned. No, there isn't always Micah, Honor scolded. He's not an armsman yet, and he's overly enthusiastic. Besides, assault with violence is a felony here in the Star Kingdom, and unlike your older brother, he doesn't have any sort of diplomatic immunity. Well, then surely there's something Richard could do about him. Miranda kept her tone light, trying to pretend she was no more than half serious, but Honor tasted the white-hot rage just below the younger woman's surface. Miranda, she said, stepping fully into the office, I truly, truly appreciate how angry you are, how much you and Andrew, and Simon, and Micah, and Spencer, and Mac all want to protect me from this, but you can't do it. And while Richard's a very good attorney, Solomon Hayes has spent decades figuring out exactly how close he can sail to outright libel without quite crossing the line into something actionable. But, my lady, Miranda protested, abandoning her pretense of humor, word of this is going to get home to Grayson. It's not going to matter much to our steaders, but that midden-toed Mueller and his loathsome bunch are going to try as hard as they can to hurt you with it where the conservatives are concerned. I know, Honor sighed. But there's not anything I can do about it at this point. I'm getting out of town and away from the newsies myself by going back to the fleet, but I've sent letters to Benjamin and Austin warning them about what's coming. That's about all I can do at this point. Miranda looked rebellious, and Honor smiled at her. It's not like I've never had anyone taking shots at me in the faxes before, she pointed out. And so far I've managed to survive, however little I've enjoyed the experience sometimes, and... She paused for a moment, then shrugged. And, she confessed, I'm not being quite as blasé about this entire thing as you seem to be assuming. Trust me, Mr. Hayes is going to come to regret this particular endeavor. Milady? Miranda perked up noticeably, and there was a slight edge to her voice. An edge accompanied by the sort of look a Grayson nanny might employ when not one of her charges seemed to know anything about how that dead sand frog had miraculously materialized in the nursery air purifier. Well, Honor said, I just happened to run into Stacy Hauptman at lunch yesterday, and somehow or other the conversation turned to journalism, and it seems Stacy has been considering venturing into that area for some time. She told me she thinks she might begin by buying the landing tattler, just to get her toes wet, you know, sort of explore the possibilities, and I think she might also have said something about making it her business to... How did she put it? Oh, yes making it her business to clean up the professionalism of Mantecaran journalism generally. My lady, Miranda said in quite a different tone, her gray eyes twinkling suddenly. Oh, that's evil, 
she continued with deep satisfaction. I never suggested that she take any action whatsoever, Honor said virtuously, and no one could possibly accuse me or any of my retainers of taking any sort of action either. I will confess, however, that I find the prospect of Stacy Hauptman taking personal aim at Mr. Hayes profoundly satisfying. It won't do much to undo what he's already done, but I feel fairly confident we won't be hearing from him a third time. And you were just suggesting the Grayson Press might incorporate a few journalistic constraints. Even in the Star Kingdom, Miranda, private citizens, as opposed to governmental agencies or public bodies, are permitted to make their displeasure known, so long as they violate no laws or civil rights, which I assure you Stacy has no intention of doing, or, now that I think about it, any need to do. Oh, of course not, my lady. I want to know who leaked this, and I want to know yesterday. Dr. Franz Illescu's voice was flat, almost calm, with a lack of emphasis and exclamation points which rang alarm bells in every member of the Briarwood Reproduction Center's senior staff. But doctor, Julia Isher, Briarwood's business manager, said cautiously, so far we don't really have any evidence it was one of our people who was responsible. Don't be stupid, Julia, and let's not pretend I am either, Illescu said in that same almost calm tone, and Isher winced. Franz Illescu could be an unmitigated pain in the ass, and despite the very nearly half-century he'd spent getting the worst of his natural aristocratic arrogance knocked out of him, there would always be that core of implicit superiority, that unassailable knowledge that he was, by the inevitable process of birth and the natural working of the universe, inherently better than anyone around him. Despite that, however, or possibly even because of it, he was normally very careful to observe the rules of courtesy with the little people with whom he came into contact. On the rare occasions when he wasn't, it was a very, very bad sign indeed. One of our people, as you put it, most definitely was responsible, he continued after a heartbeat or two. Whether someone deliberately sold the information to this, this individual haze or not, that information had to come from someone inside the center, someone with access to our confidential records, someone who, if he or she didn't deliberately sell the information, was still criminally and I use the adverb advisedly, in light of our confidentiality agreements with our patients, negligent. Someone who either gossiped about it where he or she shouldn't have, or allowed someone else unauthorized access. In either case, I want his or her ass. I want it broiled on a silver platter with a nice side of fried potatoes, and I intend to see to it that whoever it was never works in this field or any other branch of the medical profession in the Star Kingdom again. More than one of the staffers seated around the huge table blanched visibly. Illescu had still to raise his voice, but the temperature in the conference room seemed to hover within a degree or two of absolute zero Kelvin. Some of those staffers, like Isher herself, had been with Illescu for twenty T years or more, and they had never seen him this incandescently angry. Doctor, Isher said after a moment, I've already initiated a review of everyone who had access to Duchess Harrington's records. I assure you we're doing everything we possibly can to determine how that information got out of our files and into Mr. Hayes's hands. But so far, our security people, some of whom are very well-versed in forensic cybernetics, are coming up completely blank. I asked Hajman Myers. Myers was the center's head of security, who was absent from this meeting only because he was out personally heading the investigation. If we need to bring in someone else, like the landing PD, he says our people are probably as good as most of the LCPD's investigators— but he also agrees that if you want to bring in a completely outside team, he'll cooperate fully. She met Illescu's hooded basilisk gaze levelly. The truth of the matter is, though, sir, that we may never be able to identify the individual responsible. As you say, it could have been a case of idle gossip. Or, of course, 
although I don't like to think any of our people would violate our trust that way, someone could have deliberately handed the information over. In either case, however, my personal feeling is that it was almost certainly done verbally, with no written or electronic record, which doesn't leave us very much in the way of clues. Illescu looked at her, eyes cold, his normal, reassuring physician's personality noticeably in abeyance. The fact that he knew she was right only made him still angrier. I want a list of every name of every member of our staff who had access to both Duchess Harrington and Countess Whitehaven's files, he said after a moment. Everyone. Physicians, nurses, technicians, clerical staff. As a general rule, I don't much care for witch hunts, but I'm going to make an exception in this case. He looked around the conference room and showed his teeth in an expression no one would ever mistake for a smile. To be perfectly honest, I'm looking forward to it. Jesus, Julia, Martin Knipshid muttered softly as he walked down the hall beside her. I've never seen him that mad. He shook his head. I mean, this is terrible, sure. I agree, and not just because of the way it violates Duchess Harrington's confidentiality. It leaves us covered with crop here at the center, too. But let's face it, this really isn't the first time we've had an information leak, and that talk of his about witch hunts. It isn't just talk, Marty, Isher said equally quietly. He means it, and if he does find out who's responsible... She shrugged, her expression bleak, and Knipshid shook his head. I believe you. I just don't understand why. Isher looked at him for a moment, clearly considering whether or not to say something more. Dr. Martin Knipshid was, in many ways, her equivalent on the medical support side of Briarwood's operations. He wasn't one of the center's partners, but he was directly responsible for overseeing the lab's physical operation and directing the technicians who worked in them. And unless something very unexpected happened, he would be Briarwood's newest junior partner within the next three T years. It's personal this time, she said finally. Dr. Illescu has something of a history with the Harringtons. I had the impression he'd never met the Duchess before she became a patient— Knipshit objected. I didn't say he had a history with her, Marty. He has one with her parents, and it's personal, not professional. I'm not going to go into any details, but suffice it to say that if there are any two physicians in the entire Star Kingdom who he'd crawl across ground glass to avoid giving a reason to fault his professional conduct, it's Alfred and Alison Harrington. Worse, I think he's afraid they may believe he let the information out himself. That's preposterous. Knipshid was genuinely angry. He can be a royal pain, but I've never met a physician who takes his professional ethical responsibilities more seriously than he does. I agree, Isher said mildly. And I didn't say I think the Harringtons are going to believe anything of the sort. What I said was that he's afraid they may. And that, Marty, is why I am delighted that I, for one, am not the person who actually did spill the beans to Solomon Hayes. The two of them walked along in silence for another few moments, and then Isher chuckled humorlessly. What? Knipshid asked. I was just thinking. He says he wants whoever it is broiled, right? Knipshid nodded, and she shrugged. Well... I wonder if he'd let me at least light the fire for him when the time comes. We're coming up on her now, Your Grace, the pinnace pilot announced over the intercom. She's at your ten o'clock, low. Honor leaned close enough to the pinnace viewport that the tip of her nose almost touched the armorplast. She was on the starboard side of the small craft, seated just forward of the variable geometry wings, and she peered still further forward as the sleek white spindle of a starship came into view. A missile barge hung close beside it in orbit, which gave her a sense of perspective, something to relate the new ship's size to, and that perspective made her look just a bit odd to experienced eyes. She was obviously a battle cruiser, yet she was larger than any battle cruiser Honor had ever seen. The Agamemnons, like Michelle Hankey's Achilles, massed almost 1.75 million tons, but this ship was more than a half million tons heavier still, 
and where the Agamemnons were a pod-laying design, this one most definitely was not. She stepped up the magnification of her artificial eye, zooming in on the hull number just aft of the forward impeller ring. BC-762, it said, and under that, the name. Nike. She tasted the name in the depths of her mind, and her feelings were mixed as she gazed at the splendid new ship. This Nike's predecessor had been listed for disposal by the Janicek Admiralty in order to free the name for this new class's lead ship. The sudden eruption of renewed hostilities had saved BC-413 from the breakers, but the name had already been reassigned, so 413 had been renamed Hancock Station. If they'd had to rename her, Honor couldn't really fault the choice, but as that Nike's first captain, she would always think of the older ship as the rightful holder of that name. And yet, despite her manifold disagreements with the late Edward Janicek and her bitter opposition to so many of his disastrous policies at Admiralty House, she had to admit that this time he might have gotten it right. Nike was the proudest ship name in the Royal Manticoran Navy. There was always a Nike, and she was always a battlecruiser. And when she was commissioned, she was always the newest, most powerful battlecruiser in the fleet. Yet the old Nike, Hancock Station, was at best obsolescent despite the fact that she was barely 16 T years old. She'd been worked hard during those 16 years, but it was the changes in weapons and tactics, especially in missile warfare, not senility, which had relegated her to the second rank of effectiveness. In an age of multi-drive missiles, the traditional battlecruiser's niche had altered dramatically, and BC-413 was simply out of date. Battle cruisers were designed to run down and destroy enemy cruisers, or to raid and run. The ideal commerce protectors, and conversely, the ideal commerce destroyers. Traditionally, especially in Mantikoran service, they weren't intended to stand in the wall of battle because their relatively light armor and cruiser-style construction could never stand the pounding super-dreadnoughts were expected to endure. They were intended to run away from wallers, to be able to destroy anything lighter than them, and to outrun anything heavier. Yet the sheer reach of the MDM made staying out of effective range far more difficult than it had ever been before, and the emphasis on long-range missile combat required denser salvos and greater magazine space. For a time, it had seemed the battlecruiser had simply become obsolete, as the battleship had before it, and that it would vanish just as completely from the order of battle of first-class navies. But the type, or at least the role it filled, was just too valuable to be allowed to disappear, and improvements in compensator efficiency and other aspects of military technology had allowed a transformation. The Graysons had led the way toward one possible iteration of the type with their Corvosier II class of pod layers. The RMN's Agamemnons were the Manticoran version of the same design concept as the Blucher class was for the Andermani, and that approach clearly offered significant advantages over the older designs. But the BCP wasn't really completely satisfactory. Although it could produce a very heavy volume of fire, its endurance at maximum rate fire was limited, and the type's hollow core design came at a greater cost in structural integrity than the same concept did in a bigger, far more strongly built super dreadnought. So Vice Admiral Toscarelli's Bue ships had sought another approach at the same time it was designing the new Edward Saganami C class heavy cruisers. Nike was the result. A 2.5 million ton battle cruiser almost three times the size of Honor's old ship, but with an acceleration rate 30% greater. The old Nike had mounted 18 lasers, 16 grazers, 52 missile tubes, and 32 counter-missile tubes and point defense clusters. The new Nike mounted no lasers, 32 grazers, eight of them as chase weapons, 50 missile tubes, none of them chasers, and 30 counter-missile tubes and laser clusters. The old Nike had carried a ship's company of over 2,000. The new Nike's complement was only 750. And the new Nike was armed with the Mark 16 dual-drive missile. With the off-bore launch capability the RMN had developed, she could bring both broadsides missile tubes to bear on the same target, giving her 50 birds per salvo, as opposed to the older ship's 22. 
and whereas the old Nike's maximum powered missile range from rest had been just over 6 million kilometers, the new Nike's missiles had a maximum powered endurance of over 29 million. She couldn't fire the all-up three-stage MDMs the Corvosiers and Agamemnons could handle, so her tactical flexibility was marginally less, and her warheads were slightly lighter, but an Agamemnon rolling pods at her maximum rate would shoot herself dry in just over 14 minutes, whereas Nike carried sufficient ammunition for almost 40 minutes, and she carried 50% more counter-missiles as well. For that matter, although the Corvosiers did in fact carry the three-stage weapons, the RMN had chosen to load the Agamemnon's pods with Mark 16s. Buweps had gone ahead and produced the standard pods as well, but Admiralty House had decided the salvo density the Mark 16 permitted was more important than the bigger missile's greater powered envelope. Personally, Honor was convinced that this Nike represented the pattern for true battlecruisers of the future, and she deeply regretted the fact that although the Janicek Admiralty had authorized her construction, they had seen her as a single-ship testbed. The Navy desperately needed as many Nikes as it could get, and what it had was exactly one, which was all it would have for at least another full T year. But at least Honor had the only one of her there was, and she smiled at her reflection in the armor-plast, She'd convinced Admiral Cortez to give her to a captain who was almost as competent as he was irritating. "'Do you want another pass on her, Your Grace?' the pilot inquired, and Honor pressed the intercom key on the arm of her chair. "'No, thank you, Chief. I've seen enough. Head straight on to the flagship. Captain Cardonis is expecting me in time for lunch.' "'Aye, aye, ma'am.' The pinnace turned away, and Honor leaned back in her seat as her mind reached out to the future. Dr. Illescu, Dr. Illescu, would you care to comment on the press accounts of Duchess Harrington's pregnancy? Franz Illescu walked stolidly across the Briarwood lobby, ignoring the shouted questions. Dr. Illescu, are you prepared to confirm that Earl Whitehaven is the father of Duchess Harrington's child? Dr. Illescu, isn't it true Prince Michael is the child's father? Are you prepared to categorically deny that the father is Baron Grantville or Benjamin Mayhew? Dr. Illescu! The lift doors cut off the hullabaloo, and Illescu keyed his personal comm with an almost savage thumb jab. Security, Myers, a voice responded instantly. Tajman, this is Dr. Illescu. The fury seething in Illescu's normally controlled baritone was almost palpable. Will you please explain to me what the hell that... that three-ring circus in our lobby is about? I'm sorry, sir, Meyer said. I wasn't aware you were coming in through the public entrance, or I would have at least warned your driver. They descended on us right after lunch, and so far they haven't committed any privacy violations. According to SOP, I can't bar them from the public area of the facility until they do. Well, as it happens, I wrote the damned SOP. Illescu half-snarled. And as of now, you can bar those jackals from any part of this facility until hell's a hockey rink. Is that perfectly clear? Uh, yes, sir. I'll get on it right away, sir. Thank you. Illescu's voice was marginally closer to normal as he broke the circuit and inhaled deeply. He leaned back against the wall of the lift car and rubbed his face wearily. He and Myers were no closer to finding the leak than they'd been when they began, and the story was ballooning totally out of control. Not that he'd ever had much hope of controlling it in the first place. The press was working itself up to a feeding frenzy and the most preposterous speculation imaginable, as the shouted question in the lobby indicated, had become rampant. At least he'd spoken to both Doctors Harrington, unpleasant though it had been, and he felt reasonably confident neither of them thought it had been his doing— but that didn't make him feel much better. Even though he was prepared to dislike Duchess Harrington because of her parentage, she was a patient. She had a legal and moral right to privacy, to trust that doctor-patient confidentiality would not be violated, and it had been. It was almost like a form of rape, even if the assault was non-physical, and he would have been coldly, bitterly furious in any patient's case. In this instance, given the prominence of the patient in question, and the way that prominence was goading the newsy speculations, his emotions went far beyond fury. 
Franz Illescu was not a man with much use for the custom of dueling, even if it was legal. But in this case, if he could find out who was responsible, he was prepared to make an exception. Welcome back, Michelle Henke said with a smile as Andrew LaFollet peeled off at her day cabin's hatch and Honor and Nimitz stepped through it. Thanks. Honor crossed to the cabin and flopped onto Henke's couch far more inelegantly than she would ever have considered if anyone else had been present. I trust Diego did the honors properly, Henke asked lightly. Captain Diego Mikhailov was Ajax's captain. I told him you wanted it kept low-key. He kept it as low-key as my faithful minion outside the hatch there would permit, Anna replied. I like him, she added. He's a likable sort, and good at his job. Not to mention smart enough to realize how harried and hunted you must feel right now. He understands exactly why he's not invited to dinner tonight. In fact, he commented to me that you must be delighted to be back aboard ship. As a matter of fact... I've seldom been happier to find myself confined aboard ship in my entire life, Honor admitted as she rested her head on one couch arm, closed her eyes, and stretched out with Nimitz on her chest. That's because the worst that can happen here is that you get blown up, Henke said dryly. She crossed to the wet bar, opened a small refrigerator, and produced a pair of chilled bottles of Old Tillman. Honor chuckled appreciatively, although her amusement was clearly less than complete, and Hanky grinned as she opened the beer bottles. I told Clarissa I'd buzz for her if we decided we needed her, she continued, holding out one of the bottles to Honor. Here. Honor cracked one eye and looked up, and Hanky waggled the bottle at her. You look like you need this. What I need is about fifteen minutes. No, ten minutes would do nicely, actually. Alone with Mr. Hayes, Honor said balefully. She accepted the bottle and swallowed a mouthful of cold beer. I'd feel ever so much better afterward. At least until they came to put you in jail. True. The courts are tacky about things like that, aren't they? Unfortunately. Henke swallowed some of her own beer, leaning back in an armchair facing Honor's couch, and rested one heel on the expensive coffee table on the thick, even more expensive carpet between the two of them. Honor smiled at her and looked around curiously. It was the first time she'd visited Hanky aboard Ajax, and although Hanky's day cabin was substantially smaller than her own lordly flag quarters aboard Imperator, it was still large and comfortable indeed by the standards of most battlecruisers. Ajax's total complement was under 600, including Marines, and her designers, faced with all that space, had obviously felt someone as lordly as a flag officer deserved the very best. The deep pile carpet was a dark crimson, which Honor knew Henke would never have chosen for herself, and undoubtedly intended to change at the earliest possible moment, but the paneled bulkheads, indirect lighting, and hollow sculptures gave it an air of almost sinfully welcoming comfort. Best of all, it was totally empty except for Henke, Honor, and Nimitz. Feeling better? Henke asked after a moment. Some... Honor closed her eyes again and rolled the chilled beer bottle across her forehead. Quite a bit, actually, she went on after a moment. The mind glows out here are a lot easier on Nimitz and me. There must be times when being an empath is a complete and total pain, Henke said. You have no idea, Honor agreed, opening her eyes once more and sitting up a bit. To be perfectly honest, Mike... That's one reason I was so happy you invited me to dinner tonight. All my staffers are firmly in my corner, but if I'd stayed home aboard the flagship, I'd almost have had to host a formal dinner on my first night back. Eating alone with my oldest friend is an awfully much more attractive proposition. Thanks. Hey, it's what friends are for, Hanky said, more lightly than she felt and trying not to show how touched she was. Well, the company's good, Honor said with a crooked smile. But I suppose if I'm going to be completely honest, the real attraction is Chief Arbuckle's paprikash. I'll see to it that Clarissa gives Mac the recipe, Hanky said dryly. Attention on deck. 
The 8th Fleet's flag officers, their senior staffers, and their flag captains rose as Honor, Rafael Cardonis, Mercedes Brigham, and Andrea Jarowalski entered the compartment. Simon Mattingly and Spencer Hawk parked themselves against the bulkhead just outside the compartment, flanking the hatch, and Andrew LaFollet followed the naval officers in. He took his customary, inconspicuous place against the bulkhead behind Honor's chair, and level gray eyes swept the entire briefing room with instinct-level, microscopic attention to detail. "'Be seated, ladies and gentlemen,' Honor said, striding to her own place. McGinnis had contrived a proper perch for Nimitz, bracketed to the back of her chair, and the tree cat gave a buzzing purr as he arranged himself upon it. Honor smiled as she tasted his approval of the new arrangements, then seated herself and looked out at her command team. The senior divisional commanders were present this time as well, and they were no longer such unknown quantities. There were a few about whom she nursed some minor concerns, but by and large she was supremely confident in the temper of her weapon. Whether it would be enough for the tasks demanded of it was more than she could say, but if it failed, it would not be because of any fault in the quality of the men and women of whom it was composed. As you all know, she said after a moment, We've actually received a few reinforcements. Not as many as we were slated to. Other commitments, unfortunately, are drawing off units which otherwise would have been earmarked for us. Nonetheless, we have more striking power than we had last time, and... This time the wolf at her core showed in her smile. We are still getting the opportunity to show the Havenites our newest and best. Several other people smiled as well, and Honor looked at Michelle Hankey. I'm sure you were less than pleased when Captain Shelburne reported Hector's engineering casualty, Admiral Henke. I trust, however, that the replacement I've managed to arrange for you until Hector can get that beta node replaced is satisfactory? Well, Your Grace, Henke replied judiciously, I suppose under the circumstances I'll just have to make do. This time the people who'd smiled laughed out loud, and Honor shook her head. I'm sure you'll manage somehow, Admiral, she told Hanky. Then she looked at the other officers again. In most ways, this meeting is something of a formality, she told them. You've all done well in training and preparing your commands for Cutworm too. You've all had time to study our objectives, and I'm confident all of us are well aware of the importance of this operation. She paused to let that sink in. Cutworm Two is both more ambitious and less ambitious than our first attacks were, she continued after a moment. It's more ambitious primarily in terms of timing and how deep we're penetrating to hit Chantilly and Des Moines. Since all of our task forces will have different transit times, and since I've decided to once more orchestrate our strikes to hit our targets simultaneously, Admiral Truman and Admiral Miklos will depart immediately after this meeting. Admiral McKeon will depart for Fordyce the day after tomorrow, and Admiral Matsuzawa and I will depart for Augusta four days after that. Remember, hitting our assigned objectives, hard, is critically important, but bringing your ships and your people home is equally so. It seems unlikely the Republic will have been able to adjust its defensive stance significantly in the last three weeks. Nonetheless, it isn't impossible, so be alert." We're more likely to see changes in doctrine and tactical approaches than we are to see significant redeployment of covering forces. Eventually, obviously, we hope that's going to change, but simple message transit times are going to preclude their having done it yet. Hopefully, she smiled again, our modest efforts over the next two weeks will provide additional encouragement for their efforts. In just a moment, Captain Jarowalski will run through the entire op schedule one last time. Afterward, I want to go over the plan individually with each task force commander. If any questions or suggestions have occurred to any of you since our last meeting, that will be the time to bring them forward. She paused a second time, then nodded to Jarowalski. Andrea, she invited, and sat back in her own chair to listen as the ops officer activated the hollow display above the conference table. Your guests are here, Reverend. Reverend Jeremiah Sullivan, 
first elder of the Church of Humanity Unchained, nodded in response to his secretary's announcement and turned away from the picture window of his large, comfortable office in Mayhew Cathedral. Thank you, Matthew. If you'd be good enough to show them in, please. Of course, Your Grace. Brother Matthew bowed slightly and withdrew. He was back a moment later, accompanied by half a dozen men. Most were of at least middle years. The sole exception was a very young man indeed for the office he held. Obviously a prolonged recipient, but less than thirty-five T years old. He was also the evident leader of the delegation. Reverend, he murmured, bending to kiss the ring Sullivan held out to him. Thank you for seeing us. I could hardly say no to a request from such distinguished visitors, Steadholder Mueller, Sullivan said easily. Mueller smiled and stepped aside, and Sullivan extended his ring hand to the next Steadholder in line. Mueller's smile became just a trifle fixed as he watched. It was certainly correct etiquette for visitors, however exalted their rank, to kiss the Reverend's ring of office— but it was customary, in cases like this morning's meeting, for the Reverend to settle for receiving the courtesy from the senior member of the delegation. All five of Mueller's fellows kissed the ring in turn, and Sullivan waved a graceful hand at the half-circle of chairs arranged before his desk to await them. "'Please, my lords, be seated,' he invited, and waited courteously until all of them had settled— before seating himself behind the desk once more, with an attentive expression on his strong, fierce-nosed face. "'And now, Lord Mueller, how may Father of Church serve the people of Grayson?' "'Actually, Your Grace, we're not quite sure,' Mueller replied with an air of candor. "'In fact, we're here more to consult than for anything else.' "'Consult, my lord?' Sullivan arched one eyebrow, his bald scalp gleaming in the morning sunlight pouring in through the hermetically sealed window behind him. About what? About... Mueller started impatiently, then made himself stop. About the Manticora news reports concerning Steadholder Harrington, Your Grace, he said after a moment, his tone and expression once more controlled. Ah. Sullivan nodded. You're referring to that person Hayes's column about Lady Harrington? Well, to that, and to all the other commentary and speculation he seems to have generated in the Manticoran press, Mueller agreed and produced a grimace of distaste. Obviously, I find the original story and its thinly veiled innuendos an unconscionable invasion of the Steadholder's private life, the sort of thing, I'm afraid, one might expect from such a thoroughly secular society. Nonetheless, the story has been printed and widely commented upon in the Star Kingdom, and it's already starting to make its way through our own news media here in Yeltsin. So I'd observed, Sullivan agreed almost placidly. I'm sure, Mueller said, his tone more pointed, you must find that fact as deplorable as I do, Your Grace. I find it inevitable, my lord, Sullivan said in a tone of mild correction and shrugged. Steadholder Harrington is one of our most popular public figures, as all of us are perfectly well aware. This sort of speculation about her is bound to create a great deal of public comment. Despite his formidable self-control, Mueller's eyes flickered as Sullivan referred to Harrington's popularity. He really did look a great deal like a much younger edition of his deceased father, Sullivan mused. It was unfortunate the resemblance went so much deeper than the surface. Comment is one thing, Your Grace, Mueller said now a bit sharply. The sort of comment we're observing, however, is something else entirely. The other members of the conclave of Steadholder's delegation looked uncomfortable, but none disagreed with their spokesman. In fact, Sullivan saw most seemed firmly in agreement. Not surprisingly, given that they'd more or less nominated themselves for their present mission. "'In what specific way, my lord?' the reverend inquired, still mildly after a moment. "'Your Grace, you're obviously aware Steadholder Harrington's declined to reveal the paternity of her child,' Mueller said. "'Moreover, as I'm sure you're also aware, the Steadholder isn't married, so I'm very much afraid that her son—' The son, I remind you, who ought to replace Lady Harrington's sister in the succession of her steading, is illegitimate. Not to put too fine a point upon it, Your Grace, 
this boy will be not simply a bastard, but a bastard whose father is a total unknown. I might point out, Sullivan replied tranquilly, that Mantikaran practices are somewhat different from our own. Specifically, Mantikaran law doesn't recognize the concept of bastardy at all. I believe one of their more respected jurists once said, there are no illegitimate children, only illegitimate parents. Personally, I find myself in agreement with him. We're not talking about Mantikaran law, your grace, Mueller said flatly. We're talking about grace in law about Lady Harrington's responsibility as a steadholder to keep the conclave of steadholders informed about the birth of an heir to her steading, about the fact that she hasn't bothered to marry this boy's father or even to inform us as to who that father is. He shook his head. I believe, however great her services to Grayson, we have legitimate cause to be concerned when she so clearly chooses to flaunt the law of our planet and of Father Church. Excuse me, my lord, but precisely how has she done that? Mueller stared at the reverend in consternation for at least three seconds. Then he shook himself. My lord, as I'm sure you're perfectly well aware, I, as a steadholder, am required by law to inform my fellow steadholders of the prospective birth of any heir to my steading. I'm also required to provide proof that the heir in question is my child and the legitimate inheritor of my title and my responsibilities— Surely you aren't suggesting that simply because Lady Harrington wasn't born on Grayson, she's somehow exempt from the obligations binding upon every other steadholder? It was obvious from his manner that Mueller very much hoped Sullivan would make such an argument. As his father before him, although so far at least without crossing the line into active treason, so far as anyone knows at any rate, Sullivan told himself tartly, Travis Mueller had found his natural home in the ranks of the opposition. And in the opposition's eyes, Honor Harrington represented everything they detested about the Mayhew Restoration's secularization of their society. The unassailable position Steadholder Harrington held in the hearts of the majority of Graysons was gall bitter on their tongues, and Sullivan could almost physically taste the eagerness with which they anticipated this opportunity to discredit her. Not that the unfortunately large number of people who'd attempted the same task before them had enjoyed much luck, he reflected. First of all, my lord, he said after a moment, I'd recommend you consult a good constitutional scholar, since you appear to be laboring under a misapprehension. Your responsibility as a steadholder is to inform myself, as the steward of Father Church, and the protector, as Father Church's champion and the guardian of secular matters here on Grayson, it is not to inform the conclave as a body. Mueller's eyes first widened, then narrowed, and he flushed slightly. I'll grant you, my lord, Sullivan continued imperturbably, that traditionally that's included a notification of the conclave as a whole. However, the conclave's responsibility to examine and prove the chain of succession actually begins only after the birth of the heir in question, and although I realize you weren't aware of it, Lady Harrington informed Protector Benjamin and myself almost two full months ago that she was pregnant. So I assure you, all of her constitutional obligations have been faithfully discharged. It hasn't simply been traditional to notify the conclave, Your Grace, Mueller said sharply. For generations, it's had the force of law, and that notification is supposed to be given well before the actual birth of the child in question. Quite a few erroneous practices had the force of law prior to the re-establishment of the correct provisions of our written constitution, my lord. For the first time, there was a very definite iciness in Reverend Sullivan's voice. Those errors are still in the process of correction. They are, however, being corrected. Mueller started to reply angrily, then clamped his jaw and visibly made himself reassert control of his temper. Your Grace, I suppose you're technically correct about the letter of the written law, he said after several moments, speaking very carefully. Personally, I disagree with your interpretation. You are, however, as you pointed out a short time ago, Father Church's steward. I will, therefore, not contest your interpretation at this time— 
although I reserve the right to do so without prejudice at another time and in another forum. Nonetheless, the fact remains that Stedholder Harrington isn't married, that our law, unlike that of the Star Kingdom of Manticore, clearly does recognize the concept of bastardy and regards it as a bar to inheritance, and that we don't even know who the father of this child is. No, Lady Harrington isn't married, Sullivan agreed. And you're quite correct that Grayson Law, as presently written, does recognize bastardy and the disabilities and limitations which normally attach to it. However, it's incorrect to say that we, in the legal sense of Father Church and the Sword, don't know who the father of Lady Harrington's son is. You know who the father is? Mueller demanded. Of course I do, as does the protector, Sullivan said. For that matter, he thought, everyone on the entire planet knows whether they're prepared to admit it or not. Even so, Mueller said after a brief pause, the child is clearly still a bastard. As such, he must be unacceptable as the heir to a steading. His voice was flat, hard, and Sullivan nodded mentally. Mueller had finally and unambiguously thrown down his gauntlet. Whether or not a majority of the conclave of Steadholders would agree with him and sustain his position was another matter. It was possible a majority would, but even if, as Sullivan thought was far more likely, the majority didn't agree with him, he would gleefully take advantage of the opportunity to do all he could to blacken Honor Harrington's reputation in the eyes of Grayson's more conservative citizens. It occurred to me, when Lady Harrington first informed me she was pregnant, the Reverend said mildly, after a long, thoughtful moment, that a view such as that might present itself. Accordingly, I asked my staff to conduct a brief historical review. Historical? Mueller repeated against his will, when Sullivan deliberately paused and waited. Yes, historical. The Reverend opened a desk drawer and withdrew a fat, old-fashioned, hard-copy folder. He laid it on the blotter, opened it, glanced at the top sheet of paper, and then looked back at Mueller. It would appear that in 3112, 910 years ago, Stedholder Berlinko had no legitimate male children, only daughters. The conclave of Stedholders of that time, therefore, accepted the eldest of his several illegitimate sons as his heir. In 3120, Stedholder Elway had no legitimate male children, only daughters. The conclave of Stedholders of that time, therefore, accepted the eldest of his several illegitimate sons as his heir. In 3140, Stedholder Ames had no legitimate male children, only daughters. The conclave of Stedholders of that time, therefore, accepted the eldest of his several illegitimate sons as his heir. In 3142, Stedholder Sutherland had no legitimate male children, only daughters. The conclave of Stedholders of that time, therefore, accepted the eldest of his several illegitimate sons as his heir. In 3146, Stedholder Kimbrell had no legitimate male children, only daughters. The conclave of Stedholders of that time, therefore, accepted the eldest of his reportedly 36 illegitimate sons as his heir. In 3160, Stedholder Denevsky had no legitimate male children, only daughters. The conclave of Stedholders of that time, therefore, accepted the eldest of his illegitimate sons as his heir. In 3163, the Reverend paused, looked up with a hard little smile, and closed the folder once more. I trust you'll observe, my lords, that in a period of less than seventy years from the founding of Grayson, when there were less than twenty-five steadings on the entire planet, no less than six steadholderships had passed through illegitimate, bastard children. Passed, mind you, in instances in which there were clearly recognized legitimate female children. We have nine hundred and forty-two years of history on this planet— would you care to estimate how many more times over that millennium Stedholder ships have passed under similar circumstances? He tapped the thick folder on his desk. I can almost guarantee you that whatever total you guess will be too low. Sullivan's
silence hovered in his office, and his old-fashioned chair creaked as he sat back in it and folded his hands atop the folder. So what we seem to have here, my lords, is that although the stigma of bastardy legally bars one from the line of succession of a stadtholdership, we've ignored that bar scores of times in the past, the most recent instance of which, I might point out, came in Howellsteading less than twenty t years ago. Of course, in all the prior instances of our having ignored the law, the bastards in question were the children of male stadtholders. In fact, in the vast majority of the cases, there was no way for anyone to prove those stadtholders were actually even the fathers of the children in question. However, in the case of a female stadtholder, when the fact that she's the mother of the child in question can be scientifically demonstrated beyond question or doubt, suddenly bastardy becomes an insurmountable bar which can't possibly be set aside or ignored. I'm curious, my lords, why is that? Four of the reverend's visitors looked away, unable or unwilling to meet his fiery, challenging eye. Mueller only flushed darker, jaw muscles ridging as he glared back. And Jasper Taylor, Stedholder Canseco, looked just as stubbornly angry as Mueller. Very well, my lords, Sullivan said finally, his voice hard-edged with something far more like contempt than these men were accustomed to hearing. Your concerns are noted. I will, however, inform you that neither Father Church nor the Sword questions the propriety of this child's inheriting Stedholder Harrington's titles and dignities. That, of course, is your privilege and right, your grace, Mueller grated. Nonetheless, as is also well established in both our faith and our secular law, a man has both the right and the responsibility to contend for what he believes God's test requires of him, whatever the sacristy and sword may say. Indeed he does, Sullivan agreed. And I would never for a moment consider denying you that right, my lord. But before you take your stand before God and man, it might perhaps be prudent of you to be certain of your ground. Specifically, this child will not be illegitimate. I beg your pardon? Mueller jerked upright in his chair, and the other stedholders with him looked equally confused. I said, this child won't be illegitimate, Sullivan repeated coldly. Surely that should satisfy even you, my lord. Your God steward on grace in your grace, Mueller shot back. But not God himself. It's been well established in both church and civil law that no reverend, not even the entire sacristy in assembly, can make falsehood true simply by saying something is so. Indeed I cannot, Sullivan said icily. Nonetheless, this child will not be illegitimate. You will not be given the opportunity you so obviously desire to use Lady Harrington's child as a weapon against her. Father Church won't permit it. I won't permit it. He smiled once again, his eyes frozen, agate hard. I trust that is sufficiently clear, my lord. Chapter 26 Ma'am, I hate to disturb you, but I think you'd better see this. Rear Admiral Jennifer Belfay, the Republican Navy's senior office in the Chantilly system, turned towards the dining cabin hatch with a scowl that was angry, despite her best effort to control her temper. What is it, Leonardo? She tried to keep herself from chopping the words off in small icy chips, but it was more than she could manage. Admiral... Mr. Belfi, I apologize for breaking in on your dinner, but I think this is urgent. Commander Erickson, Belfi's operations officer, held out a message board to his admiral. She managed to not quite snatch it out of his hand and glared at the display. Then, abruptly, her angry expression smoothed into something very different. This is confirmed? she asked crisply, looking back up at Erickson. Yes, ma'am. I had perimeter tracking double-check before I broke in on you. He smiled apologetically. I know how much you and your family have been looking forward to this visit, Admiral. I really wish I hadn't had to disturb you on your very first evening. I wish you hadn't had to, too, 
Belfi said, her own smile thin. For a lot of reasons. She glanced at the message board again, then set it down on the table. Ivan seen a copy of this as well? Yes, ma'am, and I also routed a copy to Governor Sebastian's office. Thank you. This time, Belfay's smile was warmer, though it still seemed strained, a bit taut. I don't think there's much we can do about it right now. If they get clumsy and we get a solid read on them, I'd love to nail them. I'm not going to try holding my breath until we do, though, and I don't want to give away anything we don't have to. So tell Ivan to activate smoke and mirrors. I want everything we've got brought to immediate readiness, but no one moves, and we shut down the mirror box platforms right now. And I want all of our stealth-capable units, except the destroyers, into stealth now. They stay there until I tell them differently. Yes, ma'am. Anything else? Not right now, Leonardo. Thank you. Commander Erickson smiled, nodded once again to his admiral and her family, and withdrew. Jennifer? The Chantilly system commander looked up. She realized she'd been settling into what her mother used to call a brown study, but the sound of her name pulled her back out of it abruptly. Her husband looked back at her, waiting patiently despite the concern in the back of his deep brown eyes. I'm sorry, Russ, she said quietly. I know you and the kids just got here, and I've really been looking forward to this visit, but it appears the Mantis didn't get the memo about your trip. Russell Belfay's lips quirked very slightly at her feeble attempt at humor, but their children, Diana and Matthew, didn't even try to conceal their worry. Can you tell us about it? Russell asked. His tone said he'd understand if she couldn't, and she smiled at him far more warmly while she wondered how many other spouses could have honestly said the same in his position. Russell Belfay had spent 32 years fighting a hopeless struggle against the democratized legislaturalist educational system. Fortunately, he and his wife had been born and raised in the Suarez system, and Suarez had been added to the People's Republic only 36 years before the outbreak of the First War with Manticore, so at least he hadn't had to deal with the entrenched, massively intrusive bureaucracy of places like Nouveau Paris. He'd had enough slack to get away with actually teaching his students something, and although, like his wife, he'd hated and despised the People's Republic of Rob Pierre and state security, he'd finally seen the idea that schools were supposed to teach their students take root once more. Along the way, he'd found the time and patience to marry a serving naval officer, despite all of the dislocation a military career imposed on anyone's personal life, and the very real risk involved in marrying an officer while Oscar Saint-Just's state security was shooting entire families under his infamous policy of collective responsibility. And in the middle of all that, he'd somehow managed to raise two teenage children with only occasional visits from their mother and done a damned good job. There's not much to tell yet, she said. Perimeter trackings detected what's probably a pair of hyper footprints well out from the system primary. It may be nothing. Or it may be Manti scout ships like I saw on the boards about Gaston and Hera, Diana said tautly. At seventeen, she was the older of Belfay's children, with her mother's dark hair coloring and gray-green eyes. She also had her mother's sharp-edged adrenal personality, and at the moment, Belphi wished she'd inherited more of her father's equanimity. Yes, it may, Belphi said as calmly as she could. In fact, I think it probably is. Here? Technically, Matthew wasn't quite a teenager yet. One reason for this trip to Chantilly had been to celebrate his 13th birthday, and at the moment he looked and sounded very young and frightened indeed. The Matties are coming here, Mom? Probably, Belfi repeated. But that's enough, Matt, Russell said quietly. The boy looked at him as if he couldn't believe he could be so blasé about it. But then he saw his father's eyes and his mouth shut with an almost audible click. Better, Russell said, reaching out to ruffle his hair gently, the way he had when Matthew had been much younger. Then he turned back to his wife. 
All I really know is what I've read in the faxes and on the boards, he told her. Is this as bad as I think it is? It's not good, she told him honestly. Just how not good? I don't know yet. We probably won't for at least a couple of days. But you expect them to attack? Yes, she sighed. I wish now you hadn't come. I don't, he said softly, and her eyes prickled as he looked steadily at her across the table. Then he reached for his fork and glanced at their children. I think we should go ahead and finish eating before we pester your mother with any more questions, he told them. There's another one, sir, Chief Sullivan said flatly. Did we get a locus on it? Lieutenant Commander Crankle asked. I wish, sir, Sullivan replied in disgusted tones. He looked up from his display, and his expression was a mixture of frustration and apology. Whatever it is, and between you and me, sir, it's gotta be a stealth Manti recon platform. It's moving like a bat out of hell. I wish to hell I knew how they got these kinds of acceleration levels and endurance numbers on their platforms. Navent says they've probably put microfusion plants on them. Sullivan blinked. Fusion plants? On something this small? That's what they say, Crankle shrugged. I haven't seen any raw data on captured hardware or anything to support it, but it comes out of bolt hole. And if anyone knows what they're up to, it's got to be Admiral Foraker and her teams. Well, isn't that just peachy, Sullivan muttered, then grimaced. Sorry, sir. You're not saying anything I haven't thought, Chief, Crankle said dryly. Still, it'd make sense out of how small they've managed to make their MDMs, not to mention the hellacious power levels their remote EW platforms pump. Yeah, it would, Sullivan agreed. Then he seemed to give himself a mental shake. But what I was saying, sir, all we're getting is the backscatter and their directional transmission capabilities better than ours. The best read we've gotten was an accident— one of our own platforms just happened to wander into their transmission path, and we haven't gotten what we need for a good cross-cut bearing for any of them. Even if we did, by the time we could vector anything out there, the platform would be long gone. It'd have to see us coming, and it can pull a hell of a lot more Excel than any lack we might send after it. Then we're just going to have to hope we do get a cross-bearing, I guess, Crinkle said. Yes, sir. Sullivan turned back to his display, bending once more to the wearisome task of listening for the tiny spies flitting about the Augusta system. Personally, he figured the effort was as pointless as it was exhausting. They knew the bastards were out there, they knew they weren't going to be able to run down any of their platforms, even if they spotted them, and they knew those platforms wouldn't be there if hell itself wasn't coming to dinner. Still, he supposed he might as well waste his time doing this as anything else. Commander Estwick's data is coming in now, Your Grace. Thank you, Andrea. Honor nodded to her ops officer, then turned back to the comm. You heard, Rafe? Yes, ma'am. Yolanda's already looking at the preliminaries. So far, it seems to be about what we expected. Then it probably is, but remember, surprise is usually what happens when someone misinterprets something he's seen all along. Cardonis finished for her. She closed her mouth, then chuckled. I think I may have spent too many years at the island. No, ma'am, you've always been a teacher. Anna was a little surprised by the flicker of embarrassment she felt at the sincerity in Cardonis's tone. Well, I had some pretty good teachers of my own, she said after a moment. Admiral Corvosier, Captain Bockfish, Mark Sarno. I guess once you get stuck in the pattern, it's hard to break. If it's all the same to you, ma'am, I think we'd all just as soon you didn't try. I'll bear that in mind, Captain Cardonis. Good. And now, if you don't mind, Your Grace, we've both got some tactical information to look over, so... He grinned broadly at her. Let's be about it. Tell the Admiral we've got a major hypertranslation. Commander Ivan de Castro, Rear Admiral Belfi's chief of staff, hoped he looked calmer than he felt as he gazed into the display at Commander Erickson. 
How big is it, Leonardo? He asked. At least 13 footprints, Erickson said grimly. It may be 14. We're working to refine the numbers. Not good, De Castro said, and Erickson snorted. I see you subscribe to the theory understatement can be its own form of emphasis. When it's all you've got, you might as well be witty, I suppose. De Castro produced a wan smile. Then he squared his shoulders. All right, I'll tell her. At least she's got her family dirt side now, not on the flagship. I know. For just a moment, Erickson's expression was haunted. Christ, that's gotta be hard, knowing your kids are down there, that they know exactly what's happening. It's a bastard, all right, De Castro agreed. Get me those refined numbers as soon as you can. How big a force, did you say? Governor Juna Poikonen's face was gray on Rear Admiral Baptiste Brisson's calm. Not that Brisson blamed him a bit. The Rear Admiral intended to do his best to defend Augusta, but after he had, and after the wreckage had dissipated, Poikonen was going to have to deal with what the frigging mantis were about to do to his star system. Perimeter tracking makes it four super dreadnoughts, four battle cruisers, and seven heavy and light cruisers, Brisson repeated. It's possible one or more of the super dreadnoughts could be a carrier, but so far the emission signatures are consistent with Invictus and Medusa class STPs. If I had to guess, I'd guess we're up against the same force that hit Hera. Harrington is here? Poikonen's face got a little grayer, if that was possible. Honor Harrington is not the devil herself, Brisson said testily. So far as I'm aware, she hasn't even made any deals with the devil, assuming the devil exists, which I don't. I'm sorry, Baptiste. Poikonen shook his head like a man trying to shake water out of his ears and managed an apologetic smile. It's just, well, oh hell, you know what it is. Yes, Brisson sighed. Yes, Juna, I know what it is. Do you intend to fight her? Poikonen asked quietly after a moment. I've got some orders around here somewhere that say something about my being the Augusta System's naval commander. If memory serves, they also say something about defending my station against attack. I know they do. Poikonen's tone told Brassand his feeble attempt at humor had failed. But that doesn't change the fact that you've got one old-style super dreadnought, six battle cruisers, and a couple of hundred lakhs. That's not enough to stop her, and you know it. So what do I do, Juna? Brisson sat back and raised one hand, palm uppermost. Do I lie down and play dead? Do I just let her, or whoever's in command over there, waltz right in and blow this system's economy and industrial base to hell? We've got pods on tow, we've got the system defense pods already deployed, and if they don't have any sealax of their own, then at least they don't have any of those damned katanas to throw at us. I sent off a dispatch boat to Haven as soon as we realized they were scouting the system. A relief force is probably already on its way. If I can just delay these people until it gets here, we may be able to save at least some of your star system for you after all. We're thirty light years from the capital, Baptiste. That's four days' transit for a task force, and your message can't reach the Octagon until sometime later today. Do you really think you can stand off a force this size for four friggin' days? Probably not, Brisson said bleakly. But that doesn't mean I don't have to try. The two friends looked at one another for a moment, and then Brisson cleared his throat. In case we don't get another chance to talk, Juna, take care of yourself. I will, the governor promised softly. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask that god you don't believe in to look after you. They're here, ma'am, Commander Alan McGuire said. Perimeter tracking makes it at least six of the wall. Some of them might be carriers, of course, ten cruisers, and at least three destroyers. Commodore Desiree Carmouche, CO of the 117th Heavy Cruiser Squadron and the Republic of Haven Navy's senior officer in the Fordyce system, looked at her chief of staff and shook her head. Bit of overkill there, wouldn't you say?
she observed with ironic bitterness. I'm guessing their intelligence appreciation was off, McGuire replied. Up until Thunderbolt, we had a much heavier system defense force stationed here. He shrugged. Without an actual recon, before they dropped their damn destroyers and stealthed arrays in on us, they had no way of knowing the system picket had been so reduced. For what I'm sure seemed like a perfectly good goddamned reason at the time, Carmouche grated. She glared at the plot for several seconds, eyes fiery as she studied the blood-red rash of incoming enemy warships and the seven threadbare green icons of her own understrength squadron, and then her shoulders sagged visibly. There's nothing we can do to stop them, Alan, she said heavily. No, ma'am, there isn't, he agreed softly. Petra's already passed the word to Governor Dahlberg. Commander Petra Nielsen was Carmouche's operations officer, and the Commodore nodded in understanding and approval. I've been on the horn with Captain Watson myself, McGuire continued. Captain Diego Watson commanded the Fordyce LAC groups. He says his people are prepared to engage. In which case I might as well simply shoot them myself. Carmouche turned away from the plot at last. For Christ's sake, Diego has less than a hundred and fifty scimitars. If I commit him against these people, they'll blow him out of space before he even gets into his missile range of them. And just what the hell does he imagine he'd accomplish against super dreadnoughts, even if he got into range in the first place? Of course he wouldn't accomplish anything, ma'am. But what did you expect him to say? That he was ready to go in. Carmouche sighed, then shook her head wearily. And I suppose the rest of our magnificent task force is equally ready to get itself killed for absolutely nothing? They are if you ask them to, ma'am, McGuire said softly, and she looked at him sharply. He met her eyes steadily, and after a moment, she nodded. It does come down to that, doesn't it? She inhaled deeply. Well, Alan, as it happens, I'm not prepared to get all those people killed pointlessly. Half communications pass the evacuation order for all of the civilian platforms, as well as the fleet yard and repair station. If these are the same people who hit us last month, they're probably going to be careful about inflicting civilian casualties— but they might not be the same ones, so let's not take any chances. Aye, ma'am, McGuire said formally. Then turn the squadron around. We've got time to get out of the system before the mantis can range on us, but only if we start now. Any civilian starships who can evade are to do the same thing, but if the mantis bring them into range and order them to halt, they are to obey immediately. Make certain that's clearly understood. And the lax, ma'am? McGuire's voice was completely non-judgmental as Carmouche announced her intention of abandoning the star system to the enemy. They're to return to base immediately, and those base's personnel are to be evacuated dirt side as rapidly as possible, after which they'll blow their fusion plants, she replied flatly. I wish we had the personnel lift to pick up Diego's crews in passing, but we don't. And I very much doubt the Mantis brought along transports to haul prisoners home with them anyway. That would require a bit of gall, ma'am, McGuire agreed. On the other hand, look how close to Haven they're operating. I'm afraid gall is one thing they obviously aren't short on. Well, this is an anticlimax, Alistair McKeon observed to his chief of staff. Oh, and I can't get it right all the time, sir, Commander Orndorff said. The last time we looked, there was a sizable picket here. Obviously, times have changed. She shrugged philosophically. She was a substantial woman who produced a substantial shrug, and the tree cat on her shoulder flirted his tail in agreement with his person's observation. As if you know anything about intelligence appreciations, McKeon told the cat. Banshee made it all the way through the crusher with me, sir, 
Orndorff pointed out. You might be surprised what he picked up along the way. I might at that, McKeon agreed, chuckling as he remembered the first tree cat he'd ever met. Then he shook himself. All right, CIC is confident about its tracking data? He asked. Yes, sir, another voice said. It belonged to Commander Alakan Slovaki, McKeon's ops officer and a relative newcomer to his command team. Now Slovaki gestured at the master plot's display of the Fordyce system, indicating a small cluster of red dots accelerating rapidly towards the hyperlimit. That's all seven of the heavy cruiser's venturers arrays picked up, sir, he continued. And this, he pointed to another swarm of ruby light chips, is over a hundred lakhs returning to base. He shook his head. Their system commander, whoever he is, hasn't calmed us to announce he's standing down, but he's obviously intelligent enough to know what would happen if he didn't. And their missile pods? No word on those, sir. Probably the reason the system CO hasn't contacted you directly, Slovaki said. He's not prepared to stand them down as well, and he's afraid you might insist he do so. Damn straight I would, McKeon half growled. Then he shook his head. Not that I'd be inclined to commit any atrocities if he declined. Mind you, it'd be tempting, but Duchess Harrington would feed me to Nimitz one bite at a time if I did anything like that. That's probably an understatement, sir, Orndorff said with a ghost of a smile. Whatever. McKeon brooded over the plot for several more seconds, then nodded decisively. Okay, they're abandoning the system, or at least they aren't going to defend it with anything except the pods, and according to Venturer and Mandrake, they don't have more than a hundred or so of those. I'm going to assume they have at least twice as many as we've actually found, however, and if they don't want to get their lacks killed, I don't see any reason we should get ours killed either. Contact Admiral Corsini. I want only the katanas deployed, strictly in the missile defense role. We'll take Intransigent and Elizabeth in, covered by Gottmeyer's cruisers and the katanas. Corsini is to retain Atchison's cruiser division and the destroyers as a screen for the carriers and stay outside the hyperlimit. If any unpleasant strangers appear, she's to immediately withdraw and return directly to Trevor Star. We could probably sweep up the pieces faster with a couple of lack groups, sir, Orndorff pointed out in a diplomatic tone, and McKeon nodded. Yes, we could. On the other hand, a couple of SDPs can wipe out every significant platform out there in less than 15 minutes if we have to. I'm not going to send in the lax while holding the wallers out of missile range, and if I'm going to take the division in anyway, there's no point exposing shrikes and ferrets to potential lucky hits from the pods. If it takes us a little longer to do the job this way, so be it. Aye, aye, sir. Orndorff said, and waved Slovaki towards the flag bridge's comm section. Captain Ara Kelhovanian, acting commodore of the 93rd Destroyer Squadron, Republican Navy, glared at the master plot showing the icons of four Sealax, four battlecruisers, and seven destroyers and light cruisers sweeping inward from the hyperlimit of the Des Moines system. Sir, Governor Brookhammer is on the comm. Commander Ellen Stokely, the skipper of the destroyer RHNS Racer, and Hovanian's flag captain said quietly. Switch it to my display, Hovanian directed, and the small comm flat screen filled with the image of Governor Arnold Bruckheimer as the Commodore slid into his command chair. Commodore Hovanian, the governor said without preamble, what the hell are you still doing here? I beg your pardon? Hovanian's eyes narrowed in surprise. I asked you what the hell you're still doing here, Bruckheimer repeated flatly. Aside from the very high probability of getting yourself and all of your personnel killed, that is. Governor, I'm responsible for the defense of this system, and and if you try to defend it, you're going to fail, Bruckheimer interrupted brusquely. I can still read a tactical plot, you know. Hovanian had opened his mouth to reply hotly, but he closed it again with a click at the reminder that Bruckheimer was a retired admiral. Better, Bruckheimer said a bit more conversationally. Then he cocked his head to one side, his eyes compassionate. Commodore, Arakel, you just got dropped straight into the crapper through absolutely no fault of your own. 
If they'd waited another three weeks, we'd have had some significant reinforcements waiting for them. But they didn't, and you don't have a single capital ship under your command. There are exactly 26 cemeteries in this entire star system. I know even better than you just how thin our missile pods are stretched, and you've got less than half your own squadron present for duty. There's no way you're going to stop this with three destroyers, and... Bruckheimer's voice hardened around the edges once more. If you try and survive the experience, I will personally see you court-martialed. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir, Hovanian said after a long, still moment. Yes, sir, you do. Good. Bruckheimer ran the fingers of his right hand through his hair and grimaced. We're going to have to come up with some sort of response to this strategy of theirs, but I'm damned if I know what the Octagon's going to do about it. In the meantime, get your people out of here before they all get killed. Aye, sir, Hovanian said. He nodded to Stokely, who began issuing the necessary orders, then looked back at Bruckheimer. And thank you, sir, he said to the man who had just saved his life. I wonder what other systems they're hitting today, Admiral Brisson said. Maybe they aren't hitting any other systems, sir, Commander Claudette Gaillard, his chief of staff, said. Oh, please, Claudette. Brisson shook his head. I didn't say I thought they weren't, sir. I just pointed out a possibility. Theoretically, anything is possible, Brisson said. Some things, however, are more likely, or conversely, less likely than others. True, but... Gaillard paused as Lieutenant Commander Krenkel appeared quietly at her elbow. Yes, Ludwig, she said. We've confirmed it, Brisson's ops officer said. Assuming they haven't decided to try to spoof our identification for some reason, two of those ships are definitely a pair of the Invictuses that hit Hera. I'm guessing one of them is the Mantis' Eighth Fleet's flagship. Which means we probably are about to play host to the Salamander herself, Gaillard observed. There's an honor. You should pardon the pun. I could have done without. You and me both, Brisson said, remembering his conversation with Poikonen. Not that it's going to take any tactical genius to kick the crap out of us with this kind of force imbalance. Maybe not, sir, Crinkle said. On the other hand, there's a sort of backhanded compliment in getting pounded by the other side's best. Did I ever mention that you're a very strange man, Ludwig? Gaillard asked. Chapter 27 It looks like we caught them with their pants down, doesn't it? Vice Admiral Dame Alice Truman observed as her Task Force 81 accelerated steadily in system towards Vespasian, the inhabited planet of the Chantilly system. Yes, it does, Michelle Hankey agreed from the Vice Admiral's comm. Of course, I have this sneaky suspicion that it's supposed to look that way. Why, Admiral Hankey, I hadn't realized you had such a broad streak of paranoia. It comes from associating with people like you and Her Grace, Hankey said dryly. Then she continued more seriously. As Honor keeps pointing out, the peeps aren't stupid. And this time around, they don't have political masters insisting they act as if they were. They haven't had time to reinforce heavily, but Chantilly is a juicier target than Gaston was. It should have been more heavily defended to begin with, and they sure as hell had more hypercapable units in system than the three destroyers our arrays have picked up. Which suggests to my naturally suspicious mind that as soon as they realized we'd inserted those arrays, they went to full court stealth on their main combatants. It's what I'd do, Truman agreed. She drummed lightly on the arm of her command chair for a few moments, then shrugged. Our arrays are good, but their stealth systems have gotten a lot better, and any star system represents a huge volume. If you were going to hide your defensive task force, where would you put it? It's got to be close enough to protect the near-planet platforms, Hanky replied. Ninety percent of the system's industry is concentrated there, so there's no point deploying to defend any other area. Greyhound and Whippet swept the entire volume on this side of Aspasian very carefully, though. Even assuming they were stealthed, our arrays probably would have spotted them. 
but they have to base their deployment plans on the probability that we'll go for a least-time approach and figure they'll adjust if we do something else instead. So if I were looking for a good hiding place, I'd probably put my units on this side of the primary, but inside Vespasian's orbit. Far enough in system, the other side's remotes would have to do a flyby on the planet, and all of the bunches and bunches of recon platforms of my own I'd have concentrated covering the inner system before they could see me. But close enough so I could build an intercept vector headed out to meet an attack short of the planet. More or less what I was thinking, Truman murmured. To be perfectly honest, I'm less concerned about their warships than I am about their pre-deployed pods, Hanky said. They didn't have a huge number of them in Gaston, but that's the most cost-effective area denial system they've got, and we found out in Gaston that they're a lot harder to spot than we thought they'd be. It's pretty obvious, assuming we're right about where their starships are, that whoever's in command here's a pretty cool customer. Sneaky, too. I don't like to think about what someone like that could do with a big enough stack of system defense pods if she put her mind to it. Do you think their scouts spotted us, Ivan? It's too soon to say, ma'am, Commander de Castro replied. If they got close enough, if they looked in the right direction, if they got lucky, then yes. They probably know exactly where we are, but nothing Leonardo's sensor crews have picked up suggests they did. And we both know it's not going to make a lot of difference either way, he thought, looking affectionately at his admiral. I guess it's just the principle of the thing, Admiral Belfi said whimsically, as if she'd heard what he carefully hadn't said. Whether it does any good or not, knowing we managed to at least surprise them would do wonders for my own morale. Well, in that case, let's assume they're surprised until and unless we know differently, ma'am. So I want you to take point, Captain, Michelle Hankey said. I'm honored, the tall, gangly man at the other end of the comlink drawled in a maddening, aristocratic accent. Be interesting to see how well she does in her first action, too. She's got a lot to live up to, Hanky said. That she does, Captain Senior Grade Michael Overstegen agreed. In fact, I believe someone may have mentioned to me in passing that last Nike's first captain and XO had a little something to do with that. We tried, Captain, we tried. Despite Overstegen's sometimes infuriating mannerisms and sublime, one might reasonably say arrogant, self-confidence, Henke had always rather liked him. The differences between their families' political backgrounds only made that liking even more ironic, as had the fact that their fathers had loathed one another cordially. But not even the Earl of Goldpeak had ever questioned Michael Overstegen's competence or nerve, and she was glad he was senior to Captain Franklin Hanover, Hector C.O. She liked Hanover, and he was a good, solid man, but he wasn't Michael Overstegen, and Overstegen's seniority gave him command of Henke's third division. If ever there'd been a case of the right man in the right place, this was it, and she watched Nike and Hector crack on a few more gravities of acceleration. Winston Bradshaw and his two Saganami-class cruisers, HMS Edward Saganami and HMS Quentin St. James, closed up on Truman's carriers, while Hanky herself, with Ajax, Agamemnon, and the light cruisers Amun, Anher, and Bastet, followed in Overstegen's wake. She didn't want the interval between her own ships and Overstegen's division to get too great, but she wanted at least a few more seconds to react to any traps or ambushes Overstegen might trip. And she wanted to be sure she kept her ships and the four squadrons of katanas providing her close cover between Overstegen and the 200-plus peeplacks shadowing the Mantikaran ships. She looked at the tiny icons of the lacks on her plot, and once again she was tempted to roll pods. The small vessels were well within her powered missile envelope, but far enough out accuracy would be even lower than usual against Lax, and Agamemnon's weren't wallers. They had to watch their ammunition consumption carefully. I don't think they know where we are, ma'am, DeCastro said. It looks like they may suspect, though, 
and I'd say it's pretty definite that someone's figured out we're pretending we're a hole in space somewhere. Pity, Belfi replied. I'd hope they'd keep coming all fat and happy. Anyone care to speculate on whether or not they've deployed additional recon drones? Anything on the drones yet, Joel? Not yet, sir. Betty is still steering them into position, Commander Joel Blumenthal said from the small comm display connecting Overstegen to Nike's backup bridge. Joel Blumenthal had moved up from tactical officer to exec when Captain Overstegen had to give up HMS Gauntlet in order to assume command of Nike. Linda Watson, Overstegen's XO and Gauntlet, had no longer been available since she'd received a long-overdue promotion of her own to captain and taken over his old ship. And despite some people's possible qualms, Overstegen had brought along the newly promoted Lieutenant Commander Betty Gore to replace Blumenthal as Nike's brand-spanking new tactical officer. Competition for any slot on Nike's command deck had been fierce, but Michael Overstegen had a knack for getting the bridge crew he wanted. Which probably, Blumenthal reflected, had something to do with the results he consistently produced. I believe Admiral Henke's correctly deduced the other side's most probable position— Overstegen said now, tipping back in his command chair with a thoughtful expression. The question in my mind is precisely what they hope to accomplish. I imagine not getting shot at for as long as possible is pretty high on their list, sir, Blumenthal said dryly, and Overstegen gave one of the explosive snorts he used instead of a chuckle. No doubt it is, he said after a moment. At the same time, if that was all they wanted— the simplest thing for them to have done would be to have simply decamped. No. He shook his head. They've got something more than that in mind. He pondered for a few more moments, then looked at Lieutenant Commander Gore. Have we confirmed Greyhound and Whippet's numbers on the pods they did detect, Betty? No, sir. Gore looked up from her own console and half turned to face her CO. But as Commander Sturgis pointed out, his platforms had a very difficult time picking them up in the first place on passives, she reminded him. It's probably not too surprising there's a discrepancy. Perhaps not, but are our numbers high compared to his or low? Low, sir. We seem to be coming in at least 25% lower than his original numbers overall. That's what I thought. Overstegen said softly, and Blumenthal's calm image gave him a sharp look, one that turned suddenly speculative. Precisely, Overstegen said, then looked at his communication section. Lieutenant Patterson, I believe I need to speak to Admiral Hanke again. Would you be so kind as to see if she's prepared to take my call? I think Overstegen's onto something, ma'am. Michelle Hankey told Dame Alice Truman. But how could they have moved them without Sturgis's array seeing them? Truman's question was thoughtful, not dismissive. Very carefully, Hankey replied dryly. Truman made a face, and Hankey chuckled humorlessly. Seriously, ma'am, she went on after a moment. Think about it. Whoever this is, she's cool enough and she's thought far enough ahead to get her mobile units, aside from relax, into stealth before our race found her. Personally, I'm betting she did it as soon as her sensors picked up Greyhound and Whippet's hyper footprints, and I'm also betting she'd already decided what she was going to do with her pods if it came to it. So what she's probably been doing is quietly using some of that near-planet merchant traffic Sturgis reported to pick up and drop off previously deployed pods, if she did, I think we need to rethink our recon doctrine. Go ahead and park one or two in close and just let them sit? Yes, ma'am. Hanky didn't mention that she'd already suggested that modification, only to have the powers that were at Admiralty House shoot it down. They were concerned that a stationary platform would be more readily tracked down, especially since it would be inside most of the system's defender surveillance platforms, which would give them a far better chance of detecting the array's directional transmissions and triangulating on their source. Having the arrays localized and destroyed would have been bad enough, 
but the present generation of recon drones had all the Ghost Rider bells and whistles, including the very latest Graf Pulse comms and several other goodies Erewhon had never had to turn over to Haven in the first place. The possibility that one of them might be disabled without being destroyed, while slight, did exist, and Admiralty House strongly objected to the notion of handing the Star Kingdom's latest and best hardware to the other side for examination. I think you were probably right all along, Mike, Truman said after a moment. Certainly, if they did what Overstegen thinks they did, having a couple of platforms, or even just one, keeping a close, permanent eye on near-planet space would probably have caught them at it. Maybe. The question, though, ma'am, is what we do about it, Hanky pointed out. Well, I see two possibilities. First, we send in the lax. That means radically slowing your ship's approach while Scotty and his lack jockeys get themselves organized and catch up with you. Second, we go right on doing what we're doing. Which do you vote for? A variant of option two, Henke said without any appreciable hesitation. I don't want to waste any more time than we have to, since we don't know where any response force they've sent for is coming from, or exactly how long it's going to take to get here. What I propose is that I send the katanas ahead to catch up with Overstegen. Hopefully the bad guys won't have guessed we've taken a page from their own missile defense doctrine, but whether they have or not, 48 katanas should help out quite a bit. I don't know, Mike, Truman said dubiously. Scotty would only need a couple of hours more than Overstegen to get there, and shrikes and ferrets are a lot harder targets for their fire control than battlecruisers and a lot easier to kill if they get hit, Henke pointed out. Besides, we're already inside their powered missile envelope, if they're where we think they are. At the moment, they're not firing because we're still closing, and they're willing to wait until we give them better firing solutions. But if we suddenly break off, they're going to fire anyway, well before we could get a lack strike in close enough to start killing platforms. Since we've already stepped into their parlor, I think our best chance is to just keep going— offer Overstegen as the most attractive target, and back him up with the best missile defense capability we can. Truman thought some more. Then she nodded once, sharply. All right, Mike. Do it. They've definitely figured out roughly what we're doing with our main combatants, ma'am, Leonardo Erickson said. He tapped the projected vector CIC was throwing into the master plot. Look at this. The four squadrons of lax which had been glued tightly to the second Manti battlecruiser division were accelerating away from it, closing rapidly on the lead division. At the same time, some of the near-planet sensor platforms were beginning to pick up the shadowy ghosts of Manticker and recon drones. They weren't finding many of them, but that didn't mean they weren't there. The drones were hellishly difficult sensor targets at the best of times— the limited number they were actually seeing suggested there was probably a solid shell of them spreading out in front of the oncoming Manti starships, and CIC was doing its best to project where that shell was in three-dimensional space. The tracking crew's hard data was limited, but Belfi felt confident they'd gotten it effectively correct, and the shell they were projecting was aligned all too closely upon her own ship's positions. So, she said flatly, the question is whether we fire now, when it's pretty clear they haven't quite locked in our positions, or wait a little longer in hopes of improving our firing solutions. Opinions, anyone? She looked up from the plot. Ivan? Wait, Commander de Castro said quickly and positively. She cocked an eyebrow and he shrugged. We're so outgunned that one good shot is all we're likely to get, ma'am, he pointed out. That being the case, I'd like it to be as effective as we can make it. That's what Smoke and Mirrors was all about to start with. I see. Leonardo? She looked at her ops officer. Normally, I tend to agree with Ivan, Erickson said after a moment, but I don't like this. He indicated the steadily accelerating icons of the enemy lax once more. They've been careful to keep them between our known lack concentrations and the rest of their ships. To me, that suggests they're probably katanas in the escort role, but now they're sending them in along with their probe, 
and I'm wondering if they've evolved something like our Lack Fleet missile defense doctrine. If they have, then the people we're going to have the improved firing solutions on are also going to have significantly improved their defenses by the time we finally fire. On the other hand, ma'am, de Castro pointed out, the closer they get to us, the further they are from their main body, and if they are a sizable chunk of the Mantis Katana force, mass trapping them now might be the best thing we could do, especially since they also seem to have completely missed mirror box. Jennifer Belfi nodded slowly, and her senior staffers waited. She always invited opinions, careful to avail herself of the best advice available, and she always made the final decision herself. We wait, she said. Not as long as you'd probably like, Ivan, but long enough for our solutions to tighten up. I think we'll wait until their katanas, and I think you're right about what they are, Leonardo, are about ten minutes from matching vectors with their battle cruisers. I'd actually have liked to catch them close enough to engage our missiles with their counter missiles, but still too far out to use their laser clusters, but that's not going to work given the geometry. I think we'll go with a staggered launch, though. Staggered, ma'am? Erickson repeated. The first one to concentrate on their battle cruisers, she said with a thin smile. I'll want it heavy enough to get their attention pretty emphatically, too. Particularly, I'd like the katanas to commit as many as possible of their counter-missiles to stopping the first wave. Her thin smile grew vicious, and her staffers found themselves returning it slowly. Dagger One, Ramrod. Ramrod, Dagger One, Commander Dillinger replied. Go. Dillinger and his katanas were over five million kilometers in front of Scotty Tremaine's command lack and the rest of the carrier division strike, but there was no perceptible delay in their Grav Pulse FTL conversation. I'm getting that uncomfortable feeling between my shoulder blades, Crispus, Tremaine continued more informally. I don't know why, but I've got the feeling there's something nasty waiting out there. Uh, Ramrod, Dillinger said with a smile, I'm afraid I didn't quite copy that threat analysis. Could you repeat all after something? Dagger One, you're a smartass, Tremaine told him. Then his tone sobered. Seriously, Crispus, watch your six. I don't like how conspicuous these people's inactivity has been. I don't know exactly what they're up to, but they're up to something. That much I am confident of. Ramrod, I hear you, Dillinger responded, his smile fading. So far, though, I haven't seen a thing you haven't. I know. Tremaine frowned as he gazed at his own plot aboard Decoit. That's what worries me. Ramrod clear. Another ten minutes, I think, Jennifer Belfi said quietly. She stood beside Commander Erickson, gazing into the master plot of RHNS Cyrus, her battlecruiser flagship, at the icons of the oncoming warships. Even a few years before she knew, the Mantis would already have localized her own ships, opened fire, and almost certainly destroyed them by now but one of the Manti drones had passed within less than ten light seconds of her flagship and simply continued on its way, which made it obvious the improvements in the Republic's stealth systems were giving the enemy sensors a hard time. The fact that none of her starships had their wedges up and that all of them had gone to total emissions control undoubtedly helped, but even so, she felt the tension prickling sharper in her palms. Cyrus and her consorts were barely one light minute from Vespasian, and the Mantis were clearly looking for them hard. But they haven't found us yet, she reminded herself. So it's time to give them something else to think about before they do. Initiate decoy, she said. I, ma'am, Erickson said and nodded to the comm officer. Send initiate decoy. I have something, sir, Lieutenant Commander Gore said sharply. The Gamma 3 array is picking up what looks like stealth impeller wedges, bearing 349er, 009er from the ship, range approximately 56.8 million clicks. 
Michael Overstegen punched a command into the small-scale plot deployed from the arm of his command chair, and his eyes narrowed as the display zoomed in on the indicated datum. Nike and Hector were still 20,589,000 kilometers from Vespasian, but their velocity was down to a mere 5,265 kps as they continued to decelerate at a steady 5.31 kps squared. Their present flight profile would bring them to a halt relative to the system primary, one light minute short of the planet. That was close enough to bring all the near-planet orbital infrastructure into sufficiently short range to avoid any embarrassing accidents, like unintentional missile strikes on an inhabited world. But it was also far enough out to keep him at least two light minutes from his own estimate of the enemy's closest probable position. Commander Dillinger's katanas were continuing to close from astern. Their higher acceleration rate meant they'd been able to attain a higher base velocity before they began decelerating towards a rendezvous, and their current velocity was 6,197 kps. Their vectors would merge with Nike's in another 10 minutes, at which point they would both be down to a velocity of 2,079 kps and less than 400,000 kilometers from their planned zero-zero point, or about 18,400,000 kilometers from Vespasian. The new emission signatures Gore had picked up were just over two light minutes inside Vespasian's orbit. Assuming the ships responsible for the signatures had pods of multi-drive missiles, that would put his ships inside their effective range, but far enough out for Havenite accuracy to be very, very poor. Move the platforms closer, Betty, he said after a moment. And don't forget to watch the other approaches as well. Yes, sir. Jennifer Belfay watched her own plot, gray-green eyes slitted in concentration. It was impossible to tell whether or not the mantis had bitten, but the decoy emissions looked very convincing to her own recon platforms. She didn't have much faith in their ability to fool the mantis for long, but if CIC's projection of their recon shell's probable deployment was correct, it would take them precious minutes to get even one of their drones close enough to realize the units they were picking up were actually the recon variant of the scimitar. There were eight of them out there, each with a standard tether decoy tractored to it, and their only job was to leak enough of an impeller signature to keep the mantis looking in their direction just a little longer. Daggerflight will match vectors with us in about six minutes, sir. Lieutenant Commander Gore announced. Very good. Anything more on those impeller signatures? Not a lot, sir, but the arrays are closing in, and so far it looks like a half dozen or so point sources, maybe a few more. I see. Michael Overstegen grimaced. Over the years, he'd learned to trust his instincts, and those instincts told him something wasn't quite right. He looked back down at Blumenthal's face on the comm screen, deployed from his command chair. Why do you suppose these fellows are just sitting there, Joe? Blumenthal frowned. He gazed down into his own plot for a second or two, then looked back up. If they're planning to let us continue to close, which seems to be what they've been doing so far, then they're probably waiting until they're sure they've been detected, he said, in the tone of a man who wondered if he'd just been asked a trick question. Unless they're complete and total idiots, like my beloved cousin, Countess Fraser, Overstegen replied. They've got to have a pretty shrewd notion we've already picked them up. One thing Commander Sturgis was able to positively confirm is that the space around Vespasian is crawling with Havenite reconnaissance assets— do you seriously think we managed to get that many of our own drones right past the planet without any of those assets noticing as they went by? Well, no, sir. Of course, they are very stealthy. Yes, they are, Overstegen agreed dryly. But good as our stealth technology is, it's not yet perfect. And, much as it pains me to admit it, between what they got from the Erwanese and what they've probably managed to pick up on their own from examining captured hardware, our cloak of invisibility's probably just a tad thinner than any of us would like to think. 
I'm not saying they can get solid lockups on our platforms, but when we operate this many of them in such close proximity and so deep into the other side's sensor envelope, they're bound to pick up at least some of them. And if they've managed to do that, any tank officer worth his salt should be able to project our basic deployment pattern, in which case... They damned well ought to know that if they're sitting there with active impeller wedges, we're going to have picked them up by now. Put that way, sir, you may have a point, Blumenthal conceded. At the same time, they may be waiting until our platforms go active and they know we've got them. Maybe so, but why put themselves that far from the planet? Overstegen asked. It puts Vespasian outside their best MDM envelope by a considerable margin, which means they're risking an accidental hit on the planet if they engage us. They didn't have to let us this close to the planet in the first place. They ought to be at least a light minute closer, and if they aren't, then they ought to still be Lion Doggo. He shook his head. No, they've got something else in mind. He brooded down at the plot for a few more seconds, then looked up at Gore. Launch another shell, he said. I want to sweep this area again. He tapped a command into his armrest alphanumeric pad, highlighting the indicated volume of space on Gore's larger plot. Sir, I can recall the beta platforms to cover that volume, she pointed out. I'm certain you could, he agreed pleasantly. Unfortunately, that would require at least twenty minutes, and I want it swept now. Yes, sir. Gore beckoned to her assistant, and the two of them began punching in commands to deploy the specified drone shell to cover the area to the system north of Vespasian once again. Crap, Leonardo Erickson muttered as the fresh drones began deploying from the outsized Manti battlecruiser. So they didn't buy the decoys after all, De Castro said. No. Belfi shook her head. They bought them, for a little while at least, but whoever that is over there, she's a suspicious one, so she's double-checking the clear areas just in case. Well, they're going to pick us up, emissions control or no emissions control, in about another seven minutes, ma'am, Erickson pointed out. These two especially are coming straight down our throats. He tapped two light codes on his display, and this time Belfi nodded. Yes, they are, and they're about where we wanted them anyway. She straightened, inhaled deeply, and nodded to De Castro. It's time, she said. Missile launch, Betty Gore barked suddenly. Multiple missile launches. Overstegen looked up sharply as the deadly blood-red icons appeared on the master plot. Range at launch, 85.2 light seconds, Gore said flatly. Time to attack range, 6.13 minutes. Jennifer Belfay and her staff had devised the operational plan she dubbed Smoke and Mirrors in response to the Manticoran's first set of raids. Although Chantilly had been assigned a substantially heavier system defense force than Gaston or Hera to begin with, she'd known it was grossly insufficient to hold off attacks in such strength using any conventional defensive plan, so she'd had to go outside the box. Her six heavily refitted Warlord-class battlecruisers and three Trojan-class destroyers were the only hypercapable combatants she had— but she also had almost 600 scimitars and almost a 1,000 system defense missile pods to back them up. And she also had 240 standard MDM pods to go with it. The problem was that although the system defense pods outsized overpowered birds could actually slightly exceed Manticoran MDM's acceleration rates, her standard pods' missiles couldn't quite match them, and neither of them were as accurate as Manti missiles. In addition, what had happened in Gaston demonstrated that her lax simply could not mix it up with katanas, on Manti terms at least, and win. So she'd had to get creative if she wanted to do any good. 
The instant perimeter tracking picked up evidence the Mantis were scouting Chantilly, her battlecruisers, already in their pre-selected positions, had gone to stealth and strict emissions control under the smoke and mirrors operational plan. In addition, two-thirds of her total lack strength had gone to immediate readiness, but been restricted to its bases. She'd continued to operate 200 lacs normally, making certain the Mantis saw them, but 400 additional cemeteries, based on Vespasian's main space station and a dozen other innocuous orbital platforms, outwardly indistinguishable from any freight-handling facility, had stayed completely covert. Now, like any good magician, Belfay began her stage show by fixing her audience's attention firmly on the distraction she wanted it to see. Estimate 1,900 incoming, Lieutenant Commander Gore announced. Understood. Lieutenant Patterson, request Dagger One to expedite his arrival, if you please. Michael Overstegen's voice was as calm and drawling as ever as he watched the cyclone of missiles tear through space towards his command. Defense Plan Alpha, he continued, and HMS Nike and HMS Hector altered course. They rolled up on their sides to turn the bellies of their wedges towards the incoming fire, while keyhole platforms deployed far beyond the boundaries of their protective sidewalls and counter-missile defense solutions were already cycling. "'Looks like you had a point, sir,' Blumenthal observed quietly. "'Those—' He jabbed a hand at his own plot's icons representing the elusive impeller signatures. "'Have to be decoys.' Overstega nodded. The missiles coming at Nike and Hector had been launched from a point in space this side of Vespasian, and just under one light minute north of it, the next best thing to four light minutes away from Blumenthal's decoys. Obviously, they wanted to get us in as close as they could before launching, so they kept us looking somewhere they weren't, he agreed. But even as he spoke, something continued to bother him. All daggers, dagger one, Commander Dillinger snapped. Flyswatter, I say again, flyswatter. The 48 katanas of dagger flight changed acceleration in almost instant response. One moment they were decelerating at 700 gravities, 60,000 kilometers astern of Nike, and slowing neatly towards rendezvous. The next, they were accelerating at the same 700 gravities as they charged to catch up with and pass the battlecruisers. Although they were smaller and far frailer than any battlecruiser, they were also much more difficult targets for long-range missile fire, and they raced towards the enemy to place their own defensive missile launchers between the incoming MDMs and their targets. The Katanas are moving to intercept, ma'am, Erickson announced, and Rear Admiral Belfay jerked her head in combined acknowledgement and approval. The possibility of Cyrus's surviving the next half hour or so was remote, but she'd actually managed to put that out of her mind as she concentrated on the task in hand. "'Remind the Mirabox platforms that they do not launch without my specific order,' she said. "'I, ma'am.' "'Damn,' Michelle Henke said, far more mildly than she felt. The fact that her instincts had been correct didn't make her feel much better as she watched the massive missile launch sweeping towards Nike and Hector." Take us to maximum acceleration, she told Stackpole. Close us up on Overstegen and prepare to support his missile defenses. Aye, aye, ma'am, her ops officer said crisply. But it's going to be awfully long range for our CMs, he pointed out. And we're really too far out to coordinate with Nike and Hector. Even with FTL telemetry, we're simply too far away to data share effectively. I understand that, John, but worst case, any attack bird we kill is simply one over Stegen would have nailed anyway. And if we take out one he would have missed... Yes, ma'am. Stackpole began issuing orders, and Henke turned back to her own display. The ops officer was certainly correct about the dispersal problem, she thought. Her own battlecruiser division was two and a half million kilometers behind over Stegen. She had the reach, barely with the new extended-range countermissiles, to bolster his defensive umbrella, but her support would be far less effective from this far out. Still, something about the attack pattern. There aren't enough birds, Oliver Manfredi said suddenly. 
She looked up, turning towards the chief of staff, and Manfredi shook his golden head. There's less than 2,000 in the salvo, ma'am. That's less than 300 of their standard pods, so where are the others? Henke looked at him for perhaps three seconds, then spun her chair to face Lieutenant Kaminsky. Get me an immediate priority link to Captain Overstegen. Aye, aye, ma'am, the communications officer replied instantly. Weapons free, Commander Dillinger snapped, and the katanas of Daggerflight began punching countermissiles at the incoming fire. Dillinger didn't really like to think about just how expensive each of his lax countermissiles actually was. The systems built into the Viper for its anti lack role meant it cost twice as much as the standard extended range Mark 31 CM on which it was based. But the Viper retained the Mark 31's basic drive system, and a counter missile's impeller wedge was what it used to sweep up attack missiles. Which meant the Viper was still perfectly capable of being used defensively and earmarking a percentage of them for missile defense rather than using magazine space on dedicated Mark 31s, which couldn't be used in the anti shipping role, simplified their ammunition requirements and gave them a potentially useful cushion both offensively and defensively. Now the Vipers bored out of their launch tubes, streaking to meet the incoming missiles, and Dillinger smiled nastily. He was willing to bet the Peeps had never seen Lax kill missiles at this range. You were right, ma'am, DeCastro said. They do use those things for counter-missiles, too. Made sense, Belfay said almost absently, watching her plot. The signatures Admiral Beach recorded at Gaston made it pretty clear they were basically the same missile body and drive package after all. And it's a reasonable decision from the viewpoint of ammo supply, too, Erickson agreed, then showed his teeth. Of course, sometimes even the most reasonable decisions can bite you right on the ass. Especially if someone else helps it do it, DeCastro said with a tight answering grin. Tactical, Michael Overstegen said suddenly. Have the near-planet pods we've located launched? Sir? Lieutenant Commander Gore sounded startled. It took her a fraction of a second to shake her mind loose from the anti-missile engagement as the steady vibration of counter-missile launches shook Nike. The first wave of vipers from Daggerflight was beginning to rip holes in the Havenite salvo, and her own missile defense section was running at full stretch, analyzing the attack missile's EW patterns. But then she stabbed a quick look at a secondary plot, and Overstegen saw her twitch upright in her chair as the data registered. No, sir, she said, turning her head to look directly at him. None of this fire's coming from Vespasian orbit. That's what I thought, he said grimly. Come, get me dagger one. Sir, Lieutenant Patterson said, you have an immediate priority signal from Admiral Henke. Put it through, Jane, and get me dagger one. Aye, aye, sir. Michelle Hankey's face appeared on Overstegen's display, her expression tense. Michael, I'm looking at the missile density and... And it's too low, Overstegen broke in. We've just confirmed the near-planet platforms haven't launched a single bird. A window opened in the corner of his display, showing Crispus Dillinger's face. And now I've got to go. Overstegen told his admiral, and punched the button that brought Dillinger to the center of the display. Yes, sir, Dillinger said. There's something peculiar about their attack pattern, Commander, Overstegen said quickly. They're only using a fraction of their total missile power, and everything they're actually firing is coming from further away, with what have to be poorer targeting solutions. Sir? Dillinger looked puzzled, and Overstegen shook his head impatiently. They're trying to distract us, and quite possibly to lure us into expending countermissiles before their real attack. But this isn't a debate in society, Commander, Overstegen said. Abort your missile defense of this division now. Crispus Dillinger looked at the face on his communications display with something very like incredulity. The man had to be insane. There were almost a thousand missiles tearing down on each of his ships, and he wanted Dillinger to stop defending them? But... All daggers, he said harshly. Dagger one, abort Flaswater. Repeat, abort Flaswater. Missile Defense Alpha is now in effect. 
Well, it was nice while it lasted, Jennifer Belfay said, as the torrent of counter-missiles pouring from the katanas slowed abruptly to a trickle. She looked at Erickson. Estimates on their expenditure, Leonardo? Assuming they have the same basic magazine space as the manti-missile lacks we were able to inspect after Thunderbolt, and that these things are basically the same size as their standard counter-missiles, that has to be at least 50% of their total loadout, ma'am. Possibly as high as 60 if they've committed additional volume and mass to more point defense clusters as well. And they did a real number on our missiles with them, too, de Castro pointed out. Their kill percentages are damned close to twice what scimitars would have managed, even at much shorter ranges. True. Belfi nodded. On the other hand, there are less than fifty of them, and if Leonardo's right, they don't have a lot of missiles left. She gazed at the plot a second or two longer, then nodded again, crisply. Initiate phase two, Leonardo. HMS Nike twisted sinuously as the depleted missile storm tore down upon her and her division mate. The katanas had thinned it considerably before Overstegen ordered them to stand down. Of the 1,900 missiles which had launched, the Lax had killed 700. The battlecruiser's countermissiles killed 260, and another 150 or so simply lost lock and wandered off on their own. 312 more locked onto the Ghost Rider decoys Nike and Hector had deployed, and another 60 looped suddenly back towards the katanas, only to be ripped apart by the Lax point defense clusters. But that left 478, and as they streamed past the katanas, the battlecruisers were on their own. Overstegen watched them come, absolutely motionless in his command chair, narrow eyes very still. Thirty point defense laser clusters studded each of Nike's flanks. They were individually more powerful than any past Mantikran battlecruiser had ever mounted, with fourteen emitters per cluster, each capable of cycling at one shot every sixteen seconds. That came to one shot every 1.2 seconds per cluster, but that was only 25 per broadside per second, and these were MDMs. They had traveled over 25 million kilometers to reach their targets. Their closing speed was almost 173,000 kps, 58% of the speed of light, and they had a standoff attack range of 30,000 kilometers. They crossed the inner perimeter of the countermissile interception zone, losing another 117 in the process. Of the 361 survivors, 58 were electronic warfare platforms, which meant only 303 missiles, barely 15% of the original launch, actually attacked. The space about Nike and Hector was hideous with incandescent eruptions of fury, and bomb-pumped lasers ripped and gouged at their targets. But these battlecruisers had been designed and built to face exactly this sort of attack. Their sidewalls, especially Nike's, were far tougher and more powerful than any previous battlecruisers had mounted, and both of them were equipped with the RMN's bow and stern walls. The fact that they'd been able to keep their wedges turned towards the incoming fire even while they engaged it with their own counter-missiles presented additional targeting problems for the Havenite missiles' onboard systems. Instead of the broadside aspect ships were normally forced to show attack missile sensors, all these missiles saw was the wedge itself. But no sensor could penetrate a military-grade impeller wedge, which made it impossible for them to absolutely localize their targets. They could predict the volume in which their target must lay, but not precisely where within that volume to find it. And that was why Nike and Hector survived. The missile sensors could have seen through the battlecruiser's sidewalls, but the sidewalls were turned away from them. Most of them streaked above and below the Mantikoran battlecruisers, fighting for a look-down shot, while others crossed the Mantikoran's bows or sterns, trying for up-the-kilt or down-the-throat shots. Tough as Nike's passive defenses were, they were no match for the raw power of the Havenite lasers, but the very speed which made MDMs such difficult targets for short-range point defense fire worked against them now. They simply didn't have time to find their targets and fire in the fleeting fragment of a second they took to cross the Mantikoran ship's tracks. No damage, sir, Lieutenant Commander Gore announced jubilantly. None! Well done, guns, Overstegen replied. 
Captain Hanover reports one hit forward on Hector, sir, Lieutenant Patterson reported. No casualties, but she's lost one grazer and a laser cluster. Good, Overstegen said. In that case, let's... Missile launch, Gore said suddenly. Multiple launches, sir. I have lacked separation from in-system platforms. Overstegen's eyes flew to the main plot, and his jaw tightened as threat sources exploded across it. A fresh wave of MDMs had abruptly appeared, launched from the same spot as the first salvo. But this one was considerably more massive. The next best thing to 6,000 missile icons spangled the display, streaking towards his ships, and also Dillinger's Lax and Michelle Hankey's division, and Gore was right about the Lack launches as well. The 200 Task Force 81 had already known about went suddenly to full acceleration, charging towards the Manticorans, but twice that many more were erupting into space, turning towards Dillinger's katanas and the battlecruisers behind them. Overstegen glared at the innocent icons of the near-planet missile pods Gore's sensor crews had managed to locate. They hadn't launched yet, but they would, he knew. They were waiting until their missiles could join the missile storm coming in from further out. Their lower base velocities when they arrived would make them easier targets, but it would also give them better shots at their sidewalls, and there were probably at least another two or three thousand missiles aboard them. The tactician in him cried out to hit them with proximity-fused warheads to kill them before they fired, but they were too close to Vespasian. There was too big a chance a faulty firing solution would hit the planet itself or kill one of the unarmed civilian platforms and everyone aboard it. No, they were simply going to have to take it, and his expression was bleak as he watched the attack come in. It was unlikely that even this would destroy his ship. The one mistake whoever had planned the attack had made was in his targeting selection. He ought to have directed all of that fire at no more than one or two targets, not spread it among so many. But it was hard to fault him for that, when he probably hadn't realized just how tough the battlecruisers he faced truly were. And if he wasn't going to kill them, that didn't mean he wasn't going to hurt them badly. Which didn't even consider what was going to happen to Dillinger's katanas after they'd been mousetrapped into expending so many of their missiles against the first wave of MDMs. For just a moment, behind the armor of his eyes, Michael Overstegen felt a fleeting glow of admiration for his opponent. Whoever he was, he'd made maximum use of his limited resources— and Task Force 81's lead elements were about to get hammered. But the moment passed, and Overstegen straightened in his command chair. Defense Plan Alpha 3, he said calmly. Chapter 28 Reverend Sullivan Robert Telmaki, Archbishop of Manticore, walked across his spacious, sunlit office to shake hands as the bald, fierce-nosed visitor was ushered into it. This is an honor, Telmaki continued. And, if I may say so, a meeting I've hoped for for quite some time. Thank you, Archbishop. The head of the Church of Humanity Unchained shook the offered hand firmly. I, too, have looked forward to meeting you. Monsignor Davidson has been most satisfactory as your representative on Grayson, but given the intimacy of our two star nations' political relationship... He smiled, and Telmaki nodded with a smile of his own. Precisely, he said, escorting his guest towards an inviting conversational nook arranged in the office's huge floor-to-ceiling bay window. Of course he continued, his smile broadening as they sat. I don't have quite as much authority in the Star Kingdom's spiritual matters as you do in the Protectorates. You might be surprised, Sullivan said wryly. Our doctrine of the test makes for a certain spiritual obstreperousness. But obstreperousness can be a good thing— "'As long as you learn to pay attention to its causes,' Telmaki replied. "'We found that out the hard way in my own church. "'In fact, I believe we'd begun discovering it "'well before your own ancestors departed for Grayson. "'As did we with those lunatics on Masada. 
Sullivan said more grimly. Every faith has its moments of lunacy, Reverend. Telmaki shook his head sadly. The Inquisition, the Islamic terrorist movement, the New Athens Jihad, your own faithful. Extremism is no one's monopoly when faith turns to fanaticism. But no one faith has a monopoly on resisting fanaticism either, Sullivan replied. A point certain of my own predecessors have had difficulty remembering on Grayson, given Father Church's monopoly, he reused the word deliberately, on spiritual authority there. Perhaps, Telmaki said, yet I think no one could accuse you or Reverend Hanks of that. I've deeply admired the way both of you have grappled with the huge changes your society has faced in the wake of your alliance with the Star Kingdom. You mean, in the wake of our having been exposed to an entire galaxy of dangerous, if not downright heretical notions about radical things like women's rights? Sullivan corrected with an easy chuckle. Well, of course I did, but I'm far too diplomatic to ever say so. Both men laughed, but then Telmaki sat back in his chair, crossed his legs, and looked at his visitor thoughtfully. Your Grace, I'm truly delighted to meet you, and I see you're just as engaging in person as Monsignor Davidson's reports indicated, but I'm also aware... This is the first time in the history of Grayson any reverend has ever left the planet for any reason. I've issued all the expected press statements and news releases, and I've arranged to attend the meetings with representatives of all of our major religions and denominations which you requested. But I must confess... I wasn't very surprised when your staff contacted mine to suggest a private preliminary meeting between the two of us. You weren't? Sullivan asked, leaning back in his own chair. No, Monsignor Davidson is, as I'm sure you've discovered, as intelligent as he is charming. From certain questions which you'd asked him... He concluded you were particularly interested in establishing direct contact with me. He did not, however, suggest a reason for your interest, although I may have drawn a few conclusions of my own. Sullivan looked out the window at the sky-piercing towers of the City of Landing. It was a fascinatingly alien sight for any Grayson. Landing had been built by a counter-gravity civilization on a planet whose environment had welcomed mankind rather than attempting to repel the audacious invader. Its buildings towered far higher than any Grayson structure, and there wasn't a single environmental dome in sight. All that unobstructed sky was enough to make any Grayson nervous, especially when he watched the branches of the city Greenbelt's trees dance in the brisk morning breeze. The Reverend felt almost undressed, and his hand twitched as he suppressed the reflex to reach for the breath mask normally cased on the right side of his belt. The fact that airborne dust on Manticore didn't represent a dangerous toxic threat was something his intellect had accepted more readily than his emotions. And yet, as he looked at the moving air cars, the pedestrians, the sidewalk cafes he could see from where he sat, he saw much the same people, however bizarrely some of them were dressed, as he might have seen at home. He turned to gaze at the archbishop once more, and there, too, he found the alien mingled with the utterly familiar. He recognized Telmaki's personal faith and his genuine welcome, and Sullivan had deliberately immersed himself in studies of comparative theology since Grayson had been wrenched into the galactic mainstream. He saw in Telmaki the current heir to an apostolic succession stretching clear back to the dawn, the source of their shared faith in God. And yet, Telmaki's spiritual authority was far less than his own. His church had seen its uncontested primacy broken long before man ever left old earth, and it had come to terms with that. It had evolved, survived, 
reached out to the stars along with a multiplicity of other religious beliefs and ways of thought, which would have been totally bewildering to any Grayson. In many ways, he knew, Telmaki was far more cosmopolitan than he himself was. But was that strength, or was it weakness? And in Telmaki, did Sullivan see the reverence of Grayson's future? That lay in God's hands, the reverend told himself. One of the cardinal elements of the new way, perhaps the cardinal element, was the belief that the book was never closed, never ended. God was infinite. Man's understanding was not. And so there would always be more for man to learn, more for God to teach him, and as the doctrine of the test taught, it was best to pay attention to one's lessons, whatever the form in which they might come. Like his visit here today. Actually, Archbishop, he said, you're right. I see Monsignor Davidson's description of your own intelligence was accurate. I do have many pressing and completely valid reasons, as Father Church's spiritual head, for meeting with as many Manticran religious leaders as possible. For almost a thousand years, Grayson has been effectively a theocracy, a closed theocracy. Given our doctrines, our people have tended by and large to see the opening of the doors of our temple, as it were, as yet another of God's tests. There has been some friction, but less, I suspect, than there would have been on almost any other planet under similar circumstances. Still, as we've become more and more integrally involved with the Star Kingdom on a secular level, the influx of foreigners with their very foreign belief structures has swelled steadily. I see no reason to believe that tendency will reverse itself, and so I think it's probably past time Father Church reached out his hand to the Star Kingdom's religious leadership. There will undoubtedly be misunderstandings, or at least points of difference, but we must embrace the religious toleration which has always been a part of the Manticoran tradition. To that end, my visit to Manticor will have great significance for Father Church's members back home on Grayson. Yet while all of that is true, the reason I specifically asked to meet with you had less to do with the fact that you are, whether you choose to admit it or not, what I suppose I might think of as the senior member of the Manticoran religious establishment, than it did with a pastoral concern. Pastoral? Telmaki smiled. Let me see, he murmured. Now, what could it possibly be about? Hmm, could it be something to do with Steadholder Harrington and certain members of my own flock? Monsignor Davidson didn't do you justice, Your Grace. Sullivan said with an answering smile. It wasn't very difficult to guess, Your Grace, Telmaki replied, especially not in light of Dame Honor's stature on Grayson and the rather poisonous commentary of one of our less than scintillating examples of journalistic professionalism. Of course, the fact that she's neither Catholic nor a member of the Church of Humanity Unchained does leave both of us in rather a grey area where she's concerned. She may not be a daughter of Father Church, Sullivan said quietly, his eyes level. But of my own experience, I can tell you she is most certainly a daughter of God. I'll be honest with you and admit that nothing would give me greater joy than to have her embrace Father Church, but this is one woman for whose soul I feel no concern at all. That accords well with my own impression of her, Telmaki said seriously. I believe she's a third stellar? She is, which presents me with something of a problem, since the third stellars appear to have no organized hierarchy in the sense your church or mine does. The third stellars are actually rather like, I suppose, the Church of Humanity might have turned out, without a firmly established hierarchy, Telmaki said. When the representatives of all their congregations meet for their general convocation every three T years, they elect a leadership for the convocation 
and also the membership of a coordinating committee to function between convocations. But each congregation, and each individual member of each congregation, is personally responsible for his or her relationship with God. I'm on quite good terms with several of their clergy, and one of them compared their general convocation to an exercise in herding tree cats. Sullivan chuckled at the image, and Telmaki nodded. They agree about a great many core doctrines and issues, but beyond those central areas of agreement, there's room for an enormous diversity. I'd gathered that impression from my own conversations with Lady Harrington and her parents— Sullivan agreed. And I believe you're probably correct. The individualism the Third Stellars encourage does have many resonances with our own doctrine. Indeed, I've often thought that was one of the reasons Lady Harrington's been so comfortable with Father Church, despite our inevitable differences. However, the problem to which I referred was my inability to identify some one individual member of the Third Stellar clergy with whom to discuss my concerns— my impression of their doctrine is that it is extremely inclusive, but I must confess I'm less familiar with it than I could wish. If your concerns are what I suspect they are, Your Grace, Telmaki said, I think you don't need to worry. However, I'd be very happy to suggest two or three of their theologians with whom you might discuss your thoughts. I would Deeply appreciate that, Sullivan said, bending his head in an abbreviated bow of thanks. But that, of course, brings me to the reason I specifically needed to meet with you. Reverend, Telmaki said with another chuckle, Mother Church has learned a few lessons of her own over the millennia. I don't believe there will be any problems. So here you are, Dr. Allison Harrington said severely. And just what made you think you were going to be allowed to stay at a hotel, if I may ask? The Royal Arms Hilton is scarcely a mere hotel, my lady, Jeremiah Sullivan replied mildly as he stepped past a solemn Harrington armsman into the foyer of honor's Jason Bay mansion. He smiled, then bent over her hand and kissed it in approved Grayson style. Piffle, she shot back. I'll bet it was really just that you planned on stealing the towels, or one of those cute little bathrobes of theirs. The armsman seemed to cringe slightly, obviously awaiting the thunderbolt, but Sullivan only smiled more broadly as her eyes twinkled at him. It was the soup, actually, my lady, he said solemnly. I knew it! She gurgled a laugh and tucked her arm through his as she escorted him into the house. It's good to see you she said more seriously. And while I'm sure you really would have been perfectly comfortable at the Royal Arms, Honor and Benjamin would both have wanted my scalp if I'd let you stay there. Besides, I wouldn't have been that happy about it myself. Thank you, he said. Nonsense. She squeezed his arm tighter, and the laughter in her eyes was momentarily quenched. I still remember how comforting you were when we all thought Honor was dead. As I remember the day you explained to me why our birth rate has always been so skewed, he replied. On the day you and your team made your nanites available. Yes, well, now that we've both congratulated one another on what splendid people we are, Allison said, what really brings you to Manticore? Why, what makes you think I might have any sort of ulterior motivation? Sullivan fenced, accepting the change of subject with a smile. The fact that I have a functional brain, she replied tartly. He looked at her, and she snorted. In a thousand years, not one reverend has ever left the planet, not one. Now, three weeks after that poisonous toad Hayes's article must have reached Grayson, here you are. Allowing a week or so for travel time, you must have set some sort of galactic record for arranging this state visit of yours. I do hope... Sullivan said a bit plaintively, that my Machiavellian schemes aren't going to be this transparent to every Manticran I meet. Most Manticrans don't know you as well as I've come to, 
Allison assured him comfortably. And most other Mantecrans wouldn't begin to understand how damaging something like this could be to a political figure like Honor on Grayson. Or, she smiled warmly at him again, how deeply you care about my daughter. He inclined his head slightly, and she nodded. I thought so. You've come to straighten out the children's problems, haven't you? He burst out laughing, and she paused, turning to smile up at him until he shook his head. My lady, all of the children involved, including your daughter, are quite a few tears older than I am. Chronologically, perhaps, in other ways, she shrugged. And whatever your comfort of ages may be, they definitely need straightening out, which is why you're here, isn't it? Yes, Allison, he admitted, surrendering at last. I do intend to accomplish a few other things while I'm here, but, yes, mostly I came to straighten out the children's problems. Chapter 29 Tell me you've got some good news for a change, Armand, Thomas Theismann said moodily, as the naval chief of staff stepped into his office with a memo board clasped under his left arm. The only good news I've got is a follow-up report that Belfoy survived after all, Admiral Marquette replied. She did? Theismann perked up just a bit, and Marquette nodded. She and her entire staff got off Cyrus before the scuttling charges blew. We lost a lot of good people, but not her, thank God. Absolutely, Theismann agreed fervently. Of the four star systems Harrington had hit this time around, only Chantilly had mounted any effective resistance. Not for want of trying, he reminded himself grimly. Rear Admiral Bressand had done his best in Augusta, but he'd been totally outclassed and outgunned, and not as cunning as Jennifer Belfay. Harrington's pod layers had reduced his hyper-capable combatants to scrap metal in return for minor, if any, damage. And when his lax had closed with suicidal gallantry, they had discovered that the Mantis counter-missile tubes, at least aboard their newer construction, were perfectly capable of launching the dog-fighting missiles they developed for their damned katanas. It had been a massacre, and not one for which he could blame Brassand. A part of him would have liked to, and he could actually make a case for it if he really tried. After all, Brassand could have exercised his discretion and declined to engage such a massively superior force. But the reason that force had been so superior to his was that his own superiors, headed by one Thomas Theismann, had failed to adequately support him. Brassand had done his job with what he had— and like Belfi in Chantilly, he'd obviously hoped to inflict at least attritional damage on the raiders. And that, Theismann reminded himself, was probably a direct consequence of the staff analysis he'd ordered shared with all of his system commanders. Given the numerical advantage the Republic enjoyed, or shortly would enjoy, even an unfavorable exchange rate was ultimately in Haven's favor. He'd ordered that analysis disseminated because it was true, yet it had been much easier to accept its truth before so many thousands of Navy men and women had died in Augusta. "'Do we have a better read on the damage Belfi managed to inflict?' he asked Marquette, resolutely turning his mind away from Brassand. "'We hurt their lacks pretty badly, relatively speaking,' Marquette said. Then he grimaced. "'I can't believe I just said that.' Belfoy took out about seventy of their lacks, including fifty or so of their katanas, in return for just over five hundred of our own. As exchange rates go, that sucks, but it's the equivalent of about three quarters of one of their lack groups, and, much as I hate to say it, we can replace our personnel and material losses more easily than they can. On the starship side, we didn't do as well. "'Mostly because those damned new battlecruisers of theirs "'are a hell of a lot tougher than a battlecruiser has any right being. "'We hammered one of their pod layers pretty badly. "'Her wedge strength was down, "'and she was venting a lot of atmosphere by the end. "'Belfoy's as a main target, "'that big-assed battlecruiser that just has to be "'this new Nike we've been hearing rumors about, "'got off with what was probably only minor damage.' "'Marquette shook his head, his expression rueful. That's a very tough ship, Tom, 
And they appear to have armed her with that new, smaller MDM Navin's also been hearing about. By the way, that's how the staff winnies figure they've managed to cram so many missiles into their battlecruiser pod layer's pods. They're using pods big enough to fire all-up missiles, but loading them with these smaller ones. It costs them something in total powered envelope, but it also increases their throw rate, and accuracy at extreme range is so poor the heavier fire more than compensates across the effective envelope. And the reports that they are somehow firing both broadsides simultaneously from their more conventionally armed ships, and doing it while they are rolled on their sides relative to their target to boot, seem to be confirmed. Wonderful. Theisman turned his chair to gaze out the window behind his desk at the massive towers of the city of Nouveau Paris, all of them freshly refurbished and properly maintained for the first time in his memory. Clean windows glittered in the slanting rays of the westering sun, air cars and air buses moved steadily in the traffic lanes, and the walkways and pedestrian slideways were crowded with busy, purposeful people. It was a scene of rebirth and revitalization, of rediscovery, of which he rarely tired, but today his expression was profoundly unhappy. "'How are we going to respond, Tom?' Marquette asked quietly after a moment, and Theismann's expression turned unhappier still. He stared out the window into the sunset for several more seconds, then turned back to face the chief of staff. "'We've got two options. Well, three, I suppose. We could do nothing, which wouldn't exactly sit well with Congress or the public at large.' We could immediately launch a general offensive, which might succeed, but probably wouldn't, at least until we've got more of the new construction up to speed and ready for action, and which definitely would entail heavy casualties, or we dust off the contingency plans for Operation Gobi and hand it to Lester. Of the three, my gut reaction is to favor Gobi, Marquette said. "'especially given the intelligence we've managed to gather "'and the operational data D'Amato brought back. "'I think I agree with you, but that doesn't make me extraordinarily happy. "'It's going to divert us and disperse at least a sizable fraction "'of the striking force we've been working so hard to build up. "'Worse, it's going to take at least three weeks or a month for Lester "'to get it up and running. "'If the Montes stick to their apparent operational tempo, "'that means they'll hit us again at least once while we're hitting them.' We could have him try something a little more extemporaneous. Marquette didn't seem especially pleased by his own suggestion, but he continued anyway. He's got Second Fleet's core organization just about set up, and he's got a nucleus of experienced units to go with the new ones. He could probably slice off a battle squadron or two for a quick and dirty, off-the-cuff job if we told him to. No. Theismann shook his head firmly. If we hand him Gobi, and I think we're going to have to, he gets time to set it up right. I saw too many operations fucked up when the old management decided to improvise and demand miracles. I won't send our people in without adequate time to prepare unless there's absolutely no other alternative. Yes, sir, Marquette said quietly, and Theismann smiled almost apologetically at him. Sorry, didn't mean to sound like I was biting your head off. I think maybe I'm using you to rehearse what I'm going to wind up saying in front of the Naval Committee when it wants to know why we haven't already kicked the Monty's asses. I suppose it shouldn't really have come as a surprise that a genuine representative government's no more immune to the but-what-have-you-done-for-me-recently syndrome than the legislature lists were, Marquette said sourly. No, it shouldn't have but it's still a lot more satisfying to work for, and at least we don't have to worry about being shot, just fired. True. Marquette stood for a moment, rubbing his chin thoughtfully, then cocked his head. Actually, Tom, he said slowly, there may be a fourth option, or at least one we could try in conjunction with Gobi. Really? Theismann regarded him quizzically. Well, Lewis and Linda have handed me their tea leaf readers' best guess as to the most threatened systems. Their report is full of qualifiers, of course. 
not so much because they're trying to cover their asses as because they really don't have a good predictive model. They're having to use more intuition and old-fashioned wags than number crunching at this point, and they don't like it. Despite that, though, I think they're on to something. Tell me more, Theisman commanded, and pointed at one of the chairs facing his desk. Basically, Marquette said, sitting obediently, they tried looking at the problem through Manti eyes. They figure the Mantis are looking for targets they can anticipate will be fairly lightly defended, but which have enough population and representation to generate a lot of political pressure. They're also hitting systems with a civilian economy which may not be contributing very much to the war effort, but which is large enough to require the federal government to undertake a substantial diversion of emergency assistance when it's destroyed. And it's also pretty clear that they want to impress us with their aggressiveness. That's why they're operating so deep. Well, that and because the deeper they get, the further away from the frontline systems, the less likely we are to have heavy defensive forces in position to intercept them. So that means we should be looking at deep penetration targets, not frontier raids. All of that sounds reasonable. Theismann said after considering it. Logical, anyway. Of course, logic is only as good as its basic assumptions. Agreed, but it's worth noting that two of the systems they predicted might be it were Des Moines and Fordyce. They were? Theismann sat a bit straighter, and Marquette nodded. And Chantilly was on their secondary list of less likely targets. That is interesting, on the other hand, how many other systems were on their lists? Ten on the primary list and fifteen on the secondary. So they hit three out of a total of twenty-five, twelve percent. Which is a hell of a lot better than nothing, Marquette pointed out. Oh, no question, but we could fritter away an awful lot of strength trying to cover a list of systems that long without being strong enough in any one place to make a difference. That wasn't really what I had in mind. Then tell me what you did have in mind. You and I, and our analysts for that matter, agree that these raids represent what's basically a strategy of weakness. They're trying to hurt us and throw us off balance for a minimal investment in forces and minimal losses of their own. So I would submit that we don't really have to stop them dead everywhere— we just have to hammer them really hard once or twice, hurt them proportionately worse than they're hurting us. All right, Theisman nodded. I'm in agreement so far. Well, Javier's doing a lot of expansion work too, if not as much as Lester. He's been discussing training missions and simulations to fit his new units into existing battle squadrons and task group organizations— and he'd really like a chance to try some of his task force and task group commanders in independent command before it's a life-or-death situation. What if we were to take, say, three or four, maybe a half dozen of those task groups and pull them back from the front? We're not going to be committing them to offensive action anytime soon, and it's obvious the Mantis aren't going to launch any frontal assaults when they're running this sensitive about losses. So it wouldn't weaken our offensive stance, and it would give us some powerful forces close to likely targets, plus an opportunity to test and refine our new tactical doctrines. Hmm. Theisman gazed into space, the fingers of his right hand drumming lightly on his blotter. He stayed that way for quite some time, then refocused on Marquette. I think this has possibilities, he said. I should have thought of a similar approach on my own, but I guess I've been too fixated on maintaining concentration instead of swanning around in understrength detachments the way we used to operate. There are still some risks involved, though— a strategy of weakness or no, this is clearly their first team we're talking about. If it weren't, Harrington wouldn't be in command of it. So it's not something we want to throw green units in front of. I was figuring we'd use detachments working up a relatively smaller percentage of new units, Marquette replied. And while I'm thinking about it, 
I think it would be a very good idea to put Javier himself in position to cover the system we think is most likely to be it. Now that is a very good notion. Theisman nodded enthusiastically. He's still kicking himself over Trevor Star, and pointing out to him that he's being wise with the benefit of hindsight doesn't seem to help much. It'd make a lot of sense for him to be involved in training his own squadrons, and if he just happened to kick the ass of a Manti raid... That's what I was thinking, Marquette agreed. It would do a world of good for his confidence, and the shot in the arm it would provide for public and fleet morale wouldn't be anything to sneer at either. And if we get some of Shannon's new goodies deployed to help him out, things could get hot enough for even the salamander to think twice about climbing back into the oven again, Theisman said. He thought about it again for several seconds, then nodded once more. Sit down with Linda. Draft me a preliminary plan for it by tomorrow afternoon. Chapter 30 Excuse me, Your Grace. Honor paused in her conversation with Mercedes Brigham, Alice Truman, Alistair McKeon, and Samuel Miklosh, and one eyebrow rose in surprise. It was very unlike James McGinnis to insert himself into a serious meeting like this. He was a past master at unobtrusively refilling coffee and cocoa cups, sliding food in front of people when they started looking peaked, and otherwise keeping them provided with whatever they needed. But the key word was unobtrusively. Most of the time, people never even realized he'd been there until he was already gone. That was her first thought. Her second was more concerned as she tasted his emotions. "'What is it, Mac?' she asked, as Nimitz sat upright on the back of her chair and pricked his ears at the man who still insisted on functioning as Honor's steward. "'You have a personal message, Your Grace, from your mother.' Honor stiffened, eyes darkening with concern. "'I have no idea what it's about,' he continued quickly, "'but it came up in the standard mailbag from Jason Bay. "'If it were really bad news, "'I'm sure it would have been delivered by special courier.' For that matter, Miranda would have dropped me a line about it as well. You're right, of course, Mac, she said, smiling in thanks for his reassurance. On the other hand, Your Grace, he said, it does carry a priority code. I really think you ought to view it as soon as possible. I see. McGinnis bobbed his head and withdrew, and Honor frowned thoughtfully for a moment. Then she shook herself and returned her attention to her guests. I think we're just about at a decent stopping point anyway, aren't we? She said. I think so, Truman agreed. We need to spend a little more time kicking around what happened at Chantilly, but we can do that later. I'd never heard of this Admiral Belfi until she screened me after the shooting was over to thank us for arranging the full evacuation of the civilian platforms before we blew them. She was floating around in a pinnace, or maybe even a life pod, for most of that time, I understand, but I think we need to bring her name to O&I's attention. This woman is sneaky, Honor. She reminds me a lot of what you've said about Shannon Foraker, and if she'd had better information on our defensive capabilities, we'd have gotten hurt a lot worse. It was bad enough anyway, McKeon growled, shaking his head. Hector's going to be out of action for at least three months. I know, I know, Truman sighed. But at least Hanover's personnel casualties were light. To be perfectly honest, I'm more distressed by what happened to my katanas. We managed a four- or five-to-one exchange rate even after Belfi tricked us into firing off so many of their missiles, but that's pretty cold comfort. And she looked at Honor. Scotty blames himself. That's ridiculous, McKeon said sharply. I agree entirely, Truman replied. The deployment decision was mine, not his, not my Kenkies, but mine. Given what I knew at the time, I'd do the same thing again, too. But Scotty seems to think he should have argued with me, although exactly what form of clairvoyance was supposed to tell him this was coming eludes me. And how is Mike taking it? Honor asked quietly. Better than I was afraid she might, actually, Truman said. She's not happy about it, and especially not about the fact that she was the one who suggested using Hector and Nike as her point. But the truth is that she was right. 
Hector may have gotten hammered, but her core hull was never penetrated, and she and Nike stood up to missile attack even better than Bu ships predicted they might. And if Dillinger hadn't used up so many of his vipers defending Overstegen's division, he'd have made out much better against the people axe. I think she's drawn the right conclusions. Honor nodded. She knew both Truman and McKeon well enough to be confident they understood why she was concerned without getting any more specific. I hope you and she both have, she said aloud, smiling wryly at Truman. The two of you are developing a nasty habit of always finding the feistiest system defense forces. I'd appreciate it if you'd cut that out. Hey, you're the one assigning the targets, Truman shot back. Well, you and Mercedes here. Don't blame me, Brigham protested. My idea of how to assign the task forces was to pull system names out of a hat. For some reason, neither Andrea nor her grace thought that was a wonderful idea. Nonsense, Honor said as the other admirals laughed. What I said was that it didn't seem very professional, and it wouldn't do very much for the public's confidence in the Navy if we did it that way and word got out. As long as it works as well as it seems to be working so far, I don't think they'd have any problems, McKeon said, and Truman and Miklos nodded in agreement. Then let's keep it that way, shall we? Anna replied. And on that note, I think we should probably adjourn and let me find out what's on Mother's mind. Alice, could you have dinner with me this evening? And invite Mike and Overstegen along? For that matter, bring Scotty and Harkness, too. I haven't seen either of them in a while, and their perspective on something like this is almost always worth getting. Let's go over it with all of them in person. As you say... We need to get a better feel for what Belfi did to us, and I'd like to give Mike and Overstegen especially a chance to talk out their own reactions to it. I think that would be a good idea, Truman agreed. In that case, people, let's be about it. Hello, Honor, Allison Harrington said and smiled from Honor's display. We got the news about your return this morning, Hamish screened from Admiralty House to tell us you and Nimitz are back safe and sound. Obviously, we're all delighted to hear that, some even more than others. She smiled again, wickedly, but then her expression grew more serious. I'm sure you have all sorts of Navy things you need to attend to, but I think it would be a very good idea if you could come home for a day or two. Soon. Honor felt herself tightening internally. Nothing about her mother's expression suggested anything terrible, but she was a little surprised to realize how much it bothered her to be able to taste Allison's emotions from the recorded message. Had she become that reliant upon her odd empathic capabilities? There are several reasons I feel that way, dear, Allison continued. Among them, the fact that Reverend Sullivan's extended his visit to the Star Kingdom. They were going to put him up at the Royal Arms, but I put a stop to that— and he's been comfortably ensconced here at the Bay House. I'm sure that one reason he stayed over longer than he originally planned was to see you before he returns to Grayson. So take care of anything you really need to deal with, and then hop one of the shuttle flights home as soon as you can. We're all really eager to see you. I love you. Bye. The display blanked, and Honor frowned. A lifetime's instincts told her there was more to her mother's request than a simple desire for her to have dinner with Sullivan before the Reverend went home. Not that that wouldn't have been a perfectly valid consideration, it just wasn't the only thing on her mother's mind, and she wondered exactly what sort of devious scheme was revolving inside that agile brain. Unfortunately, there was only one way to find out, and she punched a button on her comm. Admiral's Quarters, McGinnis speaking, a voice said. Mac, please check my calendar with Mercedes. You and she both know what I'm doing better than I do anyway. I need to clear a couple of days, the sooner the better, for a quick hop back to Manticore. I thought you might, ma'am. Even across the voice-only circuit, Honor could almost feel his satisfaction. I've already checked. I believe that if you shift a few of your meetings, and possibly combine the meetings you'd scheduled with the division and squadron commanders into a single session— you could be on the evening shuttle flight tomorrow. Would that be satisfactory? And have you already discussed your proposed agenda with my chief of staff, O oh puppet master? Not in any specific detail, ma'am. McGinnis's dignified response was somewhat flawed by the chuckle lurking in its depths. 
Well, do so. Of course, Your Grace. There's the limo, my lady. Honor turned her head, looking in the indicated direction, and saw Jeremiah Tenard, the senior of Faith's personal armsman, standing beside the door of one of the VIP lounge's private aircar stages. So I see, Andrew, she said and chuckled. I wonder how Mother pried him loose from fending off assassination attempts on Faith to send him after us. Actually, Andrew Lafolle said seriously, we have a very good team in place at the house, especially since Captain Zilwicky upgraded our electronic systems for us. He's not really running any risks leaving her uncovered, my lady. You know I wouldn't tolerate that, don't you? Andrew, it was a joke, she said, turning back to him. I didn't... She stopped speaking as she tasted her personal armsman's emotions. No one looking at his expression could doubt for a moment the earnest seriousness of his response to her question. She, however, had certain additional advantages, and her eyes narrowed. All right, she told him. You got me. For a minute there, I actually thought you were serious. My lady, he said in shocked tones, I'm always serious. You, Andrew Lafolle, she said severely, have been hanging around with Nimitz entirely too long. His questionable excuse for a sense of humor seems to have infected you. Nimitz bleaked a laugh on her shoulder, and his hands flashed. The first two fingers of his right true hand closed onto his thumb, then the hand rolled over, palm downward, and folded into the sign for the letter N and jerked slightly downward. Next it rose to his temple, curled into the closed fist sign for the letter E, and moved forward. Both true hands folded their fingers over in the palm-up sign for the letter A, then swung inward and down twice, ending palm down. The right hand extended all three long, wiry fingers, while the left hand extended only two, signing the number five in one of the compromises forced upon the tree cats by the fact that they had fewer digits than humans did. Next, both true hands rose, slightly bent, fingertips just touching his chest, and the right hand flicked back slightly before turning to form a palm-out A that moved slightly to his right. Then the two opened fingers of the letter P circled his face before the right true hand touched its fingers to his chin, then dropped into the palm of his left true hand. The bent second finger of his right true hand tapped behind his ear, then fell to meet his left true hand as he linked the thumb and first fingers of both hands before raising both hands to the corners of his mouth in the H sign. So there was no need for you to infect him since he already had a good sense of humor? Honor said. Nimitz nodded and raised his right true hand, palm in, to press his forefinger to his forehead, then twisted it into a palm-out position before it closed into the upright, thumb-extended fist of the letter A. Then he held up two fingers and patted the thigh of his right leg with his right true hand, formed into the extended forefinger and thumb of an L. "'Oh, for a two-legs, is it?' she demanded, and he nodded again even more complacently while she shook her head. You're writing for a fall there, Stinker. Besides, I know your sense of humor, and I don't think the sign for good means quite what you think it does. The cat only looked away, flirting his tail airily, and La Follet chuckled. Don't take that as a compliment, Honor told him darkly. Not until you've discussed some of his ideas of what constitutes a joke with the Harrington House staff, at any rate. Oh, I have, milady, La Follet assured her. My favorite was the one with the stuffed tree cat and the cultivator. Stuffed tree cat? Honor's eyebrows arched, and he chuckled again. They were using the robotic cultivators to trench for the new irrigation system, the armsman explained. So Nimitz and Farragut kidnapped one of the life-size stuffed tree cats from Faith's bedroom. They didn't, Honor began, dark eyes starting to laugh, and La Follet nodded. Oh, but they did, my lady. They used those sharp little claws of theirs to disconnect the front and back ends, then burrowed down on either side of the trench and left the tail sticking up on one side and one poor, pathetic true hand poking up on the other. The assistant gardener almost died on the spot when he found it. Stinker, Honor said, as severely as a sudden attack of giggles would permit, when they finally come for you with pitchforks, 
I'm not going to protect you from the mob. I hope you realize that right now. Nimitz sniffed, elevating his muzzle. Timothy Mears had hopped the same shuttle flight back to Manticore with his admiral, and he laughed out loud. Honor gave him a glare and shook her head at him. A proper flag lieutenant does not encourage his admiral's cat in the ways of evil, Lieutenant Mears. Of course not, ma'am, Mears agreed, eyes twinkling. I'm shocked that you should think I would even consider doing such a thing. Sure you are, Honor growled. Then she smiled at him as Tenard started across the lounge towards them. As Andrew says, our ride is here, Tim. Can we drop you anywhere? No thanks, ma'am. I'll catch a cab. I need to do a little shopping before I head home to surprise Mom and Dad. All right, then you'd best be about it, she said, and he smiled back at her, saluted, and trotted off just as Tenard reached them. Milady, Colonel? The armsman bowed to Honor in greeting. Jeremiah! Honor nodded back. It's good to see you. And you, milady. We've missed you, all of us. Especially Faith, I think. How is she? Honor asked. Excited about her new nephew, Tenard replied with a smile. Is she really? Really, milady, Tenard said reassuringly. Don't forget, she's seen what Bernard Raoul has to put up with, and she's a smart child— She's already figured out that she's been getting off light where her own security detachment is concerned, compared to most Stettholder's heirs, and I don't think she really wants to have to put up with any more of us armsmen than she has to. At this particular point in her life, avoiding that is a lot more important than being Stettholder Harrington could ever be. Good, Honor sighed. Then she smiled. And I suppose you're here to ferry me off to meet the Reverend at the house? To meet the Reverend, yes, my lady, but not at the Bay House. You and your parents are having dinner at Whitehaven this evening, and he's joining you there. He's what? Honor blinked, but Tenard only shrugged. That's the itinerary I was given, my lady. If you want to argue with your lady mother about it, you go right ahead. I have better sense. Mother's been a terrible influence on all of you armsmen, Honor said. I don't remember you being this uppity before she got hold of you. It's all purely self-defense, milady, I promise, Tenard said earnestly, and she laughed. That I can believe. All right, if it's Whitehaven, it's Whitehaven. Let's get this cavalcade in the air. What the? Timothy Mears jerked back as he opened the air cab door and got hit in the face with an eye-stinging spray of moisture. Oh, shit, a voice said, and he blinked his burning eyes, then found himself glaring somewhat blearily at the cabbie on the other side of the opened partition between the cockpit and the passenger compartment. She was an attractive, if not spectacular, blonde, and she held a bottle of commercial air freshener in one hand, still pointed almost directly at Mears. She also wore an expression of almost comical dismay. "'I'm so sorry, Lieutenant,' she said quickly. "'I didn't see you coming, and my last fire was a smoker.' She shook her head in angry disgust. Big sign right there. She jabbed her head at the no smoking in this vehicle notice on the partition. And the jerk sits right down and lights up. A cigar of all damn things, and no very expensive one from the stank. The air freshener scent was almost overpowering, but as it began to dissipate, Mears could smell the tobacco reek to which she'd referred. And he admitted it really was pretty bad. So I was just turning around to spritz some of this stuff. She waved the air freshener. And you opened the door and, well... Her voice trailed off, and her expression was such a mixture of dismay and apology that Mears had to laugh. Hey, I've had worse happen, okay? He said, wiping the last film of air freshener off his face. And you're right. It is pretty ripe back here, so I'll just stand back and let you spray away to your heart's content. Oh, gee, thanks, she said, and applied the air freshener industriously for several seconds. Then she sniffed critically. That's about as good as it's going to get, I'm afraid, she said. You still want a ride, or do you want to wait for something that smells a little fresher? This smells just fine to me, Mir said, and climbed into the cab. Where to? she asked. I need to do some shopping, so let's hit Yardman's first. You got it, she agreed, and the cab whined away towards the capital's best-known shopping tower. Behind it, 
a nondescript man watched it with carefully incurious eyes, then turned and walked away. Hello, Nico, Honor said as Nico Havenhurst opened the front door for her. You seem to have quite a mob out here this evening. Oh, it's been more crowded than this upon occasion, Your Grace, Havenhurst said, stepping back with a welcoming smile. Not in the last few decades, you understand, but... He shrugged and Honor chuckled. Then she stepped past him into the entrance hall and paused in mid-stride. Emily, Hamish, and her parents were there. So was Reverend Sullivan, but Honor had expected that. What she hadn't expected was the distinguished dark-haired man in the Episcopal purple cassock and glittering pectoral cross. She recognized him almost instantly, although they'd never met, and she wondered what Archbishop Telmachy was doing at Whitehaven. Surprise kept her focused on him for at least a few heartbeats, long enough for her feet to get reorganized and resume carrying her forward. She'd just noticed the younger man standing at Telmachy's elbow and recognized him as Father O'Donnell, Emily and Hamish's parish priest, when the mingled flow of the welcoming committee's emotions swept over her. There were too many individual sources for her to analyze their feelings clearly, but Hamish and Emily Strand stood out more clearly than those of anyone else, including her parents. She felt herself reaching out for them as automatically as breathing, and then both eyebrows rose as she tasted the mingled love, determination, apprehension, and almost giddy anticipation rising off of them like smoke. Obviously, she'd been right to suspect her mother was up to something, but what? Hello, Honor. Emily said calmly, reaching out her hand. It's good to see you home. The meal, as always, was delicious, although Honor decided Mistress Thorne could have taught Tabitha Dupuy a thing or two about poaching salmon. The company had also been convivial, and Honor was pleased by the genuine friendship and mutual admiration she tasted between Sullivan and Telmachy. The Star Kingdom was legally non-denominational, with a specific constitutional bar against any state religion— Despite that, the Archbishop of Manticore was recognized as the Dean of the Manticoran Religious Community, and she was glad he and Sullivan had hit it off so well. But despite that, and despite her happiness at being home, she found it increasingly difficult not to select someone at random to strangle as supper went on and on, and the strange combination of the Alexander's emotions and her parents, and even Sullivan's, now that she thought about it, continued to swirl about her. She still didn't have a clue what they were all so energized about, which was maddening enough, but what made it even more maddening was her absolute confidence that it all focused on her somehow. At last, finally, the dessert dishes were cleared away, the servants withdrew, and the Alexanders and their guests were left alone around the huge table. It was the first time Honor had ever eaten in Whitehaven's formal dining salon, and despite its low ceiling and ancient wood paneling, she found it just a bit overpowering. Possibly because it was half the size of a basketball court, or seemed that way at least, after the more intimate quarters in which she, Hamish, and Emily normally dined. Well, her mother said brightly as the door to the serving pantry closed, here we all are at last. Yes, Honor said, handing a last celery stalk to Nimitz. Here we are indeed, mother. The question in my mind, and it does appear to be in my mind alone, since everyone else at this table obviously already knows the answer, is why we're all here. Goodness, Allison said placidly and shook her head. Such youthful impetuosity, and in front of such distinguished guests, too. I might point out that the guests in question are Hamish and Emily's, not yours, mother, Anna replied. Except, of course, that whenever someone is pulling the strings and you're present, I never have to look very far for the puppet master. Honor Stephanie Harrington. Allison shook her head mournfully. Such an undutiful child, too. How could you possibly think of me in that way? Sixty years of experience, the undutiful child in question responded. And now, if someone could possibly answer my question... Actually, Honor, Hamish said, and his voice and emotions were far more serious than her mother's droll tone. The person pulling the strings, in as much as anyone is, isn't your mother. 
It's Reverend Sullivan. Reverend Sullivan? Honor looked at the Grayson primate in surprise, and he nodded back gravely, although there was a twinkle in his dark eyes, and she clearly tasted the affectionate amusement behind it. And just which strings are being pulled? She asked more warily, looking back at Hamish and Emily. What it comes down to, Honor, Emily said, is that just as we'd feared, the news about your pregnancy and mine has gotten back to Grayson. It's already started to die down a bit here in the Star Kingdom, actually. Especially, a bubble of pure malicious delight danced in her mind glow. Since the landing toddler's new management discovered certain irregularities in Solomon Hayes's financial records and let him go. I believe he's currently discussing those irregularities with the LCPD and the Exchequer. But the brief flicker of amusement faded. The situation on Grayson was about what you and I had feared it might be. In fact, a delegation of stedholders called on the Reverend to discuss their concerns. Her mouth tightened bleakly for a moment, then she flipped her right hand in a shrug. Needless to say, Reverend Sullivan supported your position strongly. Honor glanced at Sullivan, who bent his head gravely in response to the gratitude in her eyes. But it was clear some of them, especially Stedholder Mueller, I understand, are prepared to use this situation to attack you as publicly as possible. So the Reverend decided to take matters into his own hands, pastorally speaking. Emily paused, and Reverend Sullivan looked at Honor. In some ways, my lady, he said, I suppose my decision to involve myself in such a deeply personal matter must be considered intrusive, especially since none of you are communicants of the Church of Humanity Unchained, and I hope I haven't offended by doing so. I might argue that my position as Reverend and First Elder and Head of the Sacristy and the constitutional obligations of those offices give me a responsibility to involve myself— but that would be less than fully honest of me. The truth is, he looked directly into her eyes, and she tasted his utter sincerity, that my own heart would have driven me to speak were I reverend or not. You as a person, not simply as Stedholder Harrington, are important to far too many people on Grayson, myself included, for me to do otherwise. Reverend, I... Honor paused and cleared her throat. I can think of many things people could do which I might find offensive. Having you take a hand to help in a situation like this certainly isn't one of them. Thank you. I hope you'll still feel that way in a few minutes. Despite the ominous words, there was a very faint gleam in his eye, and Honor frowned in puzzlement. The thing is, Honor, Emily continued, reclaiming her attention, the reverends come up with a solution for all our problems, every one of them. He's what? Both of Honor's eyebrows rose, and she looked back and forth between Sullivan, Hamish, and Emily, and her parents. That's hard to believe. Not really, Emily said, with a sudden huge smile and a matching internal swell of delight. You see, Honor, all you have to do is answer one question. One question? Honor blinked as her eyes prickled suddenly and unexpectedly. She didn't even know why, just that the joy inside Emily had reached out and blended with a matching tide of joyous anticipation from Hamish into something so strong, so exuberant, and yet so intensely focused on her that her own emotions literally couldn't help responding to it. Yes, Emily said softly. Honor, will you marry Hamish and me? For an instant that seemed an eternity, Honor simply stared at her. Then it penetrated, and she jerked upright in her comfortable chair. Marry you? Her voice trembled. Marry both of you? Are, are you serious? Of course we are, Hamish said quietly, while Samantha purred from the high chair beside him as if the bones were about to vibrate right out of her body. And if anyone can be certain of that, he added, you can. But, but, 
Honor looked at Archbishop Talmaki and Father O'Donnell, finally understanding why they were both here. But I thought your marriage vows made that impossible, she said hoarsely. If I may, my lord, Telmaki said gently, looking at Hamish, and Hamish nodded. Your grace, the archbishop continued, turning to honor, Mother Church has learned a great deal over the millennia, many things about human beings and their spiritual needs never change, and God, of course, is always constant. But the context in which those humans confront their spiritual needs does change. The rules evolve to handle those needs in a pre-industrial, pre-space civilization simply cannot be applied to the galaxy in which we live today, any more than could the one-time religious ratification of slavery or of the denial of the rights of women or the prohibition of women in the priesthood or the marriage of priests. Hamish and Emily chose to wed monogamously. The church didn't require that of them, for we've learned that what truly matters is the love between partners, the union which makes it a true marriage and not simply a convenience of the flesh. But that was their decision, and at the time, I believe it was the proper one for them. Certainly anyone looking at them, or speaking with them today, after all their marriage has endured, can still see the love and mutual commitment they share. But we live in an era of prolong, when men and women live literally for centuries. Just as Mother Church was eventually forced to deal with the tangled problems of genetic engineering and of cloning, she's been forced to acknowledge that when individuals live that long, the likelihood that even binding decisions must be revisited increases sharply. The church doesn't look lightly upon the modification of wedding vows. Marriage is a solemn and a holy state, a sacrament ordained by God. But ours is a loving and an understanding God, and such a God wouldn't punish people to whom he's given the joyous gift of a love as deep as that which binds you, Hamish, and Emily together— by forcing you to remain apart. And because the church believes that, the church has made provision for the modification of those vows, so long as all parties are in agreement and there's no coercion, no betrayal. I've spoken with Hamish and Emily. I have no question in my mind that they would welcome you into their marriage with unqualified joy. The only question which must be answered before I grant the necessary dispensation is whether or not that's what you most truly and deeply desire. I... Honor's vision wavered, and she blinked back tears. Of course it's what I desire, she said huskily. Of course it is. I just never thought... never expected... Forgive me for suggesting it, dear, her mother said gently, rising from her chair to fold her arms about her seated daughter. But sometimes, much as I love you, you can be just a tiny bit slow. Honor gurgled with tearful laughter and hugged her mother tightly. I know, I know, if I'd ever thought for a minute. She broke off and looked at Hamish and Emily through her tears. Of course I'll marry you both of you. My God, of course I will. Good, Reverend Sullivan said, and smiled when Honor turned to look at him. It just happens that Robert here, he waved one hand at Telmaki, has already granted the necessary dispensation contingent upon your acceptance of the idea, and it also just happens that Father O'Donnell here has brought along his prayer book and a special license and that I happen to know the Alexander family chapel just happens to have been given a most thorough cleansing this morning. 
And it just so happens that at this particular moment, there's a representative of Father Church here on Manticore to serve as the temporal witness required for any steadholder's marriage. So since the bride's family, he bowed to include Nimitz and Samantha in that family, are present, I don't really see any reason why we couldn't get this little formality out of the way tonight. Tonight? Honor stared at him. Indeed, he replied calmly. Unless, of course, you had other plans. Of course I had... Honor chopped herself off, torn between laughter, more tears, and a sense of the entire universe whirling further and further out of control. What? her mother demanded, still hugging her. You want a big, fancy, formal wedding? Piffle! You can always have that later, if you really feel the need, but all that hoopla isn't what makes a marriage, or even a wedding. And even if it were... I'd think having the Archbishop and the Reverend assist in the ceremony should satisfy even the highest social stickler. It isn't that, and you know it, Honor half laughed, giving her mother a shake. It's just all moving so quickly. I hadn't even considered it ten minutes ago, and now... Well, it's something you ought to have considered long ago, my lady, Sullivan said with twinkle-eyed severity. After all, you are a Grayson, and if you think I'm going to permit you and this man, he jabbed a finger at Hamish, to spend one more night cavorting in sin, then you have another think coming. He waved the jabbing finger at Honor, smiling as she simultaneously laughed and blushed. All right, all right, you win, all of you. But before we get to the I do's, we've got to get Miranda and Mac out here. I can't get married without them. Now that, Allison congratulated her, is the first reasonable objection you've raised all night. And as the Reverend is fond of saying, it just so happens I sent Jeremiah back to fetch them, and Farragut and the twins, about the time we sat down to dinner. They should be here in... She checked her chrono. Another thirty minutes or so. So... She cupped Honor's face between her hands, and her own smile was just a little misty. Why don't you and I spend the time between now and then making you even more beautiful, love? Chapter 31 Admiral Lady Dame Honor Alexander Harrington, Duchess and Steadholder Harrington, and possibly, Hamish wasn't certain exactly how it would work out, Countess Whitehaven, walked across the shuttle pad lounge in a euphoric haze. Being married was going to take some getting used to. This floating feeling of joy and relaxation, the knowledge that she'd truly come home at last, was worth any price, yet she already foresaw all sorts of problems on Grayson once news of the marriage became public. Grayson conventions denoting marital status all assumed the husband's surname would be adopted by all of his wives. But those same conventions had also always assumed any steadholder would be male— and she had a pretty shrewd notion the conclave of Steadholders wouldn't take kindly to the notion of changing the Harrington dynasty to the Alexander dynasty in the very first generation of the Steading. Plus, of course, the fact that they were going to have to deal with the fact that the Steadholder was the junior wife of a man who stood completely outside the succession. Personally, she was rather looking forward to watching her fellow Steadholders work their way through the problems. It would do their residually patriarchal little hearts good, she thought, as she counted noses in her travel party. Then she frowned as she came up a nose short. Wasn't Tim supposed to hop back up with us? she asked McGinnis. Yes, he was, milady. McGinnis shook his head with an irritated expression. But he screened last night and I forgot to tell you. He'll be catching the next shuttle flight back. Something about his younger sister's birthday, I believe? Technically, he's got another 36 hours before he's due to report back aboard, so I told him I didn't think there'd be any problem. Oh. Anna rubbed the tip of her nose for a moment, then shrugged. You were right, of course, and goodness knows a birthday party's more important, and probably a lot more fun, than riding back to the flagship with a stodgy old flag officer. Nonsense, my lady, McGinnis said with an absolutely straight face. I'm sure he doesn't think of you as old. And you, Mac, may not get a lot older, she told him with a smile. 
I'm terrified, Your Grace, he said sedately. You did what? Michelle Hankey asked, staring at Honor. I said that while I was back on Manticore and didn't have anything better to do, I went ahead and got married, Honor repeated with a huge smile. It seemed like the thing to do. She shrugged, and Nimitz bleaked with laughter on her shoulder as the two of them enjoyed Hanky's polaxed mind glow. But, but, but... Mike, you sound like one of those antique motorboats Uncle Jacques and his SCA buddies play with. Hanky closed her mouth, and her stunned expression began to transform itself into one of outrage. You married Hamish Alexander and his wife, and you didn't even invite me? Mike, I almost didn't get invited, Honor said. Reverend Sullivan, Archbishop Telmaki, my mother, Hamish, and Emily, I think about 30% of the entire population of Manticore, knew about it before anybody bothered to tell me. And when the Reverend suggests you get married right now instead of, how did he put it? Oh, yes, instead of continuing to cavort in sin with your intended groom, it takes more intestinal fortitude than I just discovered I have to say no. Yeah, sure you don't. Hanky eyed her narrowly. I've known tree cats. Hell, I've known boulders less stubborn than you are, Honor Harrington. No way in the world did anyone hold a pulser to your head and make you do this. Well, that's true, Honor admitted. In fact, I'm more than a little ticked off with myself for not having thought of this and proposed it myself months ago. It's just, after the High Ridge Smear campaign, it never occurred to me. Even if it had, Hanky said shrewdly, you wouldn't have suggested it. You'd have just sat on it and hoped the idea occurred to Emily. You might be right, Honor said after a moment. I hadn't really thought about that while I was busy kicking myself for being so slow. Honor, you're my best friend in the universe, but I've got to tell you, you've got one blind spot about two kilometers wide. It's funny, given that you're also the only functional two-foot empath I know, but it's true. You are constitutionally incapable of suggesting anything that will get you what you want if it might step on someone else. And you're so incapable of it that you go into some sort of immediate internal denial where the very possibility of suggesting it is concerned. I do not! You do so. Hanky looked at Nimitz. Doesn't she, Stinker? Nimitz looked down at Hanky from Honor's shoulder for a moment and then nodded firmly. See? Even your furry minion knows it, which is one reason this marriage of yours is going to be so good for you. Somehow, I don't see Hamish and Emily Alexander, or Hamish and Emily Alexander Harrington, I suppose now, letting you get away with that anymore. Honor considered protesting further, but she didn't. And one reason she didn't, she admitted to herself, was that she wasn't positive she could and be honest. The notion certainly bore thinking on, at any rate. Whatever, she said instead, smiling at Hanky. But the main thing is that, aside from Mac and my armsmen, you're the only one in the fleet who knows. I'm going to tell Alice and Alistair as well, but no one else. Not for a while. Marriage licenses and wedding certificates are public records, Honor, Hanky pointed out. You can't keep this one quiet for long. Longer than you might think, Honor replied with an urchin-like grin. Since I'm Steadholder Harrington, and a Steadholder outranks a Duchess or an Earl, the license and certificate are both being filed on Steadholder Harrington's Planet of Residence, in the Public Records Office of Harrington Steading, as a matter of fact. Reverend Sullivan offered to take care of it for me. Well, wasn't that nice of him, Hanky said with a matching grin. I don't suppose they're likely to get temporarily misfiled, are they? No, they aren't. Honor said more seriously. They're important official documents, so we're not going to be playing any games with them, but we're also not going to mention to anyone that they're there, and while the records are public, they have to be requested, so we'll know if anyone accesses them. She shrugged. We couldn't keep it secret forever, even if we wanted to, which we don't. This will just buy a little more time. But why buy it in the first place? Hanky frowned. Like Emily said, this solves all your problems. Except, of course, for the people who are going to suggest that the fact that you're marrying them now 
probably proves Hayes was right with his original rumors about you and Hamish. The main reason is my command and Hamish's position at the Admiralty, Honor admitted. Hamish's theory is that since the First Lord, unlike the First Space Lord, is a civilian without any authority to issue orders to uniformed personnel, he's not in my direct chain of command, and so there's been no official prohibition against our involvement from the start. Unfortunately, that's currently just his opinion. Before we go public, we want to be certain the courts are going to agree with him. And if they don't? Hanky frowned again. Rules lawyering was very unlike the Honor Harrington she'd always known. And if they don't, the solution's relatively simple. I resign my Manticoran commission, and High Admiral Matthews makes Admiral Steadholder Harrington available to the Alliance to command Eighth Fleet. That we know would be legal, since there's no similar prohibition in Grayson's service. But it would be complicated, and an obvious case of finding a way to technically comply with the law, and we'd all prefer to simply find out that what we're doing is legal in the first place under the Star Kingdom's Articles of War. And how long will it take for you to determine whether or not it is? Not too long, I hope. I've got Richard Maxwell working on it now, and he feels confident he can have a definitive opinion for us within a month or so which is actually moving at light speed for the legal system, you know. In the meantime, we've got to get Cutworm 3 organized and launched, and no one at Admiralty House or here in the fleet needs to be worrying about something like this while we're planning an op. I don't suppose I can argue about that, Hanky said. Personally, given who you and Hamish are, not to mention Emily, I figure you could probably get away with just about anything short of murder. Maybe we could, Honor said with a frown of her own. But that's one game I really don't want to start playing. Honor, you've earned a little slack, a little special consideration, Hanky told her quietly. Some people may think so. And in some respects, I suppose I do too, Honor said slowly. But the minute I begin demanding some sort of free pass... I turn into someone I don't want to be. Yes, I guess you would, Hanky said, shaking her head with a slight rueful smile. Which is probably one reason everyone else would be so willing to give it to you. Oh, well. She shook herself. I guess we'll just have to put up with you the way you are. And don't forget to write this time. Mom, Lieutenant Timothy Mears protested. I always write, you know I do. But not often enough, she said firmly with an impish smile as she banked into the final approach to Landing Field's parking bays. All right, all right, he sighed, giving in with a smile of his own. I'll try to write more often, assuming the Admiral gives me the free time. Don't you go blaming your slackness on Duchess Harrington, his mother scolded. She doesn't keep you that busy. Yes, she does, Mears objected in tones of profound innocence. I swear she does. Then you won't mind me dropping her a little note of my own to ask her not to overwork my baby boy that way? Don't you dare, Mears protested with a laugh. That's what I thought, his mother said complacently. Mothers know these things, you know. And they fight dirty, too. Of course they do. They're mothers. The air car settled into the designated parking bay, and she turned to look at him, her expression suddenly much more serious. Your father and I are very proud of you, Tim, she said quietly. And we worry about you. I know, I know. She raised one hand when he started to protest. You're safer on the flagship than you would be almost anywhere else, but a lot of mothers and fathers who thought their children were safe before the peeps started shooting again found out they were wrong. We're not lying awake at night, unable to sleep, but we do worry because we love you. So be careful, all right? I promise, Mom, he said, and kissed her cheek. Then he climbed out of the car, collected his single light bag, and waved goodbye. His mother watched him step onto the pedestrian slideway. She watched him until he disappeared into the crowd, then lifted the air car into the exit traffic lanes and headed home. She never noticed the nondescript man who also watched her son head for the departure concourse. 
I wish we were getting a few reinforcements, ma'am, Raphael Cardona said, as he, Simon Mattingly, and Honora Nimitz walked down the passage away from the flag briefing room, where the first preliminary meeting for Cutworm Three had just broken up. So do I, Anna replied. But realistically, it's only been three months since we activated Eighth Fleet. It's going to be at least a few more months before we start seeing anything else, I'm afraid. Three months. Cardona shook his head. It doesn't seem anywhere near that long somehow, ma'am. That's because of how much more intense the operational pace has been this time around, Honor said with a shrug. For us, at least. Time is probably dragging for the folks in Home Fleet and Third Fleet. It was her turn to shake her head. I was always fortunate as a captain. Except possibly for Hancock Station, I never got anchored to one of the major defensive fleets and had to sit around cooling my heels for months at a time with nothing but simulations to keep my people sharp. No, you didn't, Cardona said dryly. If I recall correctly, Your Grace, you were generally too busy getting the crap shot out of your ship to worry about something like that. Picky, 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 Honor said, and the flag captain chuckled. At least it kept my people from getting bored, she added, and he laughed harder. Honor smiled, and the four of them stepped through the hatch onto Imperator's flag bridge. It was fairly late in the shipboard day, and the watch was at a minimum. Mattingly peeled off just inside the hatch, and Honor and Cardonis crossed the spacious command deck to stand on its far side, gazing into the main visual display. The endless depths of space lay before them, crystal clear and sooty black, spangled with stars. Beautiful, isn't it, ma'am? Cardonis asked quietly. And it looks so peaceful, Honor agreed. Too bad looks can be so deceiving, her flag captain said. I know what you mean, but let's not get too moody. It's always been deceiving, you know? Think about what each of those tiny little cool-looking stars is like when you get close to it. Not so peaceful then, is it? You do have an interesting perspective on things sometimes, Your Grace, Cardonis observed. Do I? Honor turned her head as the hatch opened again, and Timothy Mears walked through it, carrying his memo board under his arm. The flag lieutenant had stayed behind to tidy up his notes of the session. If my perspective seems odd, she continued, turning back to Cardonis, it's only because... Her voice chopped off as abruptly as a guillotine blade, and she whirled back towards the hatch, even as Nimitz catapulted off her shoulder with a blood-curdling, tearing canvas snarl. Cardonis's jaw dropped, and he started to turn himself, but he was far too slow. Simon! Honor shouted, even as her right hand flashed up, caught Cardonis by the front of his tunic, and flung him towards the floor with all the brutal power of her genetically engineered heavy world musculature. The armsman's head snapped up, but he lacked Honor's empathic sense. He couldn't taste what she tasted, couldn't recognize the sudden surging horror radiating from Timothy Mears as the young man abruptly found his body responding to the orders of someone or something else. It wasn't Mattingly's fault. Timothy Mears was part of his Steadholder's official family. He was her aide, her student, almost an adoptive son. He'd been alone in her company literally thousands of times, and Mattingly knew he was no threat. And so he was totally unprepared when Mears's right hand reached out casually, so casually, in passing, and snaked Mattingly's pulser out of his holster. The armsman reacted almost instantly, Despite the totality of his surprise, his own arm lashed out, seeking to recapture the weapon, or at least immobilize it, but almost instantly wasn't quite good enough, and the pulser snarled. Simon! This time it was no shout. Honor screamed her armsman's name in useless protest as the burst of heavy caliber darts ripped into his abdomen and tracked upward into his chest. His uniform tunic, like Honor's, which had been modified to resist Nimitz's claws, was made of anti-ballistic fabric, but it wasn't designed to resist military-grade pulsar fire at point-blank range, and Mattingly went down in an explosion of blood. Honor felt the agony of his death, but there was no time to grieve. And agonizing as what had just happened to Mattingly was, it was actually less agonizing than what she tasted from Timothy Mears. His horror, shock, disbelief and guilt, 
as his hand killed a man who'd been his friend was like some horrifying shroud. She could feel him screaming in protest, fighting with desperate futility, as his arm came up, sweeping around the bridge, holding down the stud on the stolen pulsar. A hurricane of darts shrieked across Flag Bridge. Two plotting ratings went down, one of them screaming horribly. The communications section exploded as the darts chewed their way through displays, consoles, chairbacks. The deadly muzzle tracked onward, slicing the bandsaw of hypervelocity darts across Andrea Jarowalski's unmanned station and killing the tactical quartermaster of the watch. And yet, even as the carnage mounted, Honor knew it was all incidental. She knew her horrified flag lieutenant's actual target. Nimitz hit the back of a command chair, bounding towards mirrors, but the cyclone of darts slammed into the chair. They missed the cat, but the chair literally exploded under him, and not even his reflexes could keep him from falling to the deck. He landed with his feet under him, already prepared to bound upward once again, but he'd lost too much time. He couldn't possibly reach the flag lieutenant before the pulser in Mears's hand found Honor. Honor felt it coming felt the useless denial screaming in Timothy Mears's mind, knew the flag lieutenant literally could not resist whatever hideous compulsion had seized him, knew he would rather have died himself than do what he'd just done, what he was about to do. She didn't think about it, not consciously. She simply reacted, just as she'd reacted by throwing Raphael Cardonis out of the line of fire reacted with the trained instincts of over forty years of practice in the martial arts, and with the muscle memory she drilled into herself on the firing range under her Jason Bay mansion. Her artificial left hand flexed oddly. It rose before her, forefinger rigid, and in the instant before Timothy Mears's fire reached her, the tip of that forefinger exploded as a five-dart burst of pulsar fire ripped across the flag bridge, and the flag lieutenant's head erupted in a ghastly spray of gray, red, and pulverized white bone. Chapter 32 Your Grace, Captain Mandel is here, James McGinnis said quietly. Honor looked up from her console with a feeling of guilty relief. She'd gotten only a few hours of fitful sleep in the twenty-one hours since the massacre on her flag bridge, and she was still dealing with personal letters to the families of the dead. The message she'd already composed for Simon Mattingly's family had been bad enough. The one she was recording now, for Timothy Mears's parents, was far worse. McGinnis stood in the open hatch of the office workspace attached to her day cabin, and his expression was as haggard as she felt. Simon Mattingly had been his friend for over sixteen T years, and Timothy Mears had been like a younger brother. Eighth Fleet's entire command structure was stunned by what had happened, but for some honor thought it was far more personal than for others. Show the captain in, please, Mac. Yes, ma'am. McGinnis disappeared, and Honor saved what she'd already recorded for Timothy's parents. As she did, her eyes fell on the black glove on her left hand, the glove concealing the tattered last joint of her index finger, and she felt once again the terrible, tearing grief there'd been no time to feel then as she shot down all of the potential and youthful exuberance of the flag lieutenant who'd meant so much to her. A throat cleared itself, and she looked up once more. Captain Mandel, your grace. The burly, broad-shouldered officer just inside the hatch, black beret tucked under his left epaulette and spine ramrod straight, said gruffly. He and the slightly taller, slender woman beside him both wore the insignia of the Office of Naval Intelligence. And this, Mandel indicated his companion, is Commander Simon. Come in, Captain. Commander. Honor pointed at the chairs in front of her desk. Be seated. Thank you, Your Grace, Mandel said. Simon, Honor felt herself flinch inside as the commander's last name lacerated her sense of loss, said nothing, only smiled politely and waited a moment until Mandel had seated himself. Then she sat as well, economically and neatly. Honor regarded them thoughtfully, tasting their emotions. They were an interesting contrast, she decided. Mandel's emotions were just as hard-edged as his physical appearance. He radiated bulldog toughness, but there was no sense of flexibility or give. Focused, intense, determined, all of those applied, 
yet she had the sense that he was a blunt instrument, a hammer, not a scalpel. But Simon now, Simon's emotions were very different from her outward appearance. She looked almost colorless, fair-haired with a complexion almost as pale as Honor's own, and curiously washed-out-looking blue eyes, and her body language appeared diffident, almost timid. But under that surface was a poised, cat-like huntress. An agile mind, coupled with intense curiosity and an odd combination of a puzzle-solver's abstract concentration and a crusader's zeal. Of the two, Honor decided, Simon was definitely the more dangerous. Now, Captain, she said after a moment, folding her hands atop her blotter, what can I do for you and the commander? Obviously, Your Grace, everyone at Admiralty House, and in the government at large, for that matter, takes a very grave view of what's happened, Mandel said. Admiral Givens will be personally reviewing all our reports, and I've been instructed to inform you that Her Majesty will also be receiving them. Honor nodded silently when he paused. Commander Simon is attached to counterintelligence, Mandel continued. My own specialty is CID, however, which means I'll be functioning as the lead investigator. Criminal Investigation Division is taking the lead? Honor managed to keep the surprise out of her voice, but her eyes sharpened. Well, clearly what's happened here represents a serious security breach, Mandel replied. The commander has an obvious responsibility to determine how the penetration occurred. However, in a case like this, it's usually most efficient to allow an experienced criminal investigator to go over the ground first. We know what to look for, and we can often identify the points at which the perpetrator began acting abnormally. He shrugged. With that to direct them to the point at which he was first recruited, the counterintelligence types can hit the ground running. Perpetrator? Anna repeated, and to her own ears, her voice was oddly flattened. Yes, Your Grace. Mandel radiated puzzlement at her comment, and she smiled thinly. Lieutenant Mears, she said quietly, was a member of my staff for almost a full tea year. He was a diligent, responsible, conscientious young man. Had he lived, he would, I feel no doubt, have attained senior rank and discharged it well. He won't do that now, because I killed him. I would greatly appreciate it, Captain, if you could find some word other than perpetrator with which to describe him. Mandel looked at her, and something clicked into place behind his eyes. She could feel it, taste his sense of, oh, that's what it was, as he recognized, or thought he did, what he was dealing with. Your Grace, he said compassionately. It's not unusual, especially this soon after something like this, for it to be difficult to accept that someone we knew and liked, trusted, wasn't exactly what we thought he was. I'm sure you feel responsible for the death of the conscientious young man you killed, but you killed him in self-defense, and the fact that you had to demonstrates that he wasn't who or what you thought he was. Honor's eyes narrowed, and she heard Nimitz's soft, sibilant hiss. Captain Mandel, she said even more quietly. Did you or did you not read my own report about what happened here? Of course, Your Grace. I have a copy of it here. He tapped the microcomputer cased at his belt. In that case, you ought to be aware that Lieutenant Mears was not responsible for his actions, she said flatly. He wasn't the perpetrator of this crime, Captain. He was its first victim. Your Grace, Mandel said in patient tones, I did indeed read your report. It was well-written, concise, and to the point. However, you're a combat officer. You command ships and lead fleets in battle, and the entire Star Kingdom knows how well you do it. But you aren't a criminal investigator. I am, and while I don't doubt a single factual observation from your report— I'm afraid your conclusion that Lieutenant Mears was under some form of compulsion simply doesn't make sense. It's just not supported by the evidence. I beg your pardon, Honor asked, almost conversationally, and a slight tick began at the right corner of her mouth. Your grace, Mandel probably wasn't even aware of his own sense of patient, confident superiority in his area of expertise, but Honor certainly was. 
you stated in your report that Lieutenant Mears was attempting to resist some sort of compulsion the entire time he was killing people, including your own armsmen. But I'm afraid that statement is an error, a conclusion I base on two main points of observation and logic. First, I've reviewed the Flagbridge visual records of the incident, and there's absolutely no sign of hesitation on his part— Secondly, for him to have been operating under compulsion would have required major personality adjustment were he, in fact, the person you believed him to be. It's not at all unusual, when something as violent and totally unexpected as this incident occurs, for someone involved in it to be mistaken in his observations. And that, I'm afraid, is even more common when the observer doesn't want, for perfectly understandable, very human reasons, to believe what's happening or why. The visual records, however, are immune to that sort of subjectivity, and they reveal nothing but purposeful, intentional, controlled, unhesitating action on Lieutenant Mears's part. And as far as personality adjustment is concerned, it's simply not possible. Lieutenant Mears, like all Queen's officers, had received the standard anti-drug and anti-conditioning protocols— It wouldn't have been flatly impossible for those safeguards to be broken or evaded, but it would have been difficult. And even without them, adjustment takes time, Your Grace. Quite a lot of it. And we can account for almost every instant of Lieutenant Mears' time over the past T-year. Certainly, there's no unaccounted-for period long enough for him to have been involuntarily adjusted to carry out an action like this one. The CID captain shook his head, his expression sad. No, Your Grace. I know you want to believe the best of an officer to whom you were so attached, but the only explanation for what happened here is that he was, and had for some time, been an agent for peep intelligence. That's preposterous, Honor said flatly. Mandel's face stiffened, his feeling of professional superiority segueing into becoming anger, and Honor leaned forward in her chair. If, in fact, Lieutenant Mears, Timothy, she used the dead officer's first name deliberately, had been a Havenite agent, he would have been far more valuable as a spy than as an assassin. As my flag lieutenant, he had access to virtually all of Eighth Fleet's most secure and sensitive data. He would have been a priceless intelligence asset, and they would never have thrown that away in an attempt like this. In addition, Captain... I didn't state in my report that I believed him to have been under compulsion. I stated that he was under compulsion. That was not interpretation. It was an observed fact. With all due respect, Your Grace, Mandel said stiffly, my own analysis of the visual records doesn't support that conclusion. My observation, Honor stressed the noun deliberately, didn't rely upon visual analysis. Feelings and instinct are a poor basis for a criminal investigation, Your Grace, Mandel said even more stiffly. I've been doing this for almost fifty T years, and as I explained on the basis of that experience, it's normal for emotions to cloud one's interpretation of events like this one. Captain, the muscle tick at the corner of Honor's mouth was more pronounced. You're aware of the fact that I've been adopted by a tree cat? Of course, Your Grace. Mandel was obviously trying to sit on his temper, but his voice came out just a bit too clipped. Everyone is aware of that. And you're aware that tree cats are empaths and telepaths? I've read some articles to that effect, Mandel said, and Honor felt her own temper click a notch higher at the dismissiveness in his emotions. Clearly, the captain was one of those people who continued, despite the evidence, to reject the notion that cats were fully sentient beings. They are, in fact, telepathic and empathic, and also highly intelligent, she told him. And because they are, Nimitz was able to sense what Lieutenant Mears was feeling in the last few moments of his life. She considered, briefly, telling Mandel she'd sensed those emotions herself, personally and directly, but rejected the temptation immediately. If he was sufficiently closed-minded to reject all the recent scientific evidence of tree-cat intelligence and capabilities, he would undoubtedly consider any human who claimed the same empathic ability was obviously insane. Nimitz knows Captain Mandel. He doesn't suspect, and he doesn't think. 
He knows Timothy was trying desperately not to do what he was doing, that he was horrified by his own actions but couldn't stop them, and that, I submit to you, is the exact definition of someone acting under compulsion. Mandel looked at her, and she tasted his incredulity that anyone could possibly expect him to allow these supposed observations of an animal, be it ever so clever, to influence the direction of his investigation. Your Grace, he said finally, I'm attempting to make full allowance for your obvious close emotional attachment to Lieutenant Mears, but I must disagree with your conclusions. As far as his value as an intelligence asset is concerned, I will, of course, defer to the judgment of Commander Simon's people in counterintelligence. From my own perspective, however, and given how successful Eighth Fleet's operations have been, it seems obvious you'd make a perfect target for an assassination. We know the peeps are fond of assassination as a technique, and your death would have been a major blow to the Star Kingdom's morale. In my own judgment, it seems likely peep intelligence felt that killing you would be even more valuable than whatever sensitive data Lieutenant Mears might have been in position to give them. As far as your tree cat's observations are concerned, I'm afraid I can't allow them to overrule my own analysis of the visual records, which aren't subject to emotional overtones or subjectivity. And those records show absolutely no sign of hesitation on Lieutenant Mears's part from the instant he seized your armsman's weapon. And finally, as I've already pointed out, he concluded with dangerous pointed patience, there simply hasn't been an unaccounted for block of the lieutenant's time long enough for him to have been adjusted. Captain, Honor said, should I conclude from what you've just said that you don't believe a tree cat's empathic sense is a valid guide to the emotional state of humans in his presence? I'm not sufficiently versed in the literature on the subject to have an opinion, Your Grace, he said, but she tasted the truth behind the meaningless qualification. No, you don't believe it, she said flatly, and his eyes flickered. Nor, Honor continued, is your mind even remotely open to the possibility that Timothy Mears was acting against his will? Which means, Captain Mandel, that you're completely useless for this investigation. Mandel reared back in his chair, eyes wide with shock, and Honor smiled thinly. You're relieved of authority for this investigation, Captain, she told him softly. You can't do that, Your Grace, he objected hotly. This is an O&I investigation. It falls outside your chain of command. Captain, Honor emphasized his rank coldly, you do not want to get into a pissing contest with me. Trust me on that. I said you're relieved, and you are relieved. I will inform all Eighth Fleet personnel that you have no authority and instruct them not to cooperate with your investigation in any way. And if you choose not to accept my decision, I will personally return to Manticore to discuss it with Admiral Givens, Admiral Caparelli, Earl Whitehaven, and, if necessary, with the Queen herself. Are you reading me clearly on this, Captain? Mandel stared at her, then seemed to deflate in his chair. He didn't say a word, and as she tasted his emotions, she knew he literally couldn't. She held him for a moment longer with icy brown eyes, then turned her attention to Commander Simon. The commander was almost as stunned as Mandel, but she was already beginning to come to grips with it. Commander Simon? Yes, Your Grace? Simon had a pleasant mezzo-soprano much warmer than her washed-out coloring, Honor noticed. On my authority, you'll assume lead responsibility for this investigation until and unless Admiral Givens assigns a replacement for Captain Mandel. Your Grace, Simon said carefully, I'm not certain you have the authority in my chain of command to give that order. Then I suggest you accept it provisionally, under protest if you must, until the situation is clarified by someone you know is in your chain of command. Honor said coldly. Because unless you do, this investigation will go nowhere until such time as an entire new team is sent out from Manticore. I will not have Captain Mandel in charge of it. Is that clear? Yes, Your Grace, Simon said quickly. Very well then, Commander. Let's be about it. 
Chapter 33. So we've been rethinking our previous target selection criteria and force levels, Andrew Jarowalski said, looking around the flag briefing room. All of Eighth Fleet's division commanders attended electronically, each with his or her own individual quadrant of the huge hollow display hovering above the conference table. The squadron and task force commanders, and Scotty Tremaine as Eighth Fleet's senior Kalak, were physically present. And even now, almost three full days after the Flag Bridge massacre, Honor could taste the residual shock, the stunned desire to disbelieve what had happened, hovering in the compartment like smoke. At this point, Jarowalski continued, seeking her own escape from personal grief in brisk professionalism, Commander Reynolds and I are in agreement with Her Grace. The peeps have to have begun putting in place some response to Cutworm 1 and Cutworm 2. What that response may be, we can't predict. Obviously, we all know what we'd like it to be. However, even if we've succeeded completely in convincing them to do what the Admiralty wants— it's still a situation with a definite downside for us here in Eighth Fleet. Specifically, the targets are going to get tougher. Whether it's simply improved doctrine, more of what we saw at Chantilly, or an actual redeployment of assets, they're going to do their best to ensure that we don't have any more cakewalks. Bearing that in mind, we're reducing our objectives list for Cutworm 3 to only two star systems, Lorn and Solon. Admiral Truman will command the attack on Lorn. Her Grace will command the attack on Solon. We'll be assigning one carrier squadron to each attack and splitting the heavy cruisers and battle cruisers just about down the middle. She paused, looking up and sweeping the faces of her audience, corporeal and electronic, then continued. Even without any precautionary redeployment on the peeps' part, both these targets would almost certainly be more heavily defended than our previous objectives. Lawn, in particular, is a relatively important secondary naval shipyard. It's not a building yard, but a satellite yard that handles a lot of refit activity, although it's really geared to working on units below the wall. Also, we know from prior intelligence that Lawn is fairly heavily involved in construction of the Peep's new lacks. Because of that, we anticipate that the likelihood of encountering at least light and medium combatants in some numbers is relatively high. Solon is less directly involved in the construction or maintenance of peep naval units. It is, however, substantially more heavily populated than any of the systems we've hit so far. According to the last census data available to us, the system population is over 2 billion, and its economy was one of the relatively few bright spots for the peeps even before the Pierre coup. This makes it particularly valuable from our perspective, since a successful attack on it is certain to generate powerful political pressure for Theismann and his staff to deploy additional heavy units for home defense. In addition, the severity of the economic damage inflicted by the destruction of this system's industrial infrastructure will be truly significant, all of which, again, suggests the system will be more heavily defended than the more lightly populated systems we've attacked so far. She paused once again, glancing over the notes on her individual display, then looked up once more. That completes the overview, Your Grace. Would you care to entertain discussion of the points already raised, or would you prefer for me to begin the point-by-point -point operational brief? I think we'll begin by seeing if anyone has anything she wants to add to what you've already said, Anna replied. It was her turn to look around the faces, physical and electronic, and she smiled despite her fatigue and her aching awareness of the empty spots behind her, which should have been filled by Simon Mattingly and Timothy Mears. Who'd like to start the ball rolling? she asked. The intercom buzzer sounded shockingly loud in the stillness. Honor sat up quickly, brushing her right hand across her eyes, and grimaced as she brought up the time display in her left eye. She'd been stretched out on the couch for barely fifty minutes, and the small amount of sleep she'd gotten made her feel even worse than she had before she collapsed onto it. The intercom buzzed again, and she shoved herself to her feet and stalked across to it. "'Mac,' she said with unaccustomed ire. "'I thought I told you—' "'I'm sorry, Mom. McGinnis interrupted. "'I know you didn't want to be disturbed before supper, but there's someone here you should see.' Mac, she said again, without her previous atypical heat, but wearily. 
Unless it's some sort of an emergency, I really don't want to see anyone. Can't Mercedes handle whatever it is? I'm afraid not, ma'am, McGinnis replied. He's come directly from Admiralty House specifically to speak to you. Oh. Honor made her spine straighten and inhaled deeply. There'd been just enough time for her blistering comments on Mandel to reach Admiralty House and draw a response, and the fact that they'd sent someone out to deliver that response in person suggested that Admiral Givens and the Judge Advocate General might not have been too delighted by her actions. Well, that's just too bad, she thought grimly. I'm a full admiral, a fleet commander, a duchess, and a stedholder. This investigation is too important to be sandbagged at the outset by someone too closed-minded to even consider the blindingly obvious. And this time around, the powers that be are damned well going to pay attention to me. The anger in her own thoughts surprised her just a bit, and she wondered, not for the first time, how much of it stemmed from her own feeling of guilt. But that didn't really matter. Not when she knew she was right about whatever had been done to Timothy Mears. Very well, Mac, she said after a moment. Give me two minutes, then send him in. Yes, ma'am. Honor keyed off the intercom, picked up her uniform tunic and slipped it back on, sealed it, and glanced into a bulkhead mirror. She shrugged her shoulders to settle the tunic perfectly in place and ran her right hand lightly over her hair. That hair fell halfway to her waist when it was unbound these days, but its tightly coiled braids hadn't slipped during her all-too-brief nap, and she nodded in approval. The slight tightness around her eyes might have told someone who knew her very well how weary she actually was, but there was no fault to find in her outward appearance. She glanced at Nimitz, but the cat was draped over his sleeping perch, still sound asleep. She sensed him in the back of her mind, just as she knew he was always at least peripherally aware of her, even when his sleep was deepest, but she didn't wake him. He was as exhausted as she was, and he too was still dealing with his grief for two people who had been close personal friends. Simon Mattingly's funeral had helped, some. There'd been at least a little catharsis in it, but at the same time it had only made her more aware of how far he'd come from his native world to die. She'd borrowed Brother Hendricks, the chaplain attached to one of the Grayson Lack groups assigned to Alice Truman's carrier squadron, to perform the ceremony. She'd known from agonizing personal experience that the Grayson tradition was that an armsman was buried where he fell, and Andrew LaFollet and Spencer Hawk had stood ramrod straight at her back throughout the brief military funeral ceremony. And then they, Alistair McKeon, Michelle Hankey, and James McGinnis, had carried the Harrington Steading flag-draped coffin to the waiting airlock. The two armsmen had stood rigidly at attention at her back once again, as the airlock's inner hatch closed. And then Brother Hendricks had spoken quietly. Unto Almighty God we commend the soul of our brother departed, and we commit his body to the endless sea of space, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection unto eternal life, through the intercessor, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose coming in glorious majesty to judge the universe, it shall give up its dead, and the corruptible bodies of those who sleep in him shall be changed, and made like unto his glorious body according to the mighty workings, whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Amen. Honor had reached out as he spoke, and at the final word she'd pressed the button beside the hatch that expelled Simon Mattingly's coffin. The coffin's small reaction drive had activated as soon as it was clear of the ship, turning the coffin, aligning it perfectly with the distant fusion furnace of Trevor Star, and she'd felt her own heart go with it. Perhaps she'd be able in time to find the comfort in the ancient words of farewell. And certainly if there had ever been a man who had met the test of his life, that man had been Simon Mattingly. But oh, she missed him so. She drew a deep breath, crossed to her desk, seated herself behind it, switched on her terminal, and pretended to be studying the document upon it, then waited. 
Precisely 120 seconds from the moment she'd given him the instruction, McGinnis opened the cabin hatch. Your Grace, he said, your visitor is here. There was something peculiar about his voice, and something even odder about his emotions, and Honor looked up sharply. Hello, Honor, her visitor said, and she shot up out of her chair. Hamish! She never clearly remembered stepping around her desk. She just was, and then she walked straight into his arms. She heard a thump behind her as Samantha vaulted from Hamish's shoulder and flowed across the carpet. She tasted Nimitz's awakening and sudden delight as his mate's mind glow reached out to him, and then Hamish's arms were about her and hers were about him. Hamish, she repeated more quietly, almost wonderingly, letting her head rest on his shoulder. Salamander, indeed. Hamish's deep voice was more than a little frayed around the edges, and his arms tightened. Damn it, woman. Can't you go anywhere without somebody trying to kill you? I'm sorry, she said, never opening her eyes as she tasted his very real worry. I'm sorry, but no one could have seen this one coming. I know, I know. He sighed, and his embrace loosened at last. He put his hands on her upper arms, holding her back at arm's length, and looked deeply into her eyes. He lacked her own empathic abilities, but once again she tasted that echo of a tree-cat bonding between them, and she knew she could no more conceal her innermost feelings from him than he could conceal his from her. Poor Honor, he said after a moment. Love, when we got the initial dispatches, Emily and I... He broke off, shaking his head firmly. Let's just say we didn't take it well. I wanted to come straight out here personally, but I was afraid of the attention I might have drawn. But then you fired Mandel, and I decided, the hell with the attention I might attract. I know you, Honor. You wouldn't have brought the hammer down that hard on him unless he was a complete and utter idiot, and you felt an overriding urgency to get someone competent to replace him. Or unless you were really, really hurting. In either case, I needed to be here. I suppose it was a bit of each, she admitted, stepping back and linking her arm through his. She urged him across the cabin, and the two of them sat side by side on the couch, leaning comfortably against one another. I am hurting. Badly, she said quietly. Not just over Simon. Not even mostly over him, in some ways. Tim... She broke off, biting her lip, her vision misting, remembering how vehemently she had rejected Mercedes Brigham's suggestion that perhaps she should be thinking about filling the hole in her staff Mir's death had left. But no admiral was required to have a flag lieutenant, and Honor refused to replace him. It might not be the most rational decision she'd ever made, but she had no intention of changing her mind. I'm hurting, she repeated. And I will be for a long time. But I honestly believe that it was mostly because Mandel was such a square peg in a round hole. From the tone of your dispatches, and frankly his report to Pat Givens, I sort of figured it was something like that, he said. Although I understand Mandel really does have a reputation as an effective investigator. I don't doubt he does, she said. In fact, to be scrupulously fair, which I really don't want to, I imagine he really is very good at what he does, under more normal circumstances. But in this instance, he's simply not the man for the job. Maybe he's too experienced. It's like... Like he's got some sort of tunnel vision. He knows what he knows, and he's going to focus in on that and get the job done without any distractions from amateurs who don't know their ass from their elbow about criminal investigations. Hamish quirked one eyebrow at her language. You are pissed, he observed. Frustrated, she corrected. Well, and maybe pissed off because he made me so frustrated, 
but he wouldn't believe me when I told him Tim was being compelled somehow, and he wasn't ready to believe Nimitz was smart enough to recognize what was going on, assuming a cat really had any sort of telepathic ability in the first place, or to tell anyone anything sensible if he could recognize it. Jesus, he managed to step on all your sore toes, didn't he? Just about, she admitted, smiling faintly at the humor in his voice. But he was so fixated on the notion that my sense of guilt was making me believe the best about Tim that he wasn't paying any attention to what I was telling him about what really happened. And he wasn't about to change his mind either, I could tell. She tapped her temple with her right forefinger, grimacing wryly, and he nodded. I figured that was what it was, and I imagine from what you're saying you weren't about to tell him you'd sensed what was happening. Honor simply snorted, and he chuckled without much humor. Frankly, I'm just as glad you didn't. I'd like you to go on holding that little ability in reserve for as long as you can. Let people think Nimitz is the one doing the sensing. It never hurts to be underestimated in some ways. I know, not to mention the fact that I don't want people to think I'm some sort of mind-reading, privacy-invading freak. Hmm. Hamish gazed into space for a few moments, then looked back at her. I don't doubt a single thing you've said, he told her. But I've got to tell you, I viewed the same footage from the bridge visuals. His face tightened. It scared the shit out of me, too, even though I knew you hadn't been hurt before they ever showed it to me. He shook his head, jaw muscles bunching for a second, and she slipped her arm around him and squeezed tightly. But the point I was going to make, he continued more normally after a couple of heartbeats, was that watching what happened, I can see why someone who didn't realize how you can get inside somebody else's head would discount the possibility that Lieutenant Mears was trying to stop himself. He moved so fast on her, so smoothly, as if he'd not only planned out what he was going to do, but actually rehearsed it ahead of time. I don't know if you really realize sometimes just how fast your own reflexes are, but you killed him just fractions of a second before he would have killed you and I don't think anyone else could have done it, trick finger or not. Honor looked down at her gloved left hand. I know it was fast, she said. If I'd had even a fraction of a second more warning, if I'd been able to do more than just shout Simon's name, we might... She stopped and made herself inhale. I'll always wonder if it would have been better not to shout she said, admitting to Hamish what she wasn't certain she would have been able to admit only to herself. Did I distract him? Did I make him look at me in exactly the wrong direction when he might have seen something, noticed something? She looked into Hamish's eyes. Did I get him killed? No. Hamish shook his head firmly. Yes, you may have distracted him, but distracted him from what? from watching a young man he'd seen literally thousands of times walk into Flagbridge on a perfectly legitimate errand? He shook his head again. Not even a grace and armsman would have expected anything like this, love. But he was my friend, Honor half-whispered. I loved him. I know. It was Hamish's turn to squeeze her, and she leaned into his embrace. Nonetheless, he went on, the fact that you had so little warning suggests a couple of things to me. Such as? First, there's no way he was a peep agent. He never could have concealed that from you, or Nimitz, for this long. Second, whatever happened to him, he hadn't been personality adjusted. Why not? I mean, why can you be so confident of that? Partly because Mandel, however pig-headed you may have found him, was right. Adjustment takes time, lots of time, even without the safeguards built into our military's security protocols, and partly because someone who's been adjusted knows he has. On some level, he's aware of the fact that he's not fully in control of his own actions. In fact, I made a quick flight out to your parents' house on Sphinx with Samantha and had her consult the Brightwater Memory Singers about the attempted assassination of Queen Adrian. You know, I'd actually forgotten about that, Honor said in a chagrined voice. You've been under a lot of stress, Hamish told her. 
but Samantha got the memory song of the entire episode. She says the assassin knew what was happening to him from the moment he came into Diane Kett's mental reach. It wasn't like turning on a switch. Diane Kett picked him up before he ever got into visual range of the princess, and he knew there was something badly wrong the instant he tasted the assassin's mind glow. That wasn't the case here. No, it wasn't, Anna agreed. He was perfectly cheerful when he stepped through the hatch. Everything was normal, exactly the way it always was. And then, suddenly, he went for Simon's pulser. So he wasn't adjusted, Hamish said thoughtfully. But he was programmed. I suppose you could say that, but how could that be done? Anna shook her head. That's what I keep coming back to again and again. How in the name of God could someone program another human being that way without the human in question even being aware it had happened? I don't know the answer to that one, Hamish said grimly. But here's another one. Why did it happen now? Why not before this? You're suggesting whatever was done to him was done during his last trip to Manticore? It seems likely, although CID's been over his entire visit with a fine-tooth comb without finding anything out of the ordinary, and leaving that point aside for the moment, why that moment in that place? Why not in a staff meeting or when you invited him to dinner? Opportunity, maybe? Otter said thoughtfully. He looked at her and she shrugged. I think it was the first time he and I and a single armsman were in the same place at the same time, or at least when there was a single armsman he had a legitimate reason to come within arm's length of, so naturally that not even a Grayson armsman would think it was anything out of the ordinary. And why would that be significant? Because, she said grimly, my armsmen are the only people constantly in my presence who are armed. To kill me, he first had to have a weapon, and secondly, he had to disable my bodyguard. By taking Simon's weapon the way he did, he accomplished both. I see. Hamish frowned, then shrugged. You may be onto something there. I don't know, but I do know where something like this happened before. Where? Oh, Colonel Hofschulte. Exactly. Pat Givens has already sent a message to the Andamani requesting all their case files on Hofschulte because it sounds like exactly the same thing. A totally trusted, totally loyal, long-time retainer who just suddenly snapped and tried to kill Prince Wang and his entire family. My understanding is that they very carefully considered the possibility of adjustment, but that Hofschulte was never out of sight long enough for that to happen, which, again, sounds exactly like what happened here. But why should the Havenites have tried to kill the Andermani crown prince? Honor asked in puzzlement. That I can't tell you, Hamish admitted. I just know the modus operandi appears to be extremely similar. I can't see some possible advantages for them, I suppose, in killing him now that they're at war with the Andes as well as us. But then... He shook his head. Of course, StateSec was still running their entire intelligence machine at that point. Maybe they did have some sort of motive we just can't see from here. That's hard to imagine, Honor said thoughtfully. I wonder... Wonder what? Hamish asked after a few seconds. What? Oh, Honor gave herself a shake. I was just wondering if there's someone else out there... Someone who's developed a technique that would let them do something like this and made it available on a higher basis. Possible, Hamish considered. Quite possible, really, because I can't think of anyone besides the peeps who'd have both the motive and the resources to pull something like this off. I can't either, Honor agreed, but her expression was troubled. Yes, assassination had always been a favorite tactic of the People's Republic, whether it was being run by INSEC or StateSec, but it wasn't the sort of tactic she would have associated with Thomas Theismann. On the other hand, Eloise Pritchard had come up through the Havenite resistance, and her Aprilists had been credited with several dozen assassinations of key legislaturalists and INSEC personnel.
and however Honor wanted to look at it, she, as the commander of the Allied fleet which had done the most damage to the Republic's civilians, as well as its military, was clearly a legitimate military target. And assassination didn't kill anyone deader than a bomb-pumped laser. Well, Hamish said finally, one of the reasons I came out was to tell you that, although Pat would appreciate it if you'd go through channels next time, if you want Mandel out of the picture, he's gone. And she intimated to me that if he'd gotten out of line, instead of simply being dumb as a post, she'd see to it he was for the long drop as well. No, Honor shook her head. No, as much as the nasty side of me would like to see that happen, it really was just a matter of his being unresponsive to novel hypotheses. My, what a diplomatic way to put it, her husband murmured. Then he grinned crookedly. Her second question was whether or not this Commander Simon was acceptable to you. She is. Just speaking to her is like prodding a wound with your finger because of her name. But she's much more open-minded than Mandel. I don't say she agrees with me, yet at least, but she hasn't ruled the possibility out. And she hasn't already wedded herself to some theory of her own. And she apparently does believe what the xenologists have been saying about the cats and their abilities for the past few years. Good, because in that case, I want Samantha to talk to her. I don't suppose we're lucky enough that she reads sign. No, she doesn't. Pity. In that case, I'll just have to translate, I suppose. Hamish shrugged. It may be an interesting conversation, especially when Samantha tells her about the memory song about Queen Adrian, and at least I'll feel like I'm actually doing something about the bastards who tried to murder my wife. His voice hardened on the last sentence, and she felt the fury and fear behind it. They may have tried, and they may have killed a lot of other people, but they didn't kill me, and they aren't going to, she promised him, reaching up to touch the side of his face with her right hand. Not with assassins, anyway, Hamish said with a slightly strained smile. Not with both you and your furry shadow watching out for them. Honor smiled back, then stiffened. That's it, she said softly. It what? he asked when she didn't say anything else immediately. It's just that if there is some new assassination technology out there, something they used to get to Tim without his disappearing long enough to be adjusted, then they could do it to anyone which means literally anybody could be a programmed assassin without even realizing it. Talk about your security nightmares, Hamish muttered, and she nodded grimly. But at the moment whatever the programming is kicks in, they do know someone or something else is controlling them, she said. And no tree cat could miss something like that. Like food tasters, Hamish said slowly or canaries in coal mines back on Old Earth. More or less, she agreed. It wouldn't be much warning, but at least it would be some, and if the security types guarding the intended target knew to take their cue from the cat, it might be enough. Palace security on the Queen's Own have been paying attention to tree cats for centuries now, Hamish said. They at least won't have any problems with the idea. No, and you need to get Dr. Arif and her commission involved in this. It's exactly the sort of thing she's been looking for, and she's already in position to coordinate with all the cat clans to come up with volunteers. We can't put tree cats everywhere. There aren't enough of them, even if they were all prepared or mentally equipped to work that closely with so many humans in such proximity. But with her help, we can probably cover most of the major ministerial targets, for example. An excellent notion. Hamish approved, then smiled at her in quite a different way. What? she demanded as she tasted the sudden shift in his emotions, and a pleasant heat deep down inside her responded to it. Well, he said, turning sideways on the couch to take her face between the palms of his hands, I can now truthfully tell my fellow Lords of Admiralty that I discharged official business when I was out here— so, with that out of the way, 
Why don't we discharge a little unofficial business, Ms. Alexander Harrington? And he kissed her. Chapter 34 So tell me, boss, are we sure this is a good idea this time around? Captain Molly Delaney asked. Admiral Lester Tourville looked at her with a slight frown, and she shrugged. I'm not saying it isn't, his chief of staff said. It's just that the last time the Octagon sent us off on one of its little missions, it didn't work out so well. Times had certainly changed, Tourville reflected. An officer who'd said what Delaney just had would have been arrested, charged with defeatism and treason against the people, and almost certainly shot, probably in less than twenty-four hours, under the old regime. Not that she didn't have a point, he admitted to himself. Yes, Molly, he said aloud. As a matter of fact, I do think it's a good idea, and, he added just a bit pointedly, what you say to me in private like this is one thing. Understood, sir, Delaney said a bit more formally, but Tourville was pleased to note, without any trace of obsequiousness. I'll admit, the admiral continued after a moment, that attacking a target like Zanzibar isn't exactly something for the weak-nerved, but at least this time we've got what looks like adequate and accurate operational intelligence. And assuming the numbers we've got are correct, we've also got a big enough hammer this time. I know, Delaney said, and there might have been just a bit of embarrassment in her smile. It's just that we got caught with our trousers so thoroughly down around our ankles last time. That, Turville conceded, we certainly did. Of course, this time we can also be fairly certain Honor Harrington is going to be somewhere else. And while I'm not particularly superstitious, I have to admit that I consider that a good omen. He and Delaney exchanged grins, whose humor was more than a bit strained, as they recalled the Battle of Sidemoor. It was the second time Lester Tourville had crossed swords with Honor Harrington, the first time units under his command had crippled her ship and captured her. The second time she had, he acknowledged it freely, kicked his ass up between his ears. His calm expression concealed an inner shudder as he remembered the nightmare in the marsh system. Four hundred light years from home, with a fleet which was supposed to have a decisive edge over its unprepared, unsuspecting opponents, only to discover that its opponents were anything but unsuspecting, and very well prepared indeed. When Harrington sprang her trap, he hadn't expected to get anything out. As it was, he'd somehow managed to extract almost a third of his total fleet. Which, of course, was another way of saying he'd lost over two-thirds of it. And he would have lost it all if Shannon Foraker's defensive doctrine hadn't worked so well. Most of the ships he'd gotten out had been badly battered, and although he'd managed to evade any pursuit in the depths of hyperspace, the voyage home had been a nightmare all its own. Restricted by damage to the delta bands, his maximum apparent velocity had been only 1,300 C, which meant the trip had taken over three months. Three months of dealing with damage out of limited onboard resources. Three months of watching his wounded recover, or not, when even his surviving units had lost 30% of their medical personnel. And three months without any idea at all how the rest of Operation Thunderbolt had gone. It was fortunate that the answer to that last question was that it had gone quite well indeed. The success of the other fleet commanders might have rubbed a little more salt into the wound of his own failure, but at least the Mantis had been hammered far harder overall than the Republic. It was a pity Javier Giscard hadn't gone ahead and attacked at Trevor Star, but Tourville couldn't fault that decision, not on the basis of what Javier had known at the time. But the Grendelsbane attack, especially, had been a crushing success, and no one at the Octagon had blamed Tourville or his staff for what had happened to Fourth Fleet and Marsh. One or two politicians had had a few things to say— in fact, a couple of them had been vocal enough to get themselves firmly onto Lester Tourville's personal shit list. That was one side of a living, breathing democracy, which Tourville was honest enough to admit he could have done without. But the most telling evidence that he continued to enjoy the confidence of his superiors was his new assignment. Second Fleet was a new organization. The old Second Fleet had been dissolved after Thunderbolt, and the new one's skeleton of veteran units was receiving primarily new construction, straight from completing working-up exercises under Shannon Foraker's direction in Bolthole. 
When he'd been given the command, his understanding had been that it wouldn't be committed to action for at least a T-year, and probably somewhat longer. Second Fleet was supposed to be the knuckle-duster no one on the other side knew existed until it landed in a devastating right cross. But even the best plans were subject to change, and Operation Gobi was right down Lester Tourville's alley. Nor was it going to require him to commit his complete strength. He could put together the required strike force out of his more experienced, battle-hardened units without exposing his newbies. In fact, he supposed he really could have handed the entire operation over to one of his task force commanders. If there'd been a single chance in hell, he wouldn't be commanding it himself. It ought to be interesting anyway, he said after a few moments. I wasn't there when Icarus smashed Zanzibar last time, but somehow I don't think the Zanzibarans are going to be especially happy about getting run over by an air lorry a second time. And Zanzibar is at least as important to the Alliance's war effort as all of the systems Arrington has hit so far combined were to ours. I know, boss, Delaney nodded. As a matter of fact, I think that's one reason I may be feeling a little more anxious. Tourville quirked an eyebrow at her, and she shrugged. They have to know Zanzibar is important to them if we do, and they gave up an awful lot of intel on their defensive deployments the last time we hit them. If I were them... I'd have been making some changes since. Which is exactly what the operations plan assumes they've done, Tourville pointed out. But unless they're prepared to make a major commitment of ships of the wall, they're going to be using some variant of what we already saw. And unlike them, we are prepared to make a major commitment of the wall. He smiled thinly. I don't think they're going to enjoy the experience as much as we are. Honor stood on Imperator's flag bridge, hands clasped loosely behind her, and watched her plod as Eighth Fleet headed out on Cutworm Three. The bloodstains had been cleaned up long ago, of course, and the shattered consoles and command chairs had been replaced, but no one on the bridge was likely to forget that six people they'd all known well had died there. And Honor could feel Spencer Hawk standing in Simon's spot beside the hatch. She watched the silent, peaceful icons moving across the plot, accelerating steadily towards Trevor Star's hyperlimit, and tried to analyze her own emotions. Sorrow predominated, she thought. And then, not guilt exactly, but something like it. Too many of her armsmen had died in the line of duty, protecting her back, or simply caught in the crossfire of naval engagements they would never have been anywhere near if not for her. At first, she'd felt almost angry at them because of the way their deaths weighed upon her sense of responsibility. But gradually, she'd come to understand it didn't really work that way. Yes, they'd died because they'd been her armsmen, but every one of them had been a volunteer. They'd served her because they'd chosen to, and they were content. They were no more eager to die than anyone else— but they were as confident that they had given their service to someone worthy of them as Honor Harrington had been confident of the same thing the first day she met Elizabeth III face to face. And because they were, it wasn't her job to keep them alive. It was her job to be worthy of the service they'd chosen to give. And yet, despite that, she carried the weight of their deaths as she carried the weight of all her dead, and she desperately wanted them to live. And however she might feel about Simon Mattingly's death, or the deaths of her other bridge personnel, there was Timothy Mears himself, the young man she'd killed. She stood in almost exactly the same spot she'd stood then. She could turn around and see exactly where Simon had fallen, where Mears's body had slammed to the deck. She knew she'd had no choice, and that even as she killed him, Mears had understood that. But he'd been so young had so much promise, and to die like that, killed by a friend to stop him from killing other friends. Nimitz bleaked in her ear, the sound scolding, and she shook herself mentally as she tasted his emotions. He too grieved for Simon and for Mears, but he blamed neither her nor Mears. His hatred was reserved for whoever had sent Timothy Mears on his final horrifying mission, and Anna realized he was right. She didn't know who had ordered her assassination or planned its execution, but she would, 
and when she did, she would personally do something about it. Nimitz bleaked again, and this time the sound was hungrier and soft with agreement. Sir, the task force is ready to proceed. Lester Tourville turned his head to look down into the small comm display. Captain Celestine Welbeck, the commanding officer of RHNS Guerriere, flagship of Second Fleet, looked back out of it at him. What? Tourville asked with a small smile. No last-minute delays? No Liberty Party still adrift? None, sir, Welbeck replied deadpan. I informed the shore patrol that anyone who reported in late was to be shot beside the shuttle pad as an object lesson to others. There's the spirit I like to see, Twirvel said, although, truth be told, he found the joke just a bit too pointed, given the previous regime's history. Always find a positive way to motivate your personnel. That's what I thought, sir. Well, in that case, Celestine, let's get them moving. We've got an appointment with the Mantis. Aye, sir. Welbeck disappeared from the display as she began issuing the orders necessary for Task Force 21 to break parking orbit, and Tourville turned his attention to his plot. The slowly moving light codes wouldn't have meant much to a civilian, but they were an impressive sight to the trained eye. He picked out the ponderous might of his four battle squadrons, shaking down into cruising formation as they accelerated slowly. Ahead of them were the icons of a pair of battlecruiser squadrons and six aviary-class sealax followed in their wake. A sprinkling of lighter units spread out in a necklace of jewels ahead of the main formation, watching alertly for any hint of an unidentified starship, and a trio of fast replenishment ships loaded with additional missile pods trailed along behind the carriers. Not a capital ship on the display was more than three T years old, and once again, Tourville felt something suspiciously like awe. The Republican Navy might remain technologically inferior in some ways to the Royal Manticoran Navy, but unlike the Mantis, it had risen from the ashes of defeat. Its officers, its senior personnel, had known what it meant to lose battle after battle, but now the same officers and personnel had learned what it was to win. More than that, they'd come to expect to win— and Lester Tourville wondered if the Mantis truly realized just how true that was. Well, he thought, if they don't realize it now, we'll give them a hint in about two weeks. Sir, we've just picked up a hyperfootprint. It looks like at least two ships, probably destroyers or light cruisers. Where? Captain Duran demanded, walking across the space station's command deck to plotting. Forty-two light minutes out from the primary, on our side, and right on the ecliptic, sir,' Lieutenant Bebo replied. "'So the foxes are scouting the in-house,' Durand murmured. The plotting officer looked up at him a bit strangely. Charles Bebo was from the slums of Nouveau Paris, whereas Durand came from the farming planet of Rochelle, and the skipper kept coming up with oddball metaphors and similes. But the lieutenant caught his drift just fine and nodded in agreement. All right, lieutenant, Duran said after a moment, resting one hand lightly on Bebo's shoulder as he watched the hyper footprints fade from the plot. Keep an eye out. If we can pick up their platform, so much the better, but the main thing I want to know is when anyone else hypers in. I sir. Durant patted him on the shoulder once, then turned and walked slowly back to his own command chair. Somewhere out there, he knew, Manti reconnaissance arrays were creeping stealthily inward, spying out the details of the Solon system's defenses. He knew what they were going to see, and it wasn't all that impressive. A single division of old-style super dreadnoughts, a slightly understrength battlecruiser squadron, and a couple of hundred lakhs. Hardly enough to cause a manty raiding force to break a sweat. Which was fine with Captain Alexis Durand. Just fine. Chapter 35 We have Commander Estwick's report, Your Grace, Andrea Jarowalski said. Good. Honor turned away from the visual display's gorgeous imagery. 
Task Force 82 forged through hyperspace, closing in on its objective steadily in close enough formation for the display to show the glowing disks of the nearest ship's Warshawski sails. Intolerant, Imperator sister ship, and the flagship of Rear Admiral Alan Morowitz, the division CO, was the nearest vessel. Her sails, three hundred kilometers across, flickered with lambent fire, like a slice of heat lightning moving across the glowing depths of hyperspace in a visual spectacle Honor never tired of. But she turned her back upon it with what was almost a sense of relief at Jarowalski's announcement. Let's see it, she said, crossing to the secondary plot at Jarowalski's bridge station. The ops officer touched the keyboard, shunting the download from HMS Ambuscade onto the display, and then she and her admiral stood back and watched the data assemble itself. Not as much firepower as we'd anticipated, Your Grace, Jarowalski observed after a moment. No. Honor frowned and rubbed the tip of her nose. All their planning had assumed Lorne would be the target more likely to be covered by mobile units, which was why she'd swapped Alice Truman, two of Alistair McKeon's super dreadnought divisions, and Matsuzawa Hirotaka's older battlecruisers, in return for Michelle Hankey's more modern but understrength squadron. She'd also given Alice Winston Bradshaw's 7th Cruiser Squadron, with its four Edward Saganami C-Class cruisers, while she took Sharice Fanafi's Crew Run 12 with its older Saganami and Star Knight-class cruisers. Still, they'd anticipated more defensive strength than this for a target as populous and economically important as Solon. I make it two super dreadnoughts, she continued after a moment, plus seven battle cruisers and roughly, she consulted a display sidebar, a hundred and ninety lakhs. For mobile units, yes, your grace, Jarowalski agreed. But it looks like they've got a fairly dense shell of missile pods in close to the planetary industry around Arthur. And another little clutch here around Merlin, Honor pointed out and frowned some more. That's a rather strange spot for them, wouldn't you say? I certainly would. Jarowalski looked at the data and pursed her lips while she considered it. That's much too far out to cover the Nimue Belt's extraction centers, she said. Is there something going on out among Melon's moons that we don't know about? I suppose there could be, Honor mused, gazing at the stupendous gas giant, only a bit smaller than old Earth's Jupiter, in question. According to the Astro data, a couple of Merlin's moons are darn nearly the size of Manticore, and it's got a total of eleven. There could be something exploitable in among all of those, but whatever it is, it's on the far side of the primary from Arthur at the moment anyway. So I think we'll just leave Merlin alone and concentrate on Arthur and the Belter installations. That suits me just fine, Your Grace, Jarowalski agreed. It looks like our best bet is probably Alpha 3, Honor continued. I'd just as soon avoid any unnecessary bells and whistles. Alpha 3 works for me, Your Grace, Jarowalski agreed again. Shall I pass the word to Admiral Miklosh? Go ahead, Honor nodded and tell him to double-check his alternate recovery points with his collects. Of course, Your Grace, Jarowalski said, then paused, looking at her admiral thoughtfully. Um, is there some particular reason you wanted to do that, Your Grace? Nothing I can put a finger on, Honor said after a moment. I guess I'm just a little antsy. As you say, we'd anticipated a significantly heavier defensive force for a system this important— Yes, ma'am. You're thinking that whoever's in command here has tried to pull a belfry on us? Not really, Honor said almost unwillingly, then shook her head at her own formless misgivings. Estwick knows her job, and everybody was thoroughly briefed on what happened at Chantilly. And, she reminded herself, that's one reason we gave her an extra eighteen hours to scout the system. If there'd been anything close enough to Arthur to pose a threat, Ambuscade and Intruder would have found it. I suppose part of it could just be the fact that Solon lies right in the middle of a gravity wave, she continued aloud. I always get a sort of uncomfortable feeling between my shoulder blades in a case like this. Jarowalski nodded. No flag officer really liked attacking a star system which lay in the middle of a hyperspace gravity wave, not unless she was totally confident she'd brought along enough firepower to take the system outright, for a very simple reason— 
A starship could not enter a gravity wave and survive without functioning Warshawski sails, and no ship could produce a Warshawski sail if it had lost an alpha node out of one of its impeller rings, which meant a single unlucky hit could leave a warship with otherwise trifling damage unable to withdraw into hyper if the rest of its task force or fleet had to run for it. Frankly, Jarowalski suspected that was one reason Honor had assigned herself to command the Solon attack. Well, that and the fact that they'd anticipated, erroneously as it turned out, that Solon, with its heavily populated planet and relatively thriving economy, would have considerably heavier fixed defenses than Lorne. As I say, Honor continued, I don't have any real reason to feel uneasy, but have Samuel double-check anyhow. She smiled crookedly. I'm not trying to develop a reputation for infallible intuition, so it won't hurt anything if I do a little excess worrying and people catch me at it. Captain Durand! Captain Durand to the command deck immediately! Alexis Durand punched the flush button, yanked up his trousers, and hit the lavatory door running. One of the space station's civilian maintenance techs grinned as the naval officer charged past him, still sealing his trousers. Well, Durand could stand a little civilian amusement at his expense. He came through the command deck hatch and slid to a stop at plotting. Bebo had the watch again, and he looked up as Durand appeared beside him. You wanted to know when anyone else turned up, sir, the petty officer said grimly, waving at his display. Well, here they are. So I see, Lieutenant. Have you informed Admiral Deutscher? Yes, sir, and passed word to Moriarty, too. Good, Durand said softly, leaning closer to the display. What does CIC make of it so far? Twenty-eight point sources, sir. It looks like seven super dreadnoughts or carriers, eleven battle cruisers or heavy cruisers, and nine light cruisers or destroyers, all on our side of the primary and right on the limit, plus, of course, whatever they left in system to keep an eye on us. Of course. Durand nodded, and he and the lieutenant exchanged wolf-like grins. Sir? a communications rating said respectfully. Governor Matheson wants to know if she should begin evacuating the platforms? By all means, Jaron said, and remind her to be obvious about it. Aye, sir. Durand returned his attention to Bebo's plot and folded his arms across his chest while he thought. No sign of lack separation yet? he asked after a few moments. No, sir. Very good. Inform me as soon as you see it, as soon as their lead starship crosses the upper limit, or as soon as any of them micro-jump. Aye, sir. Durand gazed at the plot for a few more moments, then walked slowly to his own command chair and seated himself in it. Despite Rear Admiral Deutscher's seniority, this portion of the operation was officially Durand's responsibility, and part of him wanted to send the message now, but he made himself put the temptation firmly aside— they needed to let the situation settle down a bit first. Very well, Samuel, let's be about it, Honor said. Launch your lax. Aye, aye, old grace, Vice Admiral Mikolosh acknowledged and turned away from his comm pickup on the flag bridge of HMS Succubus to pass the order. A moment later, Honor saw the first lax icons appear on her tactical plot. The six sea lax carried over 670 lax between them, but she was leaving HMS Unicorn's wing behind to provide security for Miklosh's weakly armed carriers. She was also leaving three of Mary Lou Moreau's light cruisers, Tisiphone, Samurai, and Clotho, to help keep an eye on things, but the rest of the task force headed steadily in system with her flagship. She supposed she could have left a few main combatants as well, given how sparse the defenses were, but she still felt that unaccountable itch between her shoulder blades. She was fairly certain she was jumping at shadows, but it wouldn't hurt anything to stay concentrated. The 560 lax accompanying her starships spread out in a globe about them, and Andrea Jarowalski sent an advanced guard of recon platforms out ahead as they shaped their course to intercept the planet Arthur's orbit. Sir, they're crossing the limit, Bebo said. Present velocity, 2.61,000 kps. Range to Arthur... 10.2 light minutes. 
Tracking makes their current Axel 4.81 kps squared. They're staying concentrated? No detachments? Pretty much, sir. It looks like they're leaving their carriers behind with three cruisers and a lax security patrol, but all the rest of them are headed in system. Durand nodded, not without a flicker of disappointment. Not that he was really surprised. He'd always thought the Merlin pods were unlikely to suck them in, but it had been worth a try. And they'd needed something to camouflage the tarantula platforms anyway. Time to Arthur? he asked. Assuming a zero-zero intercept and constant accelerations, approximately three hours and seventeen minutes, sir, they'll make turnover nine or one point eight million clicks out in ninety-four minutes. Very good. Communications? Yes, sir. Send Lieutenant Bibo's data to Tarantula and instruct Lieutenant Sigoni to execute his orders. Aye, sir. Their super dreadnoughts are starting to stir, Your Grace. Honor broke off her conversation with Mercedes Brigham at Jarowalski's announcement. Her own force had been headed in system for thirty seven minutes. Her velocity relative to the system primary was up to thirteen thousand one hundred ninety one KPS, and she'd come just over seventeen million kilometers since crossing the hyperlimit, which meant she had a hundred and sixty six million still to go. She glanced at the plot and noted the vector arrows which had appeared next to the tiny defensive force in orbit around Arthur. As Jarowalski said, the starships, escorted by the swarm of lax, were beginning to move. She studied their vector for a moment, then frowned. Odd, she murmured. Ma'am? She looked up. Brigham stood at her elbow, where she'd been gazing at the same display, and the chief of staff arched one eyebrow as their eyes met. I said that's odd. Honor indicated the icons of the accelerating defenders. They're coming to meet us, which is odd enough on its own. I would have expected them to wait for us as deep into the envelope of their system defense pods as they could. If they keep accelerating at that rate, they'll be right at the very fringe of their pods' effective range when we engage, which means accuracy will be even lower than usual. By the same token, the range to their ships will be lower for us, which means our accuracy will be greater. But not only are they coming to meet us, but from these acceleration numbers, they don't have many, if any, pods of their own on tow. You think they're up to something sneaky, or is this just a panic reaction? I don't see what kind of sneakiness they could have in mind, Honor said after a second. Estwick's arrays got visual range imagery off of both of the SDs, so we know they aren't pod layers. That means they don't have any MDM capability without towing pods, which they clearly aren't doing. Oh, she waved a hand. They may have a few dozen tractored inside their wedges, but nowhere near enough to take us on in a missile duel, especially with the katanas to thicken our point defense. On the other hand, this is a bit late in the game for a panic reaction. We've been in the system for over 45 minutes. For them to be underway at all at this point, they must have been at at least standby readiness when we turned up, which makes sense since they obviously realized Estwick was scouting for a raid. But from standby readiness, they could have been underway a good 15 minutes sooner than this, a half hour sooner if they were sitting there with hot nodes. So why wait until now to panic? So what do you think they're doing? Brigham asked. I don't know, Honor admitted, rubbing the tip of her nose once more. It looks like they're reacting in confusion, and I suppose that could be what's happening. But that just doesn't feel right somehow. She contemplated the plot for a few more moments, then climbed out of her command chair, scooped a skin-suited Nimitz up in her arms, and crossed to Jarowalski Station. How's their evacuation coming, Andrea? It's still going full bore, Your Grace. Jarowalski indicated a secondary display, driven by transmissions from the stealthed arrays hovering near Arthur. I wouldn't go so far as to call it panic-stricken, she continued, but they're obviously hauling everybody dirt side as quick as they can. Still no word from the system authorities, Harper? Honor asked, turning her head towards communications. No, Your Grace, Harper Brantley replied, and Honor grimaced. But you're still picking up those graph pulses, she asked. Yes, Your Grace. The comm officer nodded his head at Jarowalski. 
Captain Jirawalski's arrays are actually picking up most of them, but we've been looking at them over here as well. So far, it all looks like our own early generation traffic, probably from fixed recon arrays scattered around the system. Their pulse repetition frequency rate's still on the low side, so the information they're passing is probably limited, but there are at least a couple of stations out there with a higher PRF. Can you localize the more capable transmitters? We've nailed down two of them, Your Grace, Jarawalski reported. One of them seems to be aboard this space station. A red sighting ring popped into existence around the system's main space station as she spoke. It was a big thing, though no more than 20% the size of Hephaestus back home. And the other? Honor asked, eyes narrowing intently. The other one is out here, Your Grace. Jarawalski dropped another icon into the display. This one appeared to be in orbit around Merlin, which put it over 40 light minutes outside the system hyperlimit on the far side of the primary. Are they talking to each other, Harper? I'd say yes, Your Grace. I can't be positive, of course, but pattern analysis strongly suggests that they are. Thank you. Honor nodded and walked slowly back across to her command chair, right hand gently caressing the plushy fur between Nimitz's ears. Your Grace, I know that expression, Brigham said quietly as Honor and Nimitz rejoined her. I beg your pardon? I said, I know that expression. May I ask what's provoking it this time? I don't know, really, Honor shrugged. There's just something wrong. It's like they're going off in all directions at once, panicky evacuation of their orbital platforms, ships heading out to meet us without even bringing along heavy pod loads, no effort to communicate with us at all, and now this FTL message traffic. Maybe they really are going off in all directions at once, Your Grace, Brigham suggested. It's one thing to know the other side is scouting your system. It's another to see a force this powerful coming down on you. I know, I know, Honor snorted. Maybe I'm simply being paranoid, but I just can't shake the feeling that there's something out of kilter. Well, ma'am, even if Arthur is talking to someone out at Merlin, it's not like either of them were close enough to pose any sort of threat to us. For that matter, Merlin's on the entirely wrong side of Solon. Exactly. So why— Honor broke off abruptly, her eyes suddenly widening. Your Grace? Brigham asked sharply. Sidemore, Honor said. They're taking a page from Sidemore. Brigham looked blank for a moment, then inhaled deeply. They'd have to have accurately predicted our objectives, she said. No reason they couldn't have, Honor replied almost absently, eyes intent as she stared into the depths of her tactical plot. Not in a general sense, at least. Deciding what sorts of targets we'd be likely to hit wouldn't be that hard. Picking the exact specific targets would probably come down to a guessing game, but it looks like someone guessed right. She looked into the plot for a few more seconds, then turned away. Harper, get me a priority link to Admiral Miklosh. Too bad they didn't go for the cheese, sir. Captain Marius Gozi said, as he and Javier Giscard studied the master plot aboard RHNS Sovereign of Space. I never figured there was more than one chance in three they would, Giscard replied. Still, it was worth a try. He stood back from the plot and folded his hands behind him while he thought. From the reports of his own sensor platforms, it was very likely that one of those Manti Super Dreadnoughts was 8th Fleet's flagship in which case he was about to sit down across the table from the best the Mantis had. But this time I get to use my own cards, he reminded himself. And they're marked. The one thing he wished he had was real-time intelligence on exactly what the Mantis were up to, but that simply wasn't possible. The tarantula net could get tactical information to him, but only by sending it aboard dispatch boats, and he didn't have an unlimited supply of them. Nor could he send any of the boats back after they'd reported to him, since the Mantis would have been much too likely to detect their hyper-footprints when they translated back into normal space. At least so far, the raiders appeared to be doing what he wanted them to do. He would have preferred for them to take the cheese, as Gozi had called it, 
If they decided the missile pods planted around Merlin indicated there was something out there worth attacking, they might have divided their forces. Of course, the real reason for the pods had been to provide background clutter to hide the tarantula platforms, because Shannon hadn't been able to get the new FTL comms into something small enough to count on evading the notice of manti-sensor arrays. But there'd always been the chance of killing multiple birds with a single stone. And once they'd come in close enough to Merlin, they would have been trapped inside the massive gas giant's own hyperlimit, pinned while his units closed in behind them. Still, as he'd told his chief of staff, he'd never really had much confidence they would. He checked the time display. Four minutes until the next dispatch boat was due. Selma, pass the preparatory signal for ambush three, he said. Aye, sir. Commander Selma Thackeray, his operations officer, responded. Yes, Your Grace, Vice Admiral Samuel Miklos said as he appeared on Honor's comm display. It's a trap, Samuel, Honor said flatly. The FTL comm graph pulses meant there was no light speed lag in their conversation at this short range, and Miklos's eyes widened in surprise. I can't prove it, yet, she continued, but I'm sure of it. Get your carriers out. Go to Omega-1. It was obvious from Miklos's expression that he wanted to ask her if she was certain that was what she really wanted to do, but he didn't. He only nodded. Yes, Your Grace, at once. And you? And we, Samuel, are going to have our hands full, I'm afraid, she said grimly. Captain Durand. Yes, Charles? Durand turned quickly towards Bibot. Sir, their carriers just translated out. Damn. Durand thought furiously for perhaps ten seconds. There could be a perfectly innocent reason for the Mantis to have suddenly decided to move their carriers, but he didn't believe it for a moment. No, somehow they'd guessed what was coming, and he suppressed a desire to swear yet again. Communications? Pass Lieutenant Bibo's current sensor data onto Tarantula— Tell them I recommend an immediate relay to Admiral Giscard. The dispatch boat, one light minute outside Merlin's orbit, received Durand's FTL transmission, relayed to its light-speed communications arrays by the tarantula net, 72 seconds after it was transmitted. The boat's computers updated, and it translated smoothly across the alpha wall. Javier Giscard's task force was waiting exactly where it had been for the past week and a half, and the dispatch boat quickly relayed the tactical update to its flagship. Sir, it looks like the Manti smelled a rat, Commander Thackeray reported. Their silax just translated out. Damn it, Gozi muttered, but Giscard only showed his teeth in a tight grin. Actually, catching them that far outside the limit would have been problematical at best, Marius, he said. You know how hard it is to plot a hyperjump this short, and they weren't exactly likely to be sitting there with their hypergenerators offline and their impeller nodes cold. Unless we translated down right on top of them, they'd have had time to get into hyper before we could range on them. He shrugged. I'd figured we were going to lose them from the moment the mantis left them behind. However... His grin turned positively lupine. If the carriers are gone, the lacks are stuck, aren't they? He looked at the updated plot for a few more seconds, then nodded decisively to himself. Selma, execute ambush three. Oh, crap, Commander Harriman muttered. Talk to me, Yolanda, Raphael Cardonis said quickly. CIC reports multiple hyper footprints, Skipper. Imperator's tactical officer reported harshly. Three separate clusters, one dead astern of us at 30.4 million clicks, one at Polar North and one at Polar South. They've got us boxed, sir. Cardonis felt his jaw muscles clench as his own tactical plot updated with the new icons. Well, the old lady's been warning us the peeps were eventually going to get wise, he told himself. I could wish they hadn't gotten quite this wise, though. It's confirmed, Your Grace, Andrea Jarowalski said. Three separate forces, a total of 18 wallers and six silax, plus screening elements. We're designating the Arthur Detachment Bogey 1, the task group to System North is Bogey 2, the 1 2 System South is Bogey 3, and the 1 astern of us is Bogey 4. 
and their units are evenly distributed between two, three, and four? That's what it looks like, Your Grace. So three to one in Waller is at best, Mercedes Brigham said quietly, her expression taut. Nine to one if they manage to concentrate, plus the older ship's in system, of course. If we let them concentrate on us, we'll deserve whatever happens to us. Honor Soprano was completely calm, almost detached. The good news was that the three ambushing task groups had clearly been waiting in place in Hyper, motionless relative to Solon. They'd come across the Alpha Wall with an effectively zero velocity, and though they were accelerating hard at 529 gravities, which meant their compensator safety margins must be down to zero, it was going to take them time to build a vector, whereas her own command was already up to over 14,000 kilometers per second. Moreover, her maximum acceleration rate was higher than theirs, so the force astern of them couldn't possibly overtake them unless they suffered drive damage. The bad news was that they were only 30 million kilometers back, and on low-powered settings, current-generation Havenite MDMs had a powered range of almost 61 million kilometers from rest. Missile defense, go to Plan Romeo, she said crisply. Shift to formation Charlie. Teo? Yes, Your Grace, Lieutenant Commander Kagari said instantly. We'll break south, Honor told her staff astrogator. Take us to military power and plot me a course that bends us the maximum distance away from bogey one, but maintains at least current separation from bogey four. Aye, aye, ma'am. Kagari bent over his console, and Anna returned her attention to the tactical plot, watching the icons of her formation shift rapidly. It won't be long now, she thought. Sir, we've got about the best Aradine solutions we're going to get, Commander Thackeray reported. Giscard looked at her, and she met his gaze frankly. Our accuracy isn't going to be very good at such extended range, she said. Understood, Selma. On the other hand, we've got a lot of missiles. Let's start getting them into space. Fire Plan Baker. Aye, sir. Chapter 36 Missile Separation Andrea Jarowalski announced. I have multiple missile separations, range at launch 30.45 million kilometers. Time to attack range, seven minutes. Understood. Do not return fire. Do not return fire, aye, aye, ma'am, Jarowalski replied. Your grace, I have that course, Kigari said. Give it to Andrea. Come to 293-005 at 6.01 kps squared. Kigari said. 293-005-6.01 kps squared, Jarowalski repeated, and the task force altered course while the first salvo howled up its wake. Each of Javier Giscard's six SDPs could roll six pods simultaneously, one pattern every 12 seconds, and each pod contained ten missiles, each a bit larger than the Royal Manticoran Navy's own first-generation MDMs. The range was extremely long for accuracy, especially using Havenite fire control systems, so Giscard opted for maximum density salvos, both to saturate the enemy's defenses and to give him more possibilities of hits. Each of his ships deployed six patterns, a total of 108 pods, programmed for a staggered launch. And then, precisely on schedule, all of them launched and sent a total of almost 1,100 multi-drive missiles screaming up Task Force 82's wake. The range at launch was 30,450,000 kilometers. Given the relative motion of the two forces, actual flight distance was 36,757,440 kilometers. At that distance, and an acceleration of 416.75 kps squared, the MDMs attained a velocity relative to the primary of 175,034 kps, which equated to an overtake velocity against Task Force 82 of 152,925 kps, or 53% of light speed. Seventy-two seconds later, a second identical salvo roared out of its pods, and seventy-two seconds after that, a third. In the space of just over 13 minutes, 11 salvos, just under 12,000 missiles, went hurtling after Task Force 82. 
In a traditional engagement, the pursuing Republican super dreadnoughts would have been able to fire only a handful of missiles from their bow-mounted chase tubes. In an era of pod layers, that limitation had long since disappeared, but what remained true was that missiles closing from directly ahead or directly astern faced the weakest defensive fire. There simply wasn't room to mount as many point-defense laser clusters and counter-missile tubes on a warship's ends as on her broadside. The clusters mounted were the most powerful ones in her entire armament, but there could be only a few of them. Telemetry links to counter-missiles were also limited, and the fact that her wedge offered no protection against fire from those angles only made the situation worse. And, of course, just to make things even better from Task Force 82's perspective— Havenite MDMs carried bigger and more powerful warheads as compensation for their poorer accuracy and penetration aids. Why aren't they returning fire? Gozi asked quietly. I don't know, Giscard replied. Maybe they don't want their own attack bird's wedges interfering with their fire control. Besides, Unless they want to alter heading to open their broadsides, they can't have the control links to manage a salvo dense enough to get through our point defense. Gozi nodded, and Giscard turned his attention back to the plot. His hypothesis was at least superficially logical, but deep inside, he didn't believe it himself. Bogey 4's first salvo's MDMs raced onward, crossing the vast gulf between the ships which had launched them and their targets. Seventy lost lock and arced off uselessly four minutes into their flight due to a telemetry glitch. One thousand and ten continued on course. Enemy fire appears to be tracking in on Imperator and Intolerant, Jarawalski reported tensely. Not surprising, I suppose, Mercedes Brigham muttered. But maybe not the smartest targeting, Anna replied calmly. Brigham looked at her and Anna shrugged. I admit... It would pay the highest dividend if they managed to knock out an alpha node on one of the super dreadnoughts, but their defenses are a lot tougher than anyone else's, and given the geometry, they'll have a long time to throw missiles at us. If I were in command over there, I'd start with the battle cruisers, or maybe even the heavy cruisers. Kill the weaker platforms first and attrit our missile defenses, Brigham said. Exactly. Each of them represents a smaller percentage of our total defensive capability, but they'd be a lot easier to kill or cripple. Honor shrugged again. You could argue it either way, I suppose. Go for the golden BB on an SDP, or chew up the weaker escorts first. Personally, I'd have done it the other way. She stood gazing into the master tactical plot, left hand resting on the corner of a tactical ratings console, right hand slowly, gently stroking Nimitz's head, and her expression was calm, thoughtful. Counter-missile launch in 15 seconds, Jarawalski announced. The powered range from rest for the Mark 31 counter-missile was 3,585,556 kilometers, with a flight time of 75 seconds. Given the geometry of the engagement, effective range at launch was over 12.5 million kilometers, and the defensive missiles started to go out 90 seconds before the Havenite MDMs reached standoff attack range of their targets. The Mod 2 XR counter-missile launcher had a cycle time of 8 seconds, which meant there was time for 11 launches per tube. In the old days, all of 4 T years ago, that wouldn't have mattered all that much, since the interference of the countermissile's own wedges would have blinded follow-up launches. Even now, that would have been true of a Havenite ship, although with the changes Shannon Foraker had made, any ship in a Havenite formation could now manage any other ship's countermissiles, as long as both units had arranged the handoff prior to launch. That meant a Republican formation with the same degree of separation between units as Task Force 82 could have managed perhaps three times the number of countermissiles it once could have. But the Royal Manticoran Navy had added the keyhole platforms to its bag of tricks. Instead of a half-dozen or a dozen countermissiles per ship, they could bring the fire of their entire broadside countermissile batteries to bear. They weren't restricted to the telemetry links physically mounted on their after hammerheads. They had sufficient links to control all of their countermissiles aboard each keyhole, and each ship had two keyholes deployed. And as Missile Defense Plan Romeo rolled on her ships up on their sides, 
those platforms gained sufficient vertical separation to see past the interference of subsequent counter-missile salvos fired at far tighter intervals than had ever before been possible. They still couldn't control eleven salvos, but they could control eight, and each of those eight contained far more missiles than anyone else could have managed. Javier Giscard's staff had anticipated no more than five CM launches, and they'd allowed for an average of only ten counter-missiles per ship, for a total of two hundred per launch. Their fire plans had been predicated on facing somewhere around a thousand ship-launched CMs, and perhaps another thousand or so from the Katanas. What they got was over 7,200 from Honor's starships alone. My God, Marius Gozi said softly, as the impeller signatures of their attack missiles vanished under the swarm of Manti countermissiles. How in the hell did they do that? I don't know, Giscard gritted, but that's why they didn't counter-launch MDMs. They figure their defenses can handle whatever we throw, and the bastards are simply conserving their ammo. He glared at the display, then looked up at Thackeray. Abort Baker! We're going to need a lot heavier salvos to get through that. He jerked his head at the plot, where his second salvo had just disappeared as tracelessly as the first. I don't know if we can throw a dense enough salvo to get through it, sir, Thackeray said. Her expression was almost shocked, but her eyes were intent, and it was obvious her brain was still working. Yes, we can, Giscard told her flatly. Here's what I want you to do. He explained for a few seconds, and Thackeray nodded sharply when he finished. It'll take me a little while to set it up, sir. Understood. Go. Giscard pointed at her console, and as she dived back into the tactical section, he returned his attention to Gozi. I never counted on that level of defensive fire either, he said, but I think it means we're going to have to change our plans for Deutscher. What do you want him to do, sir? Their new vector is going to take them within 50 million kilometers of Arthur. Given that that's almost certainly Honor Harrington in command over there, I don't expect them to peg any missiles at the civilian orbital platforms as they go by. Of course, it may not be her, or I could be wrong about what she's going to do— At any rate, we're not going to be able to prevent her from passing that close, but given that, I don't want Deutscher getting any closer to her than he has to. Besides, if he stops accelerating now, he'll have extra time to build his own side of the trap. I understand, sir. Your Grace, they've ceased fire, Andrea Jarowalski reported jubilantly. No, they haven't, Anna replied quietly. Jarowalski looked at her, and Honor smiled thinly. "'What they're doing over there right this minute, Andrea, is deploying a lot more pods. I'd guess they'll probably roll at least ten or twelve patterns each. Sequencing that many launches for a simultaneous time on target will be complicated, but not all that difficult.' "'You're probably right, Your Grace,' Jarowalski conceded after only a moment's thought. "'It's the obvious counter, now that you've pointed it out.' So the next salvo is going to be just a bit more difficult to kill. In which case, Honor said grimly, it may be time to distract them just a bit. I want the battle cruisers held in reserve. They don't have enough ammo capacity to use up pods at this range, but Imperator and Intolerant will engage the enemy. Pick one super dreadnought and pound it, Andrea. Aye, aye, ma'am. Admiral, one of Jarowalski's ratings said. Bogey One just killed its acceleration. I expected that, Honor said. Bogey One was never strong enough to fight us. I suspect the only reason it headed towards us in the first place was to contribute to the impression of a system defense force that was thoroughly uncoordinated and panicked. Now that the trap's been sprung, they're not going to want to get any closer to us than they can help. We're ready, Admiral, Selma Thackeray said. Very well. Execute. Javier Giscard's task group abruptly altered heading by 90 degrees, bringing its broadsides to bear on Task Force 82. The maneuver cut their acceleration towards the Manticoran ships to zero. But their relative velocity was losing ground steadily anyway, and the turn also brought all of their broadside fire control to bear, which meant they had many times as many control links as they'd had before. 
he was effectively conceding the pursuit in order to maximize his chances of crippling one or more of his foes. Missile launch, Thackeray's assistant operations officer barked suddenly. We have multiple missile separations, Admiral. Range at launch, 39.404 million kilometers. Time to attack range, 7.6 minutes. Well, that wasn't exactly unexpected, Giscard said, just a bit more calmly than he actually felt. They figured out what we're up to, and they want to force us to use them or lose them. Launching now, sir, Thackeray said, and Giscard nodded. So, they have a few new wrinkles of their own, Honor observed. Selma Thackeray had spent the last six minutes deploying missile pods. In that time, she'd positioned 1,080 of them. Now she launched all of them simultaneously. The next best thing to 11,000 MDMs hurled themselves at Task Force 82. Given their lower acceleration rate and the fact that TF-82 was continuing to accelerate away from them, their flight time would be 25 seconds longer than TF-82s, and their closing velocity would be almost 9,000 kps lower when they arrived, but what they lacked in performance, they more than made up in sheer numbers. They couldn't possibly have enough control links to manage that many missiles simultaneously, Honor thought, but the way the individual components of the enormous salvo were spreading out and separating, it looked as if they'd come up with a data-sharing approach similar to that of the Alliance. If she was right, their control circuits were bouncing back and forth between individual subflights of missiles, which was going to cost them even more in accuracy. But given the size of the attack wave it made possible, they probably figured the new technique was well worth it. And they're probably right about that, too, she told herself. All units, missile defense Sierra, Jurawalski snapped. Carter, stay on the attack birds. Aye, aye, ma'am, one of her assistants replied, and Jurawalski turned her full attention to the defensive engagement. We have a probable total of 288 incoming in each salvo, sir, Thackeray reported. Giscard nodded in understanding. Given the greater capacity per pod the Mantis appeared to be getting out of their new downsized MDMs, Thackeray's estimate worked out to a double pattern from each of the Mantis super dreadnoughts. Of course, given the fiendishly capable EW capabilities of Manti missile penetration aids, an accurate count of the incoming was a virtual impossibility. Still, the interval between salvos, 24 seconds, accorded well with Thackeray's estimate. Get the scimitars into position, he said. I sir, Thackeray replied, and he heard her coaching the escorting lanks into positions from which their counter-missiles and laser clusters could engage the incoming warheads without fouling Thackeray's telemetry to her own attack birds. They're moving their lanks in to intercept, Lieutenant Carter announced, his voice a bit hoarse. Despite his superb instrumentation, he himself had absolutely no control over the attack. He was simply monitoring it for honor while the tack officers of the individual ships executed the instructions Jarowalski had already transmitted, and he was very young. It's to be expected, honor told him quietly. She stood behind Jarowalski, watching the ops officer's plot as the incredible Havenite missile storm roared towards her command. Just take it as it comes, Jeff. Yes, Your Grace. Carter drew a deep breath and settled himself in his chair, and Anna reached out to rest her right hand lightly on his shoulder for a moment. But even as she did, her eyes stayed on Jarowalski's plot. Owen I estimated that the latest Havenite SDPs carried approximately the same number of missile pods as a Medusa class. Assuming that was accurate, then each of the six super dreadnoughts pursuing her task force carried 500 pods. They'd expended at least a hundred and sixty each in the first exchange, and there had to be at least a thousand pods in this monster salvo. That came to a total of somewhere around two thousand, so if the six of them carried three thousand pods between them, that meant they'd have expended two-thirds of their total ammunition allotment by the time these missiles arrived. They can't sustain this level of fire, she told herself. On the other hand, if they get through with enough of it this time around, it may not matter. They're targeting the battle cruisers this time, too, Your Grace, Brigham said softly, and Honor nodded curtly. They weren't ignoring the super dreadnoughts, 
but they'd clearly devoted at least some of their total fire to Henke's battlecruisers. Here it comes, someone said. The voice was low, and Giscard didn't recognize it, nor did he try to. He doubted whoever it was realized he'd spoken aloud anyway. Not that anyone had required the announcement. The first Manticoran salvo streaked into his task group's teeth, and it was obvious the Mantis had concentrated everything on a single target. Task Force 82's missiles roared down on the super-dreadnought RHNS Conquette. There were, in fact, 240 attack missiles and 48 EW platforms in the lead salvo. Half of the EW birds were dragon's teeth, and as they entered Bogey 4's counter-missile envelope, they suddenly appeared on the Havenite tracking displays as 240 additional attack missiles. Counter-missiles which had been locked onto them suffered massive confusion as their targets abruptly shoaled into literally dozens of false images. Other counter-missiles, which had been earmarked for genuine threats, diverted to the new targets, spending themselves uselessly. Fourteen of the dragon's teeth survived to cross the first interception zone. Six of them survived to cross the second interception zone. Two of them made it halfway across the inner counter-missile zone, but before the last of them was destroyed, they'd carried 156 attack missiles and 14 Dazzler EW platforms with them. Laser clusters tracked under the surviving Manticoran missiles, but those missiles were closing at 62% of light speed. Each cluster had an effective range of 150,000 kilometers, but Manticoran MDMs had a standoff attack range of 40,000 kilometers, and it took them barely half a second to cross the intervening 110,000 kilometers. There were literally thousands of laser clusters aboard the Super Dreadnoughts and their escorting scimitars, but they got, at most, one shot each. And just before they fired, the fourteen surviving Dazzlers erupted in bursts of jamming that blinded sensors searching desperately for targets. Despite everything the superior Manticoran EW could do, Shannon Foraker's defensive doctrine worked. Not as well as a Manticoran defense might have, perhaps, but sheer volume of firepower still made itself felt. Of the 240 attack missiles in the salvo, only eight survived to attack range. Two of them detonated late, wasting their power on the roof of Conquette's impenetrable impeller wedge. The other six detonated between 15 and 20,000 kilometers off the ship's port bow, and massive bomb-pumped lasers punched brutally through her sidewall. Alarms howled as the Temeraire-class ship shuddered in anguish. Five point defense clusters, two counter-missile tubes, and three grazer mounts blew apart. Beta nodes 1, 3, and 5, Radar 1, Gravitic 1, and three of her fire control telemetry arrays were blotted away. Fifty-one members of her crew were killed, another 18 were badly wounded, and splinters of armor, some the size of a pinnace, blasted away from her hull. But for all the horrific power of those hits, the damage was actually minor. Super Dreadnoughts were designed and built to survive the most savage punishment imaginable, and Conquette went right on rolling missile pods. It looks like we got at least a couple of hits through, Your Grace, Lieutenant Carter reported. It's hard to be certain at this range, even with the remote arrays, but CIC feels fairly confident. Good, Honor said. Good. And here comes the response, Brigham said grimly. What was that old wet navy saying you told me about, Your Grace? For what we are about to receive, may we be truly thankful, Honor finished, without looking away from the plot. That's it, Brigham agreed, and then the MDMs were upon them. It was the Republic's turn, and the tsunami of missiles crashed into Task Force 82's outer counter-missile zone. Havenite EW might not be as good as the RMNs, but it did its best, and that best was much better than it once had been. Almost 11,000 MDMs had been launched. 617 had simply become lost and wandered away as Bogey Force fire control strained to meet the demands placed on it. The remaining 10,183 continued to charge forward as the Mark 31s came to meet them. 2,600 of them died in the outer interception zone. Another 3,200 died in the intermediate zone, and the Mark 31s killed another 2,900 in the inner zone. But then it was their turn to slash across the laser cluster's engagement envelope in less than a second, and there were still 1,472 of them left.
200 were EW platforms, and the targeting solutions of the other 1,200 were far poorer than Task Force 82's had been, but there were a great many of them. The last-ditch lasers aboard the warships and their escorting lacks killed over 900. Of the 372 surviving attack missiles, 103 wasted themselves uselessly against their target's impeller wedges. Of the other 269, 172 attacked the two super dreadnoughts, and Imperator and Intolerant heaved as lasers ripped into them. Their sidewalls intercepted and blunted most of the lasers, but it was the turn of Manticoran armor to shatter under the pounding. Imperator emerged with relatively minor damage, including the loss of three grazers and half a dozen laser clusters, but Intolerant staggered as dozens of hits hammered her thick, multiply armor. Huge splinters of it blew away, energy mounts and laser clusters were wiped out, and communication and fire control emitters, radar and gravitic arrays shattered. She bucked in agony under the pounding, and then a final freak hit ripped straight into the gaping missile hatch in the center of her after hammerhead. Rear Admiral Morowitz's flagship rocked as the powerful energy blast smashed forward along the unarmored open central core of a pod layer. Hundreds of missile pods were wrecked, turned into twisted and shattered alloy and wreckage. The missile handling rails were torn apart, and over 30 of her crew were killed. Yet, terrible as the damage was, Bew ships had considered the possibility of just such a hit. Unlike the original Medusa Harrington class SDPs, the Invictus class had been built from the beginning with a double sided core hull wrapped around its hollow center, and the walls of her central missile well were armored almost as heavily as her flanks. The coffer damming and compartmentalization weren't as deep, but they were far deeper than in the earlier classes, and the additional defenses proved their worth as a ring of vaporized and splintered alloy blasted back out of the shattered missile hatch for the ship survived. Not only survived, but maintained her maximum acceleration while her anti-missile defenses continued to engage the last of the incoming MDMs. Your Grace, Intolerance lost her entire offensive missile armament and both keyholes, Jerowalski said in a tight voice. Casualties are heavy, and her flag bridge took a heavy hit. Sounds like something blew back through CIC. Admiral Morowitz and most of his staff are down. She shook her head. It doesn't sound good for the Admiral, ma'am. Understood, Honor said quietly. Star Ranger also took a beating, Jerowalski continued. She's still combat capable, but she's already confirmed sixty two dead, and her starboard sidewall is at less than half strength forward. Aside from that, the only other damage is to Ajax. Honor's expression didn't even flicker, but a cold fist seemed to touch her heart, and she looked quickly for the sidebar on Hanky's flagship. It's relatively minor, Jerowalski went on. She's got half a dozen wounded, only a couple of them seriously, and she's lost one grazer and two point defense clusters out of her port broadside. Understood, Honor said again. She looked at Lieutenant Brantley. Harper, inform Captain Cardonis that Admiral Morowitz is down, and that I'm assuming tactical control of the division for now. Aye, aye, Your Grace. Andrea, Honor turned back to Jarowalski. Drop the lax back. With intolerance damage, we'll need the ferrets and the katana's vipers. Task Force 82's second wave of MDMs roared in on Bogey 4. Counter missiles streamed to meet them, dragon's teeth spawned, targets proliferated, dazzlers flared, counter missile and MDM impeller wedges vanished in mutual self destruction, and then the surviving attackers hurled themselves once again upon Conquette. Multiple hits aft! Conquette's captain listened to his senior engineering officer's report from Damage Control Central. Heavy damage between frames 10907 and 2018. Grazer 40 has gone, just gone. There's a hole you could park a fucking penis in where it used to be, and it looks like 100% casualties on the mount. 42 is out of the fire control net as well, and sidewall 10 and 11 are toast. We've got a core hole breach at frame 2006. I've lost at least three more laser clusters, and they just took two bait nodes out of the after ring. Do what you can, Stu, the captain replied, looking at the scarlet splash damage control schematic on one of his secondary plots. We're on it, the engineer replied, and the captain nodded to himself. Conquette was hurt, no question about it, and he knew the pain of the people he'd just lost was waiting for him. 
but she was still combat capable, and that was what really mattered. Conquet reports moderate damage, Marius Gozi told Giscard. Captain Frederick says she's still combat capable, but he's rolling ship to pull his starboard sidewall away from the Mantis. Good, Giscard replied, never looking away from the main tactical plot. He didn't like the fact that the Mantis had managed to hit Conquette that hard with only two salvos, but Fredericks was a solid, reliable CO, and by simply rolling ship rather than delaying to ask permission, he was showing the sort of intelligent initiative Giscard, Tourville, and Thomas Theismann had worked so hard to create. The thoughts ran through the back of Giscard's mind, but virtually all of his attention was focused on the plot as he waited for the lightspeed report on what his first huge salvo had accomplished. "'Sir, we're showing hits on multiple enemy units,' Selma Thackeray said suddenly, her voice jubilant, and Giscard's eyes narrowed as the same results appeared on the plot sidebars. "'Hits on both SDs and at least two of the cruisers,' Thackeray continued, listening to CIC's verbal report over her earbug. "'And—' She paused, listening intently, then turned her head to look directly at Giscard. "'Sir, the platforms confirm major damage to one of the SDPs.' "'Good work,' Giscard replied, but his pleasure at the report was not unalloyed. The third Manti MDM launch was coming in, and he watched the missiles slashing in on Conquette. "'At least five more hits, Your Grace,' Jarawalski reported. "'Her wedge strength is dropping, and her point defense is weakening.' "'Which would be nice if we still had the missiles to pound her with,' Mercedes Brigham said quietly to Honor. Honor glanced at her, and the chief of staff bobbed her head in Jarawalski's direction. Do you want to use the Agamemnons to make up for intolerance pods? she asked. No. Honor shook her head, watching Giscard's second stupendous missile wave overtake her ships from astern. This has to be the last launch this size they can manage— They've shot themselves dry to manage this kind of density, and I won't do the same thing with Mike's battlecruisers just to try to kill a ship that can't shoot at us anymore anyway. Not when we may need them worse shortly. Yes, ma'am. The attacking MDMs came sweeping in, like a comber rearing higher as it neared the beach, and Mark 31s, Vipers, and standard lack countermissiles from the ferrets slashed into it. The loss of intolerance keyhole platforms weakened the defensive umbrella significantly, but the time the Havenites needed to stack patterns had increased the interval between salvos enough for Honor's lax to drop back and take up optimum intercept positions astern of her starships. Several dozen MDMs lost lock on their programmed targets as the lax impeller signatures cluttered the range. They quested for replacements, obedient to their onboard programming, and 26 of them found lax. Nineteen of them got through, and seven shrikes, nine ferrets, and three katanas, along with the hundred and ninety men and women aboard them, died. Thirty-seven other MDMs got through everything Task Force 82 could throw at them. Six of the leakers were EW platforms, the other thirty-one streaked in on Imperator and Intolerant. Four hit starboard aft, Commander Thompson reported to Rafe Cardonis from Damage Control. Two more midships, about frame 9065, Grazer 23's out of the net, but the mount's undamaged. It's prepared to fire in local control. No major penetrations and no personnel casualties, but we've lost a couple of laser clusters from the after-starboard quadrant, and we're down one beta node from the after-ring. I think I can get the node back in about twenty minutes, but I could be wrong. Do what you can, Glenn, Cardona said, but his attention was on a secondary display. His own ship's wounds were minor, superficial at worst. The same couldn't be said for Intolerant. Intolerant reports loss of her entire starboard sidewall aft of midships, Your Grace. She has at least three core hold breaches and one fusion plant offline. Her shipboard fire control and point defense are seriously compromised. Honor nodded, keeping her expression calm as she listened to Jarawalski's report. Harper, get me Captain Sharif. Aye, aye, ma'am. Captain, Honor said moments later as Captain James Sharif appeared on her comm display. Your Grace? Sharif's face was taut, but his expression and voice were under firm control. How bad is it over there, James? Honestly? Sharif shrugged. Not good, Your Grace. I've got serious personnel casualties, and engineering's lost about 25% of its damage control remotes, almost 100% in the missile core. 
our compensators undamaged, and we've got enough node redundancy to maintain military power, but our offensive combat capability outside energy range is shot, and I'm afraid our missile defense pretty much sucks right now. That's what I was afraid of. Honor glanced at the astrogation display, then looked back at Sharif. We've run out of Bogey 4's MDM range, and on our present heading, we'll just scrape by outside Bogey 3's envelope, but that's going to take us within range of the pods they've got deployed around Arthur in about another 14 minutes. How much missile defense can you restore in that much time? Not a lot, Sharif said grimly. We've lost both keyholes. I don't think we can get either of them back this side of an all-up shipyard visit, Your Grace, and we still have a major fire in secondary fire control— my shipboard control links to starboard have taken a real beating, too. We're mostly in talk to port, so as long as I can keep that side of the ship towards the threat, we'll be able to control three or four CM salvos, but at best, I figure, we'll be at maybe 40% of design missile defense capability. Do what you can, she said. Go ahead and roll ship now. I'll try to adjust the formation to give you a little more cover. Thank you, Your Grace. Sharif smiled tightly. I'm glad you're thinking about us. Take care, James, Anna replied. Clear. She looked over her shoulder at Lieutenant Brantley. Admiral Hankey, Harper, she said. Aye, aye, ma'am. Less than ten seconds later, Michelle Hankey's face had replaced Sharif's on the comm display. Mike, Honor began without preamble. Intolerance in trouble. Her missile defense is way below par, and we're headed into the planetary pod's envelope— I know Ajax has taken a few licks of her own, but I want your squadron moved out on our flank. I need to interpose your point defense between Intolerant and Arthur. Are you in shape for that? Of course we are. Hanky nodded vigorously. Ajax is the only one who's been kissed, and our damage is all pretty much superficial. None of it'll have any effect on our missile defense. Good. Andrea and I will shift the lax as well, but they've expended a lot of CMs against those two monster launches from Bogey 4. Honor shook her head. I didn't think they could stack that many pods without completely saturating their own fire control. It looks like we're going to have to rethink a few things. That's the nature of the beast, isn't it? Hanky responded with a shrug. We live and learn. Those of us fortunate enough to survive, Honor agreed, just a bit grimly. Then she gave herself a little shake. All right, Mike, get your people moving. Clear. They're shifting formation, Admiral. Selma Thackeray reported. It looks like they're moving their battlecruisers between their damaged Super Dreadnought and Arthur. Sounds like we got a pretty good piece of her, sir, Gozi observed. I'd have preferred a better one, Giscard said, his eyes on the damage control report from Conquette scrolling up his display. Despite the disparity in firepower, the Manti's stubborn concentration on a single target had paid them dividends. Conquette was the only one of Giscard's ships they damaged, but they'd hammered her severely. Her max acceleration was down by almost 22%, her point defense had been significantly degraded, she had over 200 casualties, and like all Giscard's STPs, she had effectively exhausted her offensive missile capacity. But super dreadnoughts were tough, and the Republic's damage control capabilities had improved dramatically over the past few years. Conquette might be hurt, but she would still have been combat-capable if there'd been anyone in range for her to fight. "'Their present course is going to carry them clear of Sewell, isn't it, Marius?' he asked after a moment. "'Yes, sir, I'm afraid it is,' Gozi replied. Rear Admiral Hildegard Sewell commanded the Republican task group closing in from System South. "'Not by very much, though,' the Chief of Staff continued." If Deutscher manages to inflict more impeller damage, I think she'll probably be able to bring them into her engagement envelope. And with one of their super dreadnoughts already beat up on, Giscard nodded. Well, I suppose it's all up to Deutscher then. Chapter 37 Additional damage reports came in over the next several minutes, and Honor settled back in her command chair as she digested them. Intolerance damages were the worst, and from the medical reports, it sounded very much as if Alistair McKeon was going to require a new CO for his battle squadron's first division. Honor had never gotten to know Alan Morowitz as well as she would have liked, and it didn't look as if she would ever have the chance to. Star Ranger was the next most badly damaged. Her personnel casualties were even worse than intolerance, 
but that was largely because she was one of the older, manpower-intensive Star Night-class ships. From the reports, her people seemed to have things under control, but she too was going to require an extensive shipyard stay. Given her age and how long repairs were likely to take, it was probable Bue ships would simply write her off, but at least Honor should be able to get her home. Ajax's damage was much less severe. Assuming nothing else happened to her, her repairs should be both routine and rapid. Taken altogether, things could have been far worse, she told herself. She'd allowed her task force to be mousetrapped, and the fact that the Havenites had used a variant of her own side more tactics to do it lent it an additional sting. But the thing which had made it effective at Sidemore was the same thing which had made it equally effective here. No one in normal space could see into hyperspace to detect units there. And at least she'd gotten the carriers clear before the bad guys dropped in on her. Is Rifleman still clear, Mercedes? she asked, looking up from the damage reports. As far as we can tell, they don't have a clue where she is, Brigham replied. Good, but tell her to stay where she is until we clear the hyperlimit. Brigham looked a question at her, and Honor smiled thinly. Whoever's in charge on the other side has already demonstrated she's pretty good. At the moment, it looks like all her available units, aside from Bogey 4, are still accelerating in system. They probably hope we'll take enough lumps from the Arthur pods to slow us down, let them overhaul. But if I were in command on the other side, and if I had enough hulls for it, I'd have at least one more task group waiting in hyper. To drop just outside the limit, right in our faces, just when we think we're about to get away clean, Brigham said. Exactly. Mind you, I think the odds are good that they've committed everything they have already, but let's make sure before Rifleman hypers out to tell Samuel where to pick up his lax. Yes, Your Grace, I'll see to it. Is Moriarty ready? Rear Admiral Emil Deutscher asked his chief of staff. Yes, sir, the chief of staff replied. Good. Deutscher returned his attention to his tactical display. His two obsolete wallers had almost certainly been completely dismissed by the Mantis as a threat. And by and large, the Mantis would have been correct about that. After all, at this range, without pods on tow, they couldn't possibly have a weapon with the range to reach them. But the Super Dreadnought's real purpose from the beginning had simply been to attract the Mantis' attention away from the real threat. Sir? Deutscher looked back up at his chief of staff. Yes? Sir, why did Admiral Foraker call it Moriarty? I've been trying to figure it out for weeks now. I wondered that myself, Deutscher admitted. So I asked Admiral Giscard the same question. He said one of Admiral Foraker's staffers had introduced her to some old pre-space fiction, detective stories, he called them. Apparently, this Moriarty was some kind of mastermind character in one of them. He shrugged. Mastermind, the chief of staff repeated, then chuckled. Well, I guess that does make sense in a way, doesn't it? We'll be entering the estimated range of Arthur's ports in another 45 seconds, Your Grace, Jurawalski said. Thank you. Honor turned her command chair to face the ops officer. Remind all of our TAC officers of that. Yes, ma'am. They're entering range now, sir. Thank you, Deutscher said. Send the execute. Aye, sir. Missile launch. Multiple missile launches, multiple sources. Honor snapped her command chair back around, staring at the master plot at Jarowalski's sudden sharp announcement. Estimate 17,000. I say again, 17,000 inbound. Time to attack range, 7.1 minutes. For just a moment, Honor's brain flatly refused to believe the numbers. Their scout ship's arrays had detected only 400 pods in orbit around Arthur. The maximum number of missiles aboard them should only have been 4,000. Her eyes darted across the plot and then flared wide in sudden understanding. The others, all the others, were coming from the nine ships of Bogey One, which was flatly impossible. Two super dreadnoughts and seven battle cruisers couldn't possibly have fired or controlled that many missiles, even if they'd all been pod designs, but... Where the hell did they all come from? Brigham demanded, and Honor looked at her. The battle cruisers, she said, 
her mind going back to the Battle of Hancock. Battle cruisers? Brigham looked incredulous, and Honor chuckled without any humor at all. They aren't battle cruisers, Mercedes. They're mine layers. The Havenites build their fast fleet mine layers on battle cruiser hulls, just like we do. And we were so busy worrying about super dreadnoughts and pod layers, it never occurred to us to look closely at the battle cruisers. So they've been sitting there ever since they stopped accelerating, doing nothing but lay pods. Jesus, Brigham murmured softly, and it was a prayer, not an imprecation. Then she drew a deep breath. Well, at least they can't have the fire control to handle it all. Don't bet on it, Honor said grimly. They wouldn't have gone to all the trouble of setting this up if they hadn't figured they could actually hit something with it after they did. Moriarty confirms control, sir. Good, Deutscher said, and sat back with a hungry smile. Engage bogey one, Honor snapped. Aye, aye, ma'am, Jarawalski responded. Should I use the Agamemnon's too? Yes, Honor replied. Gamma sequence. Aye, aye, ma'am, Jarawalski repeated, and began issuing orders over the task force's tactical net. Given the geometry, the effective closing speed between TF-82 and the launch platforms was almost 36,000 kps, the battlecruiser's Mark 16 MDMs, with one less stage than Imperator's larger missiles, had a maximum powered range of 42 million kilometers. But the range was over 53 million, which meant the Mark 16s would have to coast ballistically for 11 million kilometers between stage activations. That would add an additional minute and a half to their flight time, bringing it to a total of 13 and a half minutes, whereas Imperator's more powerful missiles could make the entire run under power in only seven. Moreover, the smaller missiles' closing speed relative to their targets would be over 20,000 kps lower. But by using the gamma sequence she and Jarowalski had worked out months ago, Imperator would roll her first half-dozen patterns with missile settings which duplicated those of the Mark 16s. The Agamemnons would roll six patterns each at the same rate, which would take 72 seconds, and those six salvos, each of 276 missiles, would make the crossing at the Mark 16 speed. Only after the smaller MDMs were away would Imperator begin firing full-power patterns of her own, one double pattern every 24 seconds. The first of her 120-strong salvos would arrive on target eight and a half minutes after she first began rolling pods, five minutes before the battlecruiser's fire. In Arthur orbit, the installation codenamed Moriarty came fully online for the first time. It wasn't a very huge installation. In fact, it was no larger than a heavy cruiser, and it had been transported in two prefabricated modules aboard a fleet supply ship, then assembled in place in less than 48 hours. As warship tonnages went, 400,000 wasn't a lot, unless all of it was dedicated to fire control. Moriarty was Shannon Foraker's system defense answer to the individual inferiority of the Republic's missile pods. The control station was a flat, light-drinking black constructed of radar-absorbent materials. It was almost impossible to detect as long as it practiced strict emission control discipline and the Manticoran recon arrays had missed it entirely. Now it reached out through the other innocent-looking orbital platforms, which had been seated about the system at the same time. Each of those platforms was, in effect, a less capable, simpler-minded version of the RMN's own keyholes. They formed a network, an expanding spray of tentacles, which gave Moriarty literally thousands of fire-control telemetry links. And what those links lacked in Manticoran-style sophistication, they made up in numbers, because they could control the missiles assigned to them without break all the way to their targets. Moriarty had only one real weakness, aside from the fact that if it had been detected, killing it would have been relatively simple. That weakness was the light speed limitation on its telemetry. It simply couldn't provide real-time corrections as its missiles raced down range. On the other hand, neither could Honor's telemetry links. Aside from the superior seeking systems and more capable AIs aboard the Manticoran missiles, the accuracy playing field had just been leveled. And the Republic Salvo contained 62 times as many missiles as the largest Salvo, TF-82, was firing. Get on them! Get on them now! 
Captain Amanda Bronkowski, Samuel Miklos's senior colleague, knew her people didn't need any exhortations from her, but she couldn't help it. She watched the incredible cyclone of missile icons streaking across her plot towards the task force, and it seemed impossible that any of its ships could survive. The five lack wings, arranged above and below the heavier ships, and 50,000 kilometers closer to Arthur, belched an answering hurricane. Vipers and standard counter-missiles began to launch from the lax as Mark 31s roared away from the starships and incoming missiles began to vanish. Brankovsky had 560 lax, one for every 30 attack missiles, and they punched a steady stream of counter-missiles into their teeth. Tethered and free-flying Ghost Rider decoys sang to the Republican MDM sensors. Dazzlers were launched into their faces, exploding in bursts of blinding interference, and Imperator and her consorts punched out wave after wave of Mark 31s. The front of the Republic's missile attack eroded under TF-82's defensive fire like a cliff, crumbling under the assault of a stormy sea. But like the cliff, it was only the front of a far larger mass— Thousands of MDMs were killed, yet more thousands remained, and Honor Harrington watched them reaching out for her command. Emil Deutscher watched Moriarty's fire race towards the enemy. Even from here, he could see that virtually none of the attack missiles were becoming lost in mid-flight, as normally happened in MDM combat. All of them held their courses, and he felt totally certain no defenses, not even the Mantis, could stop them— which left the little problem of the fire coming at him. It took the massive attack seven minutes to reach Task Force 82. Of the 17,000 missiles in the initial launch, only 60 lost their telemetry links and self-destructed after wandering off course. The Mark 31s killed over 3,000 in the outermost intercept zone. In the middle zone, bolstered by the Katana's Vipers and the standard counter-missiles from the Shrikes and Ferrets, they killed another 4,000. Jammers blinded another 1,600 missiles as they tried to settle into final acquisition, and the incredible cauldron of missile, starship, and lack impeller wedges was too much for Moriarty's arthritic light-speed telemetry to sort out any longer. The surviving 8,300 MDMs dropped into autonomous mode as they hit the inner counter-missile zone. Shipboard EW did its best to spoof and blind the attackers, last-second decoy launches drew some of them astray, and a seemingly solid wall of Mark 31s met them head-on. 4,000 more MDMs were wiped out of space. Another 1,100 fell prey to decoys or jamming, 300 of the survivors were Penetration 8 EW platforms without laser heads, and almost half of the remaining 2,900 lost lock and reacquired not starships, but the nearer, more readily seen lacks. They streaked into the attack, but Manticoran lacks were extraordinarily difficult targets. Only 211 of them, and the 2,100 of Honor's men and women aboard them, were killed. And then the final 1,600 missiles attacked TF-82 starships, most of them targeted on the two super dreadnoughts. Only one thing saved HMS Imperator, and that was the damage already inflicted on Intolerant. Imperator's consort's defenses and electronic warfare capability were simply far below par. She was both easier to see and easier to hit. The nearsighted autonomous mode MDMs mobbed her in huge numbers, ignoring Imperator, and her last-ditch defenses weren't equal to the task of protecting her. Warhead after warhead, literally hundreds of them, detonated in a hellish pattern of strobes, Bubbles of nuclear fusion spitting deadly harpoons of coherent radiation that crashed through Intolerant's wavering sidewalls and ripped deep, deep into her massively armored hull. Mike Henke's battlecruisers did their best to beat that tide of destruction aside, but they simply lacked the firepower, and they themselves were not immune from attack. Honor clung to the arms of her command chair, feeling Imperator shudder under the pounding of her own hits, tasting Nimitz in the back of her brain— clinging to her with all his fierce love and devotion as death thundered and bellowed about their ship. Yet even as she did, her eyes were on the plot, watching the lethal wave of fire washing over Intolerant. No one would ever know how many hits the Super Dreadnought took, but however many there were, it was too many. They ripped into her again and again and again, until suddenly... She simply disappeared in the most brilliant, eye-tearing flash of them all. Nor did she go alone. 
The light cruiser's Fury, Buckler, and a tomb vanished from Honor's plot, as did the battle cruiser's Priam and Patroclus. The heavy cruiser Star Ranger and Blackstone were reduced to crippled hulks, coasting onward ballistically without power or drives, and HMS Ajax faltered suddenly as her entire after impeller ring went down. Imperator took over a dozen direct hits of her own, yet the flagship's actual damage was incredibly light. Her thick armor shrugged off most of the hits with little more than superficial cratering, and despite the loss of half a dozen energy mounts, she remained fully combat-capable. Honor gazed into the bitter ashes of her display, tasting the cruel irony of her flagship's apparent inviolability as she saw the harrowed wreckage of the rest of her command. Of the twenty starships and five hundred and sixty lakhs she'd taken across the hyperlimit, only twelve starships, all but two of them damaged, and three hundred and forty-nine lakhs survived. And even as she watched, Ajax and the heavy cruiser Necromancer were falling behind due to impeller damage. Your Grace? Andrea Jarowalski said quietly. Honor looked at her. The remote arrays confirmed the destruction of two of their mine layers and heavy damage to one of their super dreadnoughts. Thank you, Andrea. Honor was astounded by how calm, how normal her own voice sounded. It was a pathetic return for what the Havenites had done to her, but she supposed it was better than nothing. Harper, she said, get me a link to Admiral Henke. Yes, Your Grace. Several seconds passed before Michelle Henke's strained face appeared on Honor's calm. How bad is it, Mike? Honor asked as soon as she saw her friend. That's an interesting question. Henke managed to produce at least the parody of a smile. Captain Mikhailov is dead, and things are a bit confused over here just now. Our rails and pods are still intact, and our fire control looks pretty good, but our point defense and energy armament took a real beating. The worst of it seems to be the after impeller ring, though. It's completely down. Can you restore it? Honor asked urgently. We're working on it, Hanky replied. The good news is that the damage appears to be in the control runs. The nodes themselves look like they're still intact, including the alphas. The bad news is that we've got one hell of a lot of structural damage aft, and just locating where the runs are broken is going to be a copper-plated bitch. Can you get her out? I don't know, Hanky admitted. Frankly, it doesn't look good, but I'm not prepared to just write her off yet. Besides, she managed another smile, this one almost normal-looking. We can't abandon very well. What do you mean? Honor demanded. Both boat bays are trashed, Honor. The bosun says she thinks she can get the after bay cleared, but it's going to take at least a half hour. Without that... Hanky shrugged, and Honor bit the inside of her lips so hard she tasted blood. Without at least one functional boat bay, Smallcraft couldn't dock with Ajax to take her crew off. There were emergency personnel locks, but trying to lift off a significant percentage of her crew that way would take hours, and the battlecruiser carried enough emergency life pods for little more than half her total complement. There was no point carrying more, since only half her crew's battle stations were close enough to the skin of the hull to make a life pod practical. And her flag bridge was not among the stations which fell into that category. Mike, I... Honor's voice was frayed around the edge, and Henke shook her head quickly. Don't say it, she said almost gently. If we get the wedge back, we can probably play hide-and-seek with anything heavy enough to kill us. If we don't get it back, we're not getting out. It's that simple, Honor. And you know as well as I do that you can't hold the rest of the task force back to cover us. Not with Bogey 3 still closing. Even just hanging around for a half hour while we try to make repairs would bring you into their envelope, and your missile defense has been shot to shit. Honor wanted to argue, to protest, to find some way to make it not true. But she couldn't, and she looked her best friend straight in the eye. You're right, she said quietly. I wish you weren't, but you are. I know. Henke's lips twitched again. And at least we're in better shape than Necromancer, she said almost whimsically, although I think her boat bays are at least intact. Well, yes, 
Honor said, trying to match Hanky's tone even as she wanted to weep. There is that minor difference. Rafe's coordinating the evacuation of her personnel now. Good for Rafe, Hanky nodded. Break north, Honor told her. I'm going to drop our acceleration for about 15 minutes. Hanky looked as if she were about to protest, but Honor shook her head quickly. Only 15 minutes, Mike. If we go back to the best acceleration we can sustain at that point and maintain heading, we'll still scrape past Bogey 3 at least 80,000 kilometers outside its powered missile range. That's cutting it too close, Honor, Hanky said sharply. No, Honor said flatly. It isn't Admiral Hanky, and not just because Ajax is your ship. There are 750 other men and women aboard her. Hanky looked at her for a moment, then inhaled sharply and nodded. When they see our Excel drop, they'll have to act on the assumption Imperator has enough impeller damage to slow the rest of the task force, Honor continued. Bogey 3 should continue to pursue us on that basis. If you can get the after ring back within the next 45 minutes to an hour, you should still be able to stay clear of Bogey 2, and Bogey 1 is pretty much scrap metal at this point. But if you don't get it back... If we don't get it back, we can't get into hyper anyway, Hanky interrupted her. I think it's the best we can do, Honor. Thank you. Honor wanted to scream at her friend for thanking her, but she only nodded. Give Beth my best, just in case, Hanky added. Do it yourself, Honor shot back. I will, of course, Hanky said. Then more softly, take care, Honor. God bless, Mike, Honor said equally quietly. Clear. Chapter 38 The communicator on her desk buzzed, and she looked up from the report and pressed the acceptance key. Yes? Your Grace, Harper Brantley's voice said, you have a message. What is it? We've just been informed that the First Lord and First Space Lord are aboard the midday shuttle flat, Your Grace. Their pinnace will dock with Imperator in 37 minutes. Thank you, Harper. Honor's courteous voice was calm enough to fool anyone who didn't know her very well indeed. Harper Brantley was one of those who did. You're welcome, Your Grace, he said quietly and cut the circuit. Honor sat back in her float chair, and Nimitz crooned comfortingly from his perch. She looked up and smiled, acknowledging both his love and his effort to cheer her, but they both knew he hadn't succeeded. She looked back at her terminal and the latest in the merciless progression of reports floating in its display. There was never an end to any Queen's officer's paperwork, and she'd found that was even truer after a resounding defeat than it was after a victory. In many ways, she was grateful. It gave her something to do besides sitting in the stillness of her quarters, listening to her ghosts. Nimitz hopped down onto the desk and rose on his haunches, leaning forward to rest his true hands on her shoulders while the tip of his nose just touched hers. He stared into her eyes, his own grass-green gaze as deep as the oceans of sphinx they had sailed together in her childhood, and she felt him deep inside her, felt his concern and his scolding love as they both grappled with her sense of guilt and loss. She reached out and folded her arms about him, holding him to her breasts while she buried her face in his soft, soft fur, and his croon sang gently, gently through her. Honor stood in Imperator's boat bay, Andrew Lafolay at her shoulder, as the pinnace settled into the docking arms. The green light glowed, the inner end of the personnel tube opened, and the bosun's pipe shrilled as Major Lorenzetti's marine sight party snapped to attention. First Lord arriving, the intercom announced, and Hamish Alexander, Samantha on his shoulder, swung himself through the tube first, as befitted his seniority as Sir Thomas Caparelli's civilian superior. Permission to come aboard, Captain? he asked, as Rafe Cardona saluted. Permission granted, my lord. Thank you. Hamish nodded and shook Cardonus's proffered hand. Then he stepped past the captain, and his eyes met Honor's for just a moment before he held out his hand to her. She shook it without speaking, her empathic sense clinging to the concern and love in his mind glow, acutely aware of all the other watching eyes as the bass speaker spoke again. 
First Space Lord arriving. Permission to come aboard, Captain? Sir Thomas Caparelli asked in the ancient ritual. Permission granted, sir. Cardonis gave the equally ritualistic response, and Caparelli stepped across the painted line on the deck. My lord, Sir Thomas, Honor said in formal greeting as she released Hamish's hand to shake Caparelli's in turn. Your grace, Caparelli replied for both of them, and Honor tasted his emotions as well. The anger she'd half dreaded and yet half desired was absent. Instead, she tasted sympathy, concern, and something very like compassion. Part of her was glad, but another part, the wounded part, was almost angry, as if he were betraying her dead by not blaming her for their deaths. It was illogical and unreasonable, and she knew it. And it didn't change her emotions one bit. Would you and Earl Whitehaven care to join me in my quarters? I think that's an excellent idea, Your Grace, Caparelli said after only the briefest glance at Hamish. In that case, my lords, Honor said, and waved her right hand at the waiting lifts. The short journey to Honor's quarters was silent without the casual small talk which would normally have filled it. La Folle peeled off outside the day cabin hatch, and Honor waved her visitors through it. She followed them, and the hatch slid shut behind her. "'Welcome to Imperator, my lords,' she began, then chopped off in astonishment as Hamish turned and enfolded her in a fierce embrace. For just a moment, conscious of Caparelli's presence, she started to resist, but then she realized she tasted absolutely no surprise from the First Space Lord, and she abandoned herself, briefly at least, to the incredible comfort of her husband's arms." The embrace lasted several seconds, and then Hamish stood back, his left hand on her right shoulder, while his feather-gentle right hand brushed an errant strand of hair from her forehead. "'It's good to see you, love,' he said softly. "'And you?' Honor felt her lower lip try to quiver and called it sternly to order. Then she looked past Hamish to Caparelli and managed a wry smile. And it's good to see you too, Sir Thomas. Although not perhaps quite as good, eh, Admiral Alexander Harrington? Oh, dear. Honor inhaled and looked back and forth between the two men. Have we gone public while I was away, Hamish? I wouldn't put it quite that way, he replied. A few people have either figured it out or been informed because it's just so much simpler that way. Thomas here falls into both categories. I informed him, and he'd already figured it out, essentially at least. Your Grace, Honor, Caparelli said with a crooked smile. Your relationship with Hamish has to be one of the worst kept secrets in the history of the Royal Manticoran Navy. Alarm flickered in her eyes, but he only chuckled. I might add, however, that I doubt very much that any Queen's officer would breathe a word about it. If nothing else, he'd be terrified of what the rest of us would do to him when we found out. Sir Thomas, she began, I... You don't have to explain anything to me, Honor. Caparelli cut her off. First, because I think Hamish is probably right where the Articles of War are concerned. Second, because I've never seen any indication of your allowing personal feelings to influence your actions. Third, because you've made it crystal clear throughout your career that you have absolutely no interest in playing the patronage game and relying on interest to further that career. And fourth, and probably most importantly of all, the two of you, the three of you, have damned well earned it. Honor closed her mouth, tasting the rock-ribbed sincerity behind his words. It was an enormous relief, but she made herself bite off any thanks. Instead, she simply waved for the two of them to be seated on the couch, then seated herself in one of the facing armchairs. Hamish smiled faintly, but said nothing as she deliberately separated the two of them from one another. Samantha hopped down from his shoulder, and she and Nimitz leapt up into the other armchair, curling down beside one another and purring happily. "'I imagine,' Honor said after a moment, her mood darkening once more, "'that you've come out to discuss my fiasco.' Hamish's expression never wavered, but she felt his internal wince at her choice of noun. 
I suppose that's one way to describe it, Caporelli said. It's not the one I would have chosen, however. I don't see a better one. Honor knew she sounded bitter, but she couldn't quite help it. I lost half my super dreadnoughts, 60% of my battle cruisers, half my heavy cruisers, 38% of my light cruisers, and over 40% of my lax, in return for which I managed to destroy two mine layers and damage two super dreadnoughts, one of them a pre-pod relic, and to inflict absolutely no damage on the system's infrastructure, which was my original objective. She smiled without a trace of humor. That sounds like the dictionary definition of a fiasco to me. I'm sure it does, Caporelli said calmly. What struck me most strongly, however, was how light your losses were given what you sailed into. His raised hand stopped her protest and his eyes met hers levelly. I know exactly what I'm talking about, Honor, so don't tell me I don't. You walked into a carefully prepared ambush— I've reviewed your reports and those of your surviving captains and the log recordings from your flag bridge and from Imperator's tactical section. I reviewed them very carefully, and whether you want to believe this or not, I also reviewed them very critically. And on the basis of what you knew when you knew it, I can't see a single thing you did wrong. What about sailing directly into that last missile launch? Honor challenged. If anyone should have seen that coming, I should have. The fact that you and Mark Sarno used similar tactics at Hancock Station 16T years ago doesn't make you clairvoyant, Caporelli replied. You did realize they were coming in out of hyper behind you, and I doubt very much most flag officers would have figured it out as quickly. And without knowing the size of the salvos bogey one could throw, your decision to stay away from a force which outnumbered you three to one in ships of the wall was the only reasonable one you could have made. And what about abandoning Ajax? Honor's voice was so low it was almost a whisper. That, too, was the proper decision, Your Grace, Caporelli said quietly. Honor looked up, meeting his eyes once more, tasting his sincerity. It was hard, I know that. I know how close you and Admiral Henke were— but your overriding responsibility was to the ships you could still get out, and with the damage you'd already suffered, slowing to cover Ajax would have made that impossible. If you'd been able to evacuate her personnel, that might have been one thing, but you couldn't. But, Honor began, eyes burning, and Caporelli shook his head. Don't. I've been there, too, and I know leaving people behind, however correct the tactical decision may have been— always hurts. You always ask yourself if there wasn't some way you could have gotten everyone out and curse yourself at night for not having found one. The fact that you and Countess Goldpeak were so close for so long has to make that still worse. But I've come to know you. Whether Michelle Henke had been aboard that ship or not, you'd still feel what you're feeling right now. Honor blinked, then looked away for just a moment— he was right, and she knew it. And yet, remembering Mike... She closed her eyes, her memory replaying the last she'd seen, the last she would ever see, of Michelle Henke. She and her other survivors had gotten across the hyperlimit with Bogey 2 and Bogey 3 in hot pursuit. Rifleman had performed her part of Omega-1 by translating up into hyper to rejoin Samuel Miklos's Silax at the designated rendezvous once the task force's other survivors were across the limit. And Miklos's squadron had executed a flawless micro-jump to rendezvous with honor survivors in turn. They'd gotten the surviving lax aboard the carriers and translated out less than 15 minutes before Bogey 3 crossed the hyper-limit after them, but that hadn't been soon enough to prevent her from knowing what happened. She wished there'd been time for at least one last personal message, but Ajax's communication section had taken massive damage in the first salvo Bogey 2 had fired into Henke's lamed flagship. There'd been no way to communicate, even the remote sensor arrays had been too far away to see it clearly, but from the sensor recordings, it looked as if Ajax had taken at least one battlecruiser with her. The explosion when her own fusion plants let go, however, had been far clearer. I left her.
she said softly. I left her behind to die. Because her drive was damaged, Caporelli said, deliberately misinterpreting the pronoun's antecedent. Because you had no choice. Because you were a fleet commander with a responsibility for the survival of the other ships under your command, it was the right decision. Maybe. Honor looked back at him, and the first space lord cocked his head. She could taste him accepting that that maybe was as close as she could yet come to agreeing with him, and her mouth moved in an almost smile. But whether it was the right decision or not, I still got my backside kicked right up between my ears and didn't take out my objective, exactly what Eighth Fleet wasn't supposed to have happened to it. It's not given to us to simply command victory, Caporelli told her. The other side has an interest in winning as well, you know, and when you're consistently given the most difficult jobs to do, the chances of running into something like you ran into at Solon go up rather steeply. As for your failure to hit your objectives, yes, you did. Admiral Truman, on the other hand, operating according to your plan, blew the Lorne shipyard, every bit of its supporting industry, and every mobile unit in the system into scrap for the loss of six lakhs. I know she did, Honor conceded. And I also know our primary objective was to force the Republic to redeploy, which, on the evidence of Solon, they've certainly done. But I feel depressingly confident that the way this story is going to be spun for their civilian population will dwell on how hard they hit my task force, not how well Alice's did. I think we can all safely depend upon that, Caporelli agreed especially since you've been the one blacking their eyes up until now. The defeat of the Salamander, and I agree that however well you did to salvage what you did, it was a defeat, is going to be page one news in every peep fax. They're going to play it up to the max, exactly the way our own faxes have been playing up Eighth Fleet successes. Nor, I'm afraid, he said much more bleakly, his emotions suddenly far darker, is that the only thing they're going to have to play up? I beg your pardon? Anno looked at him, and he shrugged heavily. The initial report came in this morning. Their Admiral Torville is apparently back from Marsh, and they've given him a new fleet to replace the one you trashed. Units under his command hit Zanzibar about the same time you were attacking Lorne and Solon. Honor inhaled sharply, looking back and forth between Caporelli and Hamish. How bad was it? About as bad as it could have been, Hamish replied. She looked at him and he sighed. He came in with four full battle squadrons of pod layers, and their battle squadrons are still eight ships strong. He also had a couple of divisions of carriers and at least two battlecruiser squadrons to support them, and although we'd reinforced heavily after Admiral Albaca's fiasco, and I use the word deliberately, he added bitterly, it wasn't heavily enough. He hit the defenses like a hammer, and he started right out by sweeping the asteroid belt with remote arrays of his own, followed by lock strikes on our pre-deployed pods. Not only that, he'd brought along fast colliers stuffed with additional missile pods. He left them tucked away in hyper, came in just far enough to draw our mobile units away from their own support bases and engage them at long range until both sides had burned most of their ammo. Then he pulled back across the limit, re-ammunitioned, and came right back in before we could replace the expended defense pods or get our own pod layers back in system to rearm. It was a massacre. How bad, she repeated. Eleven SDPs and seven older super-dreadnoughts, Caporelli said grimly, plus seven hundred lakhs, six battlecruisers, and two heavy cruisers. Those were our losses. Most of the Zanzibaran navy went with them, not to mention, the first space lord added harshly, the near-total destruction of Zanzibar's deep space industry for the second time. Honor paled. Those losses made her own seem almost trivial. I think we can all safely agree, Caporelli continued, 
that as things stand right this instant, it's going to be relatively easy for the peeps to convince their public, and possibly even our own, that the momentum's just shifted, which makes it even more imperative for us to convince them they're wrong. What do you have in mind, Sir Thomas? Honor asked, watching his face closely. You know exactly what I have in mind, Honor, he told her. That's one reason I came out here with Hamish. I know you're hurting, and I know your people have to be shocked by what happened at Solon, and I also know it's going to take at least several weeks for you to be in any position to plan and mount another op. But we need you and your people back in the saddle, and we need you there quickly. We'll do what we can to reinforce you and replace your losses, but it's essential, absolutely essential, that 8th Fleet resume offensive operations at the earliest possible moment. We simply cannot afford to allow the enemy, or ourselves, to believe the initiative has passed into his hands. Chapter 39 Thomas Theisman watched through the viewport as the shuttle made its final approach to the stupendous super-dreadnought. The Republic's Secretary of War and Chief of Naval Operations smiled as he remembered the last time he'd made this trip. His waiting host had been in a somewhat different mood that time. The shuttle slowed to a halt relative to the super-dreadnought, and the boat bay's docking tractors locked onto it. They snubbed away the remainder of its motion, then drew it smoothly into the bay. It settled into the docking arms, the personnel tube ran out, and Theismann and Captain Alenka Bordovic, his senior naval aide, climbed out of their seats. "'Don't lose that, Alenka,' Theismann said, tapping the case under Bordovic's left arm. "'Don't worry, sir,' the captain replied. "'The thought of being shot at dawn holds absolutely no attraction for me.' Theismann grinned at her, then turned to lead the way down the tube into Sovereign of Space's boat bay gallery. Chief of Naval Operations arriving, the announcement rang out, and Theismann smothered another grin. Technically speaking, he should have been referred to as the Secretary of War, since the Secretary was the CNO's civilian superior. It was common knowledge throughout the fleet, however, that he preferred to think of himself as still an honest admiral, not a politician, and he was always amused when the Navy's uniformed personnel chose to pander to that particular vanity of his. "'Welcome aboard, sir,' Captain Patrick Royman said, stepping forward to greet him before he could request formal permission to board. "'Thank you, Pat.' Theismann shook the tall captain's hand, then looked past him to Javier Giscard. "'Welcome aboard, sir,' Giscard said, echoing Royman as they clasped hands. "'Thank you, Admiral.' Theismann raised his voice slightly. And while I'm at it, allow me to express my thanks and the Republic's to you and all the men and women under your command for a job very well done. He still felt a bit silly playing the political leader, but he'd learned not to despise the role, and he saw the smiles on the faces of the officers and enlisted personnel in range of his voice. What he'd said would be relayed throughout the ship— and later, throughout Giscard's entire command, with a speed which mocked the grav pulses of an FTL com. And although he knew Giscard understood what he was doing perfectly, he also saw the genuine pleasure in the other man's eyes as his ultimate service superior made certain his thanks had been publicly delivered. Thank you, sir, Giscard said after a moment. That means a lot to me, just as I know it will to all our personnel. I'm glad. Theismann released Giscard's hand as Royman finished greeting Alenka Bordovic, and she stepped forward to join him in Giscard. And now, Admiral, you and I have a few things to discuss. Of course, sir, if you'll accompany me to my flag briefing room. I meant what I said, Javier, Theismann said as the briefing room hatch closed behind them. You and your people did a damned fine job. Combined with what Lester did to Zanzibar, the Montes have to be feeling as if they strayed in front of an out-of-control freight shuttle at the bottom of a gravity well. We aim to please, Tom, Giscard said, waving the CNO and his aide into chairs, then dropping into one himself. Linda and Lewis are the ones who really made it possible by guessing right. Well, them and Shannon. He shook his head, his wry grimace less than amused. 
If it had been just my mobile units, she'd have gotten away clean. I think that's a bit pessimistic, Theisman disagreed. Based on the system sensor platform's data, you got a hell of a good piece of one of the SDs before Moriarty ever got a shot at them. Yeah, and I shot six SDPs dry to do it, Giscard responded. I'm not trying to denigrate what my people accomplished, and I'm not trying to poor mouth my own accomplishments, but that missile defense of theirs... He shook his head. It's a bear, Tom. Really, really tough. Tell me about it. Theisman snorted. I know you haven't seen Lester's after-action report on Zanzibar yet, but he makes exactly the same point. In fact, he feels that the only reason he managed to carry through was the reloads he'd brought along for his super dreadnoughts. Basically, he ran them out of ammunition at extreme range, then closed in to almost single-drive missile range to get the best targeting solutions he could. And even then, he needed a superiority of three to one. He shrugged. It's something we're going to have to deal with. The next generation Seekers are about ready to deploy. That should help some. And Shannon's already working on other solutions in her copious free time. He and Giscard both chuckled at that one. In the meantime, we're having to rethink our calculations over at the Bureau of Planning on the relative effectiveness of our units. At the moment, we're still confident we'll attain it, but it's beginning to look as if it will take longer than we'd anticipated. How much longer? Giscard asked, his expression faintly alarmed. Obviously, I can't answer that definitively yet, but nothing we've seen so far indicates more than a few months' slippage, six or seven at the outside, from our original schedule. We're not talking about requiring construction not already in the pipeline, only about needing more of that construction ready to go than we'd thought we would. And given that our margin of superiority was going to continue growing for a full year beyond our original target date, six or seven months is completely acceptable. I hope it doesn't run longer, but... Giscard paused for a moment, then shrugged and continued. The thing that concerns me, Tom, is that our projections are based on what they've already shown us and what we've been able to extrapolate on that basis. But we didn't correctly extrapolate the improvement in their defensive capability. We knew it was going to get better, but I think it's safe to say none of us anticipated the actual margin of improvement— just like none of us anticipated this dog-fighting missile of theirs. What if they do the same thing to us with their MDMs? That's a completely valid point, Theisman said gravely. And I'd be lying if I said I hadn't had the occasional qualm myself. I think, though, that what we've already seen with Moriarty and the steady improvement in our own FTL communication and coordination ability indicates we're still making up ground faster than we're losing it, and at the moment, it appears both we and the Mantis are up against a fairly hard limit on the accuracy of full-ranged MDM exchanges. Theirs is better than ours, but with improvements like the new Seekers, ours is getting better faster than theirs is. He tipped back in his chair and folded his arms across his chest. I've got Linda and Op Research running every combat report through every analysis we can think of— we're charting the qualitative and quantitative improvements on both sides as accurately as we can, and we're constantly readjusting our projections. It's possible something will come along to overturn all our calculations. I don't think it will, and I hope it doesn't. But if it does, we ought to spot it in time to rethink both our options and our plans. And the bottom line is that I have no intention of committing the Navy to a decisive offensive operation unless I'm confident our calculations haven't been invalidated. And with all due respect, Admiral Giscard, Alenka Bordovic put in, what you accomplished at Solen completely validated the Moriarty concept. We're moving ahead rapidly with deployment in other star systems, beginning with the most vital ones. On the basis of Solon, we believe our defensive doctrine and capabilities are sufficient to make it impossible for the Mantis to accept the attritional losses major offensives of their own would entail. It certainly looks that way right now, Giscard agreed. On the other hand, remember that at Solon we were up against only one task force with only a single division of Invictuses. The missile defense of an entire Manti fleet would be much deeper and more resilient— 
I think you're right that Moriarty represents what's currently our best option for fixed system defenses, but it's going to have to be deployed in even greater depth than it was at Solon if it's going to stand up to a major Manti offensive. Granted, Theismann said, amused, and deeply pleased by the confidence and persistence of Giscard's arguments. It was a far and welcome cry from the way Giscard had persisted in second-guessing and blaming himself after Thunderbolt. Granted, the CNO repeated, and we're working on that. In addition, Shannon has the new system defense missiles almost ready to go into actual production. We still haven't been able to figure out a way to fit them into something an SDP can handle, but they ought to give the Mantis fits when they run into them. That's the plan, anyway. So what you're saying is we ought to have a firm enough defensive capability to be able to take a few chances operating offensively, Giscard said. Within limits, Theismann agreed, but only within limits. The one thing we can't afford is to shoot ourselves in the foot through sheer overconfidence, even if, he grinned suddenly, you did just thoroughly trounce the salamander. Well, Giscard admitted with a grin of his own, I have to admit it did feel good. I don't have anything personally against her, you understand, but as I'm sure Lester would agree, playing the part of her round-bottom doll gets old in a hurry. I've been going back over the combat reports, my own included, from the last round, Theismann said thoughtfully. It's a bit early, but I'm inclined to think she's even better than Whitehaven was, tactically at least. I know he gave us conniptions, and God knows their damned buttercup was a fucking disaster, but Harrington is sneaky. There are times I don't think she's even bothered to read the book, much less pay any attention to it. Look at that insane trick she pulled at Cerberus, for God's sake, and then what she did to Lester at Sidemore. Personally, and speaking as someone who gleefully used her own ideas against her, Giscard said, I'm wondering how much of what happened at Hancock was Sarno's idea and how much was hers. I know Navent gave Sarno the credit, and everything I've seen indicates he was good enough to have come up with it on his own, but it has all the Harrington fingerprints. Now that you mention it, it does, Theismann said. He frowned, then shrugged. Well, she's only one woman, and as you just demonstrated, she's not invincible. Tough, and not someone I want to go up against without a substantial advantage, but not invincible. Which, by the way, the Newsies have been playing up with joyous abandon ever since your dispatches arrived. I warn you, if you turn up in public anywhere on Haven, be prepared to be embarrassed within a centimeter of your life. Oh, God, Giscard muttered in disgusted tones. Just what Eloise and I needed, smutsies. Theismann laughed. He shouldn't have, and he knew it, but smutsies, the modern heirs of the old pre-space paparazzi, had always been a particularly virulent fact of life in the People's Republic. In fact, they'd been almost a semi-official adjunct of the Office of Public Information's propagandists. They'd been used to titillate and divert the mob with all sorts of intrusive, sensationalized stories about entertainment figures, supposed enemies of the people, and especially political leaders of opposition star nations. Some of the stories about Elizabeth III and her alleged relations with her tree cat, for example, had been decidedly over the top. Not to mention, he felt sure, anatomically impossible. Unfortunately, the Smutsies had survived the People's Republic's fall, and the new freedom of information and the press under the restored Constitution actually made them more intrusive, not less. So far, Giscard and President Pritchard had managed to keep their relationship more or less below the Smutsies' radar horizon, and what the so-called journalists would do when they finally realized what they'd been missing formed the basis for the unofficial presidential couple's joint nightmares. Well, Theismann said, and held out his hand to Bordovic, I can understand why that would be a matter of some concern, and while I hate to do this, I'm afraid I may be going to make it just a bit worse. Worse? Giscard regarded him suspiciously. Just how are you going to make it worse? And don't bother telling me you regret it. I can see the gleam in your eye from here. Well, it's just... This, Theismann said, 
opening the case Bordovic handed him and extending it to Giscard. The admiral took it with another suspicious glower, then glanced down into it. His expression changed instantly, and his eyes shot back up to Theismann's face. You're joking! No, Javier, I'm not. Theismann's smile had disappeared. I don't deserve it, Giscard said flatly. This is what Jacques Griffith got for taking out Grendelsbane, for God's sake. Yes, it is. Theismann reached out to reclaim the case and lifted the rather plain-looking silver medal out of it. It hung on a ribbon of simple blue cloth, and he held it up to catch the light. It was the Congressional Cross, a medal which had been abandoned 180 T years ago when the legislaturalists amended the Constitution out of existence. It had been replaced, officially at least, by the Order of Valor, awarded to heroes of the people under the People's Republic. But it had been resurrected along with the Constitution, and so far only two of them had been awarded. Well, three of them now. This is goddamned ridiculous! Giscard was genuinely angry, Theismann saw. I won one small engagement against a single task force, half of which got away, whereas Jacques took out their entire damned building program, and Lieutenant Haldane gave his life to save the lives of almost three hundred of his fellow crewmen. Javier, I— No, Tom, we can't demean it this way. Not this soon. I'm telling you, and I'll tell Eloise if I have to. Eloise had nothing to do with it, nor for that matter did I. Congress decides who gets this, not the President and not the Navy. Well, you tell Congress to shove it up, Javier. Theismann cut the Admiral off sharply, and Giscard settled back in his chair, mouth shut, but eyes still angry. Better, Theismann said. Now, by and large, I agree with everything you've just said, but, as I already pointed out, the decision is neither mine nor Eloise's, and despite your personal feelings, there are some very valid arguments for your accepting this medal. Not least the public relations aspect of it. I know you don't want to hear that, but Harrington's raids have generated an enormous amount of anger. Not all of that anger is directed at the Montes either, since the general view seems to be that we ought to be stopping her somehow. And her activities have also begun generating fear as well. Now you've not only stopped one of her raids cold, but you've decisively defeated her as well. All that pent-up frustration and anger, and fear, is now focused on what you've accomplished as satisfaction. To be frank, I'm certain that's a lot of the reason Congress decided in its infinite wisdom to award you the cross. I don't care what its reasons were. I won't accept it. That's it. End of story. Javier... Theismann began, then stopped and shook his head. Damn, you're even more like the salamander than I thought. Meaning what? Giscard asked suspiciously. Meaning there are persistent rumors that she refused the Parliamentary Medal of Valor the first time they tried to give it to her. No, did she? Giscard chuckled suddenly. Good for her. And you can tell Congress that if they decide to offer me the cross again... I may accept it, but not this time. Let them find something else, something that doesn't devalue the cross. This is too important to the Navy we're trying to build to be turned into a political award. Theismann sat there for several seconds, gazing at the Admiral. Then he replaced the silver cross in the case, closed it, and sighed. You may be right. In fact, I'm inclined to agree— but the important point, I suppose, is that you genuinely intend to be stubborn about this. Count on it. Oh, I do. Theismann smiled without a great deal of humor. You're going to put me and Eloise into a very difficult position with Congress. I'm genuinely and sincerely sorry about that, but I'm not going to change my mind, not about this. All right, I'll go back to Congress... Thank God the award hasn't been announced yet, and suggest to them that your natural humility and overwhelming modesty make it impossible for you to accept it at this time. I'll further suggest that they might want to simply vote you the thanks of Congress. I trust that that won't be too highfalutin for you? As long as it's not the cross, and... 
Giscard's eyes gleamed as Theismann groaned at the qualifier. As long as it includes thanks to all of my people as well. That I think I can arrange. Theismann shook his head. Jesus, now I'm going to have to tell Lester about this. What do you mean? Well, you know how long and hard he worked on that out-of-control cowboy image of his before we got rid of Saint-Just. How do you think he's going to react to the fact that Congress wants to give him the cross for Zanzibar, especially now that you've opened the way to turning the damn thing down? Chapter 40 Your Grace, Dr. Franz Illescu said stiffly, on behalf of Briarwood Reproduction Center, I offer you my sincere and personal apologies for our inexcusable violation of your confidentiality. I've discussed the matter with our legal department, and I've instructed them not to contest any damages you may choose to seek because of our failure. Furthermore, in recognition of the media furor the unauthorized release of this information provoked, I have informed our billing department that all additional services will be billed at no charge to you. Honor stood in the Briarwood foyer, facing Elliskew, and tasted his genuine remorse. It was overlaid with more than a little resentment at finding himself in this position, especially in front of her. And there was no question that he also suspected, or feared at least, that her parents would hold him personally responsible. Yet for all that, it was remorse and professional responsibility which truly drove his emotions. It was unlikely most people would have believed that, given his stiff-backed, tight-jawed body language and expression. Honor, however, had no choice but to accept it. She rather regretted that. After running the gauntlet of newsies outside Briarwood, despite Solomon Hayes's fall from grace, the story was still grist for the mills of a certain particularly repulsive subspecies of newsie, she'd been positively looking forward to removing large, painful, bloody chunks of Franz Illescu's hide. Now she couldn't do that. Not when it was so obvious to her, at least, that he truly meant his apology. Dr. Illescu, she said after a moment, I know you personally had nothing to do with the leakage of this information. His eyes widened slightly, and she tasted his astonishment at her reasonable tone. In addition, she continued, I've had quite a bit of experience with large bureaucratic organizations. The Queen's Navy, for example. While I'm aware the captain is responsible for anything that happens aboard her ship, I'm also aware that things happen over which she has no actual control. I'm convinced this leak was an example of that sort of lapse. I won't pretend I'm not angry, or that I don't strongly resent what's happened. I feel confident, however, that you've done everything in your power to discover just how this information got into the hands of someone like Solomon Hayes. I see no point in punishing you or your facility for the criminal actions of some individual acting without your authority and against Briarwood's policies on patient confidentiality. I have no intention of seeking damages, punitive or otherwise, from you or Briarwood. I'll accept your offer to provide your future services without fee, and for my part, I'll consider the matter otherwise closed. Your Grace, Illescu began, then stopped. He gazed at her for a moment, his clenched expression easing slightly, then drew a deep breath. That's extraordinarily generous and gracious of you, Your Grace, he said with absolute sincerity. I won't apologize further, because, frankly, no one could apologize adequately for this lapse. I would, however, be honored if you'd allow me to personally escort you to your son. Honor stood in the small, pleasantly pastel room, Andrew Lafolay at her back, and gazed at the innocuous-looking cabinet at the room center. She could have pressed a button which would have retracted the cabinet's housing and revealed the artificial womb in which her child was steadily maturing, but she chose not to. She'd viewed all the medical reports and the medical imagery, and a part of her wanted to see the fetus with her own eyes. But she'd already decided she wouldn't do that until Hamish and Emily could accompany her. This was her child, but he was also theirs, and she would not take that moment from them. She smiled at her own possible silliness, then walked across the room, seated herself beside the unit, and lowered Nimitz from her shoulder to her lap. 
The powered chair was luxuriously comfortable, and she leaned back, closing her eyes and listening. The volume wasn't turned very high on the speakers, but she could hear what her unborn son was hearing. The steady sound of her own recorded heartbeat. Snatches of music, especially the works of Salvatore Hammerwell, her favorite composer, and the sound of her own voice reading. Reading, in fact, she realized with another quite different smile, from David and the Phoenix. She sat there for several minutes, listening, absorbing, sharing. This was the child of her body, the child she'd been unable to carry, and this quiet, comfortable room existed exactly for what she was doing, for bringing herself, at least temporarily, into the presence of the mystic process from which circumstance, fate, and duty had excluded her. And in Honor's case, there was even more to it than for other mothers. She reached out from behind her eyes, listening with more than just her ears, and there, in the quiet of her mind, she found him. She felt him. He was a bright, drowsy, drifting presence, as yet unformed, yet moving steadily towards becoming. His mind glow danced in the depths of her own mind and heart, glorious with the promise of what he would be and become, stirring to the sound of his parents' voices, yearning from his peaceful dreams towards the future which awaited him. In that moment, she knew, at least partly, what a tree cat mother felt, and a part of her quailed at the thought of ever leaving this room again, of separating herself from that new bright life glowing so softly and yet so powerfully in her perceptions. Her closed eyes prickled, and she remembered the verse Catherine Mayhew had found for her when she'd had Willard Neufstyler arrange the funding for her first grace and orphanage. It was an ancient poem, older than the diaspora itself, carefully preserved on Grayson because of how perfectly it spoke to their society and beliefs. Not flesh of my flesh or bone of my bone, but still miraculously my own. Never forget for a single minute you didn't grow under my heart, but in it. She supposed it didn't really apply to her in this case, and yet it did because whatever else was true of this child, he was growing daily stronger, more vibrant, more real within her heart. And she'd already asked Catherine to send her a presentation copy of it for Emily. She blinked, then turned her head and looked at La Follet. The colonel wasn't looking at her at that instant. His eyes, too, were on the unit at the center of the room, and his unguarded expression mirrored his emotions. This was his child, too, she realized. Unlike most Grayson males, La Follet had never married. She knew why that was, too, and she felt a sudden, fresh flicker of guilt. But perhaps in part because of that, the emotions flooding out of him as he gazed at the bland cabinet hiding his Steadholder's unborn son were more than simply fiercely protective. They were, in fact, very, very similar to the ones she tasted from Nimitz. Honor savored her armsman's mind glow, and as she did, something crystallized within her. She looked at La Follet again, seeing the gray flecking his still thick auburn hair, the crow's feet at the corners of his steady gray eyes, the lines etched in his face. He was eighteen years younger than she was, but physically he could have been her father. And he was also the only surviving member of her original personal security team. Every one of the others— and all too many of their replacements had been killed in the line of duty, including Jamie Candless, who had stayed behind aboard a ship he'd known was going to be blown up to cover his Steadholder's escape. There was no adequate recompense for that sort of loyalty, and she knew it would have insulted Andrew LaFollet if she'd suggested there ought to be one. But as she tasted his fierce devotion, his love for her unborn son, and for her— an equally fierce determination filled her. Andrew, she said quietly. Yes, my lady. He looked at her, eyes slightly narrowed, and she tasted his surprise at her tone. Sit down, Andrew. She pointed at the chair beside hers, and he glanced at it, then looked back at her. I'm on duty, my lady, he reminded her. And Spencer is standing right outside that door. I want you to sit down, Andrew, please. 
He gazed at her for a moment longer, then slowly crossed the room and obeyed her. She tasted his growing concern, almost wariness, but he regarded her attentively. Thank you, she said, and reached out to lay one hand lightly on the artificial womb. A lot of things are going to change when this child is born, Andrew. I can't even begin to imagine what some of them are going to be, but others are pretty obvious to me. For one thing, Harrington Steading's going to have a new heir, with all the security details that involves. For another thing, there's going to be a brand new human being in this universe, one whose safety is far more important to me than my own could ever be. And because of that, I have a new duty for you. My lady, La Folle began quickly, his tone almost frightened. I've been thinking about that, and I have several armsmen in mind who'd be... Andrew. The single word cut him off, and she smiled at him, then reached out and cupped the side of his face in her right hand. It was the first time she'd ever touched him quite like that, and he froze like a frightened horse. She smiled at him. I know who I want, she told him quietly. My lady, he protested, I'm your armsman. I'm flattered, honored, more than you could possibly imagine, but I belong with you. Please. His voice wavered ever so slightly on the last word, and Honor caressed his cheek with her fingers. Then she shook her head. No, Andrew, you are my armsman. You always will be. My perfect armsman. The man who saved my life not once, but over and over. The man who helped save my sanity more than once. The man whose shoulder I've wept on and who's covered my back for fifteen years. I love you, Andrew Lafolle, and I know you love me, and you're the one man I trust to protect my son. The one man I want to protect my son. My lady... His voice was hoarse, shaky, and he shook his head slowly, almost pleadingly. Yes, Andrew, she told him, sitting back in her chair again, answering the unspoken question she tasted in his emotions. Yes, I do have another motive, and you've guessed what it is. I want you as safe as I can make you. I've lost Simon, Jamie, Robert, and Eddie. I don't want to lose you, too. I want to know you're alive— and if, God forbid, something happens and I'm killed in action, I want to know you're still here, still protecting my son for me, because I know no one else in this universe will do it as well as you will. He stared at her, his eyes brimming with tears, and then he laid his hand atop the artificial womb, exactly as he'd once laid it atop a Bible the day he swore his personal fealty to her. Yes, my lady, he said softly. When your son is born, on that day, I'll become his armsman, too. And whatever happens, I swear I will protect him with my life. I know you will, Andrew, she told him. I know you will. Well, that didn't work out too well, did it? Albrecht Detweiler said conversationally. Aldona Anisimovna and Isabel Bardasano glanced at one another, then turned back to the face displayed on the secure comm. They sat in Anisimovna's office, one of her offices, on Mesa itself, and they had no doubt what Detweiler was referring to. Just over one tea month had passed since the attempt on Honor Harrington's life, and this was the first time since then that they'd been back in the Mesa system. "'I haven't had time to fully familiarize myself with the reports, Albert,' Bardisano said after a moment. As you know, we've only been back in system for a few hours. On the basis of what I've seen so far, I'd have to agree it didn't work out as planned. Whether that's a good thing or a bad one remains to be seen. Indeed. Detweiler cocked his head, one eyebrow rising, and Anisimovna tried to decide whether his expression was more one of amusement or irritation. Are you sure you aren't simply trying to put the best face possible on a failure, Isabel? He asked after a moment. Of course I am, to some extent. Bartisano smiled slightly. If I said I wasn't, I'd be lying. Worse, you'd know I was. That could be decidedly unhealthy for me. By the same token, however, you know what my usual success rate is, 
and I think you also recognize I'm valuable not simply for the operations I carry out successfully, but also for my brain. That's certainly been true up till now, he agreed. Well then, she said, let's look at what happened. The operation should have succeeded, would have succeeded, according to the reports I have had time to look over, if not for the fact that Harrington had a pulser of all things actually built into her artificial hand. She shrugged. None of the intelligence available to us suggested any such possibility, so it was impossible to factor it into our plans. Apparently, our vehicle succeeded in taking out her bodyguard, exactly as we'd planned, and under circumstances which should have left him armed when she wasn't. And then, unfortunately, she shot him with her finger. Bartisano grimaced, and Detweiler actually chuckled ever so slightly. So that's why the operation failed, she continued. However, removing Harrington herself, while it would have been extremely satisfying personally to all of us on several levels, was never really the primary object of killing her. True, it would have been useful to deprive the Mantis of one of their best naval commanders, and equally true, the fact that she and Anton Zilwicky have become such good friends only adds to the reasons to want her dead. But what we were really after was killing her in a way which would convince the Mantis generally, and Elizabeth Winton in particular, Haven had done it. And that, Albrecht, is exactly the conclusion which our foreign office agent informs us they all reached. After all, who else had a reason to want her killed? I think Isabel has a point, Albrecht, Anisimovna put in. Technically, the Harrington assassination hadn't been Anisimovna's responsibility in any way. The fact that she and Bartisano were working together on several other projects, and that Bartisano's sudden demise would complicate those projects significantly, gave her a distinct vested interest in the younger woman's survival, however. You do? Detweiler's eyes moved from Bartisano to Anisimovna. I do, she replied firmly. It's well known that the legislaturalists and Pierre and his lunatics all used assassination as a standard tool. Given that history, it was inevitable, I think, for the Mantis to automatically assume that Pritchard, who's killed quite a few people herself in her time, ordered Harrington's assassination, especially given how successful Harrington's raids have been. She shrugged. So, as far as I can see, Isabel's right. The operation succeeded in its primary objective. And, Bartisano added almost diffidently, the reports I've had a chance to view so far all agree that the Mantis don't have any more clue as to how we managed it than the Andermani did. That's true enough. Detweiler pursed his lips thoughtfully for a moment, then shrugged. All right, on balance I agree with you. I would, however, add that I was one of the individuals who expected to take considerable personal satisfaction in knowing she was dead. Should the opportunity to rectify that aspect of this operation present itself, I trust it will be taken. Oh, you can count on that, Bartisano promised with a thin smile. Good. Well, turning from that, how are things proceeding in Talbot? Well, as of our last reports, Anisimovna said, Obviously, we're several weeks behind here, thanks to the communications lag, but both Norbrandt and Westman seem to be working out well, each in his or her own way. Personally, I think Norbrandt is more useful to us where Solly public opinion is concerned, but Westman's probably the more effective in the long term. Politically, the reports coming out of their constitutional convention indicate Tonkovich is still digging in to resist annexation terms, which would be acceptable to Manticore. She doesn't have any intention of actually killing the annexation, but she's so genuinely stupid she doesn't realize she's playing her fiddle while the house burns down above her. And reports from our people in Manticore all confirm that the combination of Norbrandt's attacks and Tonkovich's obstructionism are contributing to a small but growing domestic resistance to annexing the cluster after all. And Monica? Lavakinich is effectively in charge of that part of the operation, Bartisano said. 
Aldona and I did the original spade work, but Israq is coordinating the delivery and refitting of the battlecruisers. According to his last dispatch, they're running behind schedule. Apparently, the Monacan shipyards are less capable than they assured Israq they were. He's brought in some additional technicians to expedite matters, and even with the slippage to date, we're well within the originally projected timetable. I'm not totally comfortable with the fact that the schedule is slipping at all, but at the moment, things appear to be under control. Verbs like appear always make me uncomfortable, Detweiler observed in a whimsical tone. I realize that, Bartisano said calmly. Unfortunately, in black ops like this, they crop up quite a lot. I know. Detweiler nodded. And what about the propaganda offensive in the League? There, Anisimovna admitted, we're hitting some air pockets. Why? Mostly because the Mantis have replaced the complete incompetence Highridge and Decroy had assigned to their embassy on Old Earth. Anisimovna grimaced. I never would have picked Webster as an ambassador, but I have to admit that he's doing them proud. I suppose it has something to do with all the political experience he gained as first space lord. At any rate, he comes across as a very reassuring, solid, reliable, truthful fellow. Not only as a talking head on HD, either. Several of our sources tell us he comes across that way in one-on-one conversations with League officials as well. At the same time, he, or someone on his staff, although all the indications are that he's the one behind it, has orchestrated a remarkably effective PR campaign. We're making progress, Albrecht. All the imagery of blood, explosions, and body parts coming out of Split are at least creating a widespread sense that someone in the cluster objects to the annexation— and our own PR people tell us they're making some ground in convincing the Sally in the street to project Norbrandt's activities onto all the cluster systems, but I'd be misleading you if I suggested Webster isn't doing some very successful damage control. In particular, he succeeded in pointing out that actions like Norbrandt's are those of a lunatic fringe— and that lunatics aren't exactly the best barometer for how the sane members of any society are reacting. And how serious is that? For our purposes, not very at this point, Anisimovna said confidently. We're providing a justification for frontier security to do what we want. We don't have to convince the Sali public. We only have to provide a pretext OFS can use— and they've had lots of practice using far less graphic pretexts than Norbrandt and Westman. Assuming President Tyler and his Navy hold up their end, Verrocchio will have all the fig leaf he needs. I see. Detweiler pondered for several seconds, then shrugged. I see, he repeated. Still, from what you're saying, this Webster is at least a minor irritant, yes? I think that's fair enough, Anisimovna agreed. And he's popular on Manticore? Quite popular. In fact, there was considerable pressure to reassign him to command their home fleet, rather than waste him as a diplomat. Then having him assassinated by the peeps would be more than mildly irritating? It certainly would. Very well. Isabel? Yes, Albrecht? I know you've got a lot on your plate— but I'd like you to see to this little matter as well. And this time, when you choose your vehicle, pick someone from the Havenite diplomatic staff on Old Earth. Sometimes you have to be really obvious to convince Neobarbs to draw the desired conclusion. Chapter 41 Well, Honor, I believe you and Hamish have something you want to tell me about, don't you? Honor turned quickly, putting her back to the archaic, battlemented parapet of King Michael's Tower. She cursed herself silently for the suddenness of her movement and hoped she didn't look too much like a sphinx chipmunk suddenly confronted by a tree cat. Sunlight poured down over the tower's flat roof, less warm than the sun had been for her last visit to Mount Royal Palace four months earlier, but still hot. 
The rooftop garden's flowers and shrubs were in full leaf, and the fringe of the sun awning over the garden chairs popped gently in the breeze. The sky was a deep cloudless blue, and some of Mount Royal's flock of old earth ravens rode the wind in circles high overhead. Queen Elizabeth and Crown Prince Justin sat in two of the garden chairs, their tree cats stretched out comfortably on the old-fashioned wicker table between them. Hamish sat to one side, with Emily's life support chair beside him, and Samantha and Nimitz lay sprawled together in a patch of shade on Emily's other side. It was a charmingly tranquil domestic scene, Honor thought. Unfortunately, she tasted the gently malicious amusement behind the Queen's innocent brown eyes. "'What makes you think that, Elizabeth?' she asked, sparring for time and tasting Hamish's sudden consternation. She did not, she noticed, sense any such emotion from Emily. "'Honor,' the Queen said patiently. "'I'm the Queen, remember?' I have thousands and thousands of spies whose sole job is to make sure I know things. More to the point, I've known Hamish and Emily since I was born, and you for, what, fifteen tea years now? You may not be aware of how your body language has changed around them, but I certainly am. So which of you miscreants wants to confess that you and Hamish are in violation of the Articles of War? Honor felt Hamish's flicker of dismay, but there was too much devilish delight in Elizabeth's mind glow for Honor to share it. As a matter of fact, she replied after a moment, according to my attorney, Richard Maxwell, there's every reason to believe that since the First Lord is a civilian and I'm not, any relationship between us wouldn't be in violation of the Articles. Assuming, of course, she added with a smile, that there was any such relationship. Oh, certainly assuming any such thing, Elizabeth agreed affably. Uh, and would it happen there is such a relationship? Actually, Beth, Emily said tranquilly, there is. We're married. You shock me. Elizabeth chuckled and leaned back in her chair, fanning herself with one hand. Oh, how my trust in all three of you has been betrayed, woe and lamentations, and so forth. Very funny, Emily said politely. You don't seem surprised that I'm not surprised, Elizabeth pointed out. Unlike my lamentably overly trusting spouses, I felt more than a slight twinge of suspicion when you invited the three of us for a private audience. They, needless to say, walked in all innocent and unwary. Emily shook her head sadly. Well, Honor may not have. She's really much more clever about these things than Hamish, but I'm fairly confident you managed to at least partially blindside her as well. I certainly tried. Elizabeth looked at Honor, her eyes glinting in the awning shade. It's not always the easiest thing to do, she added. It's been happening to me with depressing regularity for the past several months, actually, Honor told her. First, the minor matter of that unexpected pregnancy, then Solomon Hayes's helpful announcement of it, then there was the little ambush Reverend Sullivan, Archbishop Telmachy, my mother, and my husband and wife, only they weren't my husband and wife at that point, you understand, set up. Did you know I was proposed to and married in less than two hours? The Reverend came all the way from Grayson to make an honest woman out of me, and then— Despite herself, her mood darkened. There have been a few other, less pleasant surprises since. She felt a quick, sharp echo of her own darkness from Elizabeth as her words brought back the pain of losing Michelle Hankey. Then Nimitz gave her a firm, scolding bleak, and she shook her head quickly. Sorry about that. She smiled almost naturally. I don't mean to be the ghost at the banquet. Apology accepted, Elizabeth told her. She drew a breath, then shook herself and smiled back, banishing her own sense of loss and reaching back out for her previous mood. However, she continued, the real devious reason I invited you three here and strong-armed your confession out of you is that I'm wondering just how long you intend to wait before you publicly regularize your situation. We were waiting until Richard was able to confirm Hamish's interpretation of the legal complications, Honor said. And, Hamish admitted, 
keeping quiet about it has sort of gotten to be a habit. I think we're all just a little bit nervous. No, a lot nervous, over how the public will react to this, especially after Highridge's smear campaign. Knowing you all, I assume there was no truth to Hayes' allegations at the time? No, there wasn't, Hamish said firmly, then glanced at Emily and Honor. Not, he added with scrupulous honesty, that there wasn't considerable temptation, whether Honor and I had admitted it to ourselves or not. I thought as much. Elizabeth regarded them thoughtfully, then shrugged. I'm sure a lot of people who don't know you will assume otherwise. Unfortunately, nothing you can do is going to change that, and waiting until after your son is born will only make it worse. You do realize that, don't you? We do, even Hamish, Emily said, smiling demurely at her husband. Under some circumstances, Elizabeth continued just a bit more seriously, this could have been a significant political liability. Not only is Hamish first lord, but Willie is prime minister, which, by the way, is the first time in the Star Kingdom's history two sibs have simultaneously held such important positions in a government. The idea that all of us were lying, whether we were or not, is going to present itself, and the opposition would just love to pounce on it. At the moment, however, there is no effective opposition. The only person who could put one together, really, is Cathy Montagna, and given her own irregular personal life, not to mention her basic personality, she'll be standing on top of the Parliament building, toasting the brides and groom and leading choruses of obscene drinking songs in their honour. What I'm trying to say is that, politically speaking, there's no time like the present. I think you should go ahead and make your marriage public. Besides, I've consulted the Queen's bench. They agree with Hamish's interpretation. And they also agree I have the authority as Queen to set aside Article 119. For that matter, they tell me Admiral Caporelli could make the same decision for the good of the service, on the basis that the Crown can't afford to lose either of you at this particular time. So it's time to come out of the closet, you three. That's a scary thought, Honor admitted softly, her smile just a bit tremulous. One I'm really looking forward to, you understand, but still scary after so long. And I have to go back to Trevor Star the day after tomorrow. I'll feel awfully guilty if we're all wrong and this blows up in everyone else's face while I'm off with the fleet and out of range. If we wait until you can hang around to absorb your share of any slings and arrows, we'll never get it announced, Emily pointed out. Eighth Fleet is eating up every minute of your time. She pouted. It was bad enough when the Navy was only seducing one of my spouses away from me. Hey, if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't follow the fleet, girlie, Hamish said with a wicked grin, and Emily gurgled a laugh. I bet you say that to all your dirt side dollies, Spacer, she growled. If we can return this conversation to a somewhat less salacious basis, Elizabeth said severely, eyes twinkling, I have a suggestion. Which is? Honor asked, ignoring Hamish and Emily, as Emily reached out and smacked him on the head with her working arm. Which is that we can probably diffuse at least some of any adverse public reaction if we make the announcement the right way. Which is? Honor repeated. You three were already invited to tonight's state dinner, Elizabeth said. It was going to be one of those boring but necessary evenings, full of ambassadors and hosts, and looking confident for the newsies and HD cameras. And I'll be honest with you, looking confident is more necessary than usual at the moment. Her expression darkened once more, and Ariel's ears flattened in reaction to her mood shift. What happened to you at Solon, Honor, and what the peeps did to us at Zanzibar, have had a measurable impact on public morale. Events in Talbot aren't helping either. At the moment, Admiral Sarno seems to be getting on top of the situation in Silesia, but that butcher Norbrandt is killing hundreds of peoples in Split, and what happened when the peeps tried to assassinate you also has to be factored into the mix. My read is that the assassination attempt mainly pissed people off, Hamish said.
It certainly did, Elizabeth agreed. And if you think people were pissed off here in the Star Kingdom, you don't even want to know how Grayson reacted. It was bad enough when they thought the peeps had executed you, Honor. This is even worse in a way. At the same time, though, all kinds of rumors are flying. In fairness to Lieutenant Mears and his family, I authorized the release of the information that he was acting under some form of compulsion, but the fact that we can't suggest how the compulsion was exerted is contributing to a climate of suspicion, or fear, perhaps. After all, if the peeps got to him, who else can they get to? At any rate, anything that pushes morale upward is very much worthwhile, and I think having your marriage announced here at Mount Royal, by me, with all the appropriate hoopla, ought to have a sort of festive effect. You three are probably among the dozen or so most popular public figures in the Star Kingdom right now, and that's going to more than compensate for anyone who might suspect Hamish and Honor were dallying with one another before you actually were. Politics, Honor sighed, then laughed a trifle sadly. What? Hamish asked. I was just recalling a discussion with Admiral Corvosier before we deployed to Grayson for the first time, Honor said, shaking her head. Politics are always important at our level of responsibility, Honor, Elizabeth told her. That doesn't necessarily make this a sordid decision. I wasn't trying to suggest it does. It's just that it gets so fatiguing sometimes. That it does. On the other hand, sometimes I get to combine things I genuinely want to do with political considerations. Of course, it works the other way around, too, sometimes. More often, I usually think. In this case, though, I have a belated wedding gift for the three of you. Anna regarded the queen warily. At the moment, Elizabeth's idea of what she was due, especially after Solon, would leave an unpleasant taste in her mouth. Elizabeth looked back at her as if the queen were the empath, then reached under her chair and pulled out a small, flat case. Nothing excessive, she reassured her vassal with a slight smile. I just asked Broughton and Stemwinder to make these up for me. She handed the case to Emily, and Honor walked over so that Emily's life support chair was between her and Hamish. Emily looked up at both of them, then looked back down and ran her finger across the raised, intertwined B and S crest of the firm which had been jewelers to the House of Winton for over three tea centuries. She opened it, and Honor drew a deep breath as she saw the three rings nestled into the velvet interior. They were Grayson-style wedding bands, larger and heavier than the Manticora norm, and exquisitely wrought, if not quite in the pure Grayson style. On Grayson, men's wedding rings were traditionally of yellow gold and women's of silver, but all three of these bands were made up of three interwoven strands, one each of yellow gold, white gold, and silver. They carried the Harrington Steading Key on one side and the rampant Whitehaven Stag on the other, and the flat-topped bezels bore the traditional circle of diamonds, each centered by a different semi-precious stone. I checked, Elizabeth said. Honor, you were born in October, old style. Hamish, you were born in March, and Emily was born in August. That makes your birthstones opal, jade, and sardonyx. So I had these made for you. They aren't quite Grayson, and they aren't quite Manticoran, just as the three of you no longer belong to just one of us. They're beautiful, Elizabeth. Emily looked up with bright eyes. Thank you. As gifts go, they're small enough for people who mean as much to me as you do, Elizabeth said simply. And these are from us, from Elizabeth and Justin, not the crown. Anna reached into the case and removed the opal-crested ring. She held it, glittering in the sun, gazing down at it for a few seconds. Then she tried it on the third finger of her left hand. It was a bit large, and she felt a flicker of surprise. Elizabeth had obviously taken pains to get this gift right, and it should have been easy for her to get Honor's ring size, given that Honor's father had the exact dimensions of her prosthetic hand. But then she felt Elizabeth's eyes on her and sensed the queen's waiting watchfulness. She thought about it for a moment, then removed the ring from her left hand 
and tried it on her right. It fit perfectly, and she held it up, looking past it at Elizabeth. If you want it resized, it won't be a problem, Honor, Elizabeth told her. But I think I know you pretty well by now, and it occurred to me that you might want to wear it on your flesh and blood hand. I think you're right, Honor said slowly, lowering her hand and looking down at it. She'd never been one to wear much jewelry, but that ring looked perfect, and she smiled. Then she took it back off and handed it to Emily. Please, Emily, she said, holding out her hand as well. On Grayson, the senior wife gives the wedding band to her junior. I know that, as Elizabeth says, we're not really Manticoran or Grayson anymore, but it would mean a lot to me. Of course, Emily said gently, then looked up at her husband. Hamish, would you help me? Hamish smiled at both of them, then reached down, gently holding Honor's wrist, as Emily slid the ring back onto her finger. Emily gazed at it, then looked back up. It looks good there, doesn't it? She moved her gaze to Elizabeth. And I think I'll have mine resized for my right hand, too. No need, Elizabeth told her. It already is. Such a clever person you are, Emily told her distant cousin, and Elizabeth chuckled. I have it on the best of authority that all queens named Elizabeth are clever. <laughs> Probably that sycophantic crown prince you're married to currying favor with you, Emily retorted. Thereby proving, the maligned crown prince in question said equably, how clever he is. Chapter 42 "'Congratulations, Your Grace,' Mercedes Brigham said with a huge smile, waiting just inside the hatch as Honor and Nimitz swam the transfer tube between the shuttle from Manticore and her pinnace. Andrew LaFollet and Spencer Hawk followed the two of them, and Brigham chuckled as Honor raised an eyebrow at her greeting. "'The news is all over the fleet by now.' The chief of staff gestured at the ring glittering on Honor's right hand. "'I was actually a bit surprised by how many people were surprised, if you know what I mean.' And the reaction, Honor asked, ranges from mere approval to ecstatic, I'd say, Brigham told her. No concerns over 119? Of course not. Brigham chuckled again. You know as well as I do that 119 is probably the most winked at of the articles. Even if it weren't, nobody's going to suggest it applies to you and Earl Whitehaven. Or, Brigham cocked her head, is he Steadholder Consort Harrington now? Please, Honor gave a deliberate shudder. I can hardly wait for the conclave of Steadholders to start in on this one. I seem to spend most of my time trying to find ways to give the real conservatives apoplexy. One can only hope it carries some of them off, Brigham said tartly, with all the fervor of the years she'd spent in the Grayson Space Navy. A most improper thought— with which I agree completely, however unofficially. Honor looked demurely over her shoulder at La Follet, who returned her gaze with a deadpan expression. Then she held out her arms, and Nimitz swarmed down into them from her shoulder as she moved towards her seat. Brigham followed her and seated herself across the aisle as the flight engineer sealed the hatch and the transfer tube detached. She and Honor and Honor's armsmen were the pinnace's only two-legged passengers, and La Follet and Hawk chose seats two rows in front of Honor, between her and the flight deck. It wasn't their usual position, and Honor's cheerfulness dimmed slightly as she tasted their emotions. Simon Mattingly's death and Honor's narrow escape had left their mark. Her armsman's professional paranoia had risen to new heights, and she didn't much like the hair trigger on which they were poised. She made another mental note to discuss the situation with La Follet, then returned her attention to Brigham. What's the word on our repairs? Imperator's going to be in yard hands for at least another month, Your Grace. Brigham's expression sobered. Probably more, actually. None of the damage may have gotten through to the core hull, but her after grazer mounts took a lot heavier beating than we thought before the yard survey. Agamemnon's going to be out of service even longer than that. Truscott Adams and Tisiphone should be returning sometime in the next three to six weeks. 
I was afraid of that when I saw the preliminary yard surveys, Honor sighed. Oh, well, what can't be cured must be endured, as we say on Grayson. And it's not as if repairs are the only thing that's going to be slowing us up. Your Grace? I spent three days at Admiralty House, Mercedes. The situation after Zanzibar is even worse than we'd thought. The Caliph is apparently considering withdrawing from the Alliance. What? Brigham sat upright abruptly, and Honor shrugged. It's hard to blame him, really. Look at it. His star system's been hammered flat twice, and he joined the Alliance in the first place for protection. It's kind of hard to argue we've protected his people successfully. And it's his own admiral's damned fault, Brigham said hotly. If Albacar hadn't overruled Padgorny and given the peeps a roadmap of the system defenses, it never would have happened. I know that's the general view in the fleet, but I'm not sure it's fair. Brigham looked at her semi-incredulously and Honor shrugged. I'm not saying Albacar made the right decision, or that the decision he did make didn't help the Havenites considerably, but if they'd sent in the same attack force against our original defensive deployment, it would have steamrollered anything in its path anyway. Sure, the missile pods would have hurt them more than they did, but not enough to stop an attack that powerful under Lester Tourville's command. The fact that they knew what we'd originally deployed may have inspired them to send a heavier force in the first place, but once they'd made that level of commitment, our original setup wouldn't have stopped them even if it had taken them completely by surprise. Maybe you're right. Brigham's concession was manifestly unwilling. But even if you are... Our losses would have been a lot lighter if we hadn't had to throw good money after bad by reinforcing. Mercedes, Honor said just a bit sternly, we have an alliance. That implies mutual responsibilities and obligations, and I might remind you that High Ridge's idiotic failure to remember that has already cost us Erewhon. If we find our obligations under the treaty too onerous, then we should be happy to see Zanzibar withdraw from it. If we don't, then the Star Kingdom and the Queen have a direct personal responsibility to discharge them, and that means reinforcing a threatened ally to the very best of our ability. Brigham looked at her rebelliously for just a moment, then sighed. Point taken, Your Grace. It's just... She broke off, shaking her head. I understand, Honor said. But the fleet's angry enough as it is. You and I have a special responsibility to avoid pumping any more hydrogen into that particular fire. Understood, ma'am. Good. Having said that, however, Honor continued, there are some members of the government, and a few people at Admiralty House, for that matter, who think we should actually be encouraging Zanzibar, and possibly Elizan as well, to declare non-belligerent status. They what? Brigham blinked. After all the trouble we went to to build the alliance in the first place? The situation was a bit different then, Honor pointed out. We were on our own against the peeps, and we were looking for strategic depth. Zanzibar and Elizan have both been net contributors to the alliance, or would have been if the need to rebuild both of them after McQueen's Operation Icarus hadn't cost so much. But what we really wanted them for was forward bases when everyone was still thinking in terms of system-by-system -system advances. She shrugged. Strategic thinking's changed, as our own ops, and Torville's attack on Zanzibar demonstrate. Both sides are thinking in terms of deep strikes now, operating deep into enemy territory, and simple strategic depth, unless you've got one heck of a lot of it, is looking less and less important. Not only that, but with Zanzibar effectively knocked out of the war for at least 18 months to a T-year, the system's become a defensive obligation which offers no return and Elizan, which also got hammered by Icarus, really only offers us the capacity to build a few dozen battle cruisers or lighter units at a time. So the new school of thought argues that freeing ourselves of the defensive commitments to protect relatively minor star systems would actually allow us to concentrate more strength in home fleet and here in Eighth Fleet. At the same time, assuming the Republic's willing to accept their neutrality and leave them alone, it gets them out of the line of fire. And the important allies at this moment are Grayson and the Andermani. We can protect Grayson more strongly if we can recall the forces currently tied down by commitments like Elizan 
and the Andermani are effectively secure against direct attack simply because of how far away they are. Brigham sat without speaking for almost two minutes, obviously considering what Honor had just said, then looked at her admiral. And do you agree with the new school of thought, Your Grace? I think it's a rational, fresh approach to the problem, and I think that if the Republic is willing to accept and respect the future neutrality of current members of the Alliance, it would be very much in our interest to pursue the possibility. My biggest reservation is whether or not the Republic will accept anything of the sort, though. They've been trying to split the Alliance for decades, Brigham pointed out. Yes, they have. But one thing Eloise Pritchard and Thomas Theismann obviously aren't is stupid, which means they're as well aware as we are of how the strategic and operational realities have changed. So if I were they, I'd be very tempted to reject any easy out for our allies. I'd insist on their surrender rather than simply allowing them to say they're tired of playing and want to go home. Or, Brigham said slowly, you might agree to allow them to become neutral when what you really intend to do is sweep them right up as soon as we withdraw our units and leave them on their own. That's certainly one possibility. And given the Pritchard administration's apparent track record in interstellar diplomacy, quite a few people opposed to the idea are making the same point. Personally, I think that if Pritchard officially agreed to accept their neutrality, she'd almost have to stand by her word precisely because of the dispute over what happened to our diplomatic correspondence before the shooting started again. I've said as much, not without evoking quite a bit of incredulity. It's not a point on which the government at large and I, or even my new brother-in-law and I, seem to be in close agreement. She grimaced. Fortunately, perhaps... It's a decision I don't have to make. But it is going to affect our stance here, isn't it? That's why you brought it up? Yes, it is. As things stand now, we're being forced to make even heavier commitments to Elizan and the other secondary systems because of what happened at Zanzibar, which means, of course, that finding replacements and reinforcements for Eighth Fleet just got even harder. And given what we blundered into in Solon... Admiralty House is insistent that we have to be reinforced before we resume offensive operations. We can't afford another hammering like the one Giscard gave us. So it's confirmed that it was Giscard? The news came in just before my shuttle left. He's been officially voted the thanks of the Republic's Congress for his successful defense of Solon. And Tourville got the same thing for hammering Zanzibar. That's good to know, Brigham said thoughtfully. Honor looked at her, and the chief of staff shrugged. It always makes me feel better, somehow, to be able to put a face on the enemy, Your Grace. Does it? Honor shook her head. It helps me when I consider their probable actions or reactions, but I really think I'd rather not know the people on the other side. It's easier to kill strangers. Don't fool yourself, Your Grace, Brigham said quietly. I've known you a long time now. The fact that they're strangers doesn't make you feel any better about killing them. Honor looked at her again, more sharply, and her chief of staff looked back, lovely. And she was right, Honor thought. At any rate, she continued, her tone conceding the point, we can't afford to let them do that to us again for several reasons. The losses themselves are painful enough, but we've got to regain the momentum and we're not going to be able to do that if they keep bloodying our nose. So the decision's been taken that even though it's important to get back onto the offensive as quickly as we can, we're not going to do it until we've been able to reinforce Eighth Fleet significantly. Which means turning up additional modern wallers, among other things. Which is going to take how long? Brigham asked anxiously. At least another six to eight weeks. That's why I said Imperator's repair time wasn't going to set us back badly. New wallers sound good, but I hate the thought of giving them that much free time, Your Grace. Brigham's expression was worried. They've got to be tempted to follow up their success against Zanzibar, and if we take the pressure off of them for a couple of months... She let her voice trail off, and Honor nodded. 
I made the same point to Admiral Caporelli and the strategy board. And I also made a suggestion about how we might alleviate some of the worst consequences of having to effectively stand down Eighth Fleet's offensive for that long. What sort of suggestion, Your Grace? Brigham regarded her narrowly. We're going to try to keep them looking over their shoulders. Beginning next week, about the time we'd be doing it anyway, if we were following the cycle we established in Cutworm 2 and 3, our destroyers are going to start scouting half a dozen of their systems. They'll do exactly what they've been doing as the preliminary for each of our earlier attacks, except, of course, that there won't be any attacks. That's deliciously nasty, Your Grace, Brigham said admiringly. They'll have to assume we do plan to attack and react accordingly. Initially, at least. I suspect they're smart enough to wonder if that isn't exactly what we're doing, since they know they've hurt us badly. But I think you're right. They're going to have to honor the threat, at least the first time we do it to them. After that, they could change their minds. So, if we do it to them two or three times while we aren't ready to attack, Brigham said, get them accustomed to the idea that our scouts are just part of a strategy of bluffs, then when we are ready to attack... Then, hopefully, scouting the systems will actually give us a bit of an edge of surprise, since they'll know we aren't really going to hit them, Honor agreed. And if we do it right, we may be able to convince them to do an al and tip their hands on their current defensive thinking and deployments. I like it, Brigham said. Obviously, I'd prefer not to have to suspend operations, but if we have to, let's make it work for us as much as we can. That's more or less what I was thinking. So why don't you and I spend some time thinking about which systems we'd like to make them most nervous about? Your Grace? Honor and Spencer Hawk broke immediately, stepping back towards opposite sides of the mat. They fell into rest positions, then Honor bowed and Hawk returned the courtesy before she turned towards James McGinnis. Yes, Mac? McGinnis stood just inside the gymnasium hatch. Like Honor's original flagship, HMS Second Yeltsin was an Invictus-class super dreadnought. Honor had transferred her flag to her while Imperator was undergoing repairs, but although she and her staff had been aboard Second Yeltsin for almost two weeks now, ever since her return from Manticore, the ship still didn't feel like home. Still, it wasn't exactly like camping out in a hut in the woods, either. Second Yeltsin, like Imperator, had been built as a flagship from the keel out, and several of her amenities reflected her flagship status, including the small, well-equipped private flag gym, one deck down from the Admiral's personal quarters. Honor had preferred to use the main gymnasium aboard Imperator, where she could take the pulse of the flagship's crew's morale and attitudes, but since Simon Mattingly's and Timothy Mears's deaths, Andrew LaFoulet had put his foot down firmly. He simply could not guarantee her security with so many people so close together, and his feelings and concern had been so strong that this time Honor had offered barely token resistance. Even now, she could taste her personal armsman's focused attention as he stood behind McGinnis, of all people, tautly wary of any sudden move on the other man's part. "'There's a special courier boat, Your Grace.' If McGinnis was aware of La Follet's scrutiny, and he almost certainly was, he gave no sign of it. Nor did Honor taste any resentment of her armsman's heightened wariness in McGinnis's mind glow. It's from Admiralty House, he continued. It just came through the junction, and Harper's already received a transmission from it. It has personal dispatches aboard for you. Honor felt her eyebrows try to rise. The regular morning shuttle from Manticore had arrived barely three hours ago. The evening shuttle was due in another five. So what was so urgent that the Admiralty had sent it aboard a special dispatch boat? She felt a sudden pang of anxiety, then forced herself to put it aside. If this had been some sort of personal bad news, it would have arrived aboard a private courier, not an official Admiralty dispatch boat. Thank you, Mac, she said calmly. I'll grab a shower and take the dispatches in my quarters. Of course, Your Grace. McGinnis bobbed his head and departed, and Honor turned back to Hawk. I'm sorry to break this up, Spencer. I think you're starting to get the hang of it. Hawk grinned. He'd only been studying coup de vitesse for ten T years. Schedule permitting, 
Maybe we can finish the session before supper, she said. As always, my lady, I'm at your disposal, he told her with a bow, and she chuckled and looked at La Follet. By golly, we're getting close to getting him civilized, aren't we? Close only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and tactical nuclear weapons, my lady, La Follet replied gravely. Honor slid the data chip into her desktop terminal. The display came up, and she frowned slightly as a header floated before her. The dispatch bore the electronic seal and personal cipher key of the First Lord, not the First Space Lord. Was it a personal message from Hamish after all? She input her own key and slid her right hand across the DNA sniffer. An instant later, the display blinked in acceptance and the header disappeared, replaced by Hamish's face. He looked oddly excited, but not worried. In fact, if anything, the reverse. Honor, he said, I suppose I could have let this come to you through normal channels, but I decided you'd hurt me if I did. So I pulled rank and got Tom Caparelli to agree to let me send you a special dispatch. Hold on to your socks, love. He drew a deep breath, and Honor felt her shoulders tightening in anticipation of she knew not what. We just got an official message from the peeps, delivered through Erewhon. It's an updated list of the names of POWs and of our personnel who they've confirmed as KIAs. According to it, Mike Henke is alive. Honor sat back in her chair as abruptly as if someone had punched her in the chest, which she realized an instant later, as Nimitz reared up on his perch in reaction to her emotional spike, was exactly what it felt like. She stared at the display, and Hamish looked back out of it at her without speaking for several seconds, as if he'd anticipated her reaction and was giving her time to fight through it before he continued. "'We don't have many details,' he went on after several seconds, "'but it sounds as if Ajax must have gotten at least one of her boat bays cleared. "'From the list, it looks like about a third of her people got off, including Mike. "'She's hurt. We don't know how badly.' But according to the peep's message, her injuries are definitely not life-threatening, and she's getting the best medical care they can provide. In fact, all of your wounded are. There's at least a suggestion towards the end of their message that they might be open to the idea of prisoner exchanges. You've been telling us all along that there's a big difference between the current regime and Pierre and his cutthroats. This certainly seems to bear that out. Of course, there are those, including the Queen, who argue that this is some sort of a trick, something designed to put us off guard somehow by a leopard who doesn't know how to change its spots. But whether they're right or not, I knew you'd want to know about Mike as soon as possible. According to their dispatch, the peeps intend to allow personal messages from and to their POWs, strictly according to the Deneb Accords, which is another refreshing change from state sec or the legislaturalists. I figured you'd probably want to start thinking about a message to her. He paused again, giving her a few more seconds to think, then smiled. Whatever her suspicions, Elizabeth's overjoyed to know Mike is still alive. So is everyone who knows her. And Emily and I are almost happier for you than we are for ourselves. Be well, love. Clear. The display blanked, and Honor sat staring at it. Nimitz swarmed down from his perch, climbed into her arms, and patted her on the cheek. She looked down, and his flying fingers began to sign. See? Told you things would get better. Now maybe your mind glow will finish healing. I'm sorry, Stinker. She stroked the back of his head. I know I haven't been the best company since Solon. You lost a fight, he signed back. The first one you ever really lost. I don't think you knew how to do that. And you thought your friend was gone. Of course, your mind glow was darker. Strong heart and sees clearly are good for you, they make you whole, but you have always been hardest on yourself. Deep inside, you could not forgive yourself for Mike's death. 
Now you don't have to. Maybe you're right. She hugged him gently. It was unusual for him to use Hamish and Emily's tree cat names in normal conversation. The fact that he had reflected how concerned he'd been about her, she realized, and she hugged him again. Maybe you're right, she repeated, and her face blossomed in an enormous smile as she felt the realization that her best friend was still alive, sinking home on an emotional as well as an intellectual basis. In fact, Stinker, I think you are right, and I also think we'd better go find Mac and tell him about this before he finds out from someone else. Admiral Henke? Michelle Henke opened her eyes, then struggled hastily upright in the hospital bed as she saw the person who'd spoken her name. It wasn't easy, with her left leg still in traction, while the quick heel rebuilt the shattered bone, but although they'd never met, she'd seen more than enough publicity imagery to recognize the platinum-haired, topaz-eyed woman standing at the foot of her bed. "'Don't bother, Admiral,' Eloise Pritchard said. "'You've been hurt, and this isn't really an official visit.' You're a head of state, Madam President, Hanky said dryly, getting herself upright and then settling back in relief as the elevating upper end of the bed caught up with her shoulders. That means it is an official visit. Well, perhaps you're right, Pritchard acknowledged with a charming smile. Then she gestured at the chair beside the bed. May I? Of course. After all, it's your chair. In fact... Hanky waved at the pleasant, if not precisely luxurious room. This is your entire hospital. In a manner of speaking, I suppose. Pritchard seated herself gracefully, then sat there for several seconds, her head cocked slightly to the side, her expression thoughtful. To what do I owe the honor, Madam President? Hanky asked finally. Several things. First, you're a senior POW in several senses. You're the highest ranking, militarily speaking, and you're also, what, fifth in the line of succession? Since my older brother was murdered, yes, Hanky said levelly, and had the satisfaction of seeing Pritchard flinch ever so slightly. I'm most sincerely sorry about the death of your father and your brother, Admiral Hanky she said, her voice equally level, meeting Hanky's eyes squarely as she spoke. We've determined from our own records that Statesec was, in fact, directly responsible for that assassination. The fanatics who actually carried it out may have been Masadans, but Statesec effectively recruited them and provided the weapons. As far as we are able to determine, all the individuals directly involved in the decision to carry out that operation are either dead or in prison. Not, she continued as Hanky's eyebrows began to arch in disbelief, because of that particular operation, but because of an entire catalogue of crimes they'd committed against the people of their own star nation. In fact, while I'm sure it won't do anything to alleviate your own grief and anger, I'd simply point out that the same people were responsible for the deaths of untold thousands no, millions of their own citizens. The Republic of Avon has had more than enough of men and women like that. I'm sure you have, Hanky said, watching the other woman carefully. But you don't seem to have completely renounced their methods. In what way? Pritchard asked a bit sharply, her eyes narrowing. I could bring up the little matter of your immediately pre-war diplomacy— except that I'm reasonably certain we wouldn't agree on that point, Hanky said. So instead, I'll restrict myself to pointing out your attempt to assassinate Duchess Harrington, who, I might remind you, happens to be a personal friend of mine. I'm aware of your close relationship with the Duchess, Pritchard said. In fact, that's one of the several reasons I mentioned for this conversation— some of my senior officers, including Secretary of War Theismann and Admiral Torville and Admiral Foraker, have met your salamander. They think very highly of her. And if they believed for a moment that my administration had ordered her assassination, they'd be very, very displeased with me. 
Forgive me, Madam President, but that's not exactly the same thing as saying you didn't authorize it. No, it isn't, is it? Pritchard smiled. I'd forgotten for a moment that you're used to moving at the highest level of politics in the Star Kingdom. You have a politician's ear, even if you are only a naval officer. However, I'll be clearer. Neither I nor anyone else in my administration ordered or authorized an attempt to assassinate Duchess Harrington. It was Henke's eyes turned to narrow. As Pritchard said, she was accustomed to dealing with Manticoran politicians, if not politics per se. In her time, she'd met some extraordinarily adroit and polished liars. But if Eloise Pritchard was another of them, it didn't show. That's an interesting statement, Madam President. Unfortunately, with all due respect, I have no way to know it's accurate. And even if you think it is, that doesn't necessarily mean some rogue element in your administration didn't order it. I'm not surprised you feel that way, and we here in the Republic have certainly had more than enough experience with operations mounted by rogue elements. I can only say I believe very strongly that the statement I just made is accurate. And I'll also say I've replaced both my external and internal security chiefs with men I've known for years and in whom I have the greatest personal confidence. If any rogue operation was mounted against Duchess Harrington, it was mounted without their knowledge or approval. Of that much, I'm absolutely positive. And who else would you suggest might have a motive for wanting her dead, or the resources to try to kill her in that particular fashion? We don't have many specific details about how the attempt was made, Pritchard countered. From what we have seen, however, speculation seems to be centering on the possibility that her young officer, a Lieutenant Mills, I believe, was somehow adjusted to make the attempt on her life. If that's the case, we don't have the resources to have done it. Certainly not in the time window which appears to have been available to whoever carried out the adjustment. Assuming that's what it was, of course. I hope you'll forgive me, Madam President, if I reserve judgment in this case, Hanky said after a moment. You're very convincing. On the other hand, like me, you operate at the highest level of politics, and politicians at that level have to be convincing. I will, however, take what you've said under advisement. Should I assume you're telling me this in hopes I'll pass your message along to Queen Elizabeth? From what I've heard about your cousin, Admiral Henke, Pritchard said wryly, I doubt very much that she'd believe any statement of mine, including a declaration that water is wet. I see you've got a fairly accurate profile of Her Majesty, Henke observed. Although, that's probably actually something of an understatement, she added. I know. Nonetheless, if you get the opportunity, I wish you'd tell her that for me. You may not believe this, Admiral, but I didn't really want this war either. Oh, Pritchard went on quickly as Hanky began to open her mouth. I'll freely admit I fired the first shot, and I'll also admit that given what I knew then, I'd do the same thing again. That's not the same thing as wanting to do it, and I deeply regret all the men and women who have been killed, or, like yourself, wounded. I can't undo that, but I would like to think it's possible for us to find an end to the fighting short of one of us killing everyone on the other side. So would I, Hanky said lovely. Unfortunately, whatever happened to our diplomatic correspondence, you did fire the first shot. Elizabeth isn't the only man Tickerin or Grayson, or Andermani, who's going to find that difficult to forget or overlook. And are you one of them, Admiral? Yes, Madam President, I am, Hanky said quietly. I see, and I appreciate your honesty. Still, it does rather underscore the nature of our quandary, doesn't it? I suppose it does. Silence fell in the sunlit hospital room. Oddly enough, it was an almost companionable silence, Hanky discovered. 
After perhaps three minutes, Pritchard straightened up, inhaled crisply, and stood. I'll let you get back to the business of healing, Admiral. The doctors assure me you're doing well. They anticipate a full recovery, and they tell me you can be discharged from the hospital in another week or so. At which point it's off to the Stalag, Hanky said with a smile. She waved one hand at the unbarred windows of the hospital room. I can't say I'm looking forward to the change of view. I think we can probably do better than a miserable hut behind a tangle of razor wire, Admiral. There was actually a twinkle in Pritchard's topaz eyes. Tom Theismann has strong views on the proper treatment of prisoners of war, as Duchess Arrington may remember from the day they met in Yeltsin. I assure you that all our POWs are being properly provided for. Not only that, I'm hoping it may be possible to set up regular prisoner of war exchanges, perhaps on some sort of parole basis. Really? Hanky was surprised, and she knew it showed in her voice. Really? Pritchard smiled again, this time a bit sadly. Whatever else, Admiral, and however hardly your queen may be thinking about us just now, we really aren't Robierre or Oscar Saint-Just. We have our faults, don't get me wrong, but I'd like to think one of them isn't an ability to forget that even enemies are human beings. Good day, Admiral Lenke. Chapter 43 the pinnace drifted slowly down the length of the spindle-shaped mountain of alloy. Honor, Nimitz, Andrew LaFollet, Spencer Hawk, Raphael Cardonis, and Francis Hirschfield sat gazing out the armor-plast viewport as the small craft reached the super-dreadnoughts after Hammerhead and braked to a complete halt like a tadpole beside a slumbering whale. Hard-suited construction workers, robotic repair units, and an ungainly webwork of girders and work platforms all arranged with microgravity's grand contempt for the concept of up and down, clustered about the ship as she floated against the stars. Powerful work lamps illuminated the frenetic activity of the repair crews and their robotic minions, and Honor frowned thoughtfully as she watched the bustling energy. Looks pretty terrible, doesn't it, Your Grace? Cardona said, and she shrugged. I've seen lots worse. Remember the old Fearless after Basilisk? Or the second one after Yeltsin? Cardonis agreed. But it's still like seeing your kid in the emergency room. He shook his head. I hate seeing her in this shape. She looks a lot better than she did, Skipper, Hirschfield pointed out. Yes, yeah, she does, Cardonis acknowledged, glancing at his executive officer. On the other hand, there was a lot of room for improvement. The important thing is that the yard dogs say you can have her back in another six days, Honor said, turning away from the viewport to look at him. And that's good. Captain Samsonov's been perfectly satisfactory, but I want my flag captain back. I'm flattered, Your Grace, but even after I get her back, we're going to need some pretty serious exercises to blast the rust off. Oh, I've been keeping an eye on you, Rafe, Honor said with a smile. You and Commander Hirschfield here have kept your people hopping in the simulators the entire time the ship's been down. I'm sure you will need a few days at least, but I doubt you've let too much rust accumulate. We've tried not to, Cardonis admitted. And it's helped that we didn't have to completely shut down. Just being able to keep our people on board helped, and we've been able to drill regularly with the forward weapons mounts at least. I know. I wish I'd been able to stay myself. Unfortunately, Honor shrugged and Cardonis nodded in understanding. Honor could, theoretically, have remained on board Imperator, since the repair techs had been working primarily on exterior sections of the hull and, as Cardonis had said, the rest of her crew had never had to leave her. Unfortunately, Imperator had been thoroughly immobilized, and if any emergency had turned up, Honor would have required a flagship capable of moving and fighting. Still, she went on, I'm looking forward to moving back aboard. Mac is looking forward to it, too. She grinned. Actually, he's got at least half my stuff already packed up. We're ready whenever you are, ma'am, Cardonis told her. Unless the yard dogs manage to break something new, I think I'll make the move in about four days, Honor said. 
I'll start then anyway. It's going to take at least a couple of days for Mac to get everything moved and settled back into place, and I need to make another run to Admiralty House this week anyway. I think I can schedule it to overlap with the move and let Mac get everything arranged while I'm on Manticore. That sounds fine to me, Your Grace, Cardona said, and Hirschfield, who, as Imperator's XO, was actually in charge of all such housekeeping details, nodded in agreement. Good. Honor turned away from the viewport. In that case, let's get back over to Yeltsin. We'll just about have time for lunch before the staff meeting if we hurry. We're calling the new operation Sanskrit, Andrea Jarowalski told the assembled admirals, commodores, and captains in HMS Second Yeltsin's flag briefing room. Cutworm, unfortunately, got leaked to the newsies, and it's been bandied about quite a bit over the last several weeks. Besides, we're going to be adopting an entirely new operational approach, so a new designation makes sense from a lot of perspectives. She looked around the big compartment, and Honor reached up to gently rub Nimitz's ears while she listened. The next best thing to eight weeks had passed since Task Force 82 limped back into Trevor Star, and as she'd feared, Eighth Fleet's reinforcement had taken a heavy hit in the wake of the Zanzibar disaster. Despite the fact that there was nothing left, really, to defend in the Zanzibar system, it had been politically impossible to refuse to station a powerful defensive force to keep an eye on the ruins. And Elizan, in particular, had been vociferous about the need to bolster its defenses. It was fortunate that over 40 Andromani super-dreadnoughts had finally completed their refits to handle Manticoran missile pods and reported for duty. But even with that reinforcement, finding the sheer number of hulls required had been extraordinarily difficult. Now, though, things were beginning to look up. An entire division of Invictuses, with all the latest system updates, had arrived just yesterday, and two more Super Dreadnought divisions, all pod types, were anticipated before the end of the week. If things stayed on schedule, Eighth Fleet would have three entire squadrons of SDPs, 18 ships, on its order of battle within the next two weeks. Additional battle cruisers, including the next five Agamemnons, had also come in, and Admiralty House was promising her three more Saiganami Seas as well. And while all that had been going on, Alice Truman and Samuel Miklosh had been reorganizing their carrier's lack wings, incorporating twice as many katanas into their orders of battle. This, of course, Jarowalski continued, is only a preliminary meeting. Her Grace wants us to be sure we're all thinking in the same direction. At the moment, we're planning on an execute date 19 days from today. The preliminary operations plan, based on our anticipated units, will be drafted over the next 10 days. At the end of that time, we'll conduct a dress rehearsal in the simulators. Any problems that come up will be discussed, and we'll draft a revised ops plan over the next three or four days. At that time, we should know definitely what our unit availability will be, and will make any adjustments necessary. We'll run the revised plan through the simulator at X minus three days. One or two of the people sitting at the table looked less than delighted at the timetable's tightness. In fact, Honor sensed several spikes of emotion which verged on consternation, and she couldn't blame the officers who were feeling them. She looked up at Jarowalski and made a tiny gesture with her right hand. The operations officer immediately turned to face her, and every other eye followed hers as if by magnetic attraction. "'I realize we're cutting things tight, people,' Honor said when she was sure she had everyone's attention." That's particularly true for the new ships just joining us. And for those of you who've been with us from the beginning, it seems even more rushed, I'm sure, after our relative inactivity over the last couple of months. The problem is that we don't have a lot more time. Intelligence reports indicate the Havenites have been doing a lot of the same things we've been doing. They've been analyzing and considering what happened at Solon and Zanzibar, and they've also been adding new construction to their fleets. Those same reports strongly suggest they're getting ready to uncork a new offensive of their own. It's imperative that we get our punch in first and force them to worry about their rear areas again. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do any definitive planning of our own because we simply haven't known what we'd have available at the time. And frankly, because the operational change Captain Jarowalski has already referred to required a substantial reinforcement of our wall of battle. 
The ships we need are finally becoming available, and the instant I have sufficient hulls to launch Sanskrit, it goes. I want that clearly understood. This operation must proceed as expeditiously as possible. O&I's latest estimate gives the Havenites over 500 STPs. The Alliance, at this moment, has less than 300. It's quite possible, her brown eyes were very level, that the fate of the Star Kingdom may depend on our ability to make the Havenites anxious, anxious enough about their rear areas to divert heavy forces to protect them, and anxious enough about our new weapons capabilities to rethink the price they'll pay for any offensives of their own. The compartment was very quiet, but Honor felt a sense of satisfaction as she tasted her subordinate's emotions. Concern still colored several individual mind glows, but determination predominated, and she nodded. Andrea, she said. Thank you, Your Grace. Jerowalski also surveyed the officers around the huge conference table, then keyed a holographic star map. It appeared above the conference table, and she tapped keys on her control pad, dropping a cursor into the map. It singled out a star, and Honor felt a fresh stir of surprise. Love it, ladies and gentlemen, Jerowalski said. The system Admiral Whitehaven would have taken if Highridge hadn't swallowed Saint Just's bait, hook, line, and sinker. We're going back there. You're confident you can do it with just three battle squadrons? Admiral Caparelli asked. As confident as I can be, Anna replied, a bit more calmly than she actually felt. She sat in a conference room deep inside Admiralty House, at a conference table surrounded by comfortable chairs, most of them empty at the moment. Honor herself was flanked by Mercedes Brigham on her right and Andrea Jerowalski on her left. Nimitz lay stretched across the back of her chair, and Andrew LaFollet stood directly behind her. Caparelli faced her across the table, flanked by Captain Drizzler, his chief of staff, and Patricia Gibbons. Admiral of the Green Sonia Hempel was also present, along with Commander Coleman Hennessy, her chief of staff, but Hamish Alexander Harrington was conspicuously absent. Technically, this was a matter for his uniformed subordinates, and he'd been extraordinarily careful ever since becoming First Lord to avoid stepping on those subordinates' toes, but under other circumstances, he might have attended anyway. This isn't going to be like Cutworm, Honor continued. We're going to do to love it what Tourville did to Zanzibar. We're going to strike directly at one of the nodes they strengthened heavily post-Buttercup, and we're going to do it in a way which makes a declaration. We're going to tell them that they really, really don't want to screw around with us. That sounds like a very good idea, Your Grace, Admiral Gibbon said. My only concern is how badly you may get hurt in the process of attempting to pull it off. We're not going to attempt anything, Pat, Honor said flatly. We're going to do it. Run through it for us again, please, Caparelli requested. A lot of our planning revolves around Admiral Hempel's newest toys, Honor said, nodding respectfully to the BWEP CO. The rest is predicated on three basic assumptions. First, that the Havenites are likely to believe our scouting destroyers are simply more of the misdirection we've been using to cover up our inability to mount actual operations. The second is that they know we've been forced to divert large numbers of wallers to thicken the defenses of Elizan, Zanzibar, and our other minor allies— and the third is that we established an operational pattern in Cutworm of operating in relatively light strength against relatively lightly defended star systems, and that they won't be surprised if we continue it or appear to. Obviously, we can't absolutely rely on any of those premises, but we believe they should all hold true. In particular, although they've got to be concerned about the security of Lovett, we've consistently shied away from hitting targets that hard. That ought to generate at least some sense of false security, no matter how good they are. We know from our operations over the last 60 days that they've been reacting vigorously to our scouting operations. It's pretty obvious they've been trying to identify the systems we're likely to hit and stationing forces in hyper to cover them. As you know, we planned and executed a feint attack on the Suarez system three weeks ago. We sent in scouting destroyers, 
then, after a couple of days, sent in Admiral Truman's carrier squadron, escorted by a single squadron of battle cruisers and one of heavy cruisers. Admiral Truman launched half her lacks and sent them in system, accompanied by a dozen Ghost Rider EW platforms, simulating the emission signatures of battle cruisers and super dreadnoughts, then translated back out with her hypercapable units. Given the endurance on the Ghost Rider microfusion plants, we estimated that they'd be able to continue their deception long enough to draw a response. We got one. It was a virtual repeat of what they did to me at Solon. This time, though, we'd expected what we got, and they'd planned their interception based on the maximum acceleration rates of the Wallers they thought we'd sent in, not Lax. In addition, three-quarters of our Lax were Katanas, which made them extraordinarily difficult missile targets. Our Lax were able to avoid interception and break back out across the limit before any of the defenders could follow them. Admiral Truman recovered them at the prearranged rendezvous and translated back out. The operation did several things. First, it confirmed that, at that time at least, they were sticking with a doctrine which had worked. Second, it gave us an opportunity to evaluate how quickly this covering force, as compared to the one we encountered at Solon, responded. Third, we hope it made them even more confident that we've been essentially running a bluff without the wherewithal or the will to mount a serious raid. And fourth, while they were busy bringing up their defenses, and before they realized we were using drones on them, they activated the same sort of control network they must have used at Solon. We'd hoped they would, and Admiral Truman had sensor arrays deep enough in system to see them do it, so now we know what to look for in our next op. She paused and reached for the glass sitting at the corner of her blotter. Andrea Jurowalski quickly topped it off with ice water from a carafe, and Honor smiled her thanks before she sipped. Then she set the glass down and looked back up at Caparelli, Givens, and Hemphill. We ran a few other ops, similar in nature, but without the electronic warfare platforms. In two cases, we drew no response at all, which leads us to suspect that in those two cases, there were picket forces hiding in hyper, which never got called in because they never saw a threat. In most of the others, the arrival of our scout units was the signal for courier boats to translate out, and fairly hefty response forces turned up within anywhere from two to four days. So it looks like they've adopted a nodal strategy, in addition to staking out the systems they believe we're most likely to attack. By picking Lovett, we believe we'll be striking directly at one of those nodal forces— if we can punch it out when we hit, there shouldn't be anything else close enough to be called in on us for at least 72 hours if our analysis of their previous operations is accurate. In addition, since we'll be scouting a heavily defended system, and we've established a pattern of sending diversionary scouts into systems we have no intention of attacking, we believe they'll be skeptical about our intentions. Even if they aren't, there's no reason for them to call in additional reinforcements before we actually hit them. And this time around, especially since we know what to look for in their system defense control net, we ought to be able to neutralize it with mistletoe before they ever get a chance to use it. In which case, it will be our wallers and our lax against theirs in a stand-up fight without the sort of missile launch which hammered us at Solon. So you're confident you can neutralize their system defense command and control systems? Givens asked, but her attention was more than half on Hempel, and Honor smiled. "'Admiral Hempel and I haven't always been on the same page,' she began, and Hempel actually chuckled. "'You might say that, Your Grace,' she said. "'If you're given to understatement, I seem to recall a rather passionate debriefing you gave the Weapons Development Board after that little affair in Basilisk. I was younger than Admiral, Honor said almost demurely, and I was mildly irritated at the time. And rightly so, Hemphill said with a nod. She shook her head. I don't believe I've ever had the opportunity to actually tell you this, Your Grace, but I always envisioned Fearless as a test bed. I never expected her to be committed to combat, especially not totally unsupported, 
the fact that you managed to win was an impressive testimony to your tactical ability, and the fact that you were mildly irritated, I believe you said, was certainly understandable. Besides, she chuckled again. Having watched your track record over the last few years, I'm inclined to doubt you've mellowed all that much since. Not mellowed, Honor said with another smile. Just gained a greater sense of diplomacy. This time, Caparelli and Givens joined Hempel's laughter, and Caparelli tipped his chair back. I believe you are about to respond to Pat's question, Your Grace, he said. Yes, I was, Honor agreed, turning her attention back to Admiral Givens. What I was about to say, Pat, is that this time around, I'm convinced Admiral Hempel's new wrinkles will do the job. I'd hoped to keep her new toys tucked away against a rainy day, without letting the Havenites know they exist until we really, really needed them. Unfortunately, really, really need them is a pretty good description of where we are right now. At any rate, we've quietly tested the new hardware in exercises at Trevor Star, and it's performed to specs. Obviously, that's not the same as using it operationally, but the exercise results look very good. In fact, they look much better than the original projections. We're really still just beginning to appreciate all the tactical possibilities, but even what we've already worked out is going to give whoever gets in our way at Love It fits. She smiled again, and this time there was no amusement at all in her expression. As a matter of fact, Admiral Lady Dame Honor Alexander Harrington said softly, I'm rather looking forward to the opportunity.